Frontier by Maggot Mosh Pit. Chapter 1 This is the ship you bought? Left Quill and his first mate, Surlia Wesker, stood on the hot concrete of the space dock in Citrus Creek. Before them was a ship. Look, Surlia, this is the biggest I could afford. Besides, it can do L to the fourth, and it has space for all the colonists, their livestock, and cargo. Leff was the kind of man to take risks. He was a wolverine, average height and skinny, with white streaks at random places in his brown fur. He lived in the age of the Great Planetary Rush, where fast scout ships discovered planets ripe for colonization, and ambitious men and women would ferry colonists across vast distances in exchange for large sums of money. Surlia looked at him angrily. L to the fourth? That would take us six months to get there. Leff grinned. You wanted to tag along. Don't worry, we have enough food. Surlia checked her watch. <sighs> when are the colonists supposed to arrive? Leff took a few steps towards the ship. Won't board for another day yet. Surlia was not the kind of woman to take risks. She was, however, desperate. A pure white arctic fox who was down on her luck and penniless, her only working experience being on a cargo ship. She jumped on the opportunity to serve aboard her friend Leff's ship when he offered her the position first. <sighs> I guess she'll do. You hire an engineer yet? Yep. Who? You're not going to like it. Who, damn it? Zack Wild. Surlia stomped her foot. You hired Zack to be the engineer on your ship? Are you mad? Last time he got in a ship, he blew my apartment in half. Left stifled a laugh. <laughs> you sure it's not just because he's a human? Ugh, I'm not a racist. His past exploits aside, he's the best engineer on this rock we can afford. Maybe if we were over there... He pointed to the sky where the planet Atria loomed. We could find someone better. Leff and Surlia lived on the moon of the ancestral planet of all Atrian kind. It had been terraformed early on in their species' of space age. After the discovery of faster-than-light travel, Atrians traveled far and wide, meeting alien races and habitable planets. One of those races were the humans. They were nice enough, until a short war broke out, ending in a shaky peace treaty and some deep scars left from the dead on both sides. Human Solar Federation ships still took pot shots at Atrian ships, and vice versa, but only in the faraway systems where neutral space began and the arm of the law ended. Borders remained open, but for the most part, neither race traveled into the other's domain. Surlia looked at Leff. You know, now that we have a ship, we could always, you know, fly over there and find someone else. Leff scratched his head. Yeah... About that. You see, it doesn't actually work yet. <laughs> you bought a broken ship? Why am I not surprised? That's why we're here. Zack should arrive shortly, and then we can get her spaceworthy. <sighs> I hope you're right. What did you call her, anyway? The Frontier! Celia placed her head in her paws and sighed. <sighs> I'm gonna regret this whole thing, aren't I? Once we do get it running, it'll be a beauty. It's even got particle cannons, see? Leff pointed to multiple small turrets on the main hull. At first glance, the frontier looked like some sort of building, but it was, in fact, a ship. It had three main sections, comprised mainly of cargo space. These sections were elliptical in shape, round and long, put at different angles. The two outer ellipses were thinner and longer, each with antenna protruding from them. And in the center was fatter and larger. It also had antenna. Many portholes allowed for the viewing of space, and the cockpit stuck out the front like a small nub. Gravity generators compensated for the odd angles, and each ellipses could be detached, or more added. It's a trash heap, Lef. And particle cannons are the cheapest and least effective weapons a ship can have. But I suppose it does have its charms. Lef's pocket beeped, and he pulled out and checked the screen on his small communication device, called an ESCOM, and put it to his ear. Greetings, Earthling, he said. It was Zack. Um, hi, Lef. Um... I'm kinda in prison. Some old guys accuse me of stealing his wallet, and apparently, no one trusts the word of a human these days. Leff looked at Surlia nervously, who couldn't hear what they were saying. Um, just apologize and give the guy back his wallet. I didn't steal it, Leff. I mean, come on, I'm, I'm smarter than that. Look, you need to bail me out of here, otherwise you're not getting that wreck off the ground. Why is everyone so mean to the frontier? I can't bail you out. I spent all my money on the ship. Well, I mean, do something. They won't give me another call. The ESCOM blinked out suddenly. 
Lef placed it back in the pocket of his flight jacket. Well, Zack's in prison. Great. Lef looked at Sir Leah and grinned. We've got our first mission. Come on, I think I know how we can get him out. Lef pushed open the doors of the sports bar. Inside was a large, paper-thin screen which was streaming a live match of low grav ball. Young and old alike watched and cheered for their team, beers in hand. Lef took a seat at one of the rear booths, and Sir Leah sat across from him. Zack mentioned some old guy is behind all of this. Ring a bell? Sir Leah thought a moment. Not really. Lef made hand gestures as though it might improve Sir Leah's insight. Humans, false accusations... Old man Jenkins! Lef nodded. Man's a menace. Whenever a Terran blows this way, he seems to do all he can to put them in prison. I'm surprised it took him this long to get to Zack. Ah, don't be too hard on the guy. He lost his child in the war, you know. Sulia flagged down a waiter. Two coffees, please. The waiter wrote it down and ran off to serve someone else. I know, but Zack wasn't a soldier. He was eleven when the war started. Left stopped and looked up as if to seek information from the gods. Wait, no, he was twelve. I hate math. (laughs) Anyway, why are we here? I know where old man Jenkins lives. We can go convince him to recall the accusations. Jenkins isn't home. Left pointed across the bar. An old, gray-furred fox sat cheering along with the other bar patrons. Sulia looked at the fox with puzzlement. Old man Jenkins likes low grav ball? Big fan. I can't understand it. Low grav ball is the most fake sport since the Terran's boxing. And that's not the only thing old man Jenkins likes. The waiter placed two cups in front of Lef and Srulia and ran off again. Do I smell blackmail coming? (laughs) You know me too well. Last few times I was here, I'm pretty sure Jenkins left with a pretty young lady that certainly wasn't his wife, and they were quite friendly too. Srulia sipped her coffee. I feel sorry for the old coot, but I can't stand men who cheat. Let's blackmail the gray out of his fur. Lef nodded. He cupped his hands and shouted, Hey, Jenkins! Jenkins looked over and waved. He walked over and sat beside Sir Leah. Hey, love me, old friend. What can I do for you and your lovely companion? Sir Leah shrank back as far as she could from old man Jenkins. Jenkins, we need to have a talk. He was slightly drunk, but he knew things were serious. Uh, all right, Lef, but, but I don't want no trouble. I'm afraid I can't do that, Jenkins. We have a problem. You got my engineer put in jail. I want him out of jail. See the problem? Jenkins scoffed. (sighs) That damn dirty ape. I tell you, one of these days they'll steal the planets from right under our noses. Left folded his arms across his chest. Now Jenkins, I'm not interested in your opinions. I want my man out of jail. Tell them you found your wallet. Jenkins smiled. Ooh, trying to bribe me now, are you? (laughs) Name your price. Lef smiled back. I'm not bribing you, I'm blackmailing you. I've seen you with that pretty vixen from out of town. Ha! You don't have the balls, Lef. He began to walk away. Lef pulled his escom out of his pocket and selected the Jenkins residence. Oh. Hello? A feeble female voice answered. It was Mrs. Jenkins. Ah, hello, Miss Jenkins, and how are you today? Jenkins dropped his beer and scrambled to Lef, trying to wrench the escom out of his hands. Is that Lef? Why, I haven't heard from you since you were a young pup. What have you been doing with yourself? Lef danced around as he conversed with Mrs. Jenkins. Ah, eh, nothing much. This and that, you know. In fact, the other day I was at the O'Malley's bar when... All right! All right! What, what was that, Lef? I didn't catch that last part. Oh, I'm going a little deaf in my old age. It was nothing, Miss Jenkins. Just calling to say hi. Have a lovely day now. Lef hung up and smirked at Jenkins. Well, it seems you found your wallet, Jenkins. Jenkins gritted his teeth and shot Lef a dirty look. Yes, it's right here in my pocket. Lef called the police department's non-emergency line and passed the ESCOM to Jenkins. After a brief exchange, he hung up. Lef... If you breathe a word of this to anybody, I'll kick your ass into orbit! Jenkins threw the ESCOM onto the ground, smashing it. He walked away and joined the revelers as though nothing had happened. Celia looked down at the smashed device. That was kind of fun. Left crouched and gathered up the pieces. My precious ESCOM. 
That thing cost me a fortune! He looked up at Sir Leah. But it was worth it. I feel like a pirate. She finished her coffee. <laughs> That's not a good thing. The jailhouse was small. The community was really only there because of the spaceport, and everything else was for the residents who worked there, and visiting captains and crew on shore leave. The crime rate was very low in Citrus Creek, the worst crime being the occasional assault. Leff and Sir Leah walked up to the front desk and got the attention of the receptionist. She spoke in a voice heavy with vocal fry. Oh, hello Leff. Back again, I see. What is it this time? Oh, we're just waiting for Zack. He should be released soon, right? She batted her eyelids at him. Oh, he'll be out shortly. In the meantime, we can have a nice chat. Left smiled and leaned on the table. Oh? What about? I'm sure we'll think of something. Sir Leah pulled Left by the jacket out the door and onto a bench. Hey, what was that for? Sir Leah rolled her eyes. We're leaving for a planet 500 light years away, and we need to do it by tomorrow. We can't waste time flirting. Leff gave his best puppy dog eyes. But sex, though. No. Okay. They sat watching the blue-green sky as small space rocks periodically burned up in the atmosphere, creating a constant light show. I'm gonna miss this place. Leff sighed and leaned back. <sighs> Remember when we would go outside the gravity generator's range and jump off cliffs when we were kids? <laughs> Our parents would get so mad. Surelia looked over at him. As I recall, you did all the jumping, and somehow I got all the blame. Leff waved his paw dismissively. Whatever. Remember Bobby? Ugh, God, you know he still calls me sometimes, right? Leff looked surprised. Oh? Told you you shouldn't have let him on like that. I feel sorry for the guy. He was so sweet. We can come back someday. I don't know about you, but I want to keep doing things in space. Be a freighter captain or something. Sir Leo looked up into the sky. A particularly large rock exploded into a starburst of sparkling dust. It would be a boring place without you around. You could come with me. Sir Leo smiled. I might take you up on that offer. Zack strolled out of the police office, breaking the mood. Hey, Leff. And Sir Leo. I'm assuming you guys got me out of there. Thanks. He looked around. Am I interrupting something? It's kind of hard to read your faces, you know, being aliens and all. Zack was a short man. He was thin with a slightly squat face with short hair and a connected beard mustache. He spoke perfect Atrian. His brown eyes were shifty and he barely made eye contact with people. Left stood. Zack, you are an alien to the people here and on Atria. You need to be more careful. Zack threw up his hands. Okay, okay. Now we can go and see the ship, right? I've always wanted to have a look round at an old H model. Surya stood up as well. Yes, let's go. Just no blowing things up this time. They began to walk to the spaceport. So, Zack, what have you been up to since we saw you in Lace? Eh, my parents paid off the damages. I was meaning to ask you, why did you two move all the way to Lace for one year, then leave? Surya looked at Leff knowingly. Family matters. Zack looked at them both. You Atrians are weird. Even if I have lived here for most of my life. Speaking of which, will you go back to Terra after this is done? Zack shrugged. Eh, I don't know. They don't need many engineers well versed in Atrian technology back on Earth. Maybe I'll settle with the colonists. Buy myself a nice cottage with the money you'll pay me. That is, if the ship can be fixed like you said. Lef looked at Zack, trying to gauge his reaction. Don't worry, Lef. The problem you described can be fixed with some slight tinkering. Probably. If you can't, you're buying the frontier from me. They strolled past the cleaner, newer, more streamlined ships parked at the space dock until they reached their decrepit ship. Left kicked the landing gear of the nearest ship. Pfft. They're just compensating for something. When Zack saw the ship, his eyes lit up. Huh. It's like seeing a real live dinosaur. I can't wait to dig around in the bowels of this thing. He ran up the ramp and into the ship. Left scratched his head. What's a dinosaur? Hell if I know. Lef and Surlia followed Zack into the ship. Lef led Surlia on the grand tour. First, the cockpit. Right on the front end of the ship was a large room. Inside were two chairs with matching consoles, each console having a tiny monitor, a flight wheel with 360 degree turning ability, and several control switches. Now, this ship doesn't have a huge fancy computer, 
just one of those old models that does all the little things like calculate jump trajectory and notifies you when there is an unidentified object inbound. You have to fly the ship manually at sublight speeds. Cerlia looked around. She pointed to a large machine with a half cylinder embedded in its front. You know, this is pretty cool, F. What does it do? Oh, that's the coffee maker. Last captain had it put in, I think. A coffee maker? Lef pressed the button, and a cup rose from the bottom of the cylinder, liquid being deposited into it. He took a sip. It tastes like shit, but it's convenient. Celia rolled her eyes and walked out of the cockpit doorway. Lef ran after her. All right, moving on. Each door along this hallway leads to cargo bays. Nothing in there yet. A couple have already been converted into living quarters for the colonists. Don't worry, the crew have private quarters. At the end of the hallway, there was a door. Lef pressed a button and led Cerlia through it. To your right are the crew quarters. Down those stairs is the engine room, which I forgot to remind you. Don't ever go down there while the drives are engaged. You will be slowly cooked from the inside. It's not very pleasant. Well, that sounds like an oversight. What if the engines overload mid-jump and we have to shut them down manually? You're screwed, I guess. These things weren't built for safety, you know. Also, there is a small conference room there to the left. We're just going to end up using it as a dinner table, though. Cerlia looked disappointed. That's it? I mean, I know it's a junker, but I expected more bells and whistles. You forgot the coffee machine. Before Cerlia had time to be annoyed, there was a loud hum as systems came online throughout the ship. Lights flickered as Zack emerged from the engine room, wiping some sort of lubricant from his hands. I was right. All that was wrong was the main coolant pipe, for the engines had fallen off. Every time someone tried to bring him online, a failsafe would trip and trigger a full shutdown. And of course, since the thing doesn't have a self-diagnostic system, no one bothered to look into it. They just sold it as scrap. It works fine now, but it'll need a new coolant pipe. One that's not near corroded, though. It'll work fine for a few light years, though. Left pumped his paw in the air. Ha! Yes! Things are coming up, Lef! I told you this plan would work! Cerulea punched him. It's just about dinner time. Let's stop gloating and go eat. Zack tossed aside the rag and headed for the doorway. There was this really nice looking place on the outside of town. Do you guys know it? Lef and Cerulea followed him. Yeah, me and Cerulea would eat lunch there when we went to school. As I recall, it wasn't all that good. <laughs> well, it serves some of the only atrium food I can metabolize. Of course, sometimes I forget you're an alien. Sometimes, it feels like you're the only one. Celia suddenly found something very interesting to look at on the floor as Zack made a stop in the cockpit to shut off the engines. Left, Zack, and Celia sat in a booth at the Quell family restaurant and looked at the menus. Zack studied the various food items. I've always wanted to try these strange foods. Left closed his menu. Must have been hard growing up on a strange moon among strange creatures. <laughs> I didn't grow up in a strange place. My parents made sure I was as human as them and their friends. Man, the culture shock was pretty bad when I went to college for ship engineering. Especially the urinals. Those things are weird. Lef shifted uncomfortably. Our anatomy is different. <laughs> I'll say. I remember the night I lost my- Okay, Zach, not the best topic before we eat. Zach shrugged. Whatever. You guys are more squeamish than my parents. A lupine waiter walked up to the table. Can I take your order? Zack put down his menu. Uh, yes. I'll have the laxar steak. No fries. Mmm, I'll have the soup of the day. And I'll have the pixie wing platter. And a round of waters, please. The waiter selected the items on his handheld pad and a receipt popped out. 3,500 credits, please. Zack pulled out his wallet before it left could. I'll pay. He pulled out some bills and handed them to the waiter. The waiter counted them and put all but one into a small box. He split the last bill into two pieces, approximately one one-fourth piece and one three-fourths piece. He handed the three-fourths piece back to Zack. Your meal will be out shortly. I'll bring your water in a second. Zack smiled. Thanks. He looked at the money in his hand. I still can't get over how cool your money is. On Earth, people use something called change, but here you guys actually split bills. I think we should use change. Coins are so cool. Celia said as she dug around her pocket. I even have a genuine American coin. Celia struggled to pronounce the human word. She held up the coin as Lef and Zack stared at it in amazement. The waiter came by and dropped off the water. Zack drank some. 
You know, from stories my parents used to tell me, people on Earth actually pay for their meals after they eat them. Oh, that's not true, it's just a myth. What would stop less reputable people just eating and running off? It's tradition. They continued to converse, and soon the food arrived. The waiter placed a large plate of insect wings in front of Leff, who licked his lips and rubbed his paws together in anticipation. Ooh, these look delicious. Thank you. Zack looked at Leff's food. That looks positively disgusting. Leff popped one of the fried wings into his mouth. He crunched like a potato chip. What? Mmph. Your parents don't let you try the insects? Celia snagged one of Leff's wings. Zack looked at his steak. Well, this is basically all I ate in college. My parents said I shouldn't risk anything else. Hmm. Tastes like chicken. Early the next morning, as one of the two tiny suns rose slowly into the sky, Leff and Celia once again stood before the ship. Except this time, a line of people moved a wide variety of objects up the loading ramp and into the Frontier's cargo bays. Leff swept his arm across the scene. See that? We're helping create a new home for all these people, and getting paid to do it. Celia watched as grizzled-looking farmers herded laxar up the ramp. The laxar made deep, guttural noises as they scraped their six legs against the ramp, unwilling to go up. The farmers managed to get them in without much fuss, however. Two of the colonists approached Leff and Celia. One waved. Leff! I didn't think you'd actually do it, you dog! <laughs> I keep my word, Rackham. Ah, but where are my manners? This is Surlia, my second in command. Surlia, this is old Jack Hammer Rackham, the mayor of these colonists and a personal friend of mine. Rackham shook Surlia's hand. He was a large and strong husky, and he had a jovial air about him. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you, ma'am. This is my wife, Dee. He gestured to the small woman beside him, also a husky, who waved sheepishly. Leff waved back. Nice to see you again, Dee. I trust the loading is going well. No problems? Ha ha ha! Oh, no problems at all, Leff. There's plenty of room, like you said, and looks like it won't get too crowded in there. Leff nodded. Good to hear. So, where are you from? Oh, well, well, we come from the other side of the moon, but it's gotten too expensive to farm there, so I took a colonization course at the Agricultural College, and, well, here we are. How many more waves of colonists will there be? They recommend six. Don't know how many will come, but even if no one comes, we'll be fine. Leff walked towards the ship. Looks like they're finishing up. We'd better get going. Leff stood on a crate in the cargo bay while 60 colonists milled around in front of him. He held up his arms and called for silence. Hello! The din died down and everyone looked at him. The colonists wore normal civilian clothes and wore a mix of foxes, wolves, and other canines. It was standard procedure that all colonists had to be compatible to mate with each other, otherwise the colony would die out in short order. <clears throat> My name is Leff, and I am the captain of this ship. Um, some ground rules. The cockpit and engine rooms are off-limits unless you get permission from me, the first officer, or the engineer. No fights. Other than that, we have a database with books and movies, plenty of food, all supplied by the Atrian government. We'll be departing at once, so make sure you didn't forget anything. He jumped off the crate as the colonists began chattering excitedly. Leff weaved through the colonists and made his way to the cockpit. Sir Leo was already there. Ground control just gave us clearance to lift off. Leff sat in the pilot seat, and Surlia sat in the co-pilot seat. He hit the intercom button on his console. Zack, bring the engines online. We're taking off! The engines hummed and shuddered. Leff gripped the wheel. Time for all that flight school to pay off. He pulled up on the wheel, and the Frontier shot up into the air. Inside, the shock was barely felt as Leff piloted the ship out of the moon's atmosphere. He switched on his monitor and set it to rear view. There goes the moon. Wonder if we'll ever see it again. Surlia also turned on her monitor. Can't say, Leff. She looked at him and smiled. I can't believe we actually did it. Me neither, Surlia. Me neither. Frontier by Maggot Mosh Pit Chapter 2 Leff tapped his paw against the arm of his chair as he looked into his view screen. He turned to Surlia, who was reading a book. How long until we get out of the system? You said it would take three hours. It feels like it's been five. Can't we just engage the drives and jump out of here? You know we can't jump inside a system. Why don't you pick a book and read? Left brought up and scrolled through the library directory on his screen. 
None of this looks like it's my style. Wait, Space Harlots 3? Celia removed her paws from the armrest of the chair and got up with a disgusted look on her face. Ugh, I'm going to my cabin. <laughs> I'm just kidding! Send Zack up here, will ya? Celia walked out the door. Get him yourself! He hit the intercom button. Zack, get your ass up here! His voice echoed through the corridors. The intercom went to all speaker systems, so messages could be heard by all the people on the ship. Zack arrived shortly. What is it, Lef? And be careful what you say on that intercom. Lef placed his claws together and spun his chair around. He gave Zack an evil grin. Greetings, Earthling. Zack got a cup of coffee from the dispenser. Cut that out. Mmm, this is good coffee. The resupply station in orbit around Retson. You think it'll have a coolant pipe? It should. Won't be cheap, though. Hmm, do we have any extra supplies to sell? Zack shrugged. We have an extra fuel converter, but we might need it. It'll have to do. Left checked his screen. We're close. We should arrive in half an hour. He hit the intercom button once more. Good evening. This is your captain speaking. We'll be docking at Supply Station K7 shortly. Left grinned and looked at Zack. I hope they'll have Space Hallets 3. <laughs> uh, Lef, the intercom is still on. Shit! He quickly switched off the intercom, as bouts of laughter could be heard from many of the colonists. Lef went red in the face. I need a goddamn intercom that doesn't toggle. Zack sipped his coffee. You're screwed. There are children on this ship, and they have parents. Sure enough, footsteps could be heard from outside the cockpit. There was a very loud bang from the door. Captain, open that door. We have grievances. Zack opened the door before Lef could stop him or make an excuse. Five angry-looking men and women stormed into the cockpit. Lef sprang up. Ladies, gentlemen, please. One of them shook a chopped hand at Lef. Space Harlots 3? And you even cussed in front of God and everyone. I have a good mind to slap you in your smutty little face. Soon enough, my little boy will be talking horrid sailor talk just because you are irresponsible. How could you? Lef held up his paws. I didn't know the intercom was on. Forgive me, it won't happen again. It better not. Otherwise, there will be trouble. I expect a public apology for such language, young man. The angry mothers and fathers stormed out of the cockpit as fast as they had come in. Outside, a crowd had gathered. Lef quickly closed the door. Zack was shaking with silent mirth. Oh my god. That was the most entertaining thing I have ever seen. I ought to demote you. He collected himself and toggled the intercom button. Um, this is your captain speaking. I apologize for my... Outbreak. Sorry. Left bit his lip and made sure the intercom was off. As the Frontier approached Supply Station K-7, a long mechanical arm with a ring on the end of it extended and grabbed onto one of the docking ports, locking on. It then slowly guided itself and the Frontier to the station's docking port, the ring on the arm staying between the two. As this took place, Zack and Serlia were in the engine room, Zack rummaging around in a storage locker. I know I saw it somewhere around here. Ah, here we are. He pulled out a black case and placed it on a table covered in different components. He opened it. Inside was a cylinder with two pumping arms on either side. A simple part, but one that's in almost every ship. Sir Leah extended her paw to pick it up. Zack closed the case quickly. Whoa, you, you don't want to touch that. Sir Leah frowned. And why is that? It's used, so your fingers would rot off. Serlia retracted her paw. Oh. Zack put on a pair of thick gloves and grabbed the case's handle. Come on, Lef's waiting. Lef stood in front of the docking port, which was directly behind the stairs leading to the engine room. He heard the large doors open and called down. It's about time. We docked ten minutes ago. I had to chase off some kids who wanted to run around the station or something. Zack and Serlia climbed the stairs as Lef cycled the small amount of vacuum that remained between them and the station. Soon the door opened into a busy passageway full of shops. Lef looked around. Wow, look at all the useless crap. I love useless crap. Serlia dragged Lef away from a food stall. We're here to get a coolant pipe, not blow whatever money we have left. They walked along the promenade until Zack spotted a parts shop. There. They should have it in there. The shop was run by a small blue creature with a long snout. It babbled into a device. Greetings. What can I do for you? 
the device translated. Zack slammed the case down onto the counter. We need an AHA-91 type coolant pipe. In exchange, you can have this fuel converter. Zack opened the case. The device babbled the translation at the creature. It appeared to be angry as it babbled to the device loudly. Is this some kind of joke? It's daylight robbery! You'll need to sweeten the deal if I'm going to part with premium parts like an AHA. Zack looked at Lef. We don't have anything else. Lef pushed Zack out of the way. Let me try. <clears throat> Hello, good sir. If we don't get that coolant pipe, us and many innocent colonists will be stranded here. The creature was shocked. It practically screamed into the device. So? I'm a woman, you- Translation unavailable. Why would I take the word of an individual who can't tell man from woman? Then the creature noticed Sir Leah. My word. These boots. Such fine craftsmanship. I must have them. Give me the boots and the converter, and you can have the pipe. Zack slammed the case shut. Deal. Wait, what? These boots wouldn't fit you. My feet are much wider than yours. The creature placed the case on the floor behind the counter as it babbled into the device. I collect boots. It is a hobby. It then sprouted tiny wings and flew into a back room. Sir Leah looked at Leth for help. Give the lady the boots, Sir Leah. We need that pipe. Sir Leah reluctantly crouched down and undid her boots. She dropped them onto the counter. Let's just get that pipe and get out of here before my foot paws freeze. The creature hauled a large pipe from the back room and flew it into Zack's arms. She then grabbed the boots and began inspecting them. She babbled to herself, but she didn't use the device, so her rambling sounded like gibberish. Laff assisted Zack as they quickly left the station. Once inside the engine room, they set down the large pipe and Zack slumped in a nearby chair. Oh, that's thirsty work. I should have it installed by the time we're ready to jump. That is, if you help me, Leff. Leff sat down too. Oh, all right. Just give me a second. Sir Leah walked back to her cabin to fetch another pair of boots. She then went to the cockpit and sat in the pilot seat, signaling the station. Release the docking clamp. We're departing. Acknowledged. There was a hiss as the arm pushed the frontier into space, the gas giant it was orbiting dwarfing the view screen. Sir Leah pressed the redial button, which reset the ship's last course. She leaned back and brought up the book she was reading. An hour later, Sir Leah received a transmission from somewhere. Ship. You have just exited the Atrian system. It is now safe to jump. Sir Leah checked the limited sensors the ship was equipped with. A small probe blinked on the screens. She pressed the intercom button. Hey, Lef, Zack, we can jump now. Finish repairs and report here. Shortly, Lef and Zack arrived, Lef sitting in the pilot seat and Zack sitting in the chair reserved for the engineer when they weren't in the engine room. Lef switched on the intercom. This is your captain speaking. We are about to enter hyperspace. Please vacate the engine room and grab a bucket, because hyperspace is scary. Thank you. Left switched off the intercom and looked at Sir Leah. Got your bucket? Sir Leah held up a container and glared at Leff. Yes, and thank you for asking. All right, hang on to your ass and don't leave it in a subspace pocket. Left slammed his paw onto the jump button. Nothing happened. Whoops, forgot to set a course. Left searched the computer for the coordinates. Ah, here we are, Eden. <laughs> that name translates into a cliché in English. Let's try this again, alright? Hang on to your asses and... Ah, uh, whatever. He slammed his paw onto the button again. The ship began to shake. Then the cockpit began to stretch and warp. At least it seemed to for the people on the frontier. Just as the stretching and undulating got to be too much for the mind to bear, there was a bright flash of light and everything appeared to be back to normal. Sir Leah dry heaved and almost vomited into the container. Holy shit! That was the worst jump I've ever had. Zack, you need to check the drive stabilizer. Zack checked his console. We're doing L3.9. It looks like everything checks out. We're on course. Uh, I'll check the stabilizer when we next stop. Lef held his stomach. Oh, I sympathize with you, Sir Leah. Man, I should check on the colonists. Laugh got up shakily and exited the cockpit. The cargo bay was filled with the sound of groaning and the occasional vomiting. Rackham greeted Laugh. He was seemingly unfazed. Laugh! If every jump is gonna be like that, we'll start having casualties! Laugh patted him on the back. I'm having Zack look into it. How are your people? Oh, uh, as well as you can expect. You're right. Hyperspace is scary. A Fennec Fox girl stumbled up to Laugh and sat down on the floor, clutching her stomach. 
She was short and somewhat plain with cream-colored fur. Oh, Captain, how do you survive space travel if this is what it's like? <laughs> Leth smiled. Oh, you get used to it, especially when you've flown a few times. The girl hung her head. Captain, you must have an iron stomach. Blazes! I don't think I'm okay! Rackham crouched down beside her. Bless ya! Lef, do you have anything for the lass? She seems the worst off. Lef held up a claw. Won't be a second. He ran off and returned shortly holding two pills. Here, these will help. The vixen accepted them and looked skeptically at Lef. What are they? Lef grinned. Heat suppressants? They help with nausea, too. She took them and, after a few seconds, began to look better. You're right! They do help! Thanks, Captain! Lef smiled, more to himself than anyone. Oh, it was no problem. Call me Lef. She smiled back. I'm Lena, Cat. I mean Lef. Rackham chuckled to himself as he slipped out of the scene. Ha 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 ha! Oh, Lef, when will you learn? Lef extended his paw and helped Lena to her feet. Would you like a tour? We can't see the engine room, but the cockpit is a sight to see. All right. As they walked down the corridor, Lena stopped and cocked her head to one side. Lef stopped two meters later. What is it? Hear that? Hear what? Lena's sensitive ears twitched. There's a very faint scratching coming from there. She pointed to the wall, and Lef put his ear to it. I don't hear anything. Is it in the wall or behind the wall? Lena concentrated hard. Behind? There's nothing in there but house parts for the colony. It's probably just the ship creaking. Lena ran to the cargo door, opened it, and jumped inside. Laugh ran after her. Hey, wait! Laugh stumbled around in the dark. Lena had used her ears to guide her, following the sound. Laugh eventually found the light switch and flipped it on. All right now, enough games. Where are you? Over here, Laugh! Lena was crouching in front of a crate. Lef looked at the box, paws akimbo. All right, what was the point of this? Lena poked the crate. In here. I think there's someone in here. <sighs> Cock blocked by a crate. What was that? Nothing. Let's check the crate then. Lef went to release the catch on the side of the crate, but found that it was already unlocked. Strange. Lena bounced excitedly. If someone climbed into the crate, they wouldn't be able to close the locks. It's the only explanation! They both jumped at a voice that came from inside the crate. Got it in one, kid. You're sharp. The lid opened slowly. A pure white, lean ferret wearing nothing but a pair of pants emerged. His chest had fur dye tattoos all over them, and a deep scar that ran down his chest. I'm not a kid! And what are you doing in our supplies? The ferret held up his hands. I don't want any trouble. See? Lena, go get my first officer. She's in the cockpit. Tell her to bring a weapon. Lena nodded and scurried off. Lef looked the suspicious character over. Who are you? The ferret sat on the edge of the crate. I'm just a man on the run. Not from the law, mind you. Well, actually, I am also kind of running from the law. But I haven't done anything wrong. Call me Feldo. All right, Feldo. Why are you on my ship? Uh, well now, don't get mad. I'm running from Nocto. What? You idiot! You'll get us all killed! Lef ran his paw through the fur on his head. Feldo climbed out of the crate. Don't worry, he doesn't know I'm here. Lena arrived with Sirlia. She was brandishing a pistol. What is it, Lef? Who's that? A stowaway. He's running from Nocto. Sirlia aimed her pistol at Feldo. W what? Seriously? Lef, what did we do? I don't know. I never expected something like this to happen. Lena tapped Sirlia on the shoulder. Who's Nocto? Sirlia looked at her with fear in her eyes. He's the most notorious pirate... maybe... ever? The stories say he rarely leaves a ship without killing a few on board. That is, if he leaves any drive fuel left. Some ships are discovered years later, everyone on board either starved or suffocated. Some, like our friend here, have tried to leave Nocto's gang, but are hunted down and killed. But not without a degree of torture. Lena looked at Feldo. He doesn't look like a dangerous pirate. Before the conversation could go any further, the ship began to shake violently again, and the sound was deafening. Lef stumbled to the door and shouted down the hall. 
Zack, what the hell is going on? Zack held on to the cockpit doorframe as he shouted back. We're coming out of hyperspace. I can't figure it out. There was a bright flash and a crash that rocked the ship. Left ran to the cockpit, Surlia, Lena, and Fellow in hot pursuit. Zack, report! Zack was frantically running scans. We've, we've been thrown out of hyperspace, and I have no idea why. The only explanation is that something's pulled us out into normal space. Feldo wrung his hands together nervously. Not to start a panic or anything, but, uh, it sounds like Nocto. Left grabbed Feldo. You have to be joking. You realize you're responsible for the death of all the people on this ship if he catches us. Feldo closed his eyes and clasped the sides of his head. I know, I know. Uh, God damn it! I left Nocto because I didn't want to cause any more death. I thought I could get away. Left shook him. Well, now we probably have a heavily armed pirate ship bearing down on us, unarmed civilians with an old ship. Lena pointed at a flashing light on Left's console. Uh, this looks important. Left released Feldo, who stood there, visibly regretting his life choices. Left checked the console. Proximity alert! Ship incoming. Serlia's console also lit up. We're being hailed. It's Nocto. Left straightened his jacket and sat so that the video communicator would see him. Feldo, get out of here. Let me speak to him. I can talk him down. You know as well as I do that's not possible. If he thinks you're not here, he might leave. Feldo nodded and left the cockpit. All right, answer it. Left's tiny screen came on and the face of a grizzled rat appeared on it. He had scars all over his face and wore a nose ring. Cargo vessel, disarm and prepare to be boarded. Left smiled his brightest smile. Hello, nice weather we're having. Nocto grinned back. If you don't, we'll blast you out of the sky. <laughs> you have one of our crew aboard. We want him back. One of your crew? Well, if I knew what you were talking about, I would comply, but I don't think any of your crew is aboard. I'll run a search and get back to you. Goodbye. No, we will board you, and you will submit to our search. Zack cut the transmission. Lef, I have an idea. What is it? Zack grinned. It's a stroke of genius. Listen up. Frontier by Maggot Mosh Pit Chapter 3 Soon after Zack had finished his explanation, Leff reopened the comm link. He straightened his jacket again. Nocto appeared on screen. Have you come to your senses? Leff sighed and placed his face in his paws. Look, I want a deal. I have your man. He's on board. We'll give him to you if you let us go. There's nothing on here you want except him. We're only colonists with agricultural equipment. Nocto grinned. <laughs> That's the spirit. We'll send over a shuttle. Don't try anything stupid. Uh, I'm afraid when you tore us from hyperspace, it damaged some systems, including the docking ports. We'll send them over on an escape pod. Nocto glared at Leff murderously. If we open that pod and find anything but my man, we'll destroy you so fast, you won't have time to blink. Don't worry. Leff cut the transmission. He looked at Zack. This better work. You have the cockpit. I'll be back. Left left Zack alone. He walked down the corridor until he reached the center of the ship, where the entrance to the largest cargo bay was. Left made his way through all the boxes and containers and arrived at the outer wall, where one of the escape pods was. Feldo was waiting there. Everything ready, Feldo? Feldo scratched his arm. For the record, I don't think this is a good idea. I don't care what you think. Get in the pod. Feldo reluctantly climbed inside. Leff leaned in and pointed to a console. This will set a course to Nocto's ship. It might get bumpy. Leff stood and sealed the door. He waved through the window as Feldo ejected the pod. It flew into space towards Nocto's ship, a leaf on the wind. As it drew close, the automatic docking sequence activated, and thrusters angled the pod so it would enter Nocto's docking bay. Nocto's ship was large and imposing, the entire thing painted an oppressive red color. At a distance, it looked like a chunk of metal flying through space, but upon closer inspection, 
it was revealed to be many smaller ships, most damaged, held together by force fields and pure willpower. Guns bristled from almost every orifice, though some were obviously decoys. The pod slowly rose into the bay, and the doors closed slowly behind it. As the room filled with oxygen, Feldo sat silently praying. Outside, he could hear footsteps and rough voices as he prepared for what came next. Here goes nothing, he muttered. The pod door was wrenched open as Nocto himself stood in the doorway. He was surrounded by a crew of Atrians, humans, and those blue creatures, all dressed in rags and holding large weapons. He grinned an evil grin and produced from his belt a whip of malicious design. It was long, with many barbs along its length, stained with the blood of past victims. Well, if it isn't my favorite deserter, Feldo. Feldo cowered in the rear of the pod. Nocto sneered. Bring him out of there. Two burly pirates grabbed Feldo and threw him at Nocto's feet. Let's have a little walk, Feldo. Get up, you worthless worm! Feldo stumbled to his feet and followed Nocto with a backwards glance at the pod. The pirates emptied the pod bay, laughing and pushing each other. The bay was still, but only for a short time. Inside the pod, a panel in the ceiling began to move. It popped open and from it dropped Serlia, pistol in paw. She pulled out her escom. Serlia here. I'm inside. Serlia darted to a nearby heap of scrap and crouched behind it. Hello, Celia. Reading you loud and clear. Zack, where's Leth? The colonists demanded an explanation, so he's tied up for the moment. I got a good look at that ship. It seems like it's an amalgamation of other ships strung together. One of them must be what passes as an engine room to these pirates, so I'm guessing it's near the rear. Heh, <laughs> that rhymes. You'd better be right. Serlia closed the device and darted for the door. She stalked the corridors, which were empty since the pirates wanted to see what would happen to Feldo out of a sick curiosity. Serlia glanced into rooms as she passed. Some held nothing. Some held relics of past looted ships. Some even had sleeping pirates. She kept her wits about her as she moved quickly down the tainted corridors. Now, now, don't worry. We have everything under control. Left stood surrounded by angry and scared colonists as they shouted over one another. Pirates! S someone call the police! We're all doomed! My sister was a victim to pirates. She never got over we it. We can use the escape pods. Let's escape. Yes! Anything is better than waiting in this floating coffin! No! We'll be shot out of space! Let's fight him! Left motioned with his paws. Calm down. I have a plan, and it's being carried out as we speak. Your plan be damned! QUIET! There was instant silence as all heads turned around. Rackham was standing tall, his chest puffed out. All of you, get a damned hold of yourselves. I trust Leth. He's a smart man, but if we all panic and argue, nothing'll get done. So shut your traps, sit down, or find out why they call me Jackhammer. The crowd dispersed with murmured excuses and apologies. Leth scratched his head. Hey... Thanks. Rackham jammed a finger in Left's face. Left, I made two mistakes today. One was going along with your plan, and the other was lying to all my people about you being smart. <sighs> Listen closely. If your plan goes south, the blood of all of these people are on your paws. You realize that? I do, but I can't sacrifice the life of someone to save the lives of others, no matter how many. I'm the kind of guy that saves everybody. That kind of thinking will kill you one day, even if we never run into any trouble again. Mark my words. He would have been tortured to death, Rackham. Don't tell me you could have that on your conscience. <sighs> I guess you're right, Lef. That doesn't make it the right choice. You can't always save everybody. Rackham left to let his words sink in. Lef was nearly about to leave when he noticed Lena was eavesdropping from around a nearby door. She walked over when she knew she was discovered. I'm sorry for listening in. I couldn't help it. It's fine. Rackham's right, though. I've put everyone's life in danger. I think you're right. I don't need you telling me. Wait, you do? Yeah. Doing what's best for everyone, no matter the risk? I think that's noble. Lef blushed. Thanks, Peach. He scratched his head. I have to go. Zack was poring over the scans he took of the ship as Lef entered the cockpit. He looked up. Celia is looking for the engine room now. She's made little progress. 
That ship's more of a mess than this one, and it's a maze on the inside, and the outside gives no clues as to its layout. Lef sat in his chair. She'll find it. Zack looked over the scans again. She hasn't reported back in a bit. You should call her and get an update. Lef reached for the communication set. Good idea. Surlia was in a tight spot. As she was stalking the halls, she accidentally found the engines, their girth taking up an entire small cargo ship in the rear of the floating junkyard. She was about to inspect it when a couple of engineers emerged from a hatch, forcing her to dart between two engine blocks. The heat coming from them was sweltering. One of the engineers threw a wrench onto the floor. Whatever it is, if we don't fix it, we'll be killed for sure. And I'm telling you, there is absolutely no reason for the gravity to be off in the boss's chambers! Let's check the gravity plating again. They were about to crawl back into the hatch when Sirlia's escom began to ring. The engineers froze. Oi, I think there's someone in here. Come out with your hands up! Sirlia cursed silently to herself, dropped her escom, and made her way between the engine blocks in a flanking maneuver. The two engineers arrived to find Sirlia's escom ringing on the floor. Hey, it's one of them fancy walkie-talkies. Wonder what it's doing here. Sirlia stepped slowly around the engine block and came out facing the backs of the two engineers. She drew her pistol and set it on the lowest yield setting. One of the engineers scooped up the rear escom and answered it. Hello? Who's this? Sirlia fired two quick pulses of energy at the backs of the two engineers, knocking them out. She retrieved the escom and put it to her ear. You idiot! You almost got me killed! Sirlia, who was that other guy? That was a pirate. I thought I was going to call you to prevent this exact situation. Blame Zack. Have you found the engine room yet? Yes, it's a mess in here. I'm putting Zack on. He'll tell you what to look for. There was audible shuffling as Zack took Left's seat. Alright. First, I want you to find the biggest engine-looking thing in the room. Sirlia didn't have to look far. The largest engine took up half the room. I'm looking at it now. There should be a cylinder on the side, roughly the size of your forearm at chest level. The cylinder was covered in dust and grime, but was unmistakable. I found it. Now what? Remove it. The cylinder had a handle on it, and took some pulling before it came off. Inside was a mess of cables and indicator lights. It's just a bunch of cables. You don't expect me to cut these, do you? No. If you cut them, it will most certainly kill you. Just look at the ceiling of the compartment. There should be a serial number. Read it to me. The label was peeling off, but was still legible. J335254. And it also says ZC. An old J-class engine. This'll be easy. On the floor, there should be an access hatch with a warning label on it. Open that. Sirlia looked around. There was no hatch. Zack, I don't see a hatch. That's impossible. It, it should be four feet away from the cylinder, and then four feet to the left. Sirlia estimated. Around where Zack described lay an auxiliary engine block. Zack, there's another engine on top of the hatch. Okay, this just got a lot harder. Uh, somewhere nearby there might be a blowtorch? Get that. After a significant amount of searching, Sirlia discovered a welding torch. I have it. Okay, now cut a one foot by one foot square hole as close as you can to that engine. You'll know if you've hit the right spot when you see two large cables. The work didn't take long and soon the cables were exposed. Okay, I see them. What's next? <laughs> uh, there's no actual way to know which cable is the right one. That would be the main power. That hatch just happened to be the only access to the main power cable that didn't have it running alongside an identical cable that controls life support. Cut the wrong cable, and you suffocate. Cut the right cable, and the weapons, shields, and engines all go offline. Sir Leah looked at each cable. There was no difference. What the hell am I supposed to do, guess? If I suffocate, I'm coming back to haunt you. Jeez, um, cut the left cable. That's my guess. Sirlia took the blowtorch and sliced cleanly through the left cable. She held her breath. The engines beside her went dead, and the buzzing of power could no longer be heard. Zack's voice sounded worried. Uh, did you cut the cable relative to your left, or the engine's left? Um, my left? Uh, no, no problems down there, then? Looks like the main power is offline. Why? Oh, no reason. Uh, left, get ready to jump out of here. They can't follow us anymore. I'll get back as soon as I can. Sirlia hung up. 
Just after she did, five pirates arrived in the engine room, fully armed. Among them was Feldo and Nocto. Feldo had cuts on his body and a black eye. Sirlia froze. Nocto spun his whip. Well, well, well. Looks like we're too late, eh? No matter. One toy lost. One toy gained. Sirlia glared daggers at Feldo. We had a plan! We were going to set you free! Never to deal with Nocto again! Feldo looked at his feet. I'm sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. Nocto sauntered up to Sirlia, Feldo staying close. Drop that gun, my pretty. Sirlia did so. Nocto grinned and looked her up and down. Well now, it's been a while since we've had a, a female aboard this ship. Ain't that right, boys? The three other pirates grinned and laughed to one another. Nocto extended a paw towards Sirlia's face. And even longer since one as fair as you. Sirlia spat on Nocto's outstretched paw. His paw shot back as the other pirates hooted with laughter. Nocto whirled around. Shut up! They did. I wish you hadn't done that. Feldo cringed as Nocto whirled the whip until it whistled. Sirlia backed up a few paces as Nocto grew closer. Let's see how pretty that face is with a few scars, eh? Feldo looked at Nocto. Then at Sirlia, and then at the ceiling. Ugh, fuck me. He ran up to Nocto and kicked him as hard as he could between the legs. As he fell, Sirlia reacted quickly, grabbing her gun and shooting the closest pirate before they could react. Then, under the inaccurate fire of the remaining two and shouts from Nocto, Sirlia grabbed Feldo and ran for the door. The two darted down the corridors, taking the most direct route to the pod bay. As they entered, Sirlia dove behind the scrap heap and shot a pirate who was barreling behind her. Feldo watched with wild eyes. How long is that stun gonna last? Long enough. Where did you learn to shoot like that? It was my job. Shut up, take this gun, and shoot anything that comes through that door. Feldo took the gun and fired blindly at the door as Sirlia took out her escom. Lef, we're kinda in a predicament. What? What's wrong? I was discovered. I think Nocto got lucky. Feldo glanced at her with thanks in his eyes, but he had no time to express it in words as pirates fired into the pod bay. Long story short, we have no time to set an automatic launch sequence. Even if we could, main power is off so the bay wouldn't work anyway. What do you want me to do about it? When I give the signal, target the bays and blow them open. That's a bad idea, and I like it. Standing by. Sirlia grabbed the pistol from Feldo and shot the door controls to the bay with pinpoint accuracy. The door slammed shut as pirates on the other side pounded against them. Sirlia grabbed Feldo again and dragged him into the pod. Close the hatch! Left, it's now or never! Left's paws danced over the weapons controls. He fired a few high-velocity projectiles into the bay doors, busting them open. The escape pod, being designed to withstand re-entry, took little damage as Sirlia piloted it back to the frontier. Feldo breathed heavily and clutched his chest. You... saved me. Even when I betrayed you. You showed your true colors back there. Thanks, I guess. It was immensely satisfying seeing Nocto get kicked in the nuts. <laughs> Suddenly, a blast rocked the pod. Feldo and Sirlia whirled around just in time to see a fireball erupt from the bay doors. What the? As they watched, Nocto's ship began to break apart, the different hulls and wrecked ships that made it up spinning and crashing into one another as the atmosphere vented. Despite all the terrible things that were done to him, Feldo had to look away. Sirlia looked away as well, focusing on piloting the ship. The particle cannon must have caused some sort of chain reaction. Feldo gulped. Yeah. The pod reattached itself to the frontier. Lef was waiting for them as they emerged. He patted them both on the back. Good work, you two. Now what do you say we get the hell out of here before we get hit by flying debris? Yes, yes let's. let's. Sylvia lay in her bed, resting her sore muscles. She ruminated on what happened on Nocto's ship, and what would have happened if Feldo didn't do what he did. The intercom blared to life. Ahem. <clears throat> This is your captain speaking. We had a little run-in with pirates, but we dealt with them. A message has been sent to the nearest authority, and they should arrive to... clean up soon. Zack tells me he's fixed the stabilizer. Turns out a sugar mole crawled inside and died. In other news, the news has arrived along with some personal mail. Please check one of the terminals if you need to access that. Thank you and good night. Sirlia got up and sat at the small desk in her room. She brought up the latest mail transmission from Atria. Nothing for her. The news was uninteresting. Something about a Terran ambassador just arriving on Atria to improve relations. 
She sighed and flopped back into her bed, drifting into a shallow sleep. Left sat in the cockpit, checking over some messages from his parents and a few friends, the stars whizzing by outside at impossible speeds. He jumped as the door opened. It was Lena. Oh, I didn't realize you were here, Lef. I just wanted to look at the cockpit. I'll leave now. No, wait. I was meaning to talk to you. Come here. Lena sat in Sir Leah's seat. Lef scrolled absentmindedly through the news. So, here I was thinking, we don't have nearly enough crew members on this ship. So then I was thinking, who would be useful and willing? I figured we could use Feldo. He owes me. Then I realized we might need another officer. If we run into as many problems as we have so far, we can't leave the cockpit empty like we have. What I'm getting at is, do you want to join the crew? You would need some instruction, but these things practically fly themselves. Lena was taken aback. What? Me? A crew member? Lef smiled at her. I can tell who has a knack for this kind of thing, Peach. I've seen how smart you can be, and you clearly have an interest in this ship. Besides, Rackham tells me how you're always reading up on the latest tech and stuff. I could use someone with your knowledge. I'll pay you, of course, and your contract will be the duration of this trip. Think it over. Lef stood and switched the cockpit to night mode. Lena stood also. I don't think I have to think it over much. Consider me crewman Lena, reporting for duty. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. Get some sleep. All members of the crew wake up at nine sharp. Lena threw a sharp salute. Aye, Captain! <laughs> we aren't a military ship. You don't need to salute or address me as Captain. Lef is fine. Lena nodded and ran out of the cockpit excitedly. Lef returned to his own room. He flopped into bed. If current trends continue, we're going to need every paw we can get. He muttered to himself. He drifted off to sleep, not knowing how right he was. Frontier by Maggot Mosh Pit Chapter 4 Keep it steady. The next two weeks were uneventful, aside from a short statement Lef had to make to the authorities about the pirates, making sure not to mention Feldo. Feldo assured them no one had seen his face aside from the pirates. Lef spent the remainder of that time tutoring Lena on the Frontier's operation. She was a quick learner and soon had a grasp on how to pilot it. Watch that asteroid. Use the thrusters like I showed you. Running low on fuel, Lef decided to make a stop at the Solar Federation-controlled supply station in the rings of a massive gas giant. There's the station. Signal them and request landing clearance. Lef leaned over Lena as she gripped the wheel tightly, making sure she made no life-threatening mistakes. Lena took a deep breath. She sent a transmission to the station. Ahem. Supply station. SFSS-867. This is Atrian Cargo Vessel Frontier requesting docking clearance. Lena waited for a response as Lef chuckled. It's the Frontier, not Frontier. But I suppose that's a nitpick. When hailing a human station or ship, it might take them a few seconds to translate your message to English and their message to Atrian. If we had a translator on the ship, things would be a lot easier. A crackle came over the comm. Atrian Vessel, you are clear to dock at port 12B. Alright now, docking isn't tricky, just match the station's velocity and get close enough for the docking ring to attach to us. Lena decreased speed and oriented the frontier properly. An arm from the station reached out and pulled them in. Lef patted Lena on the back. Good job. Looks like you got the hang of it now. Lena unclasped the steering wheel and wiped her sweaty paws on her pant leg. I still can't shake the nerves I get when I'm flying. It's like every muscle in my body tenses up. Don't worry. You'll get used to it. Sir Leo was also in the cockpit, reviewing the food inventory. She finished compiling a list of supplies on a scrap of paper and handed it to Lef. Here's what food we need. Looks like Zack burned through most of the human food faster than he said he would. Don't forget to pick up some of that. Also, we're running low on laxar feed. You're going to have to speak to Rackham about what human stuff is okay to feed them. Lef took the paper and stuffed it into his pocket. Alright, I'll talk to him about it. Lef strolled down the corridor with Lena towards the colonists' living space. The converted cargo space was filled with activity, colonists talking excitedly to one another as they packed day bags. Dee, Rackham's wife, was standing nearby, observing the activity. 
Lev walked up behind her as Lena was dragged off by a group of her friends. D, what's going on here? D jumped. Lev, my lord, don't sneak up on me like that. What's going on? Well, I figured all these folks have been cooped up in the same rooms for too long, so I'm organizing shore leave parties. Shore leave? That's a good idea, but you have to talk to me first. Some stations don't allow that. Luckily, this one does. Sorry, but I kind of promised someone, and then word spread and now everyone has it in their head. Lef shrugged. It's okay, just don't make the groups too big. He looked around. Where's Rackham? Dee pointed out the door. He's with the Lazar. Thanks. Also, that's not how you pronounce that. Dee waved her paw dismissively. Left shook his head and headed out the door. Dee watched the colonists for a few moments more before going off to grab a camera and some snacks for her shore leave. Lena sat down at a table with her two friends. One of them, Taliko, leaned on the table. So, what did you learn today? Taliko was a fox, but she had an unusual brown fur color, and was quite tall. The other, Yar, also leaned in. Yes, tell us. He was the only non-canine Atrian on the ship, excluding Leff and Feldo. He was an otter, sleek of fur and dark of color. Lena placed her head on her paws. We just practiced mostly. Flying in the rings, dodging asteroids and the like. Yar and Taliko looked at each other and smiled mischievously. Yar spoke first. Are you sure there was nothing else? Nothing else? Like, maybe you had trouble navigating the rings and Lef had to guard your paw with his... Or maybe you saw a particularly beautiful patch of stars and Lef turned to you and whispered, They don't compare to your eyes. Or perhaps... Lena slapped them playfully. Cut that out! She said, blushing furiously. Yar grinned and scooted out of range. (laughs) <laughs> oh, come on. It's been written all over your face for the past two weeks. Tlico feigned a swoon. It's true love, our little Lena growing up so fast! Lena rested her head on the table. It's just a silly crush. He's just so strong-willed. How old is he anyway? He's certainly older than you. I think he's 24. I'm not sure. Taliko's eyes widened. He's five years older than you. <laughs> this just got weird. Actually, he told me that after he got out of flight school, he did a lot of in-system work, so he might be even older. Jailbait! They both received slaps. Don't say anything to anyone, or I'll restrict your media access. W- wait, you can do that? We'll keep your secret. That's what friends are for. Well, that, and for borrowing money from... Uh, oh, here he comes now. Lef strolled up, oblivious. Hey, Taliko, Yar, Lena. Taliko jumped up. Hi, Lef! Lena has some... <clears throat> Lena clamped Taliko's muscle shut. What is it, Lef? Lef looked around confusedly. I just came to ask if you guys want to have some shore leave. You can come with me. I have some shopping to do. Yar and Taliko once again exchanged glances. Yar turned to Lef. Nah, you guys go ahead. We'll catch up to you. Tilico nodded, left shrugged, and went for the door. Suit yourself. Lena followed behind, but not before flashing a thumbs up at the pair. They met Zack and Surly at the airlock. Hey guys. Zack, how are you doing with Feldo? Left handed the list back to Surly as he spoke. Zack smiled to himself as he cycled the airlock. Well, he knows a surprising amount. Should take a load off me. He's taken apart some of the spare parts now, and I didn't even ask him. He told me he was mostly just a repairman on his old ship, even though he claims to be skilled. Lef looked skeptical. You sure he won't blow anything up? Don't worry, he hasn't got anything dangerous. It was lined with stalls and doorways to shops, with fluorescent signs outside advertising their contents in five different languages. Zack spread his arms wide. Look, human stuff, and this is only level 12. Oh, and you might want to buy some of those. Zack pointed to a vending machine. The machine advertised Faber's disposable translators that never fail. Five-hour battery life translates English, Atrian, Yerish. The list went on. Lef dug out his wallet. He fed a bill into the credit slot and bought three. It spat out a pitiful shred of the former bill. It's so damn expensive. I guess that's a good thing. 
He opened the package of two and put the small green bullet-shaped devices in his ears. It fits weirdly. Sir Leah struggled to put hers in her ears. It was made to fit universally. Literally. Lena had no trouble fitting hers. The tiny device filtered all sound, picked out languages, and fed them into the air at the same volume that they were heard at, so the wearer didn't even notice they were hearing different languages, aside from the mouth movements. Lena swiveled her head from side to side, her sensitive ears picking up bits of conversation. Wow! I can understand everything! These things really work! Celia spotted a space-packaged food vendor. Let's start here. The man at the counter was Yerin. Tall, gray-skinned, and hairless aliens with large eyes. They claim to have visited Earth a long time ago, but no evidence exists to back up this claim. He greeted Serlia with a strange hand gesture that was half-wave, half-salute. Greetings, customer. May the light ever drive back the darkness. What can I do for you? Serlia wave-saluted back. You too. I would like to resupply our ship. Here's what we need. As Serlia conversed with the salesman, Lena was looking distractedly at a restaurant on the other side of the room. Lef took notice. Wanna go? What? Oh, not really. Just looked interesting. Let's go. I'm hungry anyway. It's a human restaurant, right? Yes. Lef tapped Zack on the shoulder. Hey, let's go there. He pointed and Zack looked over. Oh man, is that Italian food? It's been ages. Come on, let's go. Zack ran across the room, an ecstatic grin on his face that reminded Lef of a newborn child. Sir Leah and the Yerin were haggling furiously, so Lef and Lena left them to their business. The inside of the restaurant was filled with smells that were strange to the atrians present, but not at all unpleasant. Zack joined the line at the counter. You guys find a seat. I'll buy the finest dishes for you to sample. He licked his lips. Lef and Lena found a corner seat and sat, Lef looking around the establishment. There weren't any Atrians besides themselves. In fact, there weren't many on the station at all, as far as he could tell. There were only a few. Not many of our kind here. Hey, what's wrong, Peach? Lena looked upset. Her ears were back and she was clasping her paws together tightly. They're talking about us. Who? Lena half turned. Lef spotted them without much trouble. Three Solar Federation officers sat a couple tables away in full uniform. They glanced over occasionally and talked in low tones. Lef put his paw on Lena's. Hey, just ignore what they say. They've probably never met an atrium before. They called us furries. Lef didn't hesitate. He stood, chair scraping loudly. The three officers all turned to look at him as he pointed at them. How about you come over here and say that to my face? The officer with the highest rank, indicated by the number of stripes running in a diagonal line across his uniform, approached Lef. Furry. People began to take notice. Heads turned. Lef stepped close to the man's face. You just made a big mistake, ape. You insulted me and my officer. I would choose my next words very carefully. The man grabbed Lef by the coat. You're the one that made the mistake, furry. This is a human restaurant. We don't tolerate... Bless her life. The man let go of Lef, pushing him into the table, and returned to his seat. Lef was fuming as Lena tugged on his coat. Let's just leave. I can't. Racist assholes like this deserve hell. Lef walked up to the table and grabbed the officer, spun him around, and aimed a punch at his face. The officer was quicker, catching his punch and throwing his own, which connected hard against Lef's jaw. He fell back onto the floor. The officer kneeled down. Leave. Lef was about to throw himself on the man when Zack grabbed him and dragged him away. We apologize, officer. It won't happen again. Lef struggled. Like hell it won't! They can arrest you and impound the frontier. Let's just go. <sighs> Fine. He stormed out of the room, Lena and Zack following behind. Lef paced his room, venting to Sir Leah. I mean, we didn't ask for it. We were just sitting there. Then he goes and uses a racial slur and a really bad one. Which one? The F word. <laughs> That's pretty bad. Left kicked a pillow across the room. With all the horrible things they did to us in the war, they could at least treat us with some respect. How do you think they see you? Those guys were out of line, but Atrians did some pretty terrible things too. For every human horror of war, there's at least one of ours. Then forget the war. We aren't soldiers. They were. What happened to serve and protect? Calm down, Laugh. Yelling won't fix anything. Whatever. Let's get out of here. 
Do we have everything? Yes. You've got the helm. I need to meditate. Surlia went for the door, but Leff stopped her. Wait, one more thing. How's Lena doing? Someone so young shouldn't have to hear a word with such negative connotations directed towards them. Surlia leaned on the door frame. She's shook up, but she'll get over it. She's got tough skin, that one. Yeah. Surlia exited the room, and Leff sat against the wall, head resting on his knees. Surlia slumped into her chair. She turned to Zack. Bring the engines online. I have an unfortunate announcement to make. She pressed the intercom button. This is your second in command here. I'm afraid due to some unforeseen circumstances, we will be canceling shore leave. I'm sure you all know why by now. We will be departing soon. Thank you. Zack looked at her apologetically. Uh, about leaving. Uh, the docking clamp's just locked down. I can't disengage them. Surlia clasped the bridge of her nose. This can't be good. She hailed the station. Please explain why we are being held. The comm crackled. Your ship has been detained. You've been selected for a random search. Prepare to be boarded. Surlia rolled her eyes. Son of a bitch! She hit the intercom again. Hello again. It seems we've been selected for a random search. Don't worry, it should only take a minute. Leff, you better get to the airlock to greet our guests. Surlia got up to meet Leff at the airlock. Zack, you've got the cockpit. Leff was waiting at the airlock, tapping his paw impatiently. Surlia stood next to him. Something tells me this isn't random. You think? The airlock opened and none other than the officer from the restaurant stepped through. Now that he wasn't fighting the man, Leff got a good look at his face. He was thin and lean, and his face looked as though it was carved from stone. He had gray hair, though Leff couldn't estimate his age. Leff stopped him before he could step any further. Don't take another step until you tell us what's going on. It's our right. The man regarded Leff with a cold stare. I suppose you haven't heard. A solar Federation ambassador that was recently sent on a peace mission to Atria has been assassinated. Celia gasped. The officer continued. Pending an investigation, all Atrian vessels parked at Solar Federation resupply stations and other similar services are to be searched for other possible terrorist activities. Laugh couldn't believe his ears. We aren't terrorists, we're a transport! We know exactly who you are, Mr. Quill. You are not the reason we're here. The man turned to Sir Leah. Follow me, please. Sir Leah stepped back a pace. What for? Questioning. He made a hand gesture and security officers stepped through the airlock. Two flanked Sir Leah, and the rest headed for other parts of the ship. Hey, you don't have any evidence she's a terrorist! He made no comment, and he and the security officers took Sir Leah out the airlock. Don't worry about me! Leff was left at the airlock, the doors guarded by two more security personnel. Sir Leah was taken to a small steel room with nothing but a table and chairs in it. Soon the officer returned and sat across from her. Hello, Miss Wesker. Let's have a chat, shall we? Sir Leah glared at him. My name is Cyrus. Commander Cyrus. Let's start from the beginning. Cyrus leaned in. Your parents worked for the Atrian government delivering supplies to Atrian warships in the Cyrus system, correct? Sir Leah said nothing. It is. That was rhetorical correct. It's quite a well-documented case, but let's refresh your memory. Cyrus held up a folder and threw it on the table. Photographs spilled out, each one depicting twisted pieces of metal and other scrap. There was one picture with bodies, barely recognizable as Atrian. Your parents had a solar federation mine. There were no survivors. Sir Leah did not look at the pictures, but kept staring at Cyrus. Your parents were killed by humans. If I were you, I would harbor some resentment. My parents aren't dead. Your adoptive parents are still alive, yes? Let's fast forward. While studying abroad for a semester, a man crashed a shuttle into your apartment. One of the only humans on that moon. And he chose your house to crash into. He's our engineer. We're friends now. Cyrus shrugged. According to you. Unless you have evidence that isn't purely circumstantial, I'd like to go. Surlia said, leaning back in her seat. Cyrus brushed aside the photos until he found what he was looking for. It was a full elemental scan of the cargo holds on the frontier. He placed it in front of Sir Leah and pointed to a large spike on the chart. This is a very high amount of ammonium nitrate to be carrying, isn't it? That's a very explosive compound, you know. Sir Leah looked at the chart. That's because it's fertilizer. Why did you choose to dock at a solar federation station? It wasn't my call. We docked here because Lef is naive and he thought the rings would make good practice for our junior officer. You may be innocent. 
You may not. But I was willing to take any chances. And too many things correlate. Cyrus leaned in again. And knowing you, Atrians, I'm willing to better investigation or turn up a thing or two you don't want turned up. Frontier by Maggot Moshpit Chapter 5 Feldo was trapped. He was on his way out of the engine room when he overheard Leff and Cyrus talking. He immediately smelled something fishy and darted back into the room. He looked about for a place to hide. The drive compartment was open, so he darted inside. Feldo jumped off the ladder and landed inside the drive compartment. Because of how the drive created a hyperspace bubble around the ship, the entire thing had to be encased in a special alloy, and the only way to make repairs was to crawl inside the drive compartment. This compartment was accessed through a hatch which was also made of this alloy. Small amounts of damage could be repaired this way, however, if the drive was damaged in any serious way, the entire thing had to be removed from its casing and fixed at space dock. Luckily, the drive was the most well-shielded part of the ship, protected from scans and shock by its casing. However, the deadly radiation created from the drive was not contained in the alloy casing. This radiation dispersed after traveling several meters, encompassing most of the engine room. Feldo sealed the alloy hatch behind him and put his ear against it. He could hear footsteps as security officers searched the room. He gulped, assuming they were there for him, and slid further into the compartment. He made it to where the drive itself rested. It sat, connected to ports in the wall by a spiderweb of wires, pulsing with strange energy. The main part of the drive was a perfectly spherical orb suspended by the cables. The outer shell was made of heat-resistant carbon fiber, many layers of it. In the center was the main part of the drive. Only the most qualified people knew what it was and how it worked, but to the layman's understanding, it neutralized the mass of the ship to near zero relative to normal space, so that it could be propelled at incredibly high speeds, faster than light. Beneath the floor was a reservoir of plasma used to ignite the fuel needed to power the drive. Plasma was the only substance hot enough to ignite the fuel. Faldo regarded the drive for a moment, then concentrated his attention on the hatch. He could hear the officers checking the ion engine's many compartments, throwing their contents onto the floor haphazardly. One of the officers addressed the other. My scanner shows no one else in this room. The other replied after checking his own scanner. Same here. What about behind that hatch? What is that, anyway? Who knows how these Atrians built their hyperdrives. We got nothing like it on our ships. Anyway, the scanner isn't picking up anything behind there. Could be a garbage can for all I know. One of the officers opened the hatch. Feldo darted to one side, barely avoiding the gaze of the officer. Nothing in there. Let's inform Cyrus the engine room is clear. Feldo sat on the floor, prepared to wait until the men had searched the ship entirely. The colonists didn't know what to expect as the officers stormed into their living space and began methodically scanning and searching containers. Leff ran in shortly after and stood on a crate. Everybody, stay calm and don't hide anything. We have nothing to conceal, and once they see that, we can go. Leff wasn't sure if he was heard, but the colonists seemed to understand regardless. One of the officers tapped Leff on the shoulder. He jumped off the crate and confronted the man, expecting aggression. To his surprise, the man smiled at him. You must be Leff. I'm Red. They shook hands. Look, I sympathize with you. My sister is married to an atrium, and I think you guys are pretty cool. But the Solar Federation doesn't, to put it bluntly. I wish I could give you something more conclusive, but I can't tell you much. Leff stood awkwardly. Thanks anyway. Was there something else? Oh, um, I need to see your license to pilot, carry livestock, and operate weaponry. <sighs> Hold on a second. I'll go get them. Lena was doing her best to keep order, but was having trouble as people would get mad at the security personnel for searching their possessions. As soon as she mitigated one argument, another started up. Just as she sat down to take a break, there was a scream from the other side of the room, and she recognized it as Taliko. She ran as fast as she could and arrived at a ghastly scene. Yar was leaning heavily on Taliko, a security officer standing nearby with a taser rod. Lena walked up to the officer. What happened here? The woman put her taser away and held up a small box. I was searching his things and I found this. He fought me when I asked him what it was. And I was forced to stun him. She opened the box, revealing small vials of liquid. The officer grinned. This looks to me like carpenter's acid. 
Carpenter's acid was a traditional spirit strictly controlled by law due to its extremely high ethanol content. The officer closed the box and gestured to two others. Take him to a holding cell. Trafficking through Solar Federation space is a serious offense. Toliko was pushed aside as Yar was dragged off. She shouted at the officer. It's part of his religion! You can't do this! We'll see. She walked off with the box and Yar. Lena sat down and put her head in her paws. Who knows how many more people aboard are followers? This needs to end soon before someone gets themselves in real trouble! Toliko sat next to her. It's all a political move. Probably. Leff returned to more chaos than when he left. Red was waiting for him at the door, and Leff handed him a pile of papers. There. You'll find everything is in order. Red looked over each document with care, then handed them back. Yep. Looks like it. You should know one of the colonists was just arrested. What? What for? We found a controlled substance in his possession. Leff looked at Red seriously. The Atrian government won't stand for their citizens being bullied like this. While I was in my cabin, I checked the mail, and an emergency news broadcast said that they might have sent warships to free all the falsely detained Atrians. Red nodded. Yes, and we've sent battleships to protect the places where your people are being held. His pocket beeped, and he pulled out a device. He looked at it for a moment, then muttered, <sighs> Speak of the devil, and he will appear. What? What does that mean? Red put his device away. Two Sanyo-class battlecruisers just dropped out of hyperspace and are demanding safe release of all Atrian vessels. Captain Prax sat on the bridge of the Atrian battlecruiser Endless Ocean as it orbited the gas giant, only a few hundred kilometers away from the space station. His communication officer was in a heated argument with the station commander, Cyrus. Soon the comm officer sighed and shut off the comm link. Sir, he's not letting up! Prax stood. He was tall and muscular, the perfect image of a ship captain. He was a hyena, with the characteristic light brown spots. He turned to the tactical officer. Rex, bring the pulse cannons online and load the antimatter torpedoes. Fire a warning shot, and don't hit any docked ships. Leff felt the warning shot as it streaked by the station and hit an asteroid, spraying debris onto the frontier's hull. He ran to the cockpit where Zack was waiting impatiently. Leff, what was that? That was the Atrian government making a huge mistake. Leff found the Atrian battlecruisers on sensors and hailed the one that had fired. Prax's face appeared on the screen. Leff shouted at him angrily. What the hell do you think you're doing? We aren't in any danger. Don't use this as an excuse to start a war. Prax's stoic expression did not change. Sir, you don't understand. Your freedoms have been violated without cause. We can't stand by in good conscience. Leff slammed his paw on the chair arm. Our freedoms be damned if it means another war. I have my orders. He cut the transmission abruptly. Leff attempted to calm himself by taking deep breaths. Leff, what's, what's happening? And what's all this about another war? Those are Atrian ships firing on a human station. Connect the dots. Cyrus sat in the station command center, sweating nervously. How long until our boys get here? He asked his comm officer for the 30th time. Five minutes less than the last time you asked, so about 45 minutes. Cyrus ran his hand through his thinning hair. It wouldn't be long until the Atrian ships would start blasting chunks out of the station. Then would come the inevitable boarding parties. It was a debacle to rival the original incident that sparked the war. As far as he could tell, which was pretty far, the station was the first any Atrian ships had reached, so his decision would determine the outcome of this whole thing. He could call Prax's bluff and not surrender, or he could surrender and let all the Atrians leave, disobeying a direct order. He took a coin from his pocket, prayed to God, and flipped it. It landed tails up. He turned to his comm officer. Al Prax again. Tell him. Leff watched Prax's ship from a window in the living space as the colonists cleaned up what the security personnel had spread across the floor. They had moved on to the cargo hold that contained the heavy equipment and vehicles. Nothing was happening with Prax's ship. Leff jumped as someone tapped him on the shoulder. It was Sir Leah. What? Where did you come from? Sir Leah grinned. Cyrus came to his senses. We're all free to go. Leff slowly sank to the floor. Thank the Lord. I don't think you appreciate how close we all came to oblivion. I do. Prax smiled in self-satisfaction. Rex powered down the weapons and monitored the station. Slowly, ships began disengaging and flying towards the endless ocean. Sir? Prax looked up. 
His comm officer was reading a message on screen. We're being ordered to stand down. There is to be no fighting. The Solar Federation was satisfied that the assassination was a rogue agent and not a part of a terrorist faction. They've released all detained ships. Prax looked at the screen and all the Atrian ships flying towards them. They could have gotten the message to us sooner. Left piloted out of the rings and out into open space. Zack sipped his coffee. So is that it for human stations? I wouldn't mind if we never went to one again. We were nearly at ground zero for Armageddon. Surlia was studying star charts. I wouldn't get my hopes up. We're flying a pretty direct route through human space. It'll be a long time till we're back in Atrian territory. Left let go of the wheel and coasted out of the system. Let's just hope the next station doesn't have a military garrison and any more Cyruses. He got up and walked for the door. I gotta go check to see if any stuff was stolen. Ain't no rest for the wicked. He winked at Zack, and Zack winked back. He left Zack and Surlia alone. So, Zack, do you think people trust you? What? Well, yeah, they have to. I'm the engineer. But after this, who knows what silly ideas people might get in their heads? Zack thought about that. You have a good point. Sometimes I forget I'm human I've lived with Atrian so long. Lena walked into the cockpit, a little too casually. Hi! Anyone seen Lef? Zack crushed his paper cup and tossed it at a trash bin. It missed. He's gone to do inventory. Why? Lena left hastily. No reason! Lef rummaged through a poorly repacked crate. Learn to put stuff back right when it's been taken out as a part of a power move by the government. You'd think these people had never packed a crate in their life! He rearranged the crate as he muttered to himself. He looked at the contents of the crate. One third was missing. He kicked the crate. God damn it! who would steal self-stealing stem bolts? Lena approached quietly. Left closed the crate and turned around to open another, but he bumped into Lena instead. Oof! Hey! Oh, it's you. What is it, Peach? I'm busy. Lena looked at the floor. Um, I have to tell you something. Left grabbed another crate and threw it open. Yes, what? Well, I enjoy our time together, and... He ducked his head inside the crate. He was totally empty. Son of a bitch! Sorry. Yes? Go on. I... Uh, lost something. Lena cringed at herself. Left closed the box with as much contempt as you can show while closing a box. We've lost a lot of things, it seems. I'm sorry, but it was probably stolen. Yeah. Left patted her on the shoulder as he walked past to the other side of the cargo bay. Cheer up, Peach. I'm sure we can get you another. Yeah. Lef opened another crate as Lena slowly walked to the door. She looked back at him as he rummaged some more. She opened her mouth, closed it, and left. Lef closed the crate and moved it aside. Behind it was a pile of loose stuff that someone had missed. He rolled his eyes. Lena walked back to the cockpit and sat in her chair Lef had brought in from the living space. She drew a heavy sigh. Surlia couldn't help but notice. Why so glum? The chair was the kind that rotated, and Lena spun it back and forth absentmindedly. How well do you know Lef? Me? I'm his best friend. We've pretty much known each other since birth. I think I know more about him than his parents do. Why do you ask? Lena stopped spinning and quickly changed the subject. He started calling me Peach as a nickname, you know? Surlia looked up abruptly. What? Really? Yeah, it's just a silly name. Surlia laughed and leaned back in her chair. Lena was very confused. What? What does that have to do with anything? He'll find out. Don't worry. Zack whistled as he walked back to the engine room. Once there, he noticed half-assembled components lying on the desk. He slapped his forehead. Shit. Feldo, where are you? Feldo was nowhere to be seen. Zack scoured the room, checking compartments and under tables. He then spotted the drive hatch. It wasn't closed, Les, he remembered. He quickly opened it and grabbed a flashlight. He crawled inside and shone his light around the room. There lay Feldo on the floor of the drive chamber, fast asleep. Frontier by Maggot Mosh Pit Chapter 6 Lef was standing in his house back on the moon. He didn't know how he got there, but everything seemed to make perfect sense. 
He heard soft singing from the other room and smelled food being prepared. Assuming it was his mother cooking breakfast, he ran into the room to see his mother was indeed cooking breakfast. Hi, Mom. What's cooking? His mother continued to sing and flipped the contents of a pan on the stove. She did not respond. Lef grabbed a plate and utensils and sat at the table. His mother was much, much taller than he remembered, but he didn't mind. She walked over holding the pan in her paws above Lef's head so he couldn't see what was inside. Lef wanted to look at her face, but the closer he got to raising his head, the harder it became to do so. She poured the contents of the pan onto his plate. Lef looked at it in anticipation. However, what dropped into the plate was not food, but a bundle of intestines, still pulsing with peristalsis. Ah! Lef screamed and jumped back, losing his balance and falling onto the floor. Suddenly, he was covered in a blanket and thrashing about in an attempt to free himself from it. He finally threw it off and was back in his room on the frontier. He sat on the floor for a long time, breathing heavily as the sweat glistened on his bare fur in the dim light. After calming himself down, he noticed the splitting headache he had. Ugh, must have bumped my head. He pulled himself up and looked at the screen on his desk, the only source of light in the room. It was already noon. He sighed and went to get some clothes and painkillers. Les stumbled into the cockpit and grabbed a cup of coffee in a tired daze. One month had passed since anything exciting happened. Since then, Lena had become a competent pilot under Lef's instruction, and Feldo had shown his ability more than once. Lena was piloting the ship now, having gotten up earlier than Lef. She turned to greet him. Hi! Lef held up his paw and pointed to his cup. Coffee first. He stood there, sipping slowly as the fatigue in his eyes dissipated. Okay, I'm awake now. Good afternoon, Lef. Sleep well? Lef practically fell into the co-pilot's seat. I had the weirdest dream. My mother was serving up some entrails for breakfast. Made me fall out of bed and wake up in a pool of sweat. Lena tried not to imagine Lef naked in a pool of his own sweat, but failed miserably. A nightmare? Yep. Have any dreams? Lena blushed. Y yeah I was flying in space like a bird. Hmm, sounds pleasant. It was. The comm beeped, surprising them both. Lena looked at Lef. There aren't many ships out here. I wonder who it could be. Only one way to find out. Lef answered the call. Ships in range, this is a distress call. Main power is down and life support is running out. Please help. I repeat. Lef powered up the sensors and scanned the area. That was an Atrian. Drop out of hyperspace. Lena disengaged the drive as Lef hit the intercom button. This is your captain. Good morning. There is a ship in distress we are heading to assist. Zack, Zerlia, Feldo, report to the cockpit. Thank you. The scanners showed a small blip with a very weak power signature. Lef took the controls and piloted the frontier towards the small ship as he hailed it. Vessel, we are moving to help. Prepare to come over to our ship. There was no response. Feldo arrived first. Who's in distress? Lef pulled alongside the ship. They had come out of hyperspace very close by. I don't know, but it's urgent. Aim the docking clamps, will you? Feldo crossed the room where a joystick sat beneath the screen. He grabbed the joystick, which allowed for extremely fine adjustments to the ship's position by only using 1% thruster power. He slowly guided the Frontier's docking port to the other ships, inch by inch. Almost got it. His paw twitched, and he bumped airlocks with the other ship. Feldo, watch it! Sorry. Feldo tightened his grip and held his breath. Soon, he had the clamps locked on. The camera Feldo was looking through showed a figure fall out of the ship, gasping for air. Feldo jumped up. Guys, look! He pointed at the screen. Lef and Lena were on their paws and running down the hall towards the airlock in seconds. Surly and Zack were already there, helping the figure to its feet. As the other three arrived, they got a good look at their face. It was a man, and he was a Siamese cat, with a black face, white fur, and a long, whippy tail. He coughed as he took several deep breaths. Hello. Thanks for rescuing me. I was nearly out of air. Lef took his other side and led him down to the engine room, and Lef and Serlia helped him into a chair. It took him a minute to catch his breath before he looked up at the five faces seated around him. Um, thanks again. My name's Sue. I'm a stellar cartographer from one of the Atrian colonies inside Solar Federation space. Why didn't you say you had so little air? Oh, the message you heard was a recording. I left it on a while back. I thought I was dead for sure. What caused your main power to go offline? 
I burned out a fuel relay and it caused an explosion that damaged the ion engine. Wait, why didn't you just go to hyperspace? Sue looked sideways and then back quickly. I, uh, ran out of drive fuel. I didn't prepare very well. I can't repair the engine myself, so I could use some help. And if you could spare some fuel, then I'll be on my way. Zack looked at Feldo, who nodded. Alright, let's take a look. They got up, and Sue got up to follow them, but Sir Leah sat him back down. You're in no shape to help them. You have CO2 poisoning, and you need to let your third lung filter it. Lef smiled. I'm Lef, the captain of the Frontier. That's Sir Leah, my first officer. This is Lena, my pilot. And those two that just left my engineers, Feldo and Zack. Sue nodded to each in turn. You hungry? We were just about to sit down for lunch. I could eat until I explode. Surlia, Lef, Helena, and Sue sat around the conference table. In the center was a large pot of larva soup. Sue rubbed his paws together. Man, it's been too long since I had real food. I'm swearing off the freeze-dried stuff forever. How fresh is the larva? <laughs> they were freeze-dried. Sue ladled some into his bowl. I retract my previous statement. They dug in, Lef and Sue especially. Man, missing breakfast is not fun. Try missing five breakfasts in a row. Touché. Drink and bread was passed around as the crew got to know Sue. So, what's your colony like? Surlia asked. I've never been to any of the Atrian colonies in Solar Federation space. Sue took a moment to swallow. Well, it's just like any colony, I suppose. Nothing really special about it. How long will the repairs take? I have a lot of ground to make up, charting stuff and all. I really have no idea. Zack can give you an estimate. He took a swig of fruit juice. So, a stellar cartographer, eh? You must get to see plenty of cool things, anomalies, trinary star systems, weird aliens. Oh, hey, do you mind if we download what you've charted so far? Lena perked up. Oh, yes! I would love that! To see all the interesting things you've discovered! Oh, my job isn't very exciting. I just chart empty space, sometimes a nebula or two. Besides, the company I work for doesn't want me giving anyone my charts. Oh, come on! There's not much to do in our spare time once you've read all the books, watched all the movies, and played all the video games! Can't we just take one little peek? I said no! They'd fire me on the spot! That's kinda harsh, don't you think? Just for sharing some empty space? Sue buried his nose in his food. I can't, I'm sorry. Leff and Lena were both convinced Sue was hiding something, but didn't press the issue. After they had finished, Lena took Sue on a tour of the frontier. Leff and Sir Leah, on the other hand, paid a visit to Feldo and Zack. Sue's shuttle was very small on the inside. The pilot seat had a large touchscreen that controlled all the ship's systems, an older technology, expensive and prone to problems. The rear of the ship was black with soot, and the ground was covered with metal pieces. Zack was removing a chunk of metal that had lodged itself in the engine. Feldo waved. Hey guys, things are pretty bad here. The primary fuel relay exploded, not sure why. Sue was lucky he didn't get killed by that alone. Zack wrenched the piece out, and it clattered to the floor. Phew, <laughs> you can say that again. I'm not sure this thing's ever going to fly again, at least not in normal space. Although I wouldn't recommend jumping anywhere either. Lef looked at the carnage that surrounded him. How long? I can't repair this by myself, but I could get it running at, uh... About 20% efficiency? He should be able to link back to a dock or his colony then. What about the cause? Zack looked behind Lef and Surlia to make sure no one would overhear. At first, it looked like a safety malfunction, but I noticed unusual residue on some of the walls. Some of these burns are from energy weapon fire. That got me thinking, so I checked the outside of the shuttle as well. Sure enough, the entire thing is covered in weapon damage. Lef and Surlia looked at each other uneasily. So what does that mean? You think he's a criminal? Seems likely. We'd better keep an eye on him. Lef addressed Fellow and Zack. Alright, good work. Keep trying to get this thing working, but take your time, understand? Lef and Surlia headed back to the cockpit, meeting Lena and Sue in the hall. They seemed to be getting along fine. Lef waved and pulled Lena aside. Surlia, why don't you continue the tour? Surlia nodded and led Sue to the converted cargo space. Left turned to Lena. Zack found evidence of weapon fire in and on Sue's ship. Did he tell you anything? No, but he seems agitated, like he's got somewhere to be. Keep an eye out. Something's not right here. Lena tilted her head to one side. But I also get the feeling he has nothing against us, you know? 
Maybe he's just late for something and doesn't want too many questions asked. Seems plausible. Let's head to the cockpit. I don't like leaving it empty when the autopilot's not on. They passed their time in the cockpit talking and playing word games. They had gotten to know each other quite well in the relatively short period of time, and Lena had told Lef about her life out in the country. Zack came by to give reports from time to time, and was optimistic about his chances of getting Sue's engines working again. Sue himself stopped by to inform Lef he would be in his shuttle working. Afternoon turned to night as conversation slowly dried up. Lef engaged the autopilot and stretched his arms. Well, Peach, time to put everything in night mode. Including me. <laughs> Lef laughed at his own joke. Lena remained silent as she powered down her station. Lef noticed the look on her face. What's up? <sighs> Sometimes I don't understand how you can be so clueless. Hey now, no need for name calling. She rose and walked up to him. Lef, assuming he was in trouble for something, backed up. What? what did I do? Lef? What? Whatever it is, I'm sorry. I... I've never done this before. Done what? What's... Lef trailed off as it slowly dawned on him. Um... I like you. M more than regular people like each other. I, I mean... You've got a thing for me. Yeah. He sat down in his chair and blinked slowly. Huh. Yeah, so there. You probably don't, but I just had to get it out of my system. Left smiled to himself and stood, walking up to Lena and standing close to her. What makes you say that? W what? Why would you just assume I don't feel the same way about you? Do you? He laughed and put his paws on her arms. <laughs> of course I do, Peach. You're intelligent, cute, and... Sorry, I've only done this twice before and neither of them worked out very well. Let me try this again. I knew you were something the second I saw you. I don't know when it happened, but I like you, Lena. Her face lit up with joy. I love- She found it was difficult to continue speaking as Lef abruptly kissed her. She was stunned at first, but soon closed her eyes and kissed back. He pulled away and locked eyes with her. Lef. He smiled and caressed her ear. Okay, if you want. Not much else to do in a cargo ship going out to the fourth. What? How did you... I don't know. I just know, Peach. He led her out the door and down the hall to his room, and led her inside. So Leah walked into the cockpit, expecting to find Lef. He was not there. She looked around, shrugged, and went back to her cabin. Lef woke up early in the morning from a dreamless sleep. Lena still had her arms wrapped around him, asleep. Something was off. Lef could feel it. Something gnawing at the edge of his consciousness. Something terrible. The feeling grew, and grew, and grew. Lef began to panic, so he sat up abruptly. Lena woke up to see Lef, with his back against the wall, eyes darting side to side. He noticed she was awake. Something's wrong. She sat up, grabbing the blanket so she could cover herself up. Did you have another nightmare? Suddenly the ship rocked violently, causing Lena to tumble out of bed. Seconds passed between the first shock and the next. The second shock knocked Lef off the bed. They got to their feet as quick as they could. Lef started throwing on his clothes. It's gone. Lena pulled on the clothes she was wearing the other day. What's gone? The terrible feeling. It's gone. Lena tugged on her shoes. Maybe that's a good thing. Lef pushed the door open and ran into the hall, Lena close behind. So Leah was just coming out of her room, and they met in the hallway. Lef, what's happening? Lena? Lef held up his paw to explain, but Sir Leah smacked it aside and ran towards the cockpit. Ugh, I don't care. We have bigger fish to fry. The cockpit was dead. Sir Leah looked around. What the hell? Why isn't the night computer on? Lef tugged the collar of his shirt. Well, I guess I forgot. Sir Leah jumped into the co-pilot seat and booted the main computer while Lef took his seat. Another shock rocked the ship, and panicked colonists could be heard from the converted cargo bay. As soon as the computer was online, a million indicators came on all at once, and alarms blared. So Leah tried to take it in all at once. We're being hailed. Left pressed the comm button. I don't know who the hell you are, but stop attacking us! We don't have anything of value! The face that appeared on Left's screen was a lion, his mane large and imposing. He spoke in a gruff voice. The ship that is currently docked with you, it belongs to us. We can only assume you are harboring fugitives. Prepare to have your ship and cargo seized. 
Leff tried to reason with him. Wait, on what authority? You aren't a lawman. I was granted the role of sheriff by the Atrian government so that I could keep the peace on my planet. We have some place to be. If you want Sue, you can have him, but only after I see what he's been convicted of and you assure us we can be let free. The lion frowned. I'm afraid I can't risk letting you go. Who knows what he's told you? He hasn't told us anything. But it was too late. The lion had cut the transmission. Seconds later, the ship rocked again, this time more lightly. Celia looked at the sensor data streaming in. He's locked onto us with a tractor beam, and his ship is much better equipped than ours. Zack ran into the cockpit. What's happening? No time to explain. Reverse the polarity of the hull. That might get this tractor beam off us. Left wrestled with the wheel, pulling left and right, trying to break free. Once the hull polarity was reversed, he felt the ship gain some responsiveness, but not enough. Lena, get on those cannons and disable his tractor beam. Lena stood in the middle of the room, frozen in place. I... I can't... Just do it! Lena ran out of the cockpit. Damn it! She jumped up and grabbed the weapons controls. She fired several shells at the beam emitter. The projectiles did nothing to the emitter, but the beam locked onto the projectiles instead of the frontier, which jolted away. They didn't get very far, however, as the other ship disengaged the tractor beam and instead fired their energy weapon directly into the frontier's iron engine. Zack watched as the power levels dropped quickly in the iron engine's core. Lef, they've locked on again with the tractor beam. I don't think there's anything we can do this time. Lef ground his teeth for a solid 30 seconds. He reluctantly hailed the ship again. All right, we surrender. The lion appeared on screen again. I'm glad you finally made the right choice. We'll be towing you back to our colony where you and your ship will be processed. He cut the transmission. Sir Leah turned to Lef, eyes alight with wrath. Lef, why the hell wasn't the night computer on? Ugh, as if I don't know. Sir Leah, it was a spur-of-the-moment thing. Lena was... more important at the time. You guys picked the worst goddamn time to fall in love. Zack held up his arms. Well, guys, come on. Maybe let's do this later? Sue and Rackham both burst through the cockpit doors at the same time. Rackham spoke first. Lef! What the hell is going on? Is it the pirates again? Sue answered for Lef. It's no pirate, sir. It's much worse. Rackham looked at him. What do you mean, worse? Sue sat on the floor and began his tale. I suppose I should tell you everything. I come from Bowman's planet. <gasps> what? Isn't that place dead? You may have heard it was dead, yes, but that's not what happened. There was a revolution on Bowman's planet. A crazed cult leader rose up with an army and overthrew the local government. In only a short time, he moved the remaining population underground to hide. They were forced to practice the sick practices the cult had. I was forced to. Rackham wiped a handkerchief across his brow. What sick practices exactly? Sue visibly did not want to recall them. They believe in survival of the fittest. Rape is encouraged as a rite of passage, and anyone who isn't a feline species are forced to serve as slaves. Except foxes. They use foxes as sacrifices to their gods. Sirlia gulped. F foxes, huh? I fled that hellish place. Lef looked at the ship on scanners. This is bad. I better find Lena. He got up and went for the door. Rackham stopped him. Lef, I know this wasn't your fault. But wherever this goes, remember what I told you. Lef nodded to him and ran out into the corridor. Lef found Lena in one of the smaller cargo bays. She was standing in the corner, literally kicking herself. She heard Lef approaching and looked up. I'm sorry, Lef. She embraced him. I'm sorry. I panicked. Lef patted her back. It's okay. The weapons didn't work anyway. She broke off the hug. They didn't? What's going to happen? We're being taken to Bowman's planet. I know you're scared, but I need you to be strong. Hell, I'm scared shitless, but we can get out of this. You still haven't told me what this is. Lef took her paw. Follow me. Sue will explain. Then we need to come up with a plan. Frontier, by Maggot Moshpit, Chapter 7 Left sat on a crate in front of all the colonists, attempting to gather his thoughts as they watched him, murmuring among themselves. Lena, Toliko, and Yar stood with them, waiting. Hey, Lena, what's all this about, and what was going on earlier? Yar chimed in with Toliko. Yeah, and why are you wearing the same clothes as you were yesterday? Left is about to explain it. 
The situation is bad, though. As for my clothes, that's none of your business. They both looked at her skeptically, and she held up a paw. Now's not the time. Things are worse than you think. Laugh finally stood and addressed the crowd. Everyone, some of you may have heard of Bowman's planet and how its population mysteriously vanished. Well, they haven't vanished. They've been forced into a cult. Now, this is going to sound crazy, but it's the truth. We've been captured by some of these cultists, and we're being towed back to Bowman's planet to become... slaves. The crowd became restless. Disbelief and anger was clear on the faces of most of the colonists. One of them shouted, Is this some kind of sick joke? Sue, who was standing nearby, jumped onto the crate as well. This is no joke! I escaped from Bowman's planet. I had the scars to prove it. He lifted his shirt, and plainly showing through his fur were many small scars. They punished me as a child when I didn't behave. As soon as I could, I escaped. Unfortunately, I led them right to you when Lef came to my aid. For that, I am sorry. Lef continued. But we've got a plan. Sue tells me he knows the workers' residence inside and out. He'll find us an escape route. There is a time limit, however. Part of the ideology of these people is that Fox Atrians are the physical embodiment of evil and must be... sacrificed to their gods. There is a ritual preparation that takes 12 hours at least. So unless we escape by then, those bastards will kill all the foxes in this room, including our first officer and... my pilot. The crowd began to build panic like an overloading drive, and unless something was done, it would explode. Tlaiko looked at Lena. E is what he says true? Lena nodded solemnly. Yes. I had a similar reaction. But I have confidence Lef will get us out of this. Lena gulped. I hope. Lef threw up his arms. Please don't panic. The last thing we need is to be so scared we trip over our own shoelaces. It won't be long until we arrive at Bowen's planet. And until then, me and the crew will be putting our brains together. If any of you think of anything useful, don't hesitate to come forward. Laugh spotted Rackham in the crowd, made eye contact, and beckoned as he jumped off the crate. Rackham walked over, his usual demeanor seeming much less inviting. Rackham, I need you to keep these folks from mass panic or doing anything rash. My bet is that soon as the shock wears off, they'll want to fight. You'd bet right, I'd reckon. <sighs> you sure we can't take them? I mean, if it came to that... Laugh shook his head. Remember what you told me? Yes, and I was right. Lef patted Rackham on the shoulder. Take care. You too, Lef. Lef waved to Sue and Lena as they exited the converted cargo bay. They headed directly to the conference room where Sir Leah, Fellow, and Zack waited. Zack waved a data pad. I got the schematics from your ship, Sue. Looks like you have a pretty detailed map of the settlements on Bowman's planet. Sue took the pad and laid it on the table. I took a scan before I left. I mean, I didn't do the scan myself. I took it. As in, stole it. He brought up what looked like a giant holding pen. It may not look like it, but this whole thing is 18 feet below ground. It's guarded well, and the ventilator shafts are on the ceiling, much too high to reach. Surlia shrugged. Then what do we do? It seems pretty well protected. Sue zoomed in on a small room, shooting off the main chambers. Lef took a closer look. The restroom? You don't expect us to crawl around in a pile of shit, do you? <laughs> Well, at the moment, these pens are empty, so they've cleared out the pit. They don't have proper... facilities. But see here? He pointed to a tube leading from the bottom of the pit. This leads into the ocean. Once in a while, they flood the pit, and everything goes out to sea. We can't get everyone out at once, but a small team can escape and come back to unlock the front doors. Faldo looked at the pad. It says a nine-foot drop to the bottom. It's cutting it pretty close. Sue shrugged. We can improvise. The ship rocked a small amount. Zack stood. We've come out of hyperspace. Lef also stood. Let's greet our new friends. The five stood before the boarding ramp doors. The ship rocked once more as the other ship landed them on the surface, and soon the airlock opened to the backdrop of a ruined landing pad. Standing in front of eight armed and ready men was the lion Lef had spoken to. He looked up and spread his arms. We are blessed by this boon you have given us, Larosia. He smiled a toothy smile and looked at the greeting party. You are about to enter holy service. Cheer up, I am Bowman. Celia snorted. <laughs> 
You aren't Bowman. Bowman was the original leader of Bowman's planet. The men pointed their guns at Sir Leah. Bowman roared. Cease your evil tongue! Did I tell you you could speak, Fox? I killed Bowman in hand-to-hand combat, so I took his name. It decrees it so in the scripture of La Roja. Bowman looked at Laugh. You look like you're in charge here. Keep those foxes submissive. Laugh bared his teeth. Those foxes are my officers. I don't care what your scripture says. They are your equals, if not your betters. Bowman unsheathed his claws and sliced them across Left's face as quick as lightning. Arrgh! Left fell to the floor, a paw on his face. Lena gasped and was at his side in an instant. Ah! Bowman approached her. See how they feign concern? The intent is written plainly on their faces. Has this one seduced you, my friend? Left stood shakily. I'm fine, Peach. Only one of Bowman's claws had connected with Left's face, but the ugly jagged mark ran from his forehead along his muzzle and ending at his nose. Left said nothing to Bowman, only stared him down with cold eyes. Bowman signaled to his men. No matter. What evil vices you indulge in is no business of mine. Take them. The men came forward, each one looking hardened and tough. They wore the bog-standard clothes any normal colonist would wear, but each one had a symbol pinned to their shirt a diamond with a twisted tree in its center. They brandished their old energy weapons as they came forward and threw sacks over the heads of the five and dragged them off. The last thing Laff heard before he was dragged off was Bowman ordering more men. Grab more sacks, men, and shoot whoever tries to fight back or escape. Leff was dragged roughly along a winding path. The arm of his captor had him in a tight headlock, preventing him from speaking or breathing properly. After a short time, he was thrown to the floor. His captor ripped off the mask and knelt beside him as he coughed. Blessings of the Roya be on you, worker. Left managed to croak some words before the man left to go get more of the colonists. This is wrong. The man glanced back for a second before leaving. Left sat up and looked around. He was sitting in the pen Sue had showed them. He spotted the others that were taken with him, plus some colonists, more than could have been captured in that short of a time. Lena approached him as he cursed to himself. They must have gotten in through the airlock as well as the boarding ramp, he muttered. Lena plopped down beside him, and Laugh couldn't resist giving her paw a quick squeeze before the others also sat around, forming a circle. Sue drew a shape in the dirt as he spoke. It's the same pen, thank goodness. We have to go quickly. They won't start working us until they've concluded their sacrifices, but they'll start dragging foxes off before too long. Surlia glanced around nervously. What? I thought you said preparations would take twelve hours. <laughs> yes, well... The ritual takes 12 hours, but they need the subject for that duration. Leff jumped to his feet. You should have told us that sooner! Let's- Leff was cut off by the pen doors bursting open as more colonists were brought in from the ship. The rest of them, in fact. Bowman approached the group, his smile bearing his many sharp teeth. Well, now that we've all gathered, I don't think there's any reason to wait. Bowman pointed his claw at Lena. Take her! Two men stepped forward, only to encounter Leff, arms outstretched. Don't you put a paw on her! One of the men took hold of Leff and shoved him to the ground forcefully, while the other grabbed Lena as she attempted to run away. Hey! Get off me, you brute! Lena was dragged towards the door as Leff scrambled onto his feet and ran at Lena's captors. Bowman and the other cultists held him back. Bowman's grin grew wider. Leff, I like you. In the creation tales, La Roja's bride was Wolverine, like you. I'm trying to help you. Rid you of that parasite so that you can be shown the true way. Leff stopped struggling. He had twelve hours to save her, but he wouldn't take his time. Bowman and the other cultist rejoined the one taking Lena away. Leff ran to them and stuck his muzzle through the small barred window as far as it would go and shouted as they dragged her down the corridor. I'll save you! Lena tried to shout something back, but it was muffled by the bindings that were shoved into her mouth. Leff slammed his paw into the pen door multiple times. Sirlia stood behind him awkwardly. Um, we'll get her back? Left turned to Sue. Where's the bathroom? He said it as more of a statement than a question. Sue wrung his paws together. Uh... Damn it, get a hold of yourself! It's my mate that's just been dragged off, not yours! Feldo shook his head. Wait, you guys are mates? Surlia dug her elbow into his side and flashed him the now is not the time look. Sue collected himself and pointed to a small door. Left strode towards it. Sue, you're with me. The rest of you, we won't be long. 
The bathroom was no more than a hole in the ground, and the dim light from an old LED didn't produce enough illumination for either of them to see into the pit. But judging by the smell, it was clean. Sue gulped as he gazed into the abyss. So, how do you want to do this? Lef could swear something was staring back at him. Hold on, I have an idea. He left for a few minutes and returned lugging several straw bedrolls. He tossed them into the pit, trying to get them all to fall directly down into it to ensure they would be able to land on them. Sue looked into the pit again, then gestured to it. Left sat on the edge as he looked up at Sue. I hope your schematics were right and it's not a 30-foot drop. He psyched himself up and dropped into the pit. In midair, his instincts took over as his body twisted not a moment too soon and landed him on all fours under one of the bedrolls. Sue's shadow peered at Left from the top of the pit. Lef! Lef! You okay? Just peachy! Get down here! Sue was much more careful. He dangled himself from his paws before dropping, reducing the height of the fall by five feet. He landed without much trouble. Lef hauled himself up. Why didn't I think of that? Come on, help me find the hole. They felt the sides of the pit around the circumference of the room. Lef was beginning to fear there was no hole, and as his mind raced with the possibility, his paw shot into the hole, almost causing him to lose balance. He mentally chided himself as he called Sue over. Found it! You first this time! Lef heard Sue crawl into the hole, and he followed suit. Lef suspected there was still some residue, so he tried his best to minimize the amount of contact he had with the floor and walls. After crawling for a good ten minutes, Sue stopped and whispered. Look! Light! Lef peered around Sue, finding there was a faint afternoon light coming from the end of the tunnel. It seemed like the colony time and space time were very far apart here. After a short time, Sue climbed out of the hole and stretched his arms. Lef stretched his arms as well as he spoke. Whew, I was starting to get cramped up. Lef's voice trailed off as he looked at his paws. Oh, son of a bitch! Sue laughed his usual nervous laugh. <laughs> That's just dirt. Wash it off in the waves. Sue and Lef quickly washed off the dirt on their paws in the rolling surf. If they had any interest, or time, the beach would have been a breathtaking sight. Most of it was covered with a fine layer of bioluminescent algae that sparkled along with the reflections from the sun. Lef waved his paws to dry them. All right, where do we go from here? Sue pointed to the top of a nearby hill. We can get a clear view from there. Come on. Before they reached the top of the hill, they got on all fours to minimize their silhouette. The hill indeed offered an excellent view of the compound, if it could be called that. The exterior was disguised as a bunch of ruins, the landing pad overgrown with weeds and any buildings intentionally collapsed and covered with plant life. The only evidence anyone lived here was the frontier, still parked on the pad, and the occasional figure moving to and from it. Lev squinted at the figures. I think they're conducting repairs. Ooh, if they think they're going to take the frontier from me, then they are sorely mistaken. From their vantage point, it was clear which building held the entrance, and soon the coast was clear. Lef sprang up and ran as fast as he could towards the nearest ruined building. Sue followed him as they bobbed and weaved between small shrubs. The building was only a few feet away. What was that? Two of Bowman's men stood at the entrance, pointing to where Sue had just moments ago ducked behind a crumbling wall. The one that did not speak snorted. There was nothing. We gotta get these repairs finished before tomorrow. I could have sworn I saw a flash of something just there. The second feline grunted. <sighs> then let's go and check. The two walked up to the wall and looked around it. See? Nothing. Now let's go. They hurried back to the frontier. Lef let out his breath. It was a good thing they had time to dart around the corner. Now it was a straight shot to the entrance. They kept low as they quickly made their way to the ruined building. A large slab was removed from the floor, and a staircase descended into a dimly lit corridor. Once inside, Sue pointed to a corridor leaning to the left. He mouthed his message to Lef, who got the gist. Two guards just there, pen behind. Lef nodded. Sue, being a cat in inconspicuous clothing, walked past the left passage with his face turned the other way. Then he called back, loud enough for the guards to hear. Hey, I could use a paw here! One of the guards looked at the other. You go. He yawned. Hell no, he was talking to you. The first guard sighed. Fine. He walked towards Sue. All right, what is it? As soon as he rounded the corner, Sue dealt him a fast blow right to the windpipe, stunning him. Left rushed the second guard, who stumbled to draw his weapon. He managed to get a shot off before Leff barreled into him, knocking him flat. Sue clubbed the first guard over the head with his own gun as he heard the shot. He dashed down the corridor. Leff, you all right? Leff stood and checked the guard's gun he had just lifted off his unconscious body. Yeah, he missed me, but pretty soon someone's going to come to see what the sound was. We have to hurry. 
Leff flipped the guard over on his stomach and spotted the ring of keys on his belt. You go keep watch. I'll get everyone to the frontier. Then we'll go get Lena. <laughs> yeah. Leff tried the first key. It didn't work. I wish you'd stop laughing like that. Sorry. One of the colonists near the door noticed Leff. Hey! Leff shushed him and tried the second key. It didn't work either. He spoke through the bars as he tried the third key. Get everyone ready. Tell Cerulea to get over here. She's got more experience with firearms than me. The colonists scampered off. The third key opened the pen and Leff swung the doors wide open, and Cerulea and Rackham were the first to get out. Leff grinned. Rackham, let's go take the ship back. None of the cultists on it are armed since they're there for repair work. Cerulea, help Sue. Soon we'll have some company. Here. He handed her the gun. She set it to a lower energy output. Understood. What about Lena? Leff bit his lip. First, let's get the colonists aboard. Rackham and Leff led a stream of colonists down the corridor and up the stairs. Aboard the frontier, one of the cultists conducting repairs checked over his supplies. He called to a nearby tiger. Hey, have you seen that huge wrench? No, weren't you supposed to bring it? The cultist sighed and stood up to find the wrench. It's not my fault weapon fire loosened the power conduits on this level. Why do I have to... As he went for the ramp, he was met with a figure that took up his entire field of view. It grinned at him. Hello, sugar! He didn't have time to scream before he was hit with the force of a jackhammer straight to his face, sending him bowling into the tiger. Serlia's eyes were dead set on the end of the corridor, the rifle in her paws barely shaking as it was trained on the same place. Someone was coming. She could hear it. She glanced at Sue, who nodded. Two figures appeared at the other end, and Serlia shot one of them. The other yelled. Alarm! Workers are escaped! Serlia silenced the second, too late. Someone fired down the corridor at them, sending Serlia back into cover. She poked out just in time to see Sue shoot one that was attempting to rush them. Three more appeared and began firing down the corridor. Sue, we can't stay here much longer. Sue hit Lynx as she peeked to get a shot at him. You're right. Suppressing fire on three. One, two, three. They rapidly fired down the corridor, sending the cultists' heads back. Sue and Serlia backed up to the stairs quickly, still firing. They made a mad dash to the ramp of the frontier, where Leff and Zack were waiting impatiently. Serlia, you and Zack hold them off here. Sue, let's find Lena. We need to hurry. Feldo has detected that gunship. It's heading this way from another system. Sue ducked behind the ramp they were using for cover. Cerlia shot the first head to pop out of the staircase with impressive accuracy. About that? Lef, it's too dangerous. You'd be killed. Let's cut our losses and get out of here while we still can. Lef's eyes widened. What? You said we could save her! You bastard! Tell me where she is! Sue stammered. Lef, if I told you that, you run after her and g get killed. The cultists began to gain ground, using the walls as cover. A shot whizzed past Zack's head. Guys, we're too exposed out here. I can't hit a thing anyway. Left slammed his paw onto the ramp. He remembered Rackham's words. He needed to think of all the colonists. Not just his newfound mate. God damn it! Sue, you've put me in an impossible situation! You lied to me, led me on, get inside! They dashed inside, and Left pressed the ramp's controls. His paw stayed on the button as he shook. Damn it! Damn it! Damn it! Damn it! Lena! He closed his eyes tightly, trying to prevent the tears from rolling down his cheeks. Sue stood on the ramp as it ascended. He looked at Leff, and something inside him snapped. Ah! Fuck it! He ran and jumped off the ramp before it closed. Leff opened his eyes to see Sue dive and land on the ground in a run. He quickly pressed the ramp's button again. Sue! Get back here, dammit! Get back here, you martyr complex having lying bastard! Sue dashed towards a nearby building, a different one from the one that housed the pen. The cultists were caught off guard and didn't react fast enough to shoot at him. He was gone inside in two seconds. Left grabbed the pistol from Zack and jumped behind the ramp again, shooting the guards closest to the door Sue had just gone through. Sulia joined him, and they began firing at the cultists until they ducked behind cover again, yelling obscenities. Zack crouched just out of the line of fire, holding an SCOM which was connected to the cockpit comm system. Feldo says the gunship is close. We've got maybe eight minutes. From where they were, they could see flashes of light coming from the building Sue had gone into, and they could hear plenty of yelling, too. Soon, a figure emerged. Left tapped Serlia's shoulder. Suppressing fire, now! They laid down fire on every wall nearby, keeping heads down low. The figure ran as fast as it could to the ramp, and to Left's infinite relief, he saw it was Lena. He climbed onto the ramp and pulled Serlia up with him. They dove into the ship. Left yelled, even as cultists surrounded the room Sue went into. 
Sue, don't be a hero! Celia hit the ramp button, and the ramp closed slowly. The flashes of weapon fire didn't stop, and was still going on when the ramp finally closed. Zack barked into the SCOM, and the ship lifted off. Laugh turned around and was almost thrown off balance as Lena jumped into his arms and buried her face in his shoulder. Lena! Thank God, I thought I lost you! Lena broke off and wiped a paw over her eyes. I wasn't going to let you escape without me. She laughed. Lef hugged her again. I'm glad you're safe. I'm glad you're all safe. But Sue... Celia shook her head. Maybe he got away. We didn't see. Her voice trailed off. They all knew it was impossible. They felt the ship accelerate, and Zack ran towards the engine room, yelling, You guys better save the tears and lovey lovey for later. We aren't out of the woods yet. Felder was doing his best to fly the ship, but he wasn't a pilot. He looked back in relief as Lena, Lef, and Sir Leah arrived. Guys, that gunship just entered the system. We don't have much time. Lef ran to the weapons controls, and Sir Leah took the co-pilot seat and began transmitting a call on the police line. Lef grinned at Lena. Take your station, Peach. Lena sat in the pilot's chair. She took a deep breath and grasped the wheel. Ready! What's your command, Lef? Lef trained all guns to rear and waited. Lena, do you think you can do a sharp turn along our Z-axis? She thought for a moment. It might blow up one or two thrusters, but I can do it. They won't expect it anyway. Lef nodded. Sir Leah looked up. An Atrian ship is on its way. We're lucky there was one so close. Sir Leah's console beeped. Lef, proximity alert. I see it. He took careful aim and fired all barrels at the pursuing ship's sensor array. Lights beeped at his station as two barrels misfired, but the rest hit their target. Now! Z-axis! Lena pulled up on the wheel hard, and the ship lurched along its Z-axis. Left's barrage had disabled the gunship's sensors, and the Frontier was already flying in the opposite direction by the time the backups came online. Bowman sat on the bridge, getting more and more furious. Turn around! How could they get behind us like that? Re-aim weapons! Blow them out of the sky! I don't care if they all die! The Frontier had a head start, but a ship hauling that much equipment was never a match for the speed of a top-of-the-line gunship, and soon they had a lock on the ion engines. Fire all! Bowen was cut off, however, when the ship rocked violently. One of the consoles exploded nearby, sending a cat flying. Two cultists went to extinguish the flame when the comm blared to life. Stolen vessel! This is Captain Prax of the Endless Ocean. Stand down! Depower your weapons or face dire consequences. Bowman roared. Arr! Come about! All weapons fire on that ship! The cultists worked fast, turning on a dime and getting a blast off on the endless ocean. The ship's shields absorbed the energy from the blast and returned fire. The gunship's shields ate the first two pulse blasts, but the next three got through and hit the hull, rupturing several power relays and causing a chain reaction. The ship seemed to sit in space for several seconds, lifeless when suddenly, the reaction reached the reactor and caused a breach. Escape pods jettisoned as the ship exploded, sending debris far and wide, the fireball disappearing quickly as the oxygen burned up. Left side, a long sigh of relief. Ooh. Sir Leah, hail that ship. Tell them thanks. Sir Leah's paw went for the button, but the console beeped first. They're hailing us. Left jumped into a seat and turned on the view screen. Prax's face once again appeared on it. Hey, wait. I know you. Prax smiled a toothy smile. We've met at SFSS 867. You've got some explaining to do. Lef smiled back. Come aboard. I'll tell you all about it over some larva soup. Frontier by Maggot Moshpit Chapter 8 Lef waved at the airlock as it closed behind the departing Captain Prax. Even after Prax was gone, Lef continued to wave, a smile on his face and his eyes closed. Sir Leo was standing next to him, and she nudged his shoulder. Um, Lef? He's gone. Lef's shoulders slumped as he heaved a sigh of relief. Thank God, I thought he'd never leave. That's the worst part about getting into trouble in space, the endless questions. <laughs> I think it's just because Captain Prax likes me. And didn't want to leave. Lef glared at her. Well, anyway, it was nice of him to let us use his medical facilities. My scar is completely gone. Too bad he couldn't fix this damned headache. Stress my ass. Sir Leah tried to suppress her laughter. <laughs> you... you might want to rephrase that. Whatever. Who knows? Maybe Prax was right. Maybe what we need is a vacation. Sir Leah bounded down the corridor. I'll go tell everyone. Wait, I said maybe. 
But Sir Leo was already gone, left side to himself and wandered off to his cabin to sleep. He changed into some pajamas and sat on his bed, the day's events weighing heavily on his eyelids. He was about to flop down and pass out when there was a faint knock at his door, causing him to jump. Laugh? You awake? Yeah, come in, Peach. She entered his room timidly. She was also wearing pajamas. What is it? She sat on the bed next to him. Um, about yesterday. Lef kissed her on her cheek. I have no regrets. I love you, Lena. I just didn't know it until recently. Sorry for making you wait. It was worth the wait. So, we can be mates? That's not a problem, I mean, because I'm your subordinate? Nah, it's not a problem. If we were serving on a government ship, things would be different. But I make the rules on this ship, and I say it's allowed. Lena smiled. Okay, but what about... I mean, we aren't compatible. Lef frowned. What do you mean? She searched for the words. I mean, you're a wolverine, and I'm a fox. It dawned on Lef. Oh, we'll jump that hurdle when we come to it. Lena nodded. You're right. There was one other thing. Shoot. Well, you remember how Tsu said it would take 12 hours to prepare that weird ritual? Lef could guess what was coming, and somehow he wasn't surprised. Yes? Lena fell back onto the bed. It only seemed to take an hour. They told me all sorts of things. They asked me to summon the evil gods to come save me. Then they explained how after the ritual, they'd... There's no way to sugarcoat it, Lef. They were going to cook and eat me. Lef was shocked. He didn't see that coming. Or then again, maybe he did. He lay back beside her. Are you okay? They didn't hurt you? She shook her head. Sue saved me in time. I think it was just a scare tactic, though. Lef stared at the ceiling as he tried to pin down the strange feeling he was having. I'm not so sure. They lay in silence for a while, enjoying each other's company. After a minute, Lef turned his head towards Lena, and she turned to look at him. What are you thinking? Lef grinned. I'm thinking it's late. Time for sleep. Come on, back to your bed. Lena crawled under the blankets. But it's so comfy here! Lef crawled in after her. All right, if you insist. He planted a kiss on the back of her head. Good night, Peach. Good night. Sir Leia had outdone herself. When Lef awoke the next morning and went to the cockpit, he found she had everything planned. As he entered, she tossed him a data pad. Look, it's perfect! Lef scanned the contents of the pad. The pleasure planet of Koron 4? Experience the beauty of our crystal sand beaches, the flavor of our delicious seafood, and the challenges of our tall mountains? Sir Leia, this all sounds very expensive. I doubt many of the colonists could afford it. She twirled in excitement. Ha! I knew you'd say that. Zack, tell him. Zack sipped his coffee and scratched his head. Well, I called my parents, and they said they'd pay for it. They said, We always said you need to take breaks sometimes. And then they gave me the money. Lef looked at the prices on the pad. How much did they give you? <laughs> More than what you paid for the ship. Lef sat in the captain's chair, something he installed himself, as the old captain's chair was just the pilot's seat. Why didn't your parents just buy you a new ship? Zack put down his cup. His voice took a lower, more reserved tone. My parents don't believe in giving me much money, even if they are filthy rich. Lef shrugged. It's understandable. I guess. I mean, they are really rich. Couldn't hurt to loan me some money for a new car. Lef looked over the digital ad again. He was starting to like the idea. How far is it? I don't want to take too much of a detour. Sir Leo was already plotting a course. It's only three days off course. I don't know. Three days? She whirled on him and gave her best evil eyes. We haven't had shore leave in a month. And even then, it was cut short. Lef knew she was right. The colonists were beginning to get a little stir-crazy. And after the latest incident, they were more on edge than ever. All right, fine. But don't blame me if it's run by some crazy cult, or if all the people there are Cyrus's, or Zack steals an old guy's wallet. I told you I didn't steal Jenkins' wallet. Left chuckled as he flipped on the intercom. Good morning, this is your captain speaking, and do I have some wonderful news for you. We are currently en route to Koron 4 for some much-needed R&R. Data on Koron 4 can be found on file, but I assure you it looks wonderful. And don't worry, everything has been paid for. 
Lev switched off the intercom as the excited chatter from the colonists became audible. The three days passed quickly, and soon the frontier, the exterior of the ship looking like it needed a vacation as much as the people inside, dropped out of hyperspace just outside the Koron system. Feldo, Lena, and Lef were in the cockpit, and Lena set a course to the fourth planet in the system. Feldo was scanning the planet from the engineering station as he chattered excitedly. I've never been to a pleasure planet before, before my days as a pirate. Oh, I hope they have balconies in the rooms. We're all getting our own rooms, right? Lef searched the computer for Koron 4's hailing frequency. Yes, yes. And they'll have balconies. Feldo looked over his scans. Whoa. For a planet with an average population of only 100,000, they sure spread out the facilities. Lena lay back in her seat as the ship flew towards the planet. It's to keep the population density low to prevent overcrowding. Yeah, the downside of that is we have to split the ship into two groups, each one going to a different resort. Thankfully, I've had plenty of time working out who goes where. The comm beeped. Hello, this is Koron 4 Ground Control. Welcome to Paradise. What can we do for you? Yes, hello. We would like to set down for shore leave. We have a reservation. The man on the other end sounded almost too ecstatic. Ah, he must be the frontier. Four day stay, 68 persons, 15 couples rooms, 38 single rooms, all expenses paid. That's us. Always a pleasure to serve the brave colonists, boldly going where no one has gone before. Ah, please transmit your reservation code and we'll open a hangar for your ship. The transmission ended. Left transmitted the code and received coordinates for the hangar. This is going to be fun, Left said to no one in particular. Lena threw the door of the room wide open and ran inside excitedly. Wow! It's so nice! Whoa! Look at that bed! It's huge! Lef came puffing behind her, lugging three bags with great difficulty. Yeah, real nice! He dropped the bags and sat in an authentic Atrian-made sofa. Ah, much better. What's this? A bottle sat on the table, two wine glasses next to it. Lef picked it up and examined the bottle as Lena went out onto the balcony. Lef, the view is beautiful! She ran back inside and grabbed his arm. You've got to see this! Lef opened the bottle and poured two glasses. Compliments of the establishment. They stepped out onto the balcony, wine in paw. From their high perch, they could get a good view of the entire resort. The planet was very large, and 80% of it was covered in water. Most of the land masses were large islands. The planet used to be racked with storms and hundred-foot waves, but a huge terraforming operation had made it habitable. The result of the strong weather was the finest sand and smoothest hills, and volcanic activity had created a mountain range along most of the equator, perfect for climbers. Looking down, Lef could see the building was only a few meters away from the beach. The beach itself was not crowded, and a seafood vendor was set up right on the sand. Other than that, there was a water polo game going on. At least, Lef thought it was water polo. Boats for guests to use, and children running left and right. The sea was completely flat, and tinged purple, the same color as the sky. There was no wind and no water currents as a result of the terraforming, and this meant no waves and no surfing. But the trade-off was worth it. Lef put his arm around Lena's waist. It is beautiful. Not going to drink that? Lef took a sip of his wine. Lena swirled her glass and looked into it. I just don't drink much. Just don't drink too much at once. It'll burn. Lena took one tentative sip. Mmm, that tastes good. It does kind of burn, though. Left downed his glass and placed it on the railing. Let's get down there, shall we? Feldo stood in the lobby, completely lost. He looked around at the people walking back and forth, spotting at least five different alien species, including humans and atrians. Aside from them, he saw Yerens and two others he didn't recognize. Thanks to a rather high-tech translation device he had been given, he understood all that was said. He was wearing a shirt Zack had given him. Zack said it was called a Hawaiian shirt, and Feldo thought it looked nice. But he was getting weird glances from some of the humans. Feldo looked around, unsure of where to go next. Up to his room? The beach? A bar? A restaurant? A voice behind him made him jump. Lost? He spun around. Standing before him was an Atrian woman, a Pine Martin with caramel-colored fur and dazzling blue eyes. She looked uncannily familiar. Uh, no. I can't decide what to do first. The Pine Martin smiled warmly at him. <laughs> well, going by how exhausted you look. Something relaxing, maybe? She extended her paw, and they shook. I'm Terry. Nice to meet you. Feldo smiled back. 
I'm Feldo. I just arrived and all this is, uh, rather daunting. Well, I was just about to hit the beach. You could come with me. Feldo was liking this vacation more and more, though something nagged at the back of his mind. I'd like that. Terry and Feldo strolled along the warm beach, enjoying the warmth. Terry's loose clothing flowed as she walked. So, tell me about yourself, Feldo. Not much to tell. I've been an engineer on a cargo ship called the Frontier for the past month. We're transporting colonists. Funny. I'm a fleet captain. Feldo's eyes widened. Really? Terry laughed. I'm the captain of a tiny cargo fleet. Took me a year to save up for this vacation. I started as a Lulu pilot, but worked my way up. And now I'm here. What about... before a month ago? Feldo looked away. Uh, I was... on a different ship. Oh, come on! What was it like? Tell me about your adventures! There's... nothing to tell. Terry slapped him on the shoulder lightheartedly. <laughs> I don't believe that for a second. Well, I have no stories about my time before I got aboard the Frontier. But just a few days ago, we ran into some pretty crazy stuff. Terry grabbed onto his arm and pulled him towards a seafood vendor. Tell it to me over some giant shrimp! Whoa, what's shrimp? You'll love it! Soon, Feldo sat across from Terry with a large plate of shrimp and a glass of passion fruit juice in front of him. He picked up one and sniffed it. Terry giggled. Oh, it won't bite. Go on, try it! He took a bite and then began devouring shrimp after shrimp. Terry laughed and began eating her own shrimp. See? Told ya. Fellow stopped eating for a breath. Man, this might be my new favorite food. What do they call this sauce? It's called cocktail sauce. I have no idea what it's made of. Felder shrugged and dipped the shrimp in the sauce. I don't care what it's made of. Anyway, crazy stuff. Terry clapped her paws together. Yes, do tell. Between mouthfuls of shrimp, Feldo told the story the best he could. He finished the tale at the same time he finished the shrimp. That's the story. <clears throat> Feldo closed his mouth quickly, but not quick enough to suppress the burp. Terry looked at him in mock disgust and let out a burp of her own. They laughed at their own silliness. <laughs> This left guy sounds like quite the hero. Yeah. Oh, my life. Fellow didn't realize what he said until it was too late. Terry smiled a grim smile. Oh, that sounds interesting. Tell me about it. Fellow looked around. Uh, maybe later. Terry flopped on the table in an exaggerated gesture of frustration. Aw, oh, come on. Stop being a tease. Uh... Hey, Feldo! Feldo turned around, the relief plainly showing on his face. Lef, hi. Lef came bounding up, Lena in tow. They were wearing strange clothes. What are you guys wearing? Lena tossed the ball she was holding to Feldo. They're human clothes. I think this is called a bikini and that's a speedo. Who's your friend? Oh, this is Terry. Terry, this is Lef and Lena. Oh, Feldo's told me about you. I'm a captain too. Lef's eyes lit up. Oh, really? You'll have to tell me about it sometime. Hey, we need some players for beach volleyball. Wanna join? Yes! I love volleyball! It's my favorite human game! Feldo tossed the ball to Lef. Yeah, sure. Just let me finish my drink. Terry sat back down as Lef loped off. Sure. Don't take too long. She sipped her drink. Nice guy. Feldo also sipped his drink. He's taken. Terry grinned mischievously. By you? Feldo laughed at that. No. By Lena. Terry downed her drink and sprang up. Then you have nothing to worry about, she said with a wink. She dashed off towards the volleyball net. Fellow finished off his drink and followed her. That night, Yar and Zack sat at the bar of a pub, nursing drinks. They had both come to the bar with the same goal. Yar gestured to a human woman sitting alone in a booth. And what about her? Zack took a quick glance. Her too. Yar looked at his drink in contemplation. Are like all human females lesbian? <laughs> what? No. Now her... Yar looked where Zack was glancing. A girl waved at him. She is totally into you, dude. He grinned. Okay, don't look now. But she has a friend. Zack chugged his drink in one go. Watch and learn, my furry friend. He sauntered over and smiled broadly. Hiya, ladies. Mind if me and my friend join you? We were waiting for you to say that all night. Yar took a seat next to Zack and they began to introduce themselves. 
Soon Zack had ordered a round of drinks and was telling the two women about their last mishap. And there I was, cultists on all sides. There must have been like 30 of them, just me and my pistol. I held them off long enough to let me and most of our crew escape. We did lose someone though. The two women made awe sounds. One of them, Mary, placed her hand on Zack. That was an interesting story. You know, there's a really nice spot not far from here that's really pretty at night. Care to join me? Zack grinned. He was very obviously drunk. Sure thing, sugar. Yara didn't even notice Zack and Mary's departure. Mary led Zack down a corridor and around corners of the large building that held most of the restaurants, and into a small back room. Zack grinned at her. What's all this about? Trying something? Hey! Mary said nothing as she slapped Zack's bare arm. What was the... what? Zack looked at where Mary had slapped him. A small device was stuck to his arm. What did you do? Zack fell over backwards as the device fed alcohol directly into his bloodstream. Mary searched his pockets. Now, let's see what you've got. Zack waved his arms around uselessly. Uh, stop. The last thing he saw before passing out was Mary scoffing at the contents of his wallet. Ha! <laughs> Atron money. Should have known you were a furry. That's a nice shirt, though. <laughs> Faldo and Terry were laughing so hard they practically fell into Terry's room. <laughs> I still can't get over the look on his face. Faldo fell onto the sofa, holding his aching ribs. <laughs> you can't blame him, though. <laughs> he knows nothing about human customs. Terry sat on the sofa next to him. He should at least have read up on it a little before. They burst out into another bout of laughter. When they finally stopped, Feldo noticed Terry's paw on his leg. She looked into his eyes. Feldo, you thinking what I'm thinking? Uh... Terry pushed him onto his back and lay on top of him. Terry? She began to unbutton his shirt, causing Feldo to stammer. Terry? W wait. Suddenly, she stopped. She had uncovered the large, jagged scar that ran down his chest. The skin had no fur, only a soft fuzz remained. Feldo quickly slipped out from under Terry and hastily buttoned up his shirt. Feldo! I'm sorry. I... didn't know. I mean, I don't care about the scar. Feldo kept his back turned. I have to tell you something. Terry sensed the serious air. Okay. I'm listening. Three years ago, I used to have a ship. It was a wonderful vessel, and I was her captain. Well, I'm not totally her captain. I had a co-captain. Feldo went back and sat on the sofa. My wife. Terry looked down. You're... married? Feldo shook his head. No, not anymore. We were flying some passengers back to Atria, and we were unexpectedly thrown out of hyperspace. Have you ever heard about Nocto? He was a pirate. Every captain's heard of Nocto. Feldo interlocked his paws. He boarded us. Instead of trying to do something about it, I ran and hid. I listened as he slaughtered my crew. My wife. He sniffed. When Nocto found me, he forced me to join his crew. So I became a pirate. He mostly kept me locked up in the engine room, but I still helped him. Well, that saved me. I stowed away on his ship and he helped me get away from Nocto. I thought, maybe I can atone by helping this guy. Maybe I can stop the guilt. They sat in silence for a long time. Finally, Fellow spoke again. Then we came here. When I first saw you, I... thought I was seeing a ghost. You looked just like her. I thought the universe was mocking me. I can't know you. I don't deserve it. Terry looked up. That's not true. I don't care what you did. And even if I did... It wasn't your fault! There was nothing you could have done to stop Nocto. You would have been killed! Sometimes I wish I was. Feldo stood and so did Terry, placing a paw on his shoulder. He shrugged it off and went for the door. Feldo... He left without another word. The very same night, Leff and Lena sat on an outside table for a restaurant Terry had suggested they visit. Leff held up a shrimp. They're kinda good. I don't know what Feldo was talking about when he said they were the best tasting things in the galaxy. Lena popped one into her mouth. I like 
them. They remind me of arrowfish. Huh, you're right. They do kind of taste like arrowfish. Lena sipped her wine. She was beginning to get a taste for it. I'll have to thank Terry later for recommending this place. She's a fun person to hang out with, and I've never had so much fun playing sports before today. Lef grinned. Was it fun? All I could think about was how good you look in a bikini. Lena slapped his paw playfully. Shush! Lef couldn't help but smile. You know, you remind me of my mother. She used to slap my paw when I was a kid when I did something wrong. I remember one time me and Sir Leah went climbing where we weren't supposed to. The back of my paw was red for a week. Where is Sir Leah anyway? I haven't seen her around. Lef waved his paw. Oh, she said something about climbing the mountains with a bunch of nomads. She'll be back in a day or so. You know, you haven't told me much about your parents. Lena sipped her wine again, this time taking a deeper drink. I never knew my parents. My mother died at childbirth and my father ran off someplace. I was shown pictures of them, but I don't remember them. Oh, I'm sorry for bringing it up. No, no, it's fine. Anyway, I'm done with my meal. What do you say we get back to the room? I'm tired. Lef grinned at her. How tired? Zack didn't know what was happening. The sun shone down onto his face, causing pain behind his eyes. He rolled over and realized he was lying on top of a stack of brooms. He stumbled to his feet. How much did he have to drink last night? He looked around. He was in a broom closet with a small window. He scratched his chest, noticing he wasn't wearing a shirt. He sighed to himself. Ugh. I gotta swear off drinking for the rest of this trip. He stumbled out of the closet and promptly vomited onto the floor. Frontier by Maggot Moshpit Chapter 9 The sun crawled through the room, touching a table, a chair, and eventually a bed. Soon, it reached the bed's sole occupant, snaking onto his face. This did not wake him, as he was already awake. Feldo let the sun dance across his face, the heat evaporating some of the moisture in his fur. His stomach grumbled, causing him to sigh. Feldo was no stranger to sleepless nights, but for the past month, his nights were actually spent sleeping. Absence did not make the heart grow fonder, in this case. He sat on the edge of the bed for a spell before the hunger drove him towards the dining hall. The hall was not full yet. It was still early morning, but the cooks were up and about, yelling at each other and setting out free breakfasts for all the guests. Fellow stacked a couple of eggs onto his plate and mumbled thanks to the nearest kitchen staff member. On his way back to his room, a voice called to him from his left. Sir! A hotel worker, fellow guest he was a receptionist, ran up to him. Is your name Feldo, sir? Yeah, that's me. I, I was told to give this to you, from someone called Terry. The man held up a note. She regrets she could not deliver it in person. Her fleet shipped out a few hours ago. Thanks. The man nodded and scampered off. Feldo briefly considered tearing up the note, but he knew he had to read it. He put it into his pocket and returned to his room, number 306. Once there, he poured himself some wine and drank it as he read the short note. I like you, Feldo. You're a nice guy. Maybe if you find yourself without work, find me. I could use a good engineer. Don't let the past block your path to the future. Terry Cassock. On the back was the name of Terry's ship, the Skylinks. Feldo read the note three times. He eventually put it onto his table and went for another drink of wine. Finding his glass empty, he grabbed the bottle. Left strolled briskly down the dusty path, the morning so still the landscape appeared almost picturesque. As he crested a shallow hill, he found he was looking into a valley overgrown with long grass and flowers. The valley's center had a large pen for animals, where the herd of Laxar grazed lazily. Before descending into the valley, Left took a quick photo to show Lena later. As he approached the pen, he heard laughter and noticed Rackham and Dee sitting on the fence. Hey, guys! Rackham turned around, almost overbalancing. Left! Up and about early, I see. Left jumped up onto the fence and sat with the two huskies. 
Yep, just getting some photos and taking in the scenery. D glanced around. Is Lena with you? Leff took some pictures of the Laxar as he answered. Nah, she wanted to go swimming with Taliko. Or rather, Taliko wanted to swim with her. D smiled warmly. She's grown up so fast. I remember when she was just a little kid like it was yesterday. Yep, we raised the last best we could. I just wish I could get my paws around Ray's scrawny neck. Now, now, no need to get worked up about it this early. Wait, wait, who's Ray? Leff asked. Rackham's face took on an embarrassed look. Oh, uh, Lena didn't tell you about her father? Then it dawned on Leff. Oh, Ray's her father. Yeah, she told me about him. Did you know him? Rackham huffed. Know him? <laughs> He rolled into town one day acting this big shot bounty hunter cowboy bullshit. D flicked Rackham on the nose. That's another ten credits. Aw, oh, hun. Rackham dug out a few credits and handed them over. Anyway, he comes into town, knocks up my good friend Lena. Obviously not the Lena you know. We named Lena after her mother, and he leaves without a trace. This information gave Leff a new perspective on his friend Rackham. Rackham didn't talk much about his past, and it seemed like the only reason Rackham was telling him this was because Lena was Leff's mate, perhaps as a warning. He nodded. I'll keep that in mind. As he spoke, Leff felt a cold chill pass through his fur, causing him to shiver. I thought there wasn't any wind on this planet. Brr. Rackham glanced at him. What are you going on about? There ain't no wind out here. Leff's head began to hurt, and a creeping dread once again occupied the corners of his mind. The wind picked up, and Leff hugged himself harder, shivering. What? You can't feel that? It's colder than the ice plains on Atria. D licked her paw and held it up. I'm sorry, Leff. We don't feel anything. The wind blew Leff off the fence, and the dread exploded in his mind, blackness enveloping the world. The darkness held nothing, save a vague impression of something, an idea, information. Then he understood. The world filled out, color returned, and Leff looked up into the concerned faces of Rackham and Dee. Blazes! Leff, what happened? Leff sat up and looked towards the Laxar pen. They're sick. Rackham glanced at the Laxar and back at Leff. What? What are you talking about? I think you're the one who's sick. Let's get you to a doctor. Dee, call someone! Leff stood and looked at the Laxar closer. They're sick. Dee, call the vet on this planet. Someone who has experience with animals. D had an SCOM out, but was unsure of what to do. Lev, what are you talking about? I'm sorry, but you might have just had a seizure. You need a doctor. Lev, seeing D was not about to call anyone, grabbed the SCOM from her and searched the local directory until he found the Center of Exobiology. Close enough. Rackham approached Lev with the intent of taking the SCOM, but Lev was too quick, darting away. Lev, what's gone into you? Ah, heck, I don't have my SCOM. Leff! Leff put the SCOM up to his ear and didn't even wait for a greeting before talking. You need to get the Frontier's Laxar herd into your lab ASAP. They have a disease that will render the entire stock useless as a source of food. No, don't ask me how I know. The stakes are too high. It's TZ8472 Parasite. If we don't act now, we can never cure them, and the colony I'm trying to establish will have to return to Atria to get a new herd. Okay, thanks. Leff walked back to where the two huskies stood, and handed the escom back to D. Rackham placed both paws on his head in exasperation. Leff, how could you possibly know the Laxar are sick? TZ8472 has no symptoms until the final stage. Leff thought about this, as if the fact he knew about it was of little importance, and he was just then realizing the hole in the logic of the situation. Well, I fell off the fence. Then, I knew. D was becoming more and more agitated. Spontaneous events and paradoxical situations made her uncomfortable. Are you... psychic? Not to my knowledge. Call it a hunch. A small ship flew overhead and sat down gently on the crest of the hill. A small figure emerged and made its way towards the pen, a case in its hands. Oh, Alright, what did you do this time? The human woman spoke, tossing the case onto the ground. She was short and tired looking, her hair dyed green. Rackham puffed out his chest. What's that supposed to mean? The woman opened the case and took out a heavy-looking medical scanner. Nothing. It's not my fault you Atrians can't take care of your livestock. 
Oh, God. The scanner had finished its diagnostic in a short few seconds. The screen clearly showed parasites riddling the endocrine system of the nearest Laxar. The woman grabbed her ESCOM hastily. This is Dr. Green. Transport Pen 15 to the lab immediately. And hurry! Rackham looked at the scanner's screen. Wait! Left was right? It is TZ-8472? Dr. Green packed up the scanner. Yes, and if we don't hurry, there's nothing we can do for the poor Laxar. When was their last exam? Rackham looked at his feet. Ah, uh, not since we left Atria, a little over a month ago. Dr. Green shook a finger in Rackham's face. Oh, you need to be more thorough, especially transporting livestock over long distances. I'm going to need a record of everywhere you've been. <sighs> in all my years as an exobiologist, I've never seen such incompetence. A large medical transport soon arrived, slowly flying to a spot a few feet away, causing a ruckus among the Laxar, who are not easily spooked. A team of people jumped out and began herding the Laxar onto the ship, using cattle prods. One of the men on the team approached Rackham. I assume you're Rackham, the owner of this herd? Rackham nodded. Yep, that's me. And you too. I'm transporting him and his herd along with the rest of his colony. And I'm his wife! The man turned around. Follow me. Lena sat with Taliko on the steps leading to the hotel. She impatiently kicked a stone down the steps. Where is he? He should have been back here half an hour ago. Taliko sighed. <sighs> Do you miss him that much, or is it something else? A large medical transport ship flew overhead in the direction Laugh went. Lena covered her ears from the noise. That's the second ship to go that way since he left. I'm worried. What if something happened? Only one way to find out. When that ship comes back, we'll follow it. Lena nodded. I just hope Left's okay. You guys are so cute together. But Lena wasn't listening. She was watching the horizon intently. Another half hour later, the medical transport returned, this time slowly heading in a different direction. Lena jumped up and dashed after it. Come on, Toliko! They ran down walkways and across streets. The transport set down near a building, luckily in view of the two foxes. They slowed to a stop outside the building, panting from the long run. Lena looked at the sign above the double doors. Center of Exobiology and Medical Exobiology. That's the study of alien physiology, right? Toliko shrugged. I don't know. Lena, having caught her breath, walked inside, swinging the doors wide open, Toliko in tow. The person at the front desk looked up at the two as they entered. He was Atrian, a fox with golden fur. Hello, what can I do for you ladies? That ship that just landed, it wouldn't happen to have a wolverine on board, would it? The fox shrugged. I wouldn't know. It took off to respond to a medical emergency at Pen 15. Medical emergency? Lena dashed past the desk and down a hallway. Hey, you can't go back there! The fox jumped from behind the desk and pursued her, Toliko following behind. He glanced back, noticing Toliko. What did I just say? Wait back in the lobby! Toliko laughed. <laughs> Hell nah, this is too much fun! Lena turned a corner and darted through a door, slamming into a Laxar with full force. Oof! Her vision was a field of stars as she lay sprawled on the floor. Lena, what are you doing here? Her eyes shot open. Lef, are you alright? Lef raised an eyebrow. I was just about to ask you the same question. Lena scrambled up and punched Lef on the arm. Don't ever do that again! Ow! Do what? The golden fox and Toliko came puffing into the hall. There you are! Lena didn't hear him. Disappear without telling me! I thought you were hurt. Lef was bewildered. I'm sorry, but there was an emergency with the Laxar. They're sick. Lena noticed the Laxar for the first time. The hallway was full of them, all being led towards a large holding pen. The golden fox stamped the floor. I don't know what's going on, but you weren't allowed back here. Rackham came down the hall and noticed the four. Taking in the situation at a glance, he smiled at the fox. <laughs> don't worry, they're with me. The fox looked at Rackham, ready to empty his spleen even further. However, he reconsidered this when he saw how massive Rackham was, and the fact that he was accompanied by Dr. Green. <sighs> well then, I bid you good day. He scuttled out of the room. Dr. Green sighed. <sighs> He's the most useless intern I've ever had. He's right, though. You shouldn't be back here. Leff waved his paw dismissively. This concerns them as much as it does us. Besides, that guy said we could come. Dr. Green folded her arms. 
I don't think this concerns you anymore. We can handle things from here. Your laxar will be treated by the time your stay is over. Out! She shooed them out the door and closed it behind them. Sir Leah strolled back into the hotel lobby, feeling refreshed. Nothing like a long period of strenuous activity to get the blood pumping, plus some special herb tea brewed by mountain nomads. Her fur was matted and caked with dirt in some places, and one of her ears was bound with a bandage. She whistled as the elevator took her up to her room, letting the heavy climbing pack on her back fall to the floor. She dragged it and herself down the hall and back up to her room, number 305. After a lengthy shower, she threw on some clothes and flopped into her bed, falling asleep almost as soon as her head hit the pillow. As Sir Leah's eyes shot open, the tinkle of glass could still be heard. She sat up and stretched, noticing it was late afternoon. She stood up and put her ear against the wall. She heard nothing. Perhaps it was just a dream. It wouldn't hurt to check up on her neighbor. She walked to the next door over and knocked. Hello? I heard a sound. Go away! Was that Feldo? I'm coming in. The door was unlocked, and Sir Leah entered the room, the smell of alcohol hitting her nose hard. Feldo? What's... what's going on? Feldo was slouched against the wall, a broken wine bottle spread across the floor. I told you to go away! Feldo was very clearly drunk. Sir Leah walked carefully over to a chair, turning it to face Feldo. In all the time she knew him, however short that was, she had never known him to be anything less pleasant than slightly annoyed. She tried to make her voice sound less shocked. So, something on your mind? Feldo picked up another bottle that sat beside him. It's amazing. These humans can make a drink that tastes like piss water, but still gets a body drunk. He drank deeply from the bottle before Celia snatched it away. Hey, get your own. Feldo, there has to be a reason you're spending your time drunk in your room. Reason? Feldo stumbled to his feet and leaned on the sliding door that led to his balcony. She wants a reason. I'll give you a reason. I killed her. She's dead because of me. Because I didn't do anything. Surlia had no idea what Feldo was talking about. Feldo whirled around. Have you ever lost someone? Surlia answered after a moment of silence. Yes, I know how you feel, Feldo, but... Did you cause their death? I don't think so. My body yearns for her. Every day. He opened the balcony door. I wanted a balcony. Sir Leah grabbed him and pulled him back inside, closing the door. Feldo tumbled onto the floor. He lay there for a long time, sobered a small amount. After a long time, Feldo spoke. I'm gonna start talking, and all I want you to do is listen. Sir Leah nodded. Keep this between us. But before I came aboard your ship... Left stood outside the police station, waiting in the light of a street lamp. Soon a man walked out and walked up to him. Hey, Left. This is becoming an occurrence that is too familiar. Any particular reason why he spent the day in the drunk tank? Zack smiled nervously and scratched the back of his head. Yeah, that's the thing. See, I... I don't remember. <sighs> Let's go. Zack followed left back to the hotel. You know, my wallet is missing too. Have you seen it anywhere? <laughs> it's karma. I didn't take his wallet! Yeah, whatever. They parted ways in the hotel lobby and Lef headed up to his room. Lena was lounging on the sofa, reading a book. Lef kissed her on the forehead and sat in one of the chairs. What you reading? Lena put down the book, saving her spot on the data pad. A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. Never heard of it. It was written by a human over 350 years ago. Some of the translations feel odd, but the ideas belong in a modern textbook. You'll have to let me borrow it sometime. Lena stared at the ceiling for a minute before speaking. I still don't get how you knew the Lexar were sick. I still find it hard to explain. I felt a weird feeling, then I... knew. Lena sat up. Weird how? Good? Lef shook his head. No, it was very unpleasant. A dread. Panic. Wait, you remember the first night we... spent together? Lef knew exactly what she was talking about. That morning, yes. It was similar, except I didn't get any information. But it did foreshadow Bowman's attack. Yeah, who knows? Maybe I'm just gifted. He stood and went to the bathroom to get some headache pills. Maybe it has something to do with these headaches. Two days later, 
the colonists all shuffled back aboard the frontier, sad to be leaving the lovely planet, but well rested and recharged. Lef, Sir Leah, and Lena all sat in the cockpit, waiting for the signal that everyone was back on board. Rackham poked his head around the doorframe. Everyone's here! I can say I'm sad to leave this place, but I hear Eden is just as beautiful. Lef pressed the intercom. We'll be taking off shortly. Fire it up, Zack. He switched it off. Well, let's get there then. Zack and Feldo, who were working in the engine room, engaged the atmospheric thrusters as Lef took them up. They headed back up to the cockpit, Zack nudging Feldo and grinning. Did you have a good time? It was... a time I won't soon forget. Frontier by Maggot Mosh Pit Chapter 10 The atmosphere inside the cockpit was that of another dull day flying in a straight line. Boredom and monotony was putting the crew on duty in a half-awake state, making course corrections and other duties on mental autopilot, waiting for their break. Zack began to disassemble his ESCOM for the third time that day when Lef, who was on break, burst into the cockpit waving a bottle of non-alcoholic imitation champagne. Happy two months! He shook the bottle and popped the cork, which almost hit Serlia in the head. Hey, what the hell, Lef? What? Everyone is so zombified and made up an occasion to celebrate, so... Happy two months into our journey! Lena sniffed the air. Is that... non-alcoholic? Lef poured himself a cup and tasted it. Blech. It has to be. The bubbles are nice, though. He handed them each a cup, which he took from the coffee maker. Zack held up his cup. A toast. The other three looked at him quizzically, Lena tilting her head. What? Toast? Like, toasted bread? A toast. You know, like, when I say some things and then we clink glasses. Celia downed her cup in one go. You humans have some weird customs. Her station beeped. Laugh, we're here. Laugh jumped into his seat. Peach, take us out of hyperspace. The ship slowed to a stop. Lena checked her instruments, puzzled. Um, there's nothing here. Lef switched on his view screen. This is what I wanted to show you. Come here. Still confused, Lena stood next to Lef and peered into his screen. I don't see anything. Lef clapped his paws excitedly. Exactly! No stars, no planets, nothing! Let me explain. We are right outside the area of space they call dead space. Inside there is nothing, not even any space dust. Anything that might have fallen off ships inside, not even the extremely low density, barely detectable gases that float around in normal space. All of it gets pushed to the outside, forming a fine film over the entire area which, as if to add atmosphere, blocks the light from anything outside dead space. The best part? No one has a single clue why it's here or what created it! The screen was completely black, and Lena got a chill down her spine. Is it dangerous? Left patted her on the back and laughed. <laughs> on the contrary, anything that could interfere with ship systems is absent from dead space. In fact, engine efficiency will be up 11% in there. Of course, if we hit the film in hyperspace, it would cause some serious trouble. So we have to pass through it with our ion engines. Lena returned to her station and powered up the engines, taking them in slowly. I don't read much about spatial anomalies, but I'll have to read up on this one. Serlia yawned as she watched through her view screen as a film of dust, gases, and metal bits flashed and glittered as the ship disturbed its equilibrium. It's a dry read. Mostly theories that make no sense and experiments that went nowhere. Zack frowned at her disapprovingly. I'll have you know I did a school project on dead space. It was very interesting, reading about the scientists in the shuttle that began to float outside of the anomaly, and they started freaking out and hugging each other. <laughs> anyway, it'll be a few days until we get through. Lena, take us back into hyperspace, and make sure you set the computer to drop out again once we reach the other side. The next night, Lef and Lena were relaxing, watching a movie in Lef's room. It was a documentary about early space civilizations, and how many of them fell. The credits rolled, and Lena nudged Lef, who had fallen asleep. <laughs> it's over already? I thought it was a two-hour movie. Lena giggled at his bewilderment. <laughs> you fell asleep halfway through. Ugh. Oh, I'm sorry. It was interesting, too. 
Especially the part about the people who almost discovered faster than light travel but destroyed themselves first. Was it just a dream, or did they say it was only a few light years away from Atria? Lena snuggled closer to him. Mm hmm. The probability of that is extremely low, too. He put his arm around her. Oh, I bet it is. Lef, report to the cockpit. Right after the message was delivered, Lef felt the ship drop out of hyperspace. <sighs> Damn. Duty calls. He stood up to leave, Lena staying on the bed. What, not coming? She grinned at him. They didn't say I had to go too. Besides, it doesn't sound urgent. Lef shrugged and headed to the cockpit. Feldo and Sir Lear were the only ones there, and they made their report. Lef, Feldo found something. Yeah, it was weird. I was just looking at the scans, and there was nothing. And there was something, just inside our sensor range. Lef took his seat. There isn't supposed to be anything here. Take us in. Lef, are you sure this is wise? We're just a cargo ship. We don't have any obligation to explore phenomena. Look, Sirlia, we don't know what that is. Who knows? Maybe it's a ship that needs our help. As they drew closer, Felda was able to get more detailed scans. It's a ship. Very low power signature. No distress call. Left shot Sirlia an I told you so look. See? She rolled her eyes. I'll try hailing them. Unidentified vessel, do you require assistance? She repeated the call three times. She was about to give up when she finally got a response. Uh, no thank you. Everything's perfectly alright here. We're all fine here, thank you. How are you? A male voice said, speaking Atrian. Surlia sat for a moment, stunned. We're... good. Uh, we won't be bothering you. Goodbye. The line was cut. Surlia looked at Lef with the same look he had given her. You were wrong. They don't need our help. Feldo wasn't so sure. They look damaged. They definitely need help. Surlia's console beeped. They're hailing again. On second thought, we do need help. The new voice, female and also Atrian, was cut off by the male voice. No! No, we don't! Ha <laughs> ha! Funny joke! Then, under his breath, Shut up, Meryl! Ow! There was a slapping sound. I apologize. My partner is slightly paranoid. But once he realizes we have no other choice but to trust a stranger or die... She emphasized the last word as if it was directed at the ship's second occupant. I'm sure he'll welcome the help. Lef and Surlia waited at the airlock, speculating about who could be behind it. What if it's another person running from a crazy cult? Oh, <laughs> I doubt it. They seem more like the eccentric traveler type. The airlock cycle completed and it began to open. We'll soon see. The door opened and two individuals stepped out, both dressed in heavy coats. One, a graying fennec fox who looked familiar to Lef, struck a ridiculous pose. Greetings! This is my assistant Meryl, and I, as I'm sure you know, am the famous bounty hunter Ray Phoenix! The female waved. She was a wolf with unusual purple fur. Left tilted his head and squinted his eyes. Ray Phoenix? Is that your real name? It does sound familiar. His eyes shot wide open with the realization. Wait! Ray! Everyone turned to the source of the shout. It was Rackham, and it looked like something had put the devil in him. He stomped towards Ray. Ray's ears went flat as he backed up. Well, hey there, big guy. Long time no see. I've got a question. Why does it look like you're about to kill me? Rackham had Ray backed into a corner. So Leah was about to attempt to break it up, but Lef stopped her, shaking his head. Meryl didn't seem to be too surprised someone was out to assault her partner. Rackham grabbed Ray by the coat and held him aloft. No, I don't suppose you know, do you? You didn't even stick around long enough to pay your bar tab! Ray struggled fruitlessly. I had somewhere to be. I was chasing a criminal. Tell Lena I said sorry for running off. I meant to return. Rackham shook him. Did you even stop to consider the consequences of your actions? Ray swallowed hard. Consequences? Lena is dead. She died giving birth to your daughter 20 years ago. You made a huge mistake, Ray. A huge mistake! Lef heard a noise behind him and saw Lena standing there, frozen in place, tail between her legs. Lef wheeled on Rackham and hissed at him. Rackham, shut up! Rackham turned his head. Tears began to form in Lena's eyes. I'm... a mistake? Rackham dropped Ray. No, that's not what I meant! But Lena had already run off. 
Lena, wait! Rackham ran after her, laugh as well. Ray sat on the floor, dazed both by being manhandled and with the sudden appearance of his daughter. Surlea looked at Meryl. This kind of thing happen often? Yep. Never with an illegitimate child, though. Ray looked at his paws. My boys can swim. Rackham had longer legs than Leff, and Leff caught up to him a full minute later, outside the guest room, which had been given to Lena when she began working for Leff. He gently knocked on the door. Lena! You know I never meant it like that! Lena's voice was filled with dismay. It's true! I was a one-night stand! A mistake that cost a life! Rackham opened his mouth, but he knew that, objectively, she was right. Leff stepped forward. Peach, that doesn't make it your fault. <laughs> <laughs> the sobs from the room filled Laugh and Rackham with dread. Zack walked up from his room to find out what the commotion was. Hey guys. The two both shushed him at once, and he put up his hands and walked towards his room. Left tried again. Peach. Go away! I, I need to be alone! Rackham and Left looked at each other, understanding passing between them. Left patted Rackham on the back. She'll be okay. It's not like this is news to her. Rackham shook his head. I know. I know. I did tell her the story, but it was just that. A story. To see her real father with me yelling all that damn fool stuff. <sighs> it would make the realization hit pretty hard. Leff nodded. Yeah, I'm going to discuss some things with Ray. Maybe you should cool off for a while. Rackham shook Leff's paw. Leff, you can be a real bastard sometimes. But you've been a good friend. They parted ways, Rackham heading back to the cargo bay and Leff heading back to the airlock. Once he arrived, he noticed a distinct lack of Ray, but Surlia was waiting there. She walked past him. They're waiting in the conference room. Leff followed her there, and as soon as he entered, Ray stood up. I need to talk to Lena. Leff sat down. That's not a good idea right now. The sudden appearance of her deadbeat dad has been a shock. She needs to be alone for a while. Ray reluctantly sat down. Can we talk about her? I mean, I never knew her. Meryl tapped the table, her long head fur flopping down over one eye. We have a job, Ray. We can't delay. He's getting away as we speak. He might even be out of dead space by now. Left folded his paws. So you are a bounty hunter. Who are you chasing? A human war criminal calls himself Texas Red. He escaped prison, killed 20 people, and somehow evaded both the Solar Federation and the Yerens. Meryl explained. Why the Yerens? Ray shrugged. Who cares? He has a huge bounty on his head, one I can finally use to retire. Been doing this for too long. You've... you never told me your name. It's Lef. Lef, you've got to continue our pursuit course before this guy gets too far. Meryl can show you the way. We have a tracking device on him. Lef nodded to Sir Leah. Take Meryl and go where she says. As soon as we get your ship running, you should leave. The two left the room. Speaking of your ship, Feldo and Zack will have it up and running soon. Feldo stood. Aye. Shouldn't be a problem. He went to find Zack. Left sat with Ray, unsure about how to feel. Ray was more pathetic than malicious, an old man who wasn't proud of his past. He coughed, bringing Left out of his quiet contemplation. So, can you tell me about her now? Left shrugged. All right. What do you want to know? Ray opened his mouth, but he didn't have anything ready. I don't know. I've never been a father before. Shit. Uh, what does she like? She's interested in all sorts of things, mostly to do with technology and physics. But she grew up with those farmers, I assume. Leff raised an eyebrow. The internet is a thing, you know. Oh, what about... Does she have a mate? If I was around, I... I would have taught her everything I know. She does have a mate. Ray grinned. Oh? Is he nice? He's me. The smile faded from Ray's face quickly. What? You're a... wolverine. Lef looked at him in a new light. Was this guy anti-intersubspecies? And? Ray averted his eyes. That's wrong. And that's your opinion. If Drifrasa intended subspecies to get involved with one another, she would have made them able to have children. <laughs> a religious bounty hunter. Well, I don't care about the downsides. I didn't choose to fall in love with her. Ray glared at him. I'm not getting into a debate with you about this. As long as... as long as she's happy. They sat in awkward silence for a while. So... do you think she'll want to talk to me? 
I don't know. Maybe. I really was going to come back. Lef blinked hard. His head hurt. I was going to visit her again. I... Lef's brain felt as though it was drowning in a sea of blackness. It was just... He opened his eyes. You're lying. Ray was stopped mid-sentence. What? You never planned to come back. You were just in town for some information, and you decided to have some fun. I have no idea. You thought, I'll just seduce one of these simple farmers and run off into the night. That's not true. The first time you thought about Lena since that night was when you first came aboard, when you recognized Ragum. You've got it all wrong. I... She meant nothing to you. Left was standing over the table, both paws slammed onto it. Ray was cowering into his chair. You couldn't possibly know that. But I'm right. I don't want you talking to Lena, but if she wants to, I can't stop her. Lef left Ray in the conference room to mull things over. Zack and Feldo dug around inside the Bounty Hunter's ship, becoming increasingly confused. Feldo pressed a button on a wall console, bringing up the specs of the system it controlled. This looks like the shields. Zack turned to look. But... I thought that one was the shields. He pointed across the ship to a similar console. These specs also showed transfer pipes running from the plasma reserves. Why would there be two shield systems? Why would one of them be tied to the drive? I don't know. Hang on, this looks promising. Zack pressed a button and a hatch opened in the floor, almost causing Felder to fall inside. After a minute, a giant coil of copper wire rose from the floor. Zack and Feldo looked at the thing, then at each other. Any idea why there's a giant electromagnet in the floor? Maybe. Feldo poked his head into the frontier and yelled down the hall. Mr. Phoenix, we could use some help. After a minute, Ray walked in. What is it? Hey, you need to fix the engines first. Stop playing with my plasma shields. Plasma shields? I didn't think they perfected those yet. As for your engines, there's nothing we can do. Feldo put his paws on the electromagnet in wonder. I was right. This is a plasma shield. If this thing actually works, that would explain why the engines don't work. Zack looked at him in shock. What? That's a leap of logic. Feldo brought up more information on the plasma shield console, an idea forming in his head. Let me explain it then. The plasma shield created a bubble of plasma around the ship by using that electromagnet, right? Ray puffed out his chest in pride. Yep, I even... An interesting property of plasma is it only needs a fraction of the energy to keep it going than what was used to heat it. Another interesting thing is, it absorbs energy from some types of weapons, especially ones designed to stun an opponent's ship with an EMP. It dawned on Ray. That son of a bitch Texas Red used an EMP on us! Yes, the extra energy held in the plasma fed back into the drive, not only breaking most of it, but also wiping the drive computer. In hindsight, you shouldn't have tied the shield directly into the drive plasma. Uh, that wasn't my idea. Zack shook his head. That was impressive, Feldo. Took me a second to figure it out, but yeah, we already knew what was wrong with your ship, and now we know why. You have to get your drive replaced. Ray did not like the idea. Replaced? That'll take weeks, and this guy is dangerous. We can't let him get away. You need to help us. Zack shrugged. Yeah, well, you'll need to talk to Lef about that. There's nothing else we can do here. Talk to Lef. Yeah, I'll just do that. Meryl and Serlia worked in the cockpit, trying to adapt the sensor array to the tracking device Meryl brought aboard. So, this Texas Red. I've never heard of him. A war criminal, right? Meryl pulled a strange instrument from her coat. Yep, the Solar Federation's bastard child and worst kept secret. You may not have heard about him, but you might have heard about what he made. Chameleons? Serlia was surprised. Chameleons were a deadly and very painful chemical anti-personnel weapon deployed by the Solar Federation during the war. They were impossible to see without equipment and delivered a deadly gas that turned the alveoli in the lungs to scar tissue. We're chasing the guy that made the chameleons? Why was he in prison? Meryl was facing away from Serlia, but she could hear the emotion in her voice. Aside from the inhumane thing he created, he made it his hobby to experiment on POWs. The Solar Federation says they didn't sanction his actions, but conveniently didn't catch him until the war was over. Serlia was thinking of what to say next when Zack came strolling casually into the cockpit. Hey guys, where's Lef? As soon as Meryl noticed Zack, she extended her claws and bared her teeth. Human! She pounced at him. 
Sir Leo is fast enough to cross-check her into a wall. Meryl, that's our engineer! He's with us! She stood and wiped blood from her nose. Ray was right. We don't need your help. She pushed past Zack and out of the cockpit. Sir Leo clapped her paws together. This is going about as well as can be expected. Frontier by Maggot Moshpit Chapter 11 The entire crew of the Frontier, minus Lena, and the Space Beagle, which was Ray's ship, sat around the conference table yet again. This time, there was quite a lot of glaring and dirty looks being shot around. Laff and Rackham were giving Ray the evil eyes from time to time, and Merrill was glaring daggers at Zack, who returned them. Celia stood and coughed. <coughs> we need to decide what to do. We are currently on the trail of Texas Red, and we need to decide before we pass the point of no return. I say we go after him. Leff held up his paw. I vote we kick them off the ship and not get involved. Aye! I second that! Rackham held up his paw as well. Merrill also held up a paw. Yes! Kick us out! I can't stand the smell any longer. Zack clenched his fist as Ray stood up and gestured wildly. Wait, wait! Think of what might happen if we don't catch him. He may experiment on more people. Then you won't get your money, is that it? Left sneered. Well... And what about our innocent people? There are over 60 colonists on this ship. A playground for any mad scientist. Ray's eyes shifted side to side. Well, maybe Texas Red isn't as dangerous as I made him out to be. <laughs> Sorry. Merrill muttered something under her breath that might have been, No, you're not. The only reason Texas Red was able to experiment on those POWs, Ray continued, was because he had his own soldiers to help him. And he only killed 20 people when a bomb he planted on a pursuit ship went off. Leff wasn't surprised. So you lied about that too? Just so we would feel obligated to help you? Ray's head hit the table. Yes, yes, fine, but he still poses a threat. What if he finds an unwitting colony and they take him in? Then people start to go missing. Feldo uncrossed his arms. I have to agree with Ray. We can get this guy on our terms before he has time to do anything. I remember being in a similar situation before, Leff. Did you help me just because you happened to like me a little more? Leff avoided Feldo's gaze. The stakes were higher then, but still Leff had risked everything to save Feldo's life. Zack seconded Feldo. I'm with Feldo on this one. Even if Meryl wants to rip my guts out, I don't want to rip out hers. Meryl stood abruptly. Then you can all go to hell. She stormed towards the door, but Ray stopped her. He took her out into the hall and had a hushed conversation. They returned. Meryl slumped down into her chair. Fine. Leff shook his head. Looks like we're voted out on this one, Rackham. Yep. If anyone comes near my colonists, though, they'll find out what the phrase walking pile driver means. Left stood, and anyone who wasn't already standing stood too. Let's get this show on the road. Lena sat in her cabin, wondering why she was crying. When she was just six years old, she asked Rackham why she wasn't a husky like him and his wife. He smiled, sat her down, and explained everything. After he had finished, he asked her if she understood, to which she replied, yeah, and ran off to play. Since then, the fact was simply that her mother and father were gone, and she never knew them. As she grew up, she never thought much about how it happened, or maybe if she wasn't born, her mother might still be alive. What Rackham said a short while ago seemed to make too much sense, so much sense it filled her with sorrow. She only existed because her mother was a little drunk, now dead. She only existed because maybe Ray was a little horny one night. Now her mother was dead. She only existed because one night, someone's judgment lapsed, or a condom broke, or the right perfume was worn, or... Now her mother died. It was thoughts like these that caused fresh fountains to spring forth from Lena's eyes. The cold, black realization that she took a life, her mother's life, however innocent she was. But as she thought about it more, the more she knew thinking about it wasn't going to change anything. And of course, there were the good things. Her life was fine, free from many serious troubles. She had a good family, access to a large library of knowledge to feed her interests. And Leff? None of it would be possible if Ray hadn't swung into town one day. Then again, if she didn't exist, she wouldn't be able to perceive anything anyway, and she wouldn't be having this crisis at all. 
Lena shook her head as the wells in her eyes dried. She wiped the last drops away and sniffed for the last time. She wanted to talk to Ray. He had some answers, anyway. The cockpit was abuzz with activity. The tracking device on Texas Red's ship was still in range, and to left surprise, they were gaining fast. Zack, Feldo, and Ray were working on a way to tie the Space Beagle's weapons into the Frontier's weapon controls. That way, if it came to a fight, it would more than triple their firepower, as the Space Beagle was fitted with the latest particle accelerator cannons. Leff piloted the ship himself, tracking the device on his screen. They would arrive within the hour. Merrill looked at the latest scan. Funny. Looks like he's not moving at all. Stay frosty, everyone. He might have a trick up his sleeve. Leff said as he gripped the wheel tightly. Ray was connecting wires from the Frontier's controls to a wireless uplink to his ship when he was lightly tapped on the shoulder. What is it? I'm busy- Oh. Hello, Lena. Lena was standing behind him, clutching her tail in her arms. I wanted to talk to you for a minute. If it's alright. Ray stood and called out. Meryl, take over here, will ya? Leff looked up as Meryl went over. Hello, Lena. Feeling better? Yeah. I'm sorry for- No, no, don't apologize. Leff then noticed Ray standing expectantly. A range of barely perceptible emotions played across his face, resting on a frown. Well, I won't keep you. He spun his chair and concentrated on the view screen. Lena turned to Ray, and they walked out of the cockpit. They took a stroll through the corridors of the ship. So, what did you want to talk about? Lena shrugged. I don't know. Anything? Why doesn't Leff like you? Ray looked straight ahead. Uh, he's just being... protective. Lena was too busy trying to come up with things to ask to notice Ray's blatant lie. Okay. Well, I would like to know what you're doing in the cockpit. It seems busy in there. Ray puffed out his chest. I'm a bounty hunter! I seek the scum of the universe and clean them! We just needed some help from Leff and Co. A bounty hunter? We aren't in danger, right? Nah, Leff's got it under control. Besides, I never let bystanders come to harm. They walked in silence for a while, neither knowing what to say. Ray finally spoke up. Shit! I don't know what you're supposed to say to a daughter you never knew you had. I don't think this is a good idea. Lena's face fell. What? I mean, I'm going to have to leave. I have a job. Maybe we should just... Lena was about to get angry at him when she realized he might be right. He missed 19 years of her life. He couldn't just jump in now. It was too late. You're right. Wait, I am? Lena nodded. I'm the pilot on this ship. We'll work together. But I won't expect you to be a father. That position is already filled. Ray nodded as well, perhaps a little too enthusiastically. I'm okay with that. I just wanted to say one thing. I regret not being there. He looked her dead in the eye, and she knew he wasn't lying. Thanks. To his surprise, she gave him a hug. A brief one. Hey, what was that for? Lena shrugged. I never got to hug my biological father. He looked confused. It's on my bucket list. Lena said. Ray felt the ship come out of hyperspace. Looks like we're here. Come on, let's get back to the cockpit. Back on the cockpit, Leff and Sir Leo were looking into their screens intently, Meryl hovering above them. Are you absolutely sure? It's clear as day. Texas Red gave us the slip. Meryl slammed her paw on the bulkhead. Shit! That slime ball! Ray caught her paw before she smote the wall again. Hey, never make a job personal. She glared at him. I told you that on our first job. And you were right. Lena walked over to Leff. I'd like to take my station now. Leff jumped up. Sure thing, Peach. We've been chasing a guy called Texas Red. You heard of him? Lena looked at the screen. A small chunk of metal was floating in space, probably towards the outer edge of dead space. Yes, actually. I read about him somewhere. He was in prison, right? Leff took his seat. Not anymore, apparently. Zack yelled, Aha! as power came onto his makeshift weapon tie-in station. Yes! I did it! I mean, we did it! Feldo was about to throw a screw at him when he added the last part. Yes. Anyway, we have access to the Space Beagle's weapons now. Though it looks like we won't need them. Texas Red shirked the tracking device. Merrill punched Ray on the arm. I told you to hide it better. I had like eight seconds. Lena had an idea, a brilliant one. Zack, why can't we normally detect dry fuel fumes? Zack scratched his head. Well, it's because it's basically nothing. 
Finding the drive runoff would be like looking for a needle in a cosmic haystack. Fellow chuckled. That's a colorful expression. Lena grinned. Well, here there is no haystack. Left snapped his fingers. Lena, your brain is so sexy right now. Sir Lea, find that needle. Sir Lea set the sensors for a very thorough search of the area. There definitely is a trail here, but it's been drifting for about an hour. Adjusting for the drift. Lena, set this course. She rattled off a string of numbers you wouldn't bother listening to anyway. Good job, Surlia. Peach, take us away. Maximum speed. Surlia smirked at laugh. <laughs> what? Is my brain not sexy too? The jump to hyperspace wiped the smile off Surlia's face, and she barely kept herself from vomiting. Laugh barely kept himself from laughing. Surlia, focus on measuring the age of the trail as we go along. See if we can't measure whether or not we're gaining on him. Fifteen minutes passed, the blackness outside making it seem as though they were static, the blackness causing any observer to look away after not too long. So Leah checked a graph she was constructing. Well, it seems like the age of the drive runoff, relative to the time it was produced, is steadily getting lower. We are definitely gaining on him. But there's something strange about this. If his ship was able to avoid capture for so long, it would need to be faster than a fully loaded cargo ship. Ray walked over and checked the graph. Hmm. We did get a few shots off at him in our last encounter. We must have hit something. Surlia shrugged. We'll find out soon enough. We're only 20 minutes behind him, and he's only making L to the third. We'll reach the border of the anomaly before that. There are a couple of planets nearby that can sustain life. None of them have any colonies or intelligent species, though. He may make a run for it. Try to repair his ship. He doesn't know we're behind him, after all. As they arrived at the edge of the anomaly, it was clear that a ship had passed through the film not too long ago. Celia looked at her scans, a smile spreading across her face. He didn't go back into hyperspace. His ion trail is clear as day, heading for the nearest planet. Ray grabbed his coat from where it rested. After him! We'll get the bastard this time! Lena carefully adjusted the drive for a very brief jump that would bring them alongside Texas Red's ship, seemingly from nowhere. Celia braced herself, and Lena engaged the drive for a short five seconds. When they came out of hyperspace, they were directly alongside Texas Red's ship. Left sprang up. Captaining a ship was never dull for him, quite the opposite. Everything he did was a constant source of excitement. Open fire with the particle accelerator cannons! Target the weapons! Fellow looked through the manual viewfinder, necessary due to the arrangement they had. Before he fired at the ship's weapon array, he swore he could see Texas Red in his underwear, staring in disbelief out a window at the Frontier and the Space Beagle. The cannons glowed, then two blue streams of pure energy shot out, carving a swath across the weapons of Texas Red's ship, smashing the particles together so that they were so dense they appeared to vanish, but in reality they were simply squished back into the ship, the metal glowing white hot. So powerful was this blast that some of the metal was smashed into different elements, which decayed quickly. Texas Red was not about to stick around for round two, and he powered up his ion engine and pushed it to its limit, heading into the nearby planet. Ray jumped up and down. Merrill, we're going down there after him in the Space Beagle. Lena piloted the Frontier into an orbit, and by the time they were ready, Texas Red had already landed. Ray rummaged around in his coat and pulled out a shotgun. Lef, we could use some extra paws. He pumped the shotgun. Sir Leah ogled the gun in Ray's paws. Is that a shotgun? Ray grinned. Good eye there. Yep, this is the last chemically propelled projectile weapon produced on Atria. She's never let me down yet. Meryl pulled Ray along as she rolled her eyes. God, sometimes I wonder if you've got some kind of gun fetish. Sir Leah followed him. Lef, I'm going with you. Lef was still sitting in his chair. Uh, okay. Zack, you've got command. Oh, and Lena? She looked up. Lef messed with her head fur. Fancy flying there, Peach. Thanks. The space beagle barely flew but it got them through the atmosphere safely enough. On the way, Ray and Surlia sat polishing their guns, Ray with his shotgun and Surlia with her less impressive energy pistol. Left could see, even as she piloted the ship, that Merrill also had a holstered gun, and was tapping it absentmindedly. Hey, I don't have a weapon. Ray tossed him a pistol he pulled from his coat. There. Left looked at the tiny thing, and Surlia chuckled. What is that? A point thirty eight special? Ha <laughs> ha! You really know your gun history. I'm guessing you work security somewhere. Yep. On a cargo ship for four years. Lef turned the gun over in his paws. So, is it a thirty-eight special, or...? Surlia looked at him like he had just grown a second head. The .38 special is a 400-year-old gun. 
It wasn't very effective, but yeah, that's pretty much its equivalent. Great. With a bump, the Space Beagle landed on the surface of the planet, throwing up dust and debris. Everyone locked and loaded their weapons and stepped towards the ramp. Merrill opened the door and stepped out into the dusty desert air. The sun beat down on them as they trekked along the sand dunes. The heat was sweltering. Lef wiped his brow. I can't believe Terra is full of deserts. If Atrio was this hot, we wouldn't have evolved to have fur. That's a weird mental image. Lef's odd comment garnered a glance from Serlia. You all right there? Heat getting to you? Lef waved his paw. Nah. Ray pointed towards a flat plain of sand. A ship rested there, silent and still. There he is. I can taste the credits now. The flat plain was surrounded by dunes, and so they lay on the closest dune and watched the ship. Nothing happened. The ship was dead and no one came out. Merrill studied the ship through a pair of binoculars. Maybe he walked into the desert? Ray stood up. He's not that stupid. He must be inside. Carefully and silently, they surrounded the ship. The doors were closed and showed no evidence of ever being open. Solia walked along the outside of the ship as the rest tried to pry the doors open. She noticed an alcove on the side of the ship, with a hatch inside. The hatch was open, and the inside showed signs of explosive decompression. The realization hit Serlia like a freight train. It was an escape pod. She ran back up the dunes towards the ship. Guys, Texas Red used an escape pod. I don't know how I missed it, but if he gets to the ship... It was too late. Texas Red stood in the cockpit of the Frontier, a laser pistol with 20 notches on it pointed at Lena's head. Zack tried his best to keep cool, attempting to talk him down. Slow down there. You don't want to do anything you'll regret. Texas Red pressed the gun harder against Lena's temple, her face a mask of fear. Feldo moved towards the door. Texas Red pointed at him. Ah, ah, ah. No one moves. I wouldn't hesitate to kill any of you. But someone would hear the shot. You, Fox. Take us away from the planet, and don't try anything. Your life is worth nothing to me. Lena didn't move. Feldo looked at the situation and saw history repeating itself. He put a paw behind his back. Lena, do what he says. Zack took a step closer as Lena set an escape course. I'm interested in hearing your rationale about that, Texas Red. Can I call you Texas? Texas Red glared at him. My real name is Robbins. Zack spread his arms. Robbins, nice to meet you. I'm Zack. I'd like to hear why our lives don't matter. Robbins smiled. First of all, you're all Atrians. Zack felt his skin. Did I forget to wear my fur today? You're no better. You've clearly lived with these people for far too long. You act like them. When was the last time you celebrated your birthday? We don't... Zack frowned. Robbins chuckled, then laughed. You don't celebrate your birthday... Because you're an Atrian! Zack shrugged. So what? Atrians are intelligent beings, just like you. Robbins nodded. Yes, and then we come to my second reason. My work is very important. I must continue it. As this exchange was going on, Feldo inched closer and closer to the closest console. Zack walked around Robbins so that his attention would be away from Feldo. Oh? I am on the verge of a revolutionary discovery. He leaned closer to Zack. Immortality. It was Zack's turn to laugh. <laughs> That's a pipe dream. If it was, would I do all this? I am so close to making humans immortal, and finally recognized as a superior race. Lena managed to speak. Immortality is a curse. Being cognizant for long enough would break a person. Robbins pressed the gun harder still. That is the brilliance of my research. It protects against this. You'll see. You'll see. Feldo switched on the intercom, and every word spoken was heard throughout the ship. Unfortunately, the intercom beeped when it came on. Robbins whirled around. What did you do, you miserable fairy? Feldo held up his paws. Nothing. But they could all hear the reverb as every word echoed throughout the ship. Robbins was furious. You idiot! Now you will watch your friend die! The next few events happened quickly and at the same time. As Robbins whirled around to shoot Lena, Rackham came bursting through the door, swinging a box. This caused Robbins to flinch, but he still shot Lena, who ended up on the floor. Rackham roared a mighty roar and threw the box at Robbins, smashing it over his head. Robbins sprawled on the floor and Rackham jumped on him, holding him up and punching his face repeatedly. 
You son of a bitch! You shot her, you! He stopped punching. Robin's face was bloody and bruised even after the short time, and he coughed blood onto Rackham's shirt. Felda was crouching next to Lena as he looked her over. You okay? Lena was clutching her ear. He missed me by an inch. Ow! She let go of her ear. It was burned, and a semicircle shape had been punched into it. Feldo sighed with relief. Well, at least the laser cauterized the wound. Rackham, Lena's fine. Let him go. Rackham took the laser pistol and tossed Robbins onto the ground. Left Sir Leah, Ray, and Merrill burst through the door, guns at the ready. Left saw Lena on the ground, and he rushed over. Lena! God, what happened? Your ear! He crouched beside her. It's nothing, Lef. Just a flesh wound. Oof! Lef hugged her tightly. I'm sorry for letting him get so far. I should have seen it coming. He could have killed you. Robbins coughed and staggered up. You brute. Do you know what you've done? Rackham grabbed him and pushed him at Ray. Here's your quarry. Take him and go. Ray produced a pair of paw cuffs from his coat and bound Robbins. All right, creep. You're letting me retire. He gave the cuffs lead to Merrill. Take him to the ship and send a message to the Solar Federation. Use the code word. Don't want any other bounty hunters to show up. Ray sat by Lena, still locked in Lef's embrace, as Merrill dragged Robbins off. Well, I'll be leaving now. Maybe I'll visit you sometime. Lef let go of Lena and held out his paw. Ray, I know we don't see eye to eye, but... good luck. Ray laughed and shook his paw. Thanks. Take good care of Lena. Goodbye. He stood and ran after Merrill. Lef looked at Lena's ear again. Man, and I really liked your ears too. She felt the edges of the wound. I think it would look cool. A chip in my ear. Lef helped her up, even though she didn't need help. Let's continue on, shall we? She took her seat. Yep. Felda took a station. Some small part of him was healed, seeing that he was able to, at least this time, prevent disaster. Light years away, back in dead space, a single metal plate floated in the blackness, a battery-powered running light flashing on its surface. The plate had fallen off the frontier during flight, and now it drifted towards the edge of the anomaly. The running light blinked out momentarily, as if something had passed in front of it. The plate was abruptly engulfed with blackness, then gone. Not a trace of it remained. Frontier by Maggot Moshpit Chapter 12 General Nephron sat in the High Council chambers, reading endless war reports, casualty lists, and projections. He was beginning to grow weary of this daily ritual. The rebel factions had gained another few kilometers of land and showed no signs of slowing down. He stroked his long, white beard which protruded from his large, wrinkled chin. Any human, or perhaps a knowledgeable Atrian, that saw him might mistake him for a large monkey, but with a nose that caused his face to look arrow-like. No inch of skin was without hair, all white or brown, and there was no real way of predicting which one it might be. A noise disturbed his reading, and a herald hurried into the hall, rung a small bell, and knelt at his feet. General, your wife to see you. General Nephron waved his hand, and the herald quickly retreated. A tall woman strode into the room, wearing a massive billowing garment that defied definition. My husband, must you sit in here all day and read those reports that foresee doom? Come, spend some time with your children. Nephron blew air out of his nose, making a hissing sound. My wife, the rebel factions grow in strength each day. I must do my duty lest they march into the capital and slaughter us all. His wife had not come into the room seeking his presence, but rather to have him assure her that the war was going well. Upon seeing her downcast face, he quickly reassured her. But never fear. Soon enough, we will have the troops back from Sim, and with them, General Helene, a brilliant strategist. We will soon crush the rebel factions and restore this great nation. She smiled. Yes. And then you will come play with the children? Absolutely, my wife. The herald ran back into the room, rang the small bell again, and knelt before the general. General, sir, our scouts report a strange light in the sky. It seems a star has fallen to the ground. The general couldn't believe his ears. A star, you say? Are you sure the scouts have not been drinking too much wine? The herald held his arms up. 
They describe with great detail how the stars streaked across the sky before slowly falling to the ground in the fields west of the capital. I have your ride arranged, if you would like to make the discovery yourself. He bowed to his wife. I shall. Tell someone to finish up those reports. He stepped smartly through the door, down corridors, and out into the streets. The streets in front of the high council chambers were bustling, young soldiers patrolling with their rifles slung over their shoulders, children running across the streets, and automobiles skidding along the roads, electric motors humming. Steam rose from a nearby vent in the ground. Underground restaurants were very popular these days, Nephron thought to himself. He climbed into his car, a spidery contraption, metal sticking out at odd angles to accommodate the average size of any given occupant. Two soldiers sat in the back with him, and one more drove. One of them bowed as best he could in the car. General, I'm from the Scout Regiment. Tell me what you have seen. The car sped off down the road towards the western fields. The soldier looked apologetic as he bowed a second time. Nothing personally, General, but I can attest for the accuracy of my comrade's statements. A star did fall from the sky. The general's time was precious, and he frowned at the soldier. If this is a useless endeavor, I will be very cross. The soldier closed his eyes tightly. Y yes General. The car bumped along the roads, heading into the countryside. The road was dusty and not well kept, but it led them close to the site of the reported fallen star. The four climbed out of the car and were greeted by another soldier. His face still held the wonder of the spectacle he allegedly witnessed. General Nephron, sir? You won't believe this. I'm starting to agree with you. Take me to the star. The soldier led him through the woods as he babbled his report. Sir, it's not a star anymore. We watched it from the woods as it glowed, but it soon began to cool off, and we saw fine details, windows, and other such things. It's a building, sir. Two of the other soldiers gasped. Could it be the star cutter of lore? The general scoffed. There is no such thing. The soldier who had spoken jumped. Yes, sir. It is only the product of an overactive imagination. Y yes, sir. It is. They reached the clearing, and General Nephron looked across the field and beheld the star cutter of lore. By God, you're right. There it sat, like a giant building, with three sections, two of them longer and thinner, the center fatter and shorter. The general smiled. Perhaps we found the solution to our rebel problem. Divine intervention. Lef clung to his seat, staring intently into the screen, still not believing they had actually landed without any damage. Lena was practically frozen in place. Her paws gripped the wheel tightly her blood pumping fast in her veins as the adrenaline ran its course. Left turned to Zack. Did we make it in time? Zack pressed a few buttons and looked at the data on his screen. Yes. The hold breach didn't have time to widen enough to do any permanent damage. Left quickly hit the intercom. Rackham, report to the cockpit. Rackham looked like hell. His eyes were red from being in a pressure-free environment, and capillaries all over his body had burst, bruising much of it. He was supporting Sirlia, who showed similar effects. Leff jumped up as he saw them. I told you not to stay in that bay too long. Rackham shrugged. We had to get my people out. Luckily we did. No one's been hurt any. Cerlia slumped against the wall. I still don't understand it. Where did that breach come from? I think it's just because the ship is old. Though, I thought they built them tougher than this. It doesn't even have emergency bulkheads. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had to land. Lena finally relaxed, but soon a realization hit her. Zack, did you complete the scans of this planet? Zack checked his console. Uh, yeah. Oxygen, nitrogen, atmosphere, dense vegetation, humanoid life. Left, they don't have space travel yet. What? Are you sure? He double-checked the scans. Yep. We're in big trouble. Rackham was not well-versed in interstellar law, and he looked around in confusion. What, what, what are you going on about? Left ran his paw through his fur in exasperation. It's illegal to in any way influence any alien culture that doesn't have space travel yet. There is some leniency when it comes to emergencies, but not much. We have to get out of here. Fast. He turned to Zack. Zack, find Feldo. Fix the hull breach as fast as you can. Lena, find out whether we've been found yet. Celia tried to climb to her feet. But that's... my job. Left caught her before she fell to the ground. You're in no shape to do any job. Come on, D will patch you up. He practically carried her out the door. But she is not even a real doctor. Rackham followed them. She's as close as it gets. Don't worry, we'll have you good as new in no time. 
Lena was alone in the cockpit. She sat in the co-pilot seat and ran a scan of the area. Unfortunately, it seemed that the sensors were offline, and they only fed her a string of impossible data. She frowned. It looked like she would just have to look out the windows. The cockpit windows were closed automatically as the ship's external temperature rose to critical levels, ensuring the interior of the ship remained protected during re-entry. Lena opened one such window and looked out into the woods. The trees twisted and wound around each other strangely, almost as if they were one tree and not many. The plant life fascinated her so much she didn't notice the four men standing below her, watching. When she glanced down, she locked eyes with General Nephron for a long second, before jumping back away from the window and quickly closing it again. She ran out of the cockpit and down the hall towards where the colonists were relocated. General Nephron looked at where Lena had been only moments before. What a strange beast. The two other soldiers cowered with fear behind the general. Did you see those teeth, sir? One of them stammered. This entire situation intrigued the general. He knew the creators of his world would not act with aggression, but why they would keep pets was beyond him. Yes, it seems to be a carnivore. Strange, it seemed to be walking upright. Only omnivores stand upright. Perhaps it is another creation of the stars? But where are the stars? Should they not have made their intent known by now? The general wheeled on the soldier. Fool! They will show themselves when they see fit. Go back to the capital, get the ambassador and the press. This must be made known. The soldiers scuttled back into the woods while somehow also bowing. Nephron walked around the star cutter of lore, examining the strange symbols, odd protrusions, and strange angles. The remaining two soldiers following behind, not wanting to abandon their leader, but also staying cautious. Nephron eventually came to a spot on the wall of the star cutter which appeared to be a door of some kind, judging by the seams in it. Is this a door? If it opened, it would be very difficult for someone to use it. It's almost five feet off the ground. The general thought about this. Hmm. The stars may not need solid ground to walk on. They must float. The two soldiers nodded at the general's wisdom. A panel caught the general's eye. What's this? He walked up to it, running his hand over the metal covering. To his surprise, the panel fell off, revealing a lever. He studied it for a time, then pulled it down with some difficulty. There was a loud hissing sound, and the general jumped back from the wall, the two soldiers frozen in place. Soon the ramp came down, exposing the interior of the ship. It was a ramp, the general muttered to himself. He and the two soldiers slowly ascended the ramp. Are you sure they saw you? Left sat with Lena as the bustle of colonists moved here and there, either receiving treatment from D, who had her paws full, or moving their belongings back into the converted cargo bay. She nodded. Yes, they looked like military men. I should have been more careful. Now, now, none of that- <clears throat> Left clutched his head, a familiar, unwelcome feeling sweeping across his mind. Lena grabbed his arms. Left, is it- Lena's voice was coming from the end of a long, dark tunnel. He followed her voice. When he emerged from the tunnel, he saw her face, ears back, the look on it showing concern. Peach, the loading bay. Left, are you okay? You blacked out there for a moment. The bay, the loading bay. What? Did you see something? We have visitors. He stood and walked towards the door. Get Zack and tell him to bring one of the translators we got on Koron 4. Bring him and the device to the loading bay. But... Just go. I'll be fine. Lena stood there for a second, then went to do what she was bid. Left headed for the loading bay, making sure he had the small energy pistol Ray had given him. The general and the soldiers looked around the interior with awe. To them, all the lights, panels, and consoles all looked as though they had religious significance, or perhaps held great power. Soon Left stepped from a door and confronted the two. One of the soldiers pointed his gun at Lef, but General Nephron swatted it away. Lef frowned. The general made a series of clicking sounds that might have been a language. Lef smiled and held out his paws. Now, gentlemen, we... uh... come in peace. The general took a step back as Lef smiled. Although Lef couldn't understand exactly what was said, from how the general reacted, he knew something frightened him. The general pointed to his own mouth. Leff realized he was baring his rather imposing teeth at the general, and he stopped smiling. Sorry, 
Um... Leff took a step forward. The two soldiers took a step back, the general standing his ground. Leff extended his paw to the general. He looked at it curiously, looking at each of his fingers, and the pad on his palm in digits. He looked at Leff, then at his paw, then slowly extended his own hand, which only had four fingers. Leff took it and shook it firmly. The general looked shocked, but he saw Leff's positive reaction and smiled too. Leff put his paw against his chest. Leff. The general took a few seconds to get what Leff was trying to say. Leff. Leff spoke the syllable slowly. Leff. Leff. Leff nodded. Yeah, there you go. My name's Leff. What's yours? The general was about to introduce himself when Lena and Zack came into the room. This better be... Oh, wow. Zack looked at the aliens with wonder. They look like monkeys. The general pointed at Zack. Uh, Zack, this'll be easier with that translator set up. Leff watched the general's increasing agitation, the two soldiers behind him inching closer and closer to the end of the ramp. Zack walked up to the general and held up the device. The general looked at it like it might explode. Zack nodded. Yeah, just keep talking. He gestured at his mouth, miming words pouring forth. Lena watched with fascination as the general just kept talking. His anatomy was similar to other races, but the differences were clear. It was this type of discovery she couldn't get enough of. The general's words began to make sense. Star. What? God's help. Zack looked at the tiny screen. It's almost done. The general's eyes opened wide as he pointed at Zack. Understood. Yep. We'll be able to understand each other soon. Leff looked at the state of the general and his soldiers. He knew the cultural contamination was already bad. Very bad. Then what? Do we just... up and leave? The general waved his arms. No, don't leave. Heralds of the Stars, we need your help. Lena stepped closer. Heralds of the Stars? What do you mean? The general pointed at her. You! Do you not bring with you the great stars to aid us in our war? War? No... I mean, we do come from the stars. Lef cut in. What she means is we're leaving very soon, so just forget you saw us and never speak of this to anyone. The general looked at Lena's chest, puzzled. Did you say she? You truly are strange indeed. Lena crossed her arms. Hey! We're aliens! Don't expect us to live up to your unrealistic standards! Peach? The general was taken aback. Aliens, you say? So, you aren't from the stars? Zack waved his arms. Now wait, we didn't deny it. The general drew his sidearm. Enough of this! It is clear by everything, your language, appearance, and ignorance, that you are not from the stars. Therefore, it is my duty to take you in for questioning. Take them away! The two terrified soldiers gained some confidence from the boldness of the general, and they marched up the ramp, guns at the ready. Leff was desperate, so he bared his teeth and growled as loud as he could. The two soldiers backed up, but the general pushed them forward. Don't be fools. If they make a move, shoot them. The soldiers grabbed Lena and Zack, and the general took hold of Leff. Is there any more on this vessel? Leff shook his head. No, it's just us. They were pushed and shoved off the ship. Nephron replaced the lever, and the ramp closed. As they were pushed through the woods, they met up with another group of aliens. They stopped dead when they saw who the general was escorting. One of them took what seemed to be a photograph. Nephron bowed to them. Ambassador Buta, do not be alarmed. The ambassador was very, very short, and also old. He wasn't lacking in gusto, however. What is the meaning of this? These are not stars. Nephron held up his arms and bowed again. My apologies. The reports about the stars are a result of the scouts having an overabundance of seal. Buddha stomped his foot. Then what are those? The general bowed again, as if it would calm the ambassador down. Aliens, ambassador. The ambassador did something unexpected. He turned around and walked away, muttering, I'm going back to bed. The general called after him as more soldiers filed in beside them. We'll have this cleared up, ambassador. They were led along further. Zack looked over at Lena. Nice going. Leff glared at him as Lena looked at the ground. Shut up, Zack. You aren't helping things. Zack glared right back. Don't you think you're a little biased? She messed up. Let her take responsibility. Leff was about to make a retort when Lena put a paw on his shoulder. He's right, Leff. 
I shouldn't have said anything. Sorry. He took her paw. Something tells me he would have dragged us off regardless. You might be right. What's the plan? I told Celia not to bother us, but she'll get worried soon enough and find us gone. Maybe they'll come rescue us? Quiet! No talking unless spoken to, one of the soldiers yelled. They kept quiet, and soon they were shoved into a large automobile with a flatbed in the back. It hummed and sped off towards the capital. Serlia sat on a crate near the door leading to the loading ramp. She had been treated, though there wasn't much Dee could do. Luckily, her injuries were mostly superficial. She checked the time on her escom. It was time to check on them, even though Zack warned that the more the not merrier. She stood shakily and went through the door. Nothing. Not a sign of anyone. Not a speck. She ran as fast as she could back into the ship. Rackham, we've got a problem. Frontier by Maggot Moshpit Chapter 13 Serlia, Rackham, and Feldo sat around the conference table, desperately trying to think of what to do. Feldo tapped his fingers on the table. Before long, more of those... Uh, computer says they're called celestial lights. Feldo struggled to pronounce the word. Anyway, more of them will show up to strip the ship or blow it up or something. Who knows how they think. Well, I locked the loading ramp so they can't get in as easily. Rackham was a man of action, and he slammed his paw on the table. I say we just fly the ship to wherever they went, grab them, and then run! Feldo shook his head. We can't fly now. I haven't patched up the ship yet. Without Zack, this would take twice as long. Even with a short atmospheric flight, it might make the breach worse. Besides, we don't know where they've been taken. He thought for a moment. Maybe we can sneak around or something. I don't know. Rackham shrugged. I'm not the plant type either. What do you think, Serlia? Feldo turned to her. Yes, the acting captain now. What do we do? Serlia didn't know. When she signed up for this, she knew she would have to give all the commands in this exact situation, and she thought she was ready. But now she drew a blank. She turned away and faced the wall. Huh. Give, give me a second, okay? What would Lef do? Probably crack wise and come up with a brilliant plan that would get them all killed, but pull it off in such a way that it didn't. He was probably thinking of a way to escape now, or was being tortured for information. Serlia shook her head. Now is not the time to let worry cloud her judgment. Feldo looked at her curiously. Are you alright? I'm thinking. Okay, the first order of business is to find out where they were taken and how much danger they're in. Um, how do we do that? Well, we can't question anyone. We're making the cultural contamination worse. We would use the sensors if they worked. Unless... Feldo said as he stroked the fur underneath his chin. Unless what? Sarlia leaned over the table intently. The escape pod. It's basically a little shuttle. It's got its own sensors and even weapons. It's also designed to withstand the re-entry. So it wouldn't have gotten damaged. Sarlia clapped her paws together. Okay! That's somewhere to start. Get on it, Feldo. Rackham, you might want to explain the situation to the colonists. Rackham nodded as he and Feldo stood to do their tasks. Celia smiled to herself. She was getting the hang of this. She was about to follow Feldo when two people entered the conference room. It was Taliko and Yar. Celia crossed her arms. What can I do for you, kids? Taliko carried an air of confidence, and Yar stood behind her unsuccessfully trying to copy her sure-footed stature. Taliko pointed at Serlia and declared, We want to help. Y yeah. Serlia didn't have time for this. Look, I know Lena is your friend, but I really need to concentrate and I can't be babysitting you. Yar went for the door. Yeah, whatever you say. Taliko pulled him back. We aren't kids. We can be valuable to you. I've been told that I'm pretty smart. And even though Yar here is the coward and has a huge crush on you, he's the strongest guy I know. Baron Rackham, of course. Yar punched Taliko on the arm, then turned to Serlia. You have to let us help. Serlia sighed. Fine, but I don't have anything for you to do. Taliko pumped her arm. Yes! I'll go help Felda with the sensors on the skate pod. She ran off, Serlia calling after her. Wait, do you know anything about that? Taliko called back. Nope. Yar watched her round a corner. I let her go. She won't get in the way. Probably. She's just worried about Lena. And the other two, of course. 
Celia sat down at the table, a new respect for Lef's job forming in her mind. You don't have to worry about Lena's safety. Lef will protect her with his life. Call it a virtue or a flaw. Yar hesitated for a moment, then sat down too. Uh, sorry for eavesdropping. Only half of Cerlia was paying attention to him. The rest was developing a rescue plan for if Feldo found where Lef was. Yeah, no problem. Maybe you can help me think of what to do. Yar looked surprised. Wait, you don't already know? Hell no, I don't know! Lef usually handles this part. I didn't sign up for this whole thing to almost get eaten by cultists, almost restart the war, crash land on an alien planet, and probably get arrested for fucking up an entire culture and get my best friend, his mate, and Zack killed! Cerlia realized she was venting to someone she didn't even know that well. She sighed. I'm sorry. You probably don't want to hear it. Yar tried to put on his best supportive smile, but ended up looking nervous. Uh, no, no, it's fine, really. But we should focus on, you know, saving everyone. They fell silent, deep in thought. Cerlia looked at Yar after a while. Hey. Hmm? Eyes up here. The cell was cold and damp, the floor made of some sort of straw. Lef, Lena, and Zack sat on the dank floor, contemplating their fate. When do you think they'll interrogate us? Zack shrugged. I don't know, but it won't be soon. This is a tactic, like you see in the movies, let you rot a bit in the dungeon, then interrogate you when you're cold and hungry. Lena shivered, her body was not accustomed to the cold, as her subspecies mostly evolved in the hottest parts of Atria. You would think that they treat us m m more like guests than prisoners. Lef went over to Lena so he could share his body warmth. He looked over at Zack. Zack, get over here. You'll freeze to death. Nah, I'm good. Thick skin is as good as any coat of fur. The particular dungeon they were in was silent, save the occasional snore from the cell across from them and the shuffling from a nearby guard. Time passed slowly, and after a time the snoring stopped, and someone stirred in the other cell. The someone grunted and hauled himself into a sitting position. The guard must have been given the translation device, because the three captives could understand their dungeon mate. Uh, guard, I've <laughs> sobered up. Let me out. The guard was trying not to stare at the strange things in his cell, and he was glad to have someone to distract him. Uh. No, you need to learn your lesson. Ah, come on, Jadigar. I... By the stars, what are those? The drunk was completely sobered as he laid his eyes on the aliens in the cell next to him. The guard rattled the bars with some sort of sword. Quiet! They are simply criminals. Down here, that's all they'll be. Lef waved at the drunk. He waved back, then fainted. General Nefron stood in the Capitol building's yard, often used for training by the elite soldiers in his army. As such, many straw men were set up. Beside Nefron was his closest advisor, Xerix, Ambassador Buddha, three of his most trusted captains, and the Herald. They had all gathered around a small table, on which sat Lef's pocket pistol, small and unimpressive for any spacefaring race, but strange and potentially very, very dangerous in the wrong hands. Nefron studied it, and turned to his advisor. I've never seen a firearm like this before, but you have more experience than me. What do you make of it? Xerix took the energy weapon gingerly, turning it over in her hands. It looks like no gun I've ever seen, sir. I don't see any magazine, breech, or hammer. I say we test it, one of the captains said. Buddha tapped his foot impatiently. Yes, enough standing around. Shoot the damn thing already. Nefron took the gun his large hands making it look pathetic. It's very small. My finger dwarfs the trigger. He pointed it at one of the dummies, making sure his finger wasn't covering the barrel. Nephron had trouble reaching the trigger, as it was designed for the more slender fingers of an atrian. Nonetheless, he found a relatively comfortable position and pulled the trigger. A pulse of energy shot at extremely high velocity into the dummy's head, causing it to explode in a burst of fire and straw. There was a collective gasp from the audience as everyone stepped back, looks of awe on their faces. Nephron hastily put the gun back onto the table. What? What was that? Even Buddha remained silent as the straw smoldered on the ground. One of the captains began to pray as Nephron turned to his advisor. Xerix, I want the best scientists on this right away. Find out how the thing works and build me more of them. 
Yes, sir. I will see to it personally. She took the gun and walked into the Capitol building. Buddha's temper was slightly sated for the time being, and he continued staring at where the dummy's head used to be. Nephron, we may have stumbled upon something that will win us this war. I think you may be right. Nephron produced a pocket watch and glanced at the strange markings on it. I think it's time we get some answers. Captain Manic, bring the prisoners to the interrogation chamber. The captain bowed sharply and walked off quickly. Buddha looked Nephron in the eye. I suppose you'll be performing the interrogation yourself? The general nodded. Of course, it has been too long since we've had a good interrogation. The public will think I have gone soft. I look forward to it. Buddha grinned, something that did not happen every day. Leff was quietly dozing against Lena, who tried her best to keep warm. The cell was so damp it had flattened her fur against her body, which didn't help at all with her temperature. Even with Leff's warm body draped over her, she couldn't feel her toes or fingers anymore. Zack was curled up in the corner, snoring loudly despite himself, sometimes synchronizing with a drunk across from them. She shivered, hoping someone would come along soon. Leff stirred, changing position slightly. Lena looked down, and Leff's mouth opened a small amount. Mm, yeah, I agree. What? Oh. Lena listened as Leff talked in his sleep. Good. There's a high price on silver. His crazy ramblings made no sense, though it might have in the context of the dream he was having. You look really good today. Really good. Lena's face flushed. Was he dreaming about her? Love you. She smiled. If she was to die on this planet, at least she would do it having been able to love a man like Lef. Lef's mouth moved again. Rissa. She looked down abruptly, her face shocked into an expression of horror. Who the hell was Rissa? Her sharp movement caused Lef to awaken, his eyes fixing on her face. How long was I asleep? What? Do I have something on my face? Uh, no. Lef sat up slightly and noticed how cold she was. He took her paw. And for the first time since she met him, she didn't know if she wanted him to. Lena, your paws are so cold. Here. He rubbed her paws together, generating friction and adding his own heat. You should have said something. He huffed. These people don't know how to treat visitors. He stopped rubbing. Hey, what's the matter? She looked into his eyes. Lef? Who's Rissa? His eyes narrowed ever so slightly. How do you know that name? You... You talked in your sleep. Lef seemed worried. What did I say? Lena glanced away. Only her name. She lied. She's... nobody. It's not important. Lena knew she wasn't getting the whole truth. It felt like she was getting only a shadow of the truth, in fact. Lef. They were interrupted by three guards arriving and, quite loudly, slamming open the door. You three, on your feet! Zack rolled over. Uh, five more minutes, Mom. The guards hauled him up onto his feet. Shut up, freak. It's time for your interrogation. One of the guards hauled Zack off, and the other two seized Lef and Lena, who was in no shape to struggle. Lef, however, didn't make things easy, pulling and thrashing as they were dragged bodily off to wherever the nefarious deed was to take place. They weren't taken very far, and soon were thrust into a room, which was suspiciously clean with three chairs in its center. General Nephron stood beside the chairs, holding a whippy tree branch, a rather thick one. The guards tied the three up, one of them handing over the translator, and with a nod from the general, they stepped outside. He cracked the branch. Now, tell me what I want to know, and this will be easy. They stared him down. He began to pace the room, swishing his branch so that it whistled. Where are you from? Lef glared at Nephron with fiery eyes. We come from the stars! Nephron lashed Lef's arm. He jumped, biting his lip. Where are you from? This time, General Nephron addressed Zack. No. He simply stated. He received a lash. The general walked over to Lena. Where are you from? Lena remained silent. Lef saw Nephron pull back his arm, and he briefly considered saying something. But he knew that if these people ever learned about the vast civilizations out there, it was impossible to tell what they'd do, be it reverse-engineer their technology without first gaining an appreciation of what space was truly like, or blow themselves to oblivion. 
most likely the latter. He closed his eyes as the switch made contact. The yelp he heard felt worse than when he had been hit. He opened his eyes, and the general was looking at him. You care for this one. He hit her again. I need to know where you are from. And again. A place with such powerful weaponry, I must know how to get there. And again. I don't want to be doing this, but the future of my people depends on it. Again. People die every day. These rebels claim to want equality, but they really want my rule. Again. I must drive them back and end this once and for all, and I need your power to do it. He held his arm back. Lena's eyes were shut tightly, tears streaming down her face. Left couldn't bear to watch anymore. He didn't know what good it would do, but he might as well try to explain it the best he could while preserving their culture as much as possible. Stop! Stop! No more! Zack looked at him. Leth. Shut up, Zack! I can't listen anymore! Nephron pulled up a chair and sat in front of Leth. Where are you from? Leth first looked over at Lena. Peach, are you okay? She looked over. I I'll be fine! Nephron used his stick to push Leth's muzzle so that he was facing him. I won't ask again. <sighs> first, let me explain something. If I tell you where I'm from... It will be very, very bad for your entire planet. You especially. Nephron poked Lef with his stick. I'm not interested in your talk of pacifism. I've heard it all before. Lef shook his head. You don't understand. The slightest mistake might level an entire city or render the planet uninhabitable. I assume you tested my pocket pistol? Nephron nodded. Yes, it destroyed a dummy. Although Lef didn't show it, he was shocked at this information. They must have accidentally burned out the battery in one shot. Yes, our ship, the, uh, Nostalgia for Infinity. Left didn't know where that came from, but it sounded more intimidating than the Frontier. It has guns capable of much, much more destruction. But if someone like you tried to operate them, you would surely destroy yourselves in the process. Nephron tapped Left on the nose. You still haven't answered my question. Translation unavailable. Left didn't know why the device didn't translate the last word, but he got the inflection. Well, we, uh, come from very high up. We live on our ship, in your sky. We crashed, much like one of your boats might dash up against some rocks. The stars are angry with us. We aren't supposed to share our vast knowledge yet. Please, let us go and destroy any record of our being here. The general stood and faced away from Lef. Do you know why they call me general? Because you command the army? He turned again. No. It is only because we are at war. Normally I am king, but these rebels have turned me into a ruthless military leader. He sat. With the power you describe, you can help us end this conflict. I am sure the stars would forgive you if you helped the rightful ruler of all Zizix. Left knew that no matter what he said, the general would not give in. Do not know how you could possess such power, or how this device allows us to communicate. He held up the translator. But rest assured, I am the right hands. Lef looked skyward and opened up his mouth to speak. Look. A loud explosion rocked the building, followed by two more nearby explosions. Dust fell from the ceiling as Nephron ran out of the room, yelling back. It must be the rebel factions. See what they do? He was gone down the corridor, not waiting for an answer. Zack looked over at Lef. Nice try. Bought us some time at least. Another explosion caused the ground to shake. Yeah, but it seems like we're in even more danger somehow. Lena noticed something on the ground. Hey, look! He dropped the translator! Zack began scooting forward. I might be able to burn through these ropes if I cross the wires in the... Hello? A female Kalidocyte walked into the room, followed by two males. She drew a knife. Hey now, slow down! Zack said as he scooted back. She slashed with the knife, severing Zack's bonds. Ah, uh, oh, thanks lady. She cut the rest of their bonds, and Leff picked up the translator. Yes, thank you. Who are you? One of her companions glanced out the door. Miss, we must be going. All right, you three, follow me. We must go, now. Leff took Lena's arm, which was bleeding profusely. He tore off a piece of his shirt and pressed it into the wound, causing her to wince. Hold that. All right, we're coming. Anything is better than this place. They ran off down the passage, taking a winding route deeper and lower into the Capitol building eventually arriving at a trap door. They were whisked quickly through it, and followed a dark tunnel until they came to a ladder. The female Kalidocyte climbed up. Up here! Hurry! 
They emerged in the forest, surrounded by Kalidocytes that wore ragged clothing, and held a wide array of weaponry. The female Kalidocyte bowed to them. Now that we're safe, let me introduce myself. I am Xerix, leader of the rebel factions. And you are going to teach me how to use this. She held out Lef's pocket pistol, the barrel charred and bent. Feldo gave the pod's power box one last kick, and Taliko yelled excitedly. Yes! That's it! I can see everything! It worked! Feldo nudged her out of the way. Good. The signal was boosted. Nice work. Feldo input atrian and human life signs as he watched the screen intently. Alright, let's see. I think that's them. He pointed to an orange-yellow color change on the topographical map the overclocked computer was generating. It's not that far away. Short flight, but... How would they be in the forest? Tilico shrugged. Maybe they got away? Feldo fed in colitocyte life sign data from the computer memory. The area they were in changed to gray. Looks like they're surrounded. We can't go get them. Tilico made a frustrated sound. Ugh! Damn, this is space loss! We should just fly in there and snatch them up! Feldo shook his head. That wouldn't be a good idea. The computer says they should have relatively sophisticated weaponry by now. AA guns are possible. Tilico jumped up. Well, I'll go tell Serlia. Maybe she's thought something up. Serlia and Yar were still sitting in the conference room. They had come up with a couple plans that were very risky, and neither of them thought it was worth it. Tilico pranced into the room. Guys! Feldo found them! Serlia stood. Where? In the middle of the jungle, surrounded by aliens. She smote the table. Fuck! Yar flinched. This is so frustrating. We try and save them, screw up an entire world. Don't save them? Who knows? Yara looked up. Uh, it seems to me like we already screwed up this place. I mean, how much more damage could we do? A lot more, trust me. She stood for a long time, then finally sat back down. There is only one option. Toliko, watch the sensors on the pod. Toliko's eyes grew wide. We aren't going to leave them here, are we? No, at least not right away. If they aren't back in two days, we have to leave. Let's hope I think of something else or they get out of it themselves. Frontier by Maggot Mosh Pit, Chapter 14 General Nephron threw one of the three chairs into the wall, smashing it. Escaped! How could they have escaped, bound and helpless from a building full of soldiers? Buddha watched with a considerable amount of amusement as Nephron vented to one of his captains. What were you thinking, leaving your post like that? The captain tried his best to stand to attention. Under the circumstances, no one could blame him for cowering a little. Sir, there are people trapped under a fallen beam. Nephron jabbed his finger at the captain's chest. And you couldn't even save them, could you? N no, sir. The general kicked over one of the chairs. Take off that uniform. You are now a lowly foot soldier. Send in your old second. He will take your place as captain. Buddha chuckled as the unfortunate former captain left the room dejectedly. I see you haven't lost your touch. It's of little importance. We still have the gun of incredible power. And the ship is still there. Nephron was about to agree when the second rushed in. General, sir! The technology development head says Xerox never delivered the gun to him. We looked everywhere, and we can't find her. If Kalidocytes had blood vessels, Nephron would have been popping most of them about then. Everything was falling apart, even before they were set up. Nephron pushed the second, now a captain, aside. She must have escaped with a gun, by the stars. Who would have thought she would turn coat? Who can I trust? The captain bowed. I will serve you with my life. Buddha shook his head. It seems like the rebel factions gain strength every day. If they have the gun, we may lose. Nephron slammed his hand under the doorframe. Never! Not in this life and not in the next. Captain Abraxas, gather all the captains, tell them to assemble the army. We will go out there and sweep the forest clean. They can't have gone far. Captain Abraxas bowed and ran off. Buddha walked out of the room, making one final comment. Be careful. They may be expecting you to make a rash move. We have enough troops. As long as they do their job, we will prevail. 
Leff looked at the gun, clearly destroyed and unusable, then up into the optimistic face of the rebel leader. Uh, I don't know how to tell you this, but it's broken. Her face hardened. What? I see. You do not sympathize with us as I thought. So you try to lie your way out of this? She pointed the gun at him. It was a pathetic sight, the gun looking twice as small as the hands of Xerix, not to mention the condition it was in. If you do not teach me, I will learn and use you as target practice. She pulled the trigger. Left did not flinch. He held his paws out. See? You burned out the... uh... ammunition in one shot. It wasn't that useful to begin with, except maybe for destroying weak doors. Xerix looked at the gun, then threw it to the ground. Then tell me where I can get more! Leff was about to say something when Lena stepped forward. You know what? You sound exactly like that general. He wanted the exact same thing, and I'm willing to bet for the exact same reasons. Xerix glared at her. Do not compare me to Nephron, little man. That pig wants half the population as his slaves. I only seek to free them. I am not a man! Zack looked around at the tired faces of the rebels. Look, lady, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Xerix tilted her head. What? Uh, it's an expression. You might think you're fighting for the good of these people, but what are you going to do if you win? Nephron's people won't just switch sides. They will have to. <sighs> now you really sound like Nephron. Xerix was about to lose her temper when a scout ran up. Xerix! The general's army is sweeping the forest! She jumped onto a rock. No matter. Even without your weapons, I have the element of surprise on my side. Break off into small groups, strike fast, and strike hard. Then make like smoke in one's palm. We will win this day! The rebels began to move into the night, grouping into guerrilla units. Xerix turned to the three captives. As for you, you will be valuable to me. She led them deeper into the forest, surrounded by four of her choicest soldiers. Toliko watched as two groups of gray splodges met. The sensors beeped as they detected sharp temperature changes in the first group. The second group lost a few life signs, and began showing sharp spikes in heat. Toliko watched in horror as one group annihilated the other. She jumped out of the pod and ran to Sir Leah's cabin. I... I think there's fighting. Looks like a war zone out there. Sir Leah opened the door. What? Where's Leff and the others? Toliko dragged Sir Leah to the pod, explaining wildly. They're moving away from the fighting. Two groups of quality sides met. Then there were spikes in temperature, and one group just... died. I think it was a gunfire. The screen was lit up with gunfire when they arrived at the pod. Smaller groups would flank larger ones and defeat them. Toliko covered her mouth. They're killing each other. Serlia watched the carnage. That's war, kid. Left's group is moving off. Maybe an opportunity will arise. Whoa! The screen lit up. An explosion, indicated as a white flash, hit dead on a small group. The group no longer remained when the flash cleared. Looks like a shelling to me. I don't know what's going on, but this planet is at war. Maybe we can use this to our advantage. The shelling continued, as both sides took heavy losses, though it was hard to tell who was who just by judging by the sensors. The explosions could be heard through the ship's hull, along with the occasional scream. Toliko, get ready. Toliko! Serlia shook her. Toliko was staring wide-eyed at the screen, her ears plastered to her skull. Toliko, I need your help. We might get the chance to save them if they're alone, but I can't use you while you're shell-shocked. Toliko nodded. I'll try. Serlia jumped into the pod's seat. She primed the engines and prepared to take off. The instant they're alone, haul her and we'll be there in a second. Toliko nodded, then remembered something. Wait. Fell to say something about double-A guns. Don't worry about that. It's too dark now. We can fly by sensors. They can't shoot by moonlight. <laughs> this planet doesn't even have a moon. 
Lef, Lena, and Zack were shoved into a shallow hole at the base of a tree. Xerix looked down at them. My guards will keep you safe from Nefren's men. Call it an act of kindness. She turned to the guards. I will join the fray and fight side by side with your brothers and sisters as an equal. The guards bowed. We respect your bravery, miss. Xerix nodded. If I die tonight, do not despair. I will live on in my deeds. She dashed off into the woods, weapon drawn. Zack huffed. Narcissist much? Shut up in there! Left gestured at the translator in Zack's pocket, then whispered. Turn it off and keep it to a whisper. Zack did, and Left got a strange feeling, as though a pressure he didn't know was there had been lifted from his ears. Weird. I didn't know that thing felt like anything. Zack shrugged. Lena shook her large ears. I noticed it. It was kind of nice. An explosion caused them to jump. It wasn't far off. The guards were clearly on edge. Lef looked at Zack. It looks like we might not slip out of this one. Zack shook his head. Don't say that. Listen, if we don't make it out of this alive, I want you to know that you've been a good friend and a damn good engineer. Zack nodded. And I didn't steal Jenkins' wallet. They laughed and left turned to Lena. She shook her head. No. Don't say goodbye until we're dead. He embraced her. I'm not saying goodbye. I'm covering my bases. You have been the best I could ever hope for. And I love you. He quickly wiped a tear from his face. I sit here in the middle of a war zone. Explosions and gunfire all around me. And all I can think of is losing you. And it scares the ever-loving fuck out of me. He let go of her. Let's not die. Lena nodded. Yes, let's not die. Zack sighed. Atrians are so sentimental. Shut up. A closer explosion threw up dirt, peppering them with silt. One of the guards looked to his left, then was blown back into the hole, his flight emphasized by the ratatat of machine gun fire. One of the guards clicked his tongue, and the remaining three dove for cover. The guard tumbled to a stop at Left's feet, his rifle still slung over his shoulder. Left freed it with some difficulty and tossed the soldier's pistol to Zack. Left crawled for the mouth of the shallow cave. Zack peeked out at the carnage unfolding around them. So, uh, who do we shoot at? Left sighted down the rifle. The ones that are trying to kill the ones that aren't actively trying to kill us. He fired across the clearing at the muzzle flash of one of Nephron's machine gun nests. He missed, and the gun continued wreaking havoc on nearby rebels, who had been joined by twelve more allies. Damn these primitive weapons! Zack, how do you reload this thing? Zack didn't even bother trying to shoot with his pistol. I don't even know. Lena appeared from nowhere. Give me that! Mm, this lever. Use it to reload after each shot. Left pulled the lever down, and a spent cartridge shot out, bouncing off Zack's head. How did you know that? Lena ducked as another explosion shook the area. I don't know. Seemed logical. Left took another shot at the nest. This time, the gun stopped firing. There. I might get a better vantage point to the left here. Left scooted over to the left and took a few more shots. Zack and Lena could only see his face briefly when it was lit by the muzzle flash of his gun. An explosion lit up the area, and Lena screamed as the silhouette of a figure could be seen grabbing Left. The two bodies rolled over and over into the hole, Zack pointed his gun, but he didn't dare take the shot, or jump into the fray. One of the figures punched the other, who punched back. Lef, push him off! I can't get a clear shot! One of the figures pushed the other up against the wall, and Zack took aim. Lena pushed his arm away. Wait! That's Lef! The figure that was on the ground scrambled up, but the one against the wall took one swipe. There was a gurgling sound as the figure fell over backwards. Zack quickly pulled out the translation device and used its screen to illuminate the area. Left was standing over the body of a soldier, blood quickly forming in a pool on the ground from the soldier's neck. Zack watched as Left retracted his blood-stained claws. Whoa, uh, does it hurt when you do that? Left wiped blood from his paws. Every time. He inspected the corpse. I don't think this guy had arteries. Seemed to do the trick, though. Poor bastard. Lef opened the soldier's eyelids. Face death with open eyes so the devil may look into your soul. Zack looked out into the battle zone. It looks like things are cooling down. Lef saw Lena and how she was looking at him. Peach, 
I'm sorry you had to see that. No. It was him or us. Zack glanced around. Guys, I think everyone's gone. As Zack uttered the words, a familiar sound faintly permeated the ambience. Zack cocked his head skyward. Is that... The Frontier's escape pod gently landed in the clearing, thrusters glowing faintly. The doors opened, and Taliko leaned out. Hurry up! There are more coming! Left, Lena, and Zack didn't hesitate, dashing for the open doors and cramming inside the small pod. As they lifted off, Lena gazed out the window down into the scene below. With a bird's eye view, she could see the full scale of the carnage. Skirmishes taking place only 20 meters apart, the rolling thunder of distant artillery guns foreshadowing the blast of fire that blew apart the limbs of trees and men alike. No matter how hard she tried, she couldn't shake the feeling that their presence was the cause, and she was forced to look away. She felt bad for them, but she was desensitized to things like this, growing up in the generation directly after the war. Despite this, it probably would be a long time until she got that soldier's death gurgle out of her mind. Left maneuvered to the front of the pod. Sir Leah. Left, don't apologize. It wasn't your fault. I wasn't going to. Her expression softened. I'm glad you're safe, Lef. I'm glad I'm safe, too. Surya punched him. Nephron stood on a hill overlooking the battlefield, absolutely fuming. We're losing! How can we be losing? Captain Abraxas used a pair of binoculars, or at least the Kalidocyte equivalent, to peer into the distance. It looks like they're regrouping for another attack. We should withdraw and shell the area more. No! We will meet them! Gather the reserves! Prepare to charge! Two of the captains gathered around him dashed off to gather the troops. Nephron stabbed the ground repeatedly, then turned to address his approaching armies. Hear me! I will not lose to the common ground slime! We will uphold the rightful rule over this land, and restore balance! CHARGE! There was a mighty roar from the troops as they stormed down the hill towards the regrouping rebels, General Nephron leading the charge, foam flying from his mouth. The escape pod coupled with the frontier, and its occupants spilled out onto the floor, and quickly scrambled up as Left took charge. Alright, Zack, finish sealing that breach. Sirlia, Lena, come with me. They ran to their tasks, leaving Taliko at the pod. Rackham ran into the room, having heard the pod returning. Sir Leah! Toliko! Where's Sir Leah? Toliko shrugged. I don't know! What's the matter? She shook her head. It's nothing. I'll get over it. What about you? Rackham rubbed his head. Everybody is getting scared, and we need to get out of here now. Did you get Lena back? Toliko nodded. They're all here. Rackham ran back to the converted cargo bay to deliver the good news. Thanks, kiddo! Tilico sat in the cargo bay for a long time, then finally muttered, I'm not a kid anymore. Lef burst into the cockpit, jumped over his seat, and landed on it. Sir Leah and Lena took their seats as well, and almost as soon as they did, the intercom beeped. Zack here. Looks like Feldo got the hull patched up. We tested it and it looks good as new. We're clear for takeoff. Left thrust out his arm. You know what to do, Peach. General Nephron stared up at the sky, his eyes reflecting the sight of the frontier streaking up into space, vanishing into the stars. Nephron would have thought it a strange sight if his head was still connected to his body. Almost the instant the frontier exited the atmosphere, a ship hailed them. Sarlia checked the source, then shook her head. Of all the... Ugh, it's Prax. <laughs> Maybe you can use your charm to convince him not to arrest us all. The calm came alive, and Prax's face appeared on Left's monitor. Well, Prax, fancy to meet you here. It's starting to seem like you're the only other ship out here. Prax grinned. And it's starting to seem like you're the only ship getting into trouble. Touché. Look, you know why I'm here. Prepare to be boarded, Prax said right before breaking the comm link. Left side. Guys, I'll take full responsibility. I am the captain. Sir Leah and Lena both turned around. Sir Leah growled at him. Lef, stop that talk. 
It was an accident. We had no control over it. No one's to blame. Somehow, I don't think Prax will have the same opinion. You had no control over it. No one's to blame. Leff and Zerlia looked at Prax with bewilderment as he tucked into a bowl of larva soup. You're serious? Prax nodded. Yes. Well, not totally. You see, under normal circumstances, I would jail you all for ten years. Leff was having a hard time understanding what was happening. Wait, what circumstances? Prax wasn't looking at Leff, but he answered him. That planet down there? It's already had its culture contaminated. The research ship Polar Star crash-landed there during the war, and it turned a peaceful society into one that is almost always at odds. Wait, I didn't read anything like that in the databases. Prax shrugged. It was covered up. Oh, you're uh, going to have to sign a non-disclosure agreement after this. He handed them a pair of forms. Left scratched behind his ear. Uh, so we're free to go? Prax grinned, showing his unusually sharp teeth. Not exactly. He pulled out a pad. I am deducting a million credits from your account as a fine. What? That's half of what the government pays me in a month! Prax tapped the pad. Should have thought of that before violating almost every safety protocol in the books. The only reason you had to land is because you didn't have bulkheads or plug foam. I'm also ordering you to station Alpha 2 for retrofitting. You are in serious need of repairs and safety precautions. Lef wished Prax had just arrested them. But we hardly have any money left. I spend most of the monthly pay on food. That's what it's for, anyway. That's your problem. But enough talk. Sir Lea, are you doing anything later? Lef lay in his cabin the next night, not sure how he should be feeling. He wasn't a prisoner, but he was in a very tight spot. Prax was practically towing them to Station Alpha 2, where he would have to come up with the money to fix his ship. Perhaps this particular roll of the knuckle bones was not favorable. There was a small knock on the door. Then again. Come in, Peach. Lena entered the room and sat beside him, no longer shy about it. Lef looked up from where he was lying. What's up? I can't sleep. Lef sat up. Why not? Something bothering you? She looked him in the eye. Tell me about Rissa. Apparently, the Knucklebones hated Lef. I already told you. She's nobody. Well, she's gotta be somebody, Lef. You were talking about her in your sleep. She's just someone I used to know back on the moon. I guess my brain got nostalgic and was reliving old memories. Some of the worries in Lena's mind began to lift. Just someone from your past? Lef smiled, thanked the knucklebones, and kissed Lena on the lips. Just someone from my past. She was kind of a bitch, actually. Lena laughed. Maybe it was just Lef's ex. Maybe he was just dreaming of a time he thought he loved her. Maybe. Lef grinned at her. You doing anything right now? Lef's pocket pistol sat on the ground in the middle of the battlefield, waiting. It was only a matter of time before somebody found it. Frontier by Maggot Mosh Pit Chapter 15 Rico paced the narrow alleyway nervously, tapping his fingers against his pant leg. He looked up into the sky, if it could be called that. It was more of a gigantic panorama of scaffolding, through which a gas giant could be seen so close that it filled the entire sky. He watched as repair personnel floated around the scaffolding, repairing ships that were docked among them. Rico tried to distract himself from his current predicament by marveling at what an engineering feat Alpha 2 was. A massive oxygen field in space without gravity that allowed repair crews full versatility without needing to either eliminate gravity on a planet or have crews wear spacesuits. After the repair station was set up, the village was put in. A few houses for permanent residents, a hotel, curiosity shop, quite a lot of public space for patrons, and a restaurant. All of this was situated below the repair area, and only had gravity for six meters up. If someone threw their keys high enough, they could be lost forever. Rico watched the repair crews patch up an Atrian battlecruiser. The rumor was that it was almost torn apart by a plasma storm. 
Alpha 2 was owned and managed by Gedio, an Atrian civilian who didn't care who docked at his station as long as they weren't on the run or broke. Rico himself was neither, but his intentions weren't exactly pure, which was why he was there, in that alley, in the first place. Rico ran his hand through his raven black hair as he checked his escon. He was late. Rico was a tall man, born in space to a family of smugglers. He had no facial hair save some stubble he forgot to shave that morning. Other than that, he looked like your average guy, which is what made his job so easy. One expects people like him to have handlebar mustaches and wear black clothes. A sound behind him made him spin so fast he almost threw his escom into the wall of the restaurant whose alley he was using as his meeting place. Well, well, well. Rico, you showed up. I expected you to cut and run. Rico barely managed to keep his nerves under control. Kane, we both know what would happen to me if I did. Kane stood at the other end of the alley, alone, though he probably had goons looking around every corner. He was a human as well, with curly brown hair, squinty eyes, and a strange way of setting his jaw that constantly put a smirk on his face. He stepped forward casually. So, the fact that you are here tells me you have a ship somehow. <laughs> well, no, you see... Kane punched Rico in the stomach without warning. Rico crumpled to the tiled ground. <coughs> Kane pulled him up with incredible strength, something Rico expected he paid a ridiculous sum of money for, be it cybernetics or some drug. Rico, when I hired you, you said you could have a ship transport my goods without a trace by yesterday. He threw him to the ground, Rico hitting his elbow hard. I could get rid of you and hire someone competent, but you're the only person who can get me what I want in this godforsaken metal patchwork. Kane crouched beside Rico. This might be hard to believe, but I work for someone. I was instructed to escort their cargo to them in secret. If I can't do that, they'll get very angry with me. Then I'll be very angry at you. You wouldn't survive the experience. Kane stood and strolled to the mouth of the alley. Two days. If you can't find me a transport by then, well, I don't have to tell you what will happen. By the time Rico was able to crawl to his feet, there was no trace of Kane. Rico sighed. It looked like he had his work cut out for him. He stumbled to the curio shop, aptly named Curios, from which he ran his operation. As he walked through the door, a frantic-looking otter ran up to him. Rico! I need something! Rico walked past her and behind the counter. What is it this time? She pulled at her claws, her face twitching slightly every few seconds. You know what it is. Rico pulled a device from under the counter, a small platform with a clear glass surface. He grabbed what appeared to be an antique toy block from the shelf and placed it on the platform, then pressed a button. The block dissolved, then lost all color until it became a white powder, which Rico poured into a small pouch and handed to the Adrian woman. The woman sniffed the contents of the pouch, sneezed, then handed Rico a wad of cash, which he pocketed. You ever try this stuff? Oh, clears the sinuses right up. Rico wagged his finger. I only deal it. Never try it. The woman nodded to him, then darted out of the shop. Although his shop had been under investigation before, they never came up with enough evidence to press charges. Rico turned around and poked his head through a doorway behind the counter and yelled up a flight of stairs. Lale! Get down here and bring the arrivals manifest! There was a bang from upstairs, and Pink Lenny, a weasel, ran down the stairs holding a data pad. He was tall with pure white fur. He had a lean and hungry look and terrible posture. Although Rico knew how to speak Atrian, Pink Lenny was brought up by humans and didn't speak any. He tossed the manifest. Here, Rick. Kane didn't, uh, beat you up too bad, did he? Rico and Lenny had been partners in crime for a while now, and both of them knew that they could worm their way out of this one. Rico shook his head as he scrolled the arrivals list. Nah, but he will if we don't find someone willing to transport illegal cargo. Let's see. Horizon? No. Stargazer? No. Goliath. <laughs> I'm pretty sure her captain wants to kill me. The Frontier, hmm? Never heard of her before. He brought up the ship specs and crew manifest. Pink Lenny screwed up his nose. Ew, this is one of them old dime a dozen freighters. Uh, H model, right? Rico chuckled. 
There are a million places to hide shit in these things. Wait, Zack? Lenny gave him a dumb look. Eh, who's Zack? Zack Wilde, we, uh, well, we knew each other. Lenny clapped his paws together. Great. Eh, uh, manipulate the shit out of him and save our skins. Rico tossed the pad onto the table. That's what we do. Lena piloted the frontier into the oxygen bubble and between the intricate metal beams and tunnels to the spot Prax had reserved. But Prax did only that. Leff would have to come up with the money for a custom refit himself. He sat in the captain's chair, silently fuming to himself. Leff was rarely in a bad mood, and when he was, it wasn't pleasant for his crew. Lena eased off the thrusters as they slowed to a stop. Two station personnel jumped from beams on opposite sides of the frontier, carrying two magnetic cables. They attached them to the hull and they went taut, holding the frontier in place. Sir Leah switched on the external camera and watched as the cables were attached. We've docked. Left didn't answer. He was too busy thinking of ways to make money and wring Prax's neck at the same time. Left knew it wasn't Prax's fault they crashed on that planet, but he wanted somewhere to direct his anger. Surlia watched as one of the clamps pulled a section of hull plating clean off. The attendant was lucky enough to be able to jet away in time. The other clamp automatically disengaged to avoid pulling the frontier into the scaffolding. The comm beeped. Leff answered. Hey, you here for repairs? Cause you need them bad. Yes, we are. <laughs> for the sound of your voice, I'd say it was a rough trip. I'm Gedio, owner of this place. Well, we can get you all patched up and ready to go for a reasonable price. Leff found he wanted to glare at Gedio, but he couldn't, so he glared at the coffee machine instead. That's the problem, see? We don't have any f any money. Gedio was quiet for a minute. Well, I would kick you right out of here under normal circumstances, but that would be a death sentence. <laughs> Leff gritted his teeth as Gedio laughed at his own joke. Well, I can't give you a line of credit, but if you have anyone over there who's a tech whiz, I can repair your ship in exchange for their help. Leff rubbed his eyes. We don't only need repairs, we also need a safety retrofit by the orders of the Atrian government. Well, for an old derelict like that- I Hey! Don't insult my ship. Left could hear Gedio shrugging. <clears throat> Sorry. Anyway, a uh, retrofit would cost you a pretty penny to use a human expression. I can repair your ship, but if you don't have the money by the time we're done, it's goodbye for you and no retrofit. Left switched off the comm without saying goodbye. He toggled the ship intercom. Feldo, I've got a job for you. Zack tried to hide his indignant look. What? You're sending Feldo? But I'm the chief engineer. Feldo's older. Feldo strolled in, wearing Zack's Hawaiian shirt. What's up, Lef? Zack crossed his arms. He wants you to go do some tech whiz stuff on Alpha 2 instead of his chief engineer. Lef growled. <sighs> the only reason you're the chief engineer is because you were the only one available. Not because you had merit. Zack opened his mouth, but when he realized what Lef said, he was speechless. Lef? Just... Take a break. Left stormed out of the room and to his cabin. Zack left too. Feldo, you better go do that thing. We need the repairs. He said as he passed. Feldo had no idea what was going on. He held up his paws. Celia, can you help me out here? Oh yeah, since we don't have any money, we're getting repairs in exchange for helping the station owner with something. He shrugged and walked out. I'll get right on it. Lena wrung her paws together. I've never seen Lef like that. He was... He was a jerk. Serlia locked down her station and got up, patting Lena on the back. Lef gets very frustrated with things he can't control much. You should have seen him when he thought you were going to be killed by those cultists. Don't worry, he'll run himself down soon enough. Lena nodded. I hope you're right. Zack poked his head into the converted cargo bay and looked around. People were shuffling out to stretch their legs in the village. He shrugged and followed them. The rear loading ramp was open, and a station attendant was helping people down a rope, which was attached to the ground below. As colonists stepped off the ramp and suddenly became weightless, they flailed around comically before being secured to the rope and sent on their way. The loading bay was filled with laughter and a general good air, but Zack wasn't sharing in the fun. He watched stone-faced as Yar clung helplessly to Toliko, as he screamed and she laughed uncontrollably. The attendant attached them both to the rope and pushed them down, much to the amusement of the gathered crowd. When it came to Zack's turn, he attached himself and floated down effortlessly. 
As his feet broke the gravity barrier, the clamp securing him to the rope grabbed the lifeline, slowing his descent. He landed on his feet gently and detached himself. He strolled along the sidewalks, watching tiny go-kart-like vehicles taking people around the park. Am I just your average engineer? He muttered to himself. Leff was right. He was practically right out of school, green and convenient. Though Zack didn't know much about Fellow's past, he knew he had to at least be 30 years old. And Sir Leah had let slip that he had once been in a position of power on a ship before he was forced to become a pirate. Zack kicked a rock across the street. He briefly wondered why there would be a rock on his space station, but he dismissed the thought. Maybe Feldo would be a better chief. Zack was brought out of his brooding by a long gasp from his left. He looked over and spotted Toliko and Yar beside a fountain. Toliko was bouncing up and down. That is so cool! Zack walked over to see what the fuss was about. The fountain sprayed a jet of water into a glass dome, which was held in place by thin pillars. It was high enough to break the gravity barrier, so the water splashed around in interesting ways until it dropped back into the gravity zone and into the fountain. It was a creative way of making use of the environment to create a unique piece of art. He was appreciating the fountain when Toliko tugged at his arm. Hey, Zack! Let me borrow your ice gum. Uh, what? Don't you have your own? Toliko laughed. <laughs> I left it on the ship! Come on, I gotta call Lena and tell her to get down here! Zack shrugged and handed it over. She called the Frontier, and Lena answered. Lena! It's so nice down here. Grab Lev, and let's make it a double date. Toliko covered the mic piece as Lena answered, whispering to Zack. Hey! I don't have a date. Be my date! No. Okay. Yar, you're my date! Huh? She uncovered the mic. Aw. Come on, Lena. Make him come. Zack and Yar both snickered, and Toliko shot them looks. Okay. We'll wait. She hung up and tossed the SCOM back to Zack. Here you go, Grumpy. Zack caught his SCOM and walked off, not wanting to face Lef again, as much as he hated to admit it. Alpha 2 was a rather bright place. The system it was in had two suns, and the place was constantly bathed in sunlight. Hence why everything was so white, and why Zack had to wear sunglasses. He looked around, seeing none of the Atrians wearing them. That was one thing all Atrian species had in common. A retina that could block UV rays and any damage or pain sunlight might cause. He was lost in thought about Atrian evolution when a shout from behind him caused him to jump. Zack! He froze. That voice. It couldn't be. Rico? Zack spun around to see none other than Rico standing there with a huge grin on his face. Rico! Zack ran over and gave him a firm hug. Uh, what the hell are you doing here? Rico laughed as he patted Zack on the back. Hey, it's a small universe! Zack realized he was hugging another man in public and quickly let go. So, um, I haven't seen you since college. What's up? Oh, you know, this and that. I just happened to drift to this place and I set up shop. When you say shop... You don't mean to say you actually opened an antique store. That I did. Come on, we have some catching up to do. Feldo floated through the air, holding on to the gas jetpack of Gedio as he gave him a tour of Alpha 2. Gedio was a raccoon. He was stout and always in a good mood, but he held a no-nonsense attitude and almost never took no for an answer. He pointed to a cluster of scaffolding extending out towards the gas giant. And that there is the launch bay for our gas mining operation. We installed it last year, and it's turning a tidy profit. Feldo gulped. This is all very interesting, but can we get somewhere where there's gravity? Gedio laughed, a deep belly laugh. <laughs> Not found your zero-g legs yet, eh? Alright, I'll show you where the problem is. Gedio accelerated towards a building that was suspended in the metal framework. Gedio twisted himself midair and landed on the platform, Feldo tumbling off his back. Oof! Gedio laughed again as he pulled Feldo up. <laughs> Come on, let's get down to business. He led Feldo inside the control room. Feldo had to take a minute to look around. The place was stunning, walls lined with servers, screens, and camera feeds. Not to mention devices for almost any task one might have to perform on a station like this. Hey, Gedio, this place is amazing. <laughs> Glad you like it. Well, unfortunately, with all this impressive stuff, things are bound to go wrong. Feldo looked at a nearby screen, a list of all currently docked ships. He skimmed the list. The Frontier was there, and... Skylinks. 
Gedio watched as Feldo just stood there, staring at the name of Terry's ship. Um, the problem's over here. Feldo shook his head, making a mental note to keep an eye out for Terry. He wasn't ready to talk to her again. Gedio led him to a computer station with a very frustrated-looking IT tech, slamming his hand on the keyboard. Damn it! That one got sent to the protein resequencer! Earl, shut down resequencer 8. Earl flipped a switch on a panel across the room. Gedio laughed. <laughs> oh, don't worry, Chad. We have help. Uh, all right, Veldo. I'll let Chad explain the problem. Chad glanced up at Gedio. What? I thought you were going to explain it. Chad was skinny, pale, and wore huge glasses, but his chin was chiseled from stone. Now's not the time to get embarrassed. Explain the problem. Yes, sir. Gedio walked off to take care of some administrative business. Chad sighed and pointed at the screen. <sighs> all right. We have a problem with... The bathrooms. They keep sending the waste to weird places. We tracked it down to a computer problem, but now I'm not so sure. Your computer's saying shit to the protein resequencer. Ha! Chad placed his head in his hands. Yes, now can you help? It's only a matter of time before it goes to a fountain or something. Faldo knew a lot about computers. Not as much as machines, but he was very proficient. After looking over the control software and finding no problems, Chad's bewilderment became clear. How could there be a problem? The software works fine. Chad shrugged. It's very strange. Feldo opened the folder containing all the files used to run the software. In the folder labeled Transfer, Feldo found a huge amount of DLL files. What's all this? Shouldn't there be normal files here? Chad thought for a moment. It looks like the software delegates the transfer protocols to an outside source. Fellow snapped his fingers. Yes, that outside source must see what's malfunctioning. But I didn't know there was a second system running the plumbing. No one told me. Fellow swatted him on the back. Don't feel bad. Whoever designed this thing deserves to be slapped. Chad chuckled as Fellow tried to find out where the second system was. After some tampering with one of the DLLs, he was led to a location where the second system had to be. There, in the middle of the public park. Yeah, that would be the main pipe everything passes through. There must be a second computer there. Come on! Feldo and Chad walked hastily through the park, Feldo constantly glancing behind his back and scouring the park. Chad glanced at him. You look like you've seen a ghost and you're expecting it to jump out and spook you. Feldo didn't answer. Chad was exactly right. Chad practically tripped over the hatch labeled access pipe. He righted himself. <clears throat> this is it. He pulled the hatch up, his staff badge beeping, signaling the automatic lock was disengaged. Feldo jumped into the shallow hole, a large pipe ran by, and a single laptop sat on a table, wired from every port to the wall. What is this mess? Chad watched as Feldo opened the laptop. It was dead. Feldo shook his head. Who installed this? I don't know. It must have been installed before I came here. Feldo searched around and saw a power cable lying on the ground. He sighed, replaced the cable, and booted the computer. He stood, his eyes peeking over the hatch. He glimpsed a single brilliant blue eye and dove for the floor. Uh, Felt- Shh! He stayed on the floor, and eventually he saw Terry's back as she passed the hatch, her tail swirling casually. Chad glanced at her, then back at Feldo. He smiled a couple minutes later. Is that your ex? Feldo leaned on the edge of the hole, watching Terry round a corner. Not exactly. Zack and Rico laughed uncontrollably as they stumbled into Curios. Rico slammed his hand on the table. He did what? <laughs> Zack wiped tears from his eyes. <laughs> he, he, I can't say it again. They eventually settled down and Zack could look around the shop. Wow, you've got a ton of crap in here. Rico punched him on the arm. Hey, some of this stuff cost me a fortune. Look at this. He picked up a long stick that had a short metal rod sticking out of the end. This is the most famous rifle in history. Zack's jaw dropped. That is a rifle? Rico pulled back a lever and the gun made a loud ping sound. Yep, over 400 years old. Cost me a fortune. Wow. Rico put the gun down and led Zack around the room, pointing out interesting things and telling anecdotes about how he came by them. Zack picked up an antique toy block and tossed it into the air. A very interesting collection. <laughs> Although I can't imagine stuff like this sells very well. 
Rico caught the block midair and placed it back on the shelf. People from all over dock here, many of them are suckers. Zack took another look around the room. You never left an explanation as to why you left so suddenly. I missed you, man. Rico walked behind the counter and sat down. I had to leave because I hated that school. Don't even know why I was there in the first place. Nothing personal, but I saw an opportunity to leave and I took it. Just then, Lenny walked into the shop. Hey, Rico. Hey, you ma- Uh, hello. Rico jumped up. Ah, Lenny. Just in time to meet my friend Zack. Zack, this is Pink Lenny. Don't call him Pink. They shook hands. Hello, Lenny. Strange name for an Atrian. Zack said, switching to Atrian. Lenny tried his best to keep a polite air about him. Eh, I was brought up by humans. I don't speak Atrian. Oh, my bad. Rico glanced out the door, then pulled both of them upstairs. Zack, I just remembered. I have a little problem I could use your help with. He led them into an upstairs kitchen and sat at a table. I have some things I need transported. Just a little cargo. Zack sat down. Really? We won't do it for free. Rico inwardly cursed, but outwardly smiled. Name your price. We need to pay for a safety refit. Pay it off, and I'm sure my captain will agree to transport your dusty relics. Lenny's eyes screamed no at Rico, but Rico smiled. That's a lot of money. But since you're my friend and you're doing me a favor, all right. They shook on it. Cool. I'll show you our ship if you want. Rico stood. Sounds good. Frontier by Maggot Moshpit Chapter 16 Feldo walked along the public path towards the rope that led back to the frontier. He left Chad to finish up, and Chad had given Gedio the good news, who had promptly ordered the repair crews to start their work. Having done his job, he wanted to get out of the public walkway as soon as possible. He didn't even stop to say hi when he spotted Lef, Lena, Taliko, and Yar strolling a little ways away. From the sound of laughter, it seems that Leff's mood had improved, at least a little bit. He quickened his pace when he caught sight of the rope, a bored-looking attendant helping somebody up next to it. Feldo ran up, clamped himself on, and shot up the rope without even acknowledging the attendant's presence. He hopped off the rope and into the gravity of the loading bay, heading straight to Celia's cabin. He knocked. Celia, you there? There was quite a lot of shuffling from the other side of the door before Celia answered. Yes, what is it, Feldo? Can I come in? There was more shuffling. Just a minute. Soon the door opened to Sir Leah, her fur looking very fluffy. Fellow stepped inside and sat on a chair. Sorry to bother you. I mean, you clearly just got out of the shower. Sir Leah picked up a brush and started cleaning up her fur. It's no problem. What's up? Feldo sighed. Terry is here. Oh? Feldo spun the chair around, looking at the ceiling. I'm not ready to face her yet. I... I can't talk to her. <laughs> it seems you've got everything figured out. Why'd you come to me? Feldo thought about that. I don't know. I guess I wanted your opinion. Look, this isn't something I can just give my opinion on. I hardly know enough. Well, you know everything. Celia looked at him, half her face still very fluffy. I don't know everything. Why do you want to avoid Terry? I look at her. Her eyes especially. Let's see... Magenta. But I screwed that up. I can't have another chance. Serlia had not been told the name of Feldo's wife, and she thought the name was pretty, as a passing thought. Feldo, what do you feel when you look at Terry? Feldo opened his mouth. He didn't know how he felt about Terry. Did he like her? Hell, did he love her? It didn't matter. All he saw was Magenta. I don't know. Serlia gave him her best no-nonsense look. Feldo, your wife is dead. This is a fact you cannot change. Terry is not your wife. Feldo felt himself choke up. Serlia continued. Maybe you screwed up. Maybe there was something you could have done. But you made a mistake. You've carried the burden of that for all this time. Don't let one mistake ruin you. If you want to talk to Terry, you should do it. But... What if I talk to her and I start to, I don't know, talk to Magenta? What if I can't not see Magenta? Sir Leah took his paw. 
Faldo, what happens next time a pine marten with blue eyes comes along? Are you just going to collapse? I know you've been through a lot, but you have to try not seeing magenta. Feldo's face was lined up with Serlia's, and he realized she had blue eyes. They reminded him of his wife. But of course, Serlia was still there. The hole left by his wife, his crew, would never heal. But he still had a heart, and he was starving. Feldo stood hastily, planted a kiss on Serlia's cheek, and ran for the door. Thanks, he said as he left the room quickly. Celia was left sitting in her cabin, blushing like a stoplight. Feldo ran down the hall and into the loading bay. He jumped for the rope and grabbed it without attaching himself. He climbed paw over paw down the lifeline until he tumbled into the gravity zone, landing on all fours, running to nowhere in particular under shouts from the angry attendant. Zack, Rico, and Lenny strolled down the sidewalk towards the frontier's passenger rope. Zack was about to start another anecdote about his time on the frontier when a figure blew past him. Whoa! Feldo, slow down! Feldo didn't respond, and in a second he was around the next corner. Rico laughed. That was Feldo? <laughs> You'd think he was running from a ghost or something. Zack shrugged. Who knows? Maybe he was. Lenny looked back. Was he a weasel? I've never met another, uh, member of my species before. Eh, close. Ferret. Oh. They stopped walking, Zack pointing up. Well, there she is. The utter train wreck that got us here. The frontier was a mixed blessing for Rico. As a cargo ship, it would have to undergo regular scans from Atrian, Yeren, and Solar Federation probes in accordance with the Intergalactic Contraband Prevention Law. Not to mention the fact it seemed like it would fall apart if you looked at it funny. Rico had ways around this, but it wouldn't be easy. Then there was the fact that he couldn't bring Kane and his goons along. Kane wouldn't like it, but he would have to take a star bus. Rico chuckled to himself at the thought of Kane and his two cronies sitting on public transit next to a couple of chatty old ladies. The good part was that he had Zack's trust, surprisingly fast, too. And they were a colony ship, so they had the fast track to their destination, except from random searches and checkpoints. Of course, the entire crew had to have a clear criminal background, but that said nothing about passengers. Zack tapped Rico on the shoulder. Hey. You're gonna burn a hole in the hull if you keep staring at it like that. Uh, oh, sorry. She's a nice ship. Lenny grunted. Eh, uh, no she ain't. Zack patted Lenny on the back. Heh, <laughs> you're absolutely right. But she grows on you. She makes you appreciate all the little things in better ships. Lenny pulled out a pair of binoculars from nowhere and peered at the frontier through them, examining the underside. Well, she looks like an H model. Uh. For a ship that only goes L to the 3, you sure made good time getting here, Rico said, remembering some of the specs he read earlier. You mean L to the 4, Zack corrected. Lenny looked at Zack through the binoculars. L to the 4, you say? Uh, Age model never did L to the 4. Zack shrugged. Imagine my surprise. It did have some custom work done on it, although why anyone would spend the time and money on a H model is beyond me. Lenny chuckled as he turned his binoculars back to the frontier. Next, you'll be telling me there's a, uh, coffee maker in the cockpit. Rico walked over to the rope, the attendant methodically clamping him in. Well, come on then. Uh, not you, Lenny. I need you to open the shop for the night. Lenny's shoulders slumped. Oh, Rick, I uh, wanted to see the ship. Lenny. Eh, okay. Rico and Zack rode the line up to the frontier, landing safely in the loading bay. Zack held out his arm as though he was an usher at a fancy party. And now, the main attraction. The force field around the station dimmed, simulating night. The sun still shone in the sky, but they looked as though someone had put several pairs of sunglasses over them. Feldo sat on a bench in the dim light, staring at the ground. He couldn't find Terry. He couldn't even find her ship, not knowing what it looked like. She could be gone, for all he knew. He heaved a heavy sigh. The universe was playing tricks on him again. He didn't look up when he heard footsteps, and soon he was staring at a pair of boots. Hey. Feldo looked up. A security officer stood, tapping her foot. The park is closed at night. Move along. Feldo looked down again. Just... give me a minute. The officer saw what state Feldo was in, and she sighed. Oh, all right, you poor thing. She walked off. 
Even through all his feelings, Feldo found the entire situation silly. It reminded him of an old Russian fairy tale Zack had shown him, where a male bird, something that never evolved on Atria, so the concept was very strange to him, was in love with a female bird, but she didn't feel the same. Eventually he decided he didn't love her, at which point the female bird decided she did love him, and the cycle continued into eternity. Fellow didn't know why he was reminded of this. Perhaps the irony? His thoughts were interrupted by the bump of someone sitting on the bench next to him. I said I'd leave in a minute. What? Feldo's head shot up, and his eyes were pierced with two blue gems. Feldo! I didn't know you guys were here. I just talked to Lef. Terry's voice trailed off as Feldo took in the details of her face, the ring of dark fur around her muzzle, her blue eyes. He had to look away. Feldo? What's wrong? If it's too soon... Feldo looked back. No. No, um... <clears throat> Hello, Terry. She laughed softly. <laughs> Hello, Feldo. Feldo knew he should say something, but what? Let's be friends? I love you? Can I borrow a pencil? I accept your offer. Terry's eyes widened after a moment of remembering. Oh, really? Oh, of course. When can you start? Well, after I'm done on the frontier, I'll be around Eden in three months. Terry hugged his arm. Aw, thank you. That's pretty much when my chief engineer is retiring. This is perfect. Eh, it's no problem. I was only going to stick around until then anyway. Not that I was going to choose any ship. Don't explain yourself. They sat a while in silence, Terry still holding onto Feldo's arm. He looked down and noticed their tails had curled around each other, Terry's faintly striped caramel fur blending with his pure white. Feldo had a crazy idea. Terry, you want to get dinner? She tilted her head and smiled. I thought you'd never ask. Rico and Zack sat in the loading bay, waiting for Lef and the others to get back. Rico tossed a wrapper out the door and watched it float away slowly. I've known party animals, no pun intended, but these guys sure stay out late. Just as he finished his sentence, Taliko and Yar shot into the loading bay in a bundle of fur and laughter. Taliko untangled herself from Yar and stumbled up, clearly tipsy. Hey! Zack! Stop the ship from moving! <laughs> <laughs> Yar wasn't as drunk, but he was drunk enough to ignore his fear of heights. Toliko, you're drunk. The ship stopped moving a long time ago. Oh, who's you? Rico laughed. <laughs> I'm Rico, here to do business with your captain. Toliko let out a gurgling sound. Love, uh, guys need to lighten up. Drink a little more, like Lena did. Zack pulled Yar to his feet. I think you guys should go get some sleep. Toliko grabbed Yar's arm and pulled him through the door. Yeah! Let's go to my bunk and do what people do after dates or whatever. Yar grinned. <laughs> Can't argue there. Rico looked at Zack. Uh, shouldn't we stop them? Uh, no. A noise made them turn around, and Lef and a very tired-looking attendant gently floated up into the loading bay, carrying Lena's sleeping form between them. Zack rushed over to help. Lef? What happened? Lef braced himself, but found Lena didn't weigh that much in the gravity of the loading bay. What? Oh! She had two drinks. Two. Fell asleep in the car on the way here. Zack noticed the content expression on Lena's face as she instinctively curled into a ball. Nothing serious. Oh. Lef smiled at Zack awkwardly. Listen, about what I said earlier. Zack briefly considered cutting him off and saying no problem, but he let Lef continue. I was out of line. You're a good engineer. But Felda was better, Zack wanted to say. Damn right. Lef spotted Rico, who waved. Who's this? Zack smiled. This is our ticket to a retrofit. Rico, meet Lef. Lef... Rico. I would shake your hand, but... Rico chuckled. <laughs> no need. Lef shifted Lena's weight in his arms. She was starting to get heavy. Uh, let's talk somewhere else. Meet me in the conference room. He hurried as fast as he could to her room. He kicked the door open and laid her down in her bed, pulling the covers over her. He was about to leave when something made him stop. Was the alcohol getting to him? 
he only had one drink. Leff realized what it was, and he went to sit down as a preemptive attempt to prevent injury. But something was definitely different this time. Leff shut his eyes, his spine turning to jelly and his mind going blank. The pain was dull this time, not sharp, not icy. He opened his eyes, but he couldn't see. He was blind. His mind still reeling, he stumbled forward, bumping into something, sending its contents crashing onto the floor. He wasn't getting anything in his blank mind. No information. Nothing. Maybe alcohol affected whatever this was. He finally lost consciousness without gaining anything. Leff had a dream, however. He was standing in space somehow, looking into Alpha 2. He could see everything from here, from the ships to the people to the finest details on the sidewalk. Leff felt sick as his brain saw everything on the station at the same time, from every conceivable angle. He saw Terry and Feldo laughing over glasses of something. The attendant, asleep at his post, a man with curly hair talking to two burly men. Leff! He awoke, finding he was looking into Lena's green eyes. Leff, thank God! What happened? He groaned and rubbed his head. He didn't remember much. Just going into the room, blank, and waking up. He tried to think, and he scraped something in his mind that caused him to shudder. Something so huge it filled him with fear. Something he couldn't begin to comprehend. Then, he was gone. Ugh. I must have tripped on the nightstand. The nightstand in question was on the floor. Its contents, mostly trinkets and some jewelry, strewn about. Lena felt around his head for a bump. I don't feel anything. Come on, lay down for a while. Left sat up, his head perfectly clear. No, I feel fine. Zack wants to talk to me. I have to go. He stood, collected the items on the floor, and replaced the nightstand. Lena stopped him before he could leave. Wait, are you sure you're all right? He smiled, kissed her on the forehead, and turned for the door. I'm fine, Peach. Don't worry about it. He walked out, leaving a very confused Lena. She flopped back in bed. I need to drink less. Zack and Rico tapped their fingers on the table. Jeez, this guy likes to make you wait. Zack shrugged. Maybe he... Leff walked through the door and sat down energetically. All right, how can I help you? Rico leaned forward and went into business mode. It's what I can do for you that's important. I have goods that have been purchased by a very wealthy collector, but I need to get them to him, and I need to soon. So, in exchange for passage to Baker Colony and cargo space under ship, I will pay for your ship's retrofit. Leff couldn't believe his ears. That was all. Why can't you just mail it? <laughs> Snail mail? They'd bring all the items and get there a week late. But you, as a colony ship, will be near Baker Colony in two days. Leff could usually tell if someone was trying to deceive him, because it was mostly bad liars that did, but he trusted Rico, and so did Zack. So, what exactly is it? Well, a couple boxes full of trading cards. Just found them in an old storage locker. Leff raised an eyebrow. What's a trading card? It's kind of hard to explain. An old Earth hobby or something. They're really rare and expensive. Leff looked Rico in the eye and extended his paw. All right, it's a deal. Bring the cargo aboard as soon as everything is fixed and fitted, and of course, we'll let you come along. Rico stood and shook Leff's paw. It's a deal, then. Thank you for this. It's a lifesaver. No, you saved us. We really need this refit. Rico nodded, then yawned. <sighs> well, it was good doing business with you, but it's late and I'm tired. He turned to Zack. It was great catching up with you, man. See you around. He walked out waving. Left slumped in his chair, his energy from a few minutes ago suddenly gone. You used to know him? <sighs> yeah, know him. I suppose you could say that. Rico walked back to Curio's, smacking the front desk next to Lenny's head. Lenny snorted and shot up. Bah! Uh, I wasn't asleep. Lenny, we got it. Oh, uh, nice job. Now we ain't gonna be scalped. Rico pulled out his SCOM and patched into a secure channel with practiced speed. Kane, I've got good news and bad news. Kane sounded irritable, though he always did. What is it? Did you get me a ship? Not exactly. You can't come aboard the ship, but I will keep good care of the cargo. Kane was clearly not a fan of this idea. What? You think I'm gonna trust you? It's out of the question. 
I will accompany you. Make sure you don't steal the cargo. I already made a deal with the captain. He's going to suspect something if I just show up with a surprise passenger. Kane chuckled. <laughs> You're a smart boy. You'll think of something. He cut the line. Rico almost smashed the SCOM as he slid the screen violently back into the body of the device. We might not have it. Eh, uh, shit. I'll think of something. I always do. Rico muttered. You better. Uh, I told you this whole thing was a bad idea. Oh, shut it. It was very late, almost midnight, yet Terry and Feldo walked around the same small garden, too deep in discussion to notice they had arrived at the Frontier's rope half an hour ago. No, no, Batista's a great throw, but he can't block for beans. What? You're forgetting the game between the darts and the knights when he blocked 89% of the shots made! I guess. I don't know why he's my least favorite player, then. Terry grinned. Maybe it's because his face looks like a prune. They laughed, Feldo swatting her shoulder with the back of his paw lightly. It does not. It totally does! You can imagine it on TV advertising prune juice! Okay, you're right. <laughs> Eventually they stopped laughing, and Feldo noticed the rope, devoid of any attendant. Well, there's my ship. Terry took his paw. Feldo, I had a great time. Me too. Thought I'd be out of practice. Terry giggled and swung his paw back and forth. You aren't out of practice. Or maybe you are. And you're just a natural at showing a girl a good time. Yes. That one. They laughed again, and Feldo broke the following silence. Terry? Yes? Is it alright if I kiss you? Yes. Feldo leaned in and pecked Terry gently. Well, see you in three months, then. Yep. Safe trip. You too. Feldo walked over to the rope and strapped himself in, waving at Terry as he did. As he ascended towards the frontier, Feldo felt as though he was floating, even more than you can in zero gravity. Frontier by Maggot Moshpit Chapter 17 Shortly after Rico paid Gedio, the crew of Alpha 2 started their work. The first order of business was to install emergency bulkheads around the cargo bays. These heavy metal doors would close shut shortly after a hull breach formed. Before the repair crews patched the Frontier's hull up, they took the opportunity of having access to the inner hull to install Plug Foam Trademark, a special polymer that expands and hardens as it is exposed to space, meaning breaches would automatically be sealed with the foam. During the renovations, the Frontier had to be vacated, though no one stayed on the ship anyway. Leff was taking a stroll in one of the parks, admiring the feat of botany it was to get all the plants to grow healthily in the alien environment. His bad mood had completely gone, now that things were finally coming up Leff. His pocket beeped, and he pulled out his SCOM, replaced by his old SCOM's insurance policy after it was broken by old man Jenkins, and answered the unknown number. Hello? Oh, hey Leff. It's me, Rico. Rico sounded nervous. Hey, what's up? Um, can you meet me at Curio's? Like, now? Leff had a bad feeling about this. Alright, what's this about? Nothing serious? No, nothing serious. Just, uh, unexpected. Okay, I'll be right there. Rico hung up. Leff put away his SCOM, thinking that Rico sounded too anxious for an antique dealer. He turned around and whistled as he followed the street signs to Curio's. He saw Rico pacing the shop from its garage door-like open wall as he approached. A man stood next to him. As he walked into the shop, he recognized the man as the man he had seen in his dream, a dream he never remembered having. A flood of memory poured into his head, taking along with it a splitting headache. Although most of what he had seen had been lost, he still remembered a great deal of information about Alpha 2, including this man. Rico stepped up to Lef as he walked in, ignoring his wince of pain. Ah, Lef, I'd like you to meet my Uncle Rick. He would like to tag along. Leff shook his hand, remembering the two men the man was talking to in his dream. He was pretty sure they called him Kane, though. Hello, I'm Leff. Nice name. Rick shot a glance at Rico. We're a very unimaginative family. Rico laughed nervously. Yeah, <laughs> my sister's name is Ricky. Anyway, this is very sudden, but I don't think it'll be a problem. Rick nodded. I just heard Rico was going to Baker Colony, and I thought I'd join him. Seeing as I was going there myself. Something didn't add up. So, 
you two are related, and you're both going to the same place, but you only just learned about this, Rick? Rick glanced around. Yes, well, we don't talk much. And it's a total coincidence we're going to the same place. Lef nodded slowly. Right, sorry to pry, but if you don't talk much, why not just go separately? Rick shrugged. Free ride. Lef relaxed his shoulders. He was probably being paranoid. He smiled. All right, then you can come along. It might not be as luxurious as a star bus, but what are you going to do? Rick just nodded and walked out of the shop. Lef looked around the shop, only having heard Rico was an antique dealer from Zack. Nice collection of stuff you got here. Rico perked up. His genuine interest in antiques was clear. Yes, I'm very proud of all the things I've collected, and there's a story behind almost every one. Lef perused the many items. Tin toy cars, large cameras, ancient video game consoles, all manner of historical paraphernalia. Hmm, I'm not much of a Terran history buff, but... This is impressive. Rico beamed. Thank you. I try. Lef picked up a thin rectangular box. The faded cover showed a raccoon atrium, but the numbers on the bottom dated the item at 2005. Terran calendar. He showed the item to Rico. What's this? Oh, that's an old Earth game. A popular item for archaeologists, as it shows atriums on Earth even before we discovered faster-than-light travel. Rico grinned. I think it's either a coincidence or a fake. Left put the item down. You'd think they'd have records of it on Terra. Clear up the question. Rico shrugged. A lot of culture was lost in World War III. Left really wasn't a Terran history buff. He had completely forgotten Terra had gone through three world wars. Huh, I didn't know that. Hell, I don't know shit about Atrian history. Don't feel bad. Well, you must know some things. You did live on Atria's moon, didn't you? I mean, that's how you met Zack? Yeah, but I didn't bother learning anything. I was an exchange student. My parents made me do it for the betterment of both cultures, as they put it. Lef nodded as Rico continued. I stayed there for a while, and I hated it so much I ran away and started a new life. Here? Well, I did some other stuff first, but yeah. And what about Zack? You guys seem to be pretty close. Lef said, the curiosity getting the better of him. Heh, <laughs> we used to date. Lef almost laughed. Homosexuality was extremely rare among Atrians, due to their reproductive cycle, but it did happen. Atrians didn't hold any prejudice against it, and there were no laws against it, but the concept was the butt of many jokes on Atria, something the few homosexual Atrians did not appreciate. Leth had to remind himself humans had a much higher number of these individuals, and a much more mature attitude towards it. Uh, okay, that's... cool. Rico laughed. <laughs> You sound like my physics teacher. Sorry, it's an Atrian thing. Don't worry about it. Rico shrugged. Humans weren't always so open to the idea of gay people running around, but those types pretty much disappeared 200 years ago. Hmm, Atria had something similar. In ancient times, the different subspecies of Atrians lived apart. Not by choice, mind you. Atria is three times bigger than Earth, and it took a while for them to find each other. But once they did, there were race wars. The feline species seemed the most powerful for a while, and the gap between species got so bad that feline nobles would walk around taking canines into slavery right off the streets. Whoa, what happened? One man named Martin stood up and showed we all had something in common. Left pointed to his eye. Our eyes are all the same. Soon it was discovered that all Atrians had pretty much the same internal organs. And we got over ourselves. Took a hundred years, but it happened. Rico digested the story for a minute. Hmm. I guess humans and Atrians aren't so different after all. Lef frowned. I just wish the Atrian government had looked in a history book before declaring war on your race. History repeats itself. I guess it does. Lef looked around the room some more, deciding he liked Rico and trusted him. Something on the wall caught his eye and he walked over and picked it up. What's this thing? Rico walked over and looked at the gun in Lef's paws. That's a rifle. I have no idea what it's called, but the seller said it was really famous. Lef felt the weight of the rifle in his paws and looked down the sight. Hmm, it's got a certain aesthetic quality I like. How much? I'd like to put it on the wall in my room. Rico grinned. You sure you can afford it? 
<laughs> I'm not paying a single credit for these repairs, and I'm getting paid 85 million credits when I'm done with my mission. I think I can afford it. Well, if you say so, it's a thousand bucks. Uh, that's 95,000 credits. Left pulled out his wallet and produced his bank chip. Never hurts to splurge when your days are numbered. Rico took his chip and walked over to the counter, plugging it into a machine and typing in the amount. All right, it's yours. You want some bullets for it? Uh, is that illegal? Rico waved his hand. Not if you have a license to carry. When I got the thing, I wanted to see if it would work, so I sent an order to a matter replication plant and they sent me eight bullets. Here's seven. He tossed Lef a small box. Thanks, but I won't need it. He waved and left with the rifle and box. Two days later, Left stood in the cockpit of the Frontier, waiting for a message. Everyone was aboard and raring to go. Leff heard the steady sound of a plasma welder suddenly stop as the last section of hull was replaced. Soon after, the comm beeped. Sir Leah answered. This is the Frontier. Go ahead. Gedio laughed on the other side of the comm. <laughs> Why so formal? You're all good. You won't explode next time there's a hull breach. Best of luck. Thank you. Goodbye. Left sat in his chair. Lena, take us out. Zack walked out of the engine room and towards the cockpit after running a last-minute check on the drive. As he passed one of the cargo bays, he heard grunting and peeked inside. Ah, uh, Rico. Do you want any help with that? Rico was pushing his cargo against the wall with difficulty. Uh, no, I've got it. Zack rolled his eyes and pushed the crate alongside Rico. <laughs> You're a terrible liar. Rico was about to say, fooled you, didn't I, but decided to pass up the opportunity and instead mumbled something. With Zack's help, the crate was pushed to the far end of the room, far away from the larger, non-breakable crates. Rico dusted off his hands. Whew! That's better. I don't want one of those crates falling and crushing mine when we jump to hyperspace. I don't think that would happen, but if it makes you feel any better... It does. Rico opened the crate and checked over the top layer of cards. Each one was in its own sleeve, and looked in good condition. Zack picked one up and turned it over in his hand. These are baseball cards. I didn't know there were this many left. There are, apparently. And before you ask, I had them checked. They're legit. Zack gingerly removed the card from its sleeve and looked at it closely. Something was wrong. Not with what the card looked like, but with its texture. Instead of being smooth, it was rough and grainy. Before he could wonder further, Rico snatched it from him. Hey, don't handle the merchandise! Okay, sorry. Ugh, you got fingerprints on it! Oh well, no one will notice. Thanks for the help. Ah, no problem. Zack took the hint and walked out of the cargo bay, heading to his cabin. Once he arrived, he picked up a data pad he was reading, but noticed something on his fingers. He looked closely. It looked like some of the card had crumbled and stuck to his fingertips. He sniffed them for no particular reason, and immediately sneezed. He shrugged brushed the remaining dust off his fingers, and continued to read. Rico walked into the converted cargo bay, where the usual hustle and bustle created an ambience of voices. Children kicked balls around, chased by their mothers when they inevitably broke something. Older folks sat at tables, talking or playing cards. Rico spotted Kane sitting at one such table, just staring nowhere in particular. He went over and sat across from him. Kane, what are you doing? Kane snapped out of his trance. What? Oh, it's you. I was just listening. An old habit. The more information you gather about anywhere you'll be spending a lot of time, the better. I suppose I expected you not to know that. Rico frowned, ignoring the offhand comment. So share some of the info. What have you heard? Kane nodded towards two people sitting across from each other, talking into their cups of water. Nothing of any value. These simple folk don't talk about much. That couple over there have been talking about the same thing for an hour and a half. Rico glanced over. What? They're all the way on the other side of the room. Kane tapped his ear. I didn't only get my strength enhanced, you know. Yeah, whatever. So what are they talking about? Kane sighed. <sighs> Their goddamn relationship. Apparently they had one night of drunken sex, and now they're discussing whether or not they have... Feelings for each other. It's the most shallow conversation I've ever heard. That's the problem with these Atrians. 
They rely too much on feelings to solve their problems. Hence why they haven't resolved the issue in an hour and a half. Kane, don't look now, but I think your prejudice is showing. Kane's smirk somehow got more menacing. I'm just making an observation. Sure. Oh, here comes a third one. This'll get interesting. From a cultural standpoint, of course. Rika watched as Lena walked up and sat at the table. Kane, do you watch soap operas by any chance? Zack wasn't feeling very well. His vision was getting blurry, and he was having trouble concentrating on his book. He stumbled to his feet, leaning heavily on the wall. He'd only felt something like this once before at a college party when he'd tried something a drunk friend had given him. What was on that card? He tried to think back to the party, but his mind felt fuzzy and didn't want to remember what the friend had called it. Zack exited his room, getting his footing somewhat, and walked shakily to the cargo bay where the cards sat in their crate. By the time he got there, he was thanking God he didn't sniff more of the stuff, as he was now feeling the full effects of the drug, if that's what it was. He couldn't think that straight, so he decided to talk instead. <sighs> Don't worry, Zack. Once you get to the bottom of this, you can warn Rico there's drugs on his cards. He ripped open the crate and picked up a card, removing it from its sleeve. His hands trembled as he inspected it. Sure, it was the one he picked up earlier. He rolled it between his fingers, and a fine dust fell to the floor. The more he rolled his fingers, the more dust fell, until there was a hole through the card. What the fuck? It's made of the stuff. He took the card in his hand and crushed it, the powder falling to the floor. He pulled out more cards, crushing them. It's all. He took out the top layer by removing the top tray, and beneath it were more cards and a small device. A light was blinking on the device. He picked it up pressing some of the buttons randomly. His random pressing caused something to happen. The device vibrated, causing Zack to drop it. He watched as it fell among some of the cards. The top glowed, and all the cards in the tray it fell on lost their color and turned to white powder. Zack! He turned around, the drug in his system wearing off surprisingly quickly. Rico, what is all this? Rico was holding his SCOM, and it was vibrating in his hand. Zack looked at it and realized something in the crate must have alerted him that someone was tampering with it. Zack, this isn't what it looks like. I know exactly what this is. This is drugs, Rico. You bought drugs aboard. Rico walked towards him slowly. Zack, you have to understand, I didn't have a choice. The fuck you did? You manipulated me into transporting your drugs and you know it. Alright, fine. But I need this, Zack. I'm deep in debt and can't- er, Rick- will kill me if I don't deliver this. I don't care. You're gonna get us all arrested. Zack pushed past Rico and towards the door. Zack, wait! He was about to shout back when he felt the end of a pistol against his back. I'm sorry, but I can't let you leave. You wouldn't shoot me. Rico pulled out his SCOM and called Kane. Rick, we've got a problem. Get to the goods now. He hung up before Kane could berate him. Zack, I'm not lying about Rick. <sighs> Fuck it, his name is actually Kane. He's a pawn in a drug cartel, and so am I. But it wasn't always like this. I was behind on my payments, and this was the only way out. Zack turned around slowly. I don't believe you. Rico's hand shook as he gripped the pistol. Whatever! Maybe I did deal on the side, but I never hurt anybody. Look at me. I'm stoned, and it's not very pleasant. Zack said, his mind still fuzzy. Kane burst into the room and ran over. Rico! What the hell is happening? Rico, you're dead. Lef was sitting at the table with Taliko, Yar, and Lena, trying to sort out their problem. Lena was in the middle of a spiel about being honest with oneself when something hit Lef in the side of the head. It wasn't something physical, and it felt as though it passed through his brain, leaving something behind. He felt like he was only out for a second, but when he opened his eyes, he was on the ground, surrounded by the occupants of the table. Taliko covered her mouth with her paws. Lef, what was that? You shouted in Phil- Lef sprang up. Lena, call the police. Tell them to get the SRT here ASAP. What? What's happening? Just trust me. Hurry! Lef ran off to his cabin. Shut up, Kane. We'll just, I don't know, lock him up until we get there? Kane reached inside his coat and pulled out a pistol of his own. No. We have to dispose of him and take the ship. Our cover has been blown. Rico pushed against Kane's arm. No, wait! 
Kane pulled the trigger, but Rico pushed it hard enough to cause him to miss. Zack jumped back, dripping on the crate top and sprawling on the floor. Rico, damn it! Think about what you're doing! We need to make this delivery! I know! Just don't kill Zack! Kane grabbed Rico with his other hand and shoved him away with incredible strength. I don't care what you say, and I never did. He needs to go! There was a gunshot. Kane staggered forward and turned around. What? He looked down at his shirt. Blood was spreading from a hole in his chest. Laf crouched at the door, the rifle in his paws, barrel smoking slightly. Kane tumbled forward. The same instant Rico fired his pistol at Laf, missing him and hitting the doorframe. There was a loud klaxon as the emergency bulkhead lowered quickly, Laf managing to roll out of the way just in time. He felt the ship drop out of hyperspace as he watched the bulkhead close fully. Damn touchy bulkhead. You could breathe at it and it would activate. Sully and Feldo arrived, out of breath. Lef, what's going on here? Why do you need the SRT team? It seems Rico's gotten into some trouble. I don't know what happened, but Rick tried to kill Zack. I got here in time, but Rico shut the door, and now the bulkhead is down. Feldo pulled off the door panel and fiddled with the wires as Serlia put her ear against the door. Is he safe in there? Rico won't hurt him? For some reason he tried to stop Rick, but I'm not sure. Feldo pulled out a wire. The controls are fused. I knew something was up with this Rico character the second I laid eyes on him. Serlia removed her ear from the door. I don't think I hear shooting, but who knows? Let's just hope the police get here in time. Rico paced the room, Zack sitting on the floor trying to stem the flow of blood from his nose. Rico, look, they've got you. Left found out somehow, maybe by psychic beads, I don't know, I'll have to ask him later. Look, what I'm trying to say is, you're screwed. Shut up! I'm trying to think. He paced some more, then remembered something. He pulled out his SCOM, set it for long distance, and called. Lenny, get everything you can and run. They got me. No, just... Go! Don't look back! He hung up. As soon as the bulkhead had closed shut, Rico had shot the door control some more to ensure they would remain shut. Zack ripped a strip off his shirt and jammed it up his nose. Rico, come on. Think about this for a second. What are you gonna do? You're trapped. I always think of something. His SCOM beeped. He answered it. Lenny, I told you to- He hung up fast. The police are here already. Oh, fuck, fuck, fuck! This is all your fault. If I hadn't gotten emotional, we would be free and clear. But now one of us is dead and I'm fucked. <sighs> Maybe Kane was right. Feelings do complicate things. Zack held out his hand. Give me the gun, Rico. No! I won't make the same mistake twice. Maybe I could use the escape pod. They'll blow you out of the sky, you know that. Rico swung the pistol at Zack, making him step back. It's better than going to prison for the rest of my life! I'm only 28. I'm not living my last 50 years in a cold cell on some penal colony. It's either that or death if you try to fight. Come on, think about this. Jesus, it's so simple. Give me the gun, turn yourself in. It's not going to be too long before they blow down the doors and get you anyway. Rika crouched on the ground and buried his head in his hands. I don't know. Just let me think. Zack quickly took this opportunity to snatch the gun from Rico's hands. Rico looked up abruptly. I would have given you the gun. I couldn't take that chance. Zack walked over to the door, reached inside the hole that was once the door controls, and pulled down the manual override lever, opening the bulkhead. Atrian SRT officers rushed in and grabbed Zack and his gun. Wait, guys, I was the hostage. Rico was quickly apprehended, as the officer that grabbed Zack smiled sheepishly. Yeah, I knew that. Feldo ran up to Zack. Are you alright? What did you do to your nose? I fell. Two officers shooed them out. This is a crime scene now. Please follow us. Zack looked back and caught Rico's eye for a split second before he was pulled off. They were led down the hall and through the crowd that had gathered and into the conference room where a command center had been set up. And though the officer that was setting it up was told it would be a long negotiation, and now he was packing all the equipment up trying not to look too disappointed. They sat at the table. Lena was sitting there as well, and she turned to Lef. So, they got him? Evidently, yes. Serlia chuckled. I don't know how you knew what was happening, but to be honest, I'm not complaining. A familiar face strolled into the room. Hello again. 
Leff wasn't surprised at this point. Hi, Prax. <laughs> well, in trouble again, hmm? This time unwittingly transporting drugs. I pushed my ship to L7 to get here, you know. No, don't worry, you're not in trouble. Kane isn't dead either, so I have to thank you. We were looking for that guy for a long time. But that's all classified. Anyway, down to business. You all have to fill out these forms. He handed them each a thick stack of papers and pens. And I'll be along later to collect your statements. He was on his way to the door when he turned around. Oh, and Lef, I'd better not find out you knew about the drugs and use them to pay off your repair bill, because I have a feeling that wouldn't make me very happy. Lef looked him in the eye. I didn't know. I'm just checking. He stepped out. Lef looked at the others at the table. What? I didn't know. After the long and tedious process, Prax and his crew finally left with their two prisoners. Lef shook his paw as he left. Thanks again. Don't mention it. He waved at Sir Leah as the airlock closed. Lef wiped his paw on his pant leg. I still don't like that guy. He keeps saving our fur. Yeah, yeah, I know, but he did take a million credits from me. They returned to the cockpit where the rest of the crew waited. Before giving the order to leave, Lef tapped Zack on the shoulder. Zack, you alright? What? Yeah, I'm alright. Why do you ask? You went through some pretty traumatic shit. I mean, held hostage by your ex? <laughs> you know, somehow that made it less scary. Right. Lena, resume course. I left! Frontier by Maggot Moshpit Chapter 18 Lef and Lena sat at a table in Lef's cabin, playing chess. It was Lef's turn, and he was deep in thought, paws folded in front of his muzzle. In an expert move that took Lef completely off guard, Lena had turned the tides of battle in her favor. Lef had taken what he thought was a brilliant move, taking a bishop and putting Lena's king in check with his queen. Lena, however, had set a trap expertly, and took his queen and put Lef in check with her other bishop. It's your move, Lef! He extended a paw towards the board, then retracted it. Oh, shush. Lena grabbed her tail and pretended to use it as a pillow, snoring loudly. Left sighed. You can be such a kid sometimes. He moved his rook to guard his king, a pawn guarding it. Lena woke up and looked at the board. I could see the same thing about you, Mr. I'm years older than my mate. She moved one of her knights. Left frowned. Lena's move made little sense. I've got you now. Six moves later, Left's king was in checkmate. He hung his head. I concede. Lena pumped her paw. Yes! I told you I could beat you! Uh, I mean, good game. Left began to put the pieces away. Humans and their deceptively simple games. I'd like to see Zack beat me at a game of sacrifice. He may very well win. He beat me at chess, you know. Lef grinned as he set the box on his desk, and pushed the table into a slot on the wall. Want me to smack him in the head a few times so you can remain the smartest person on the ship? <laughs> I'd like that. Lef stretched and yawned, glancing at the clock. <sighs> Man, it's late. Lena stood and went for the door. Just let me change into my pajamas. Lef changed into his sleepwear while she was gone. When she returned, Lef got an idea. You know, it's kind of annoying to have to run to my cabin in the morning in my underwear to get my clothes, and I am sure you feel the same way. Lena sat in her chair and nodded. Les scratched his head and looked at the floor. Wouldn't it just be easier to just, I don't know, move your stuff in here? Lena grinned. Les Quill, are you asking me to move in with you? Well, maybe just one drawer... Lena stood and left the room. Lef looked at the door in confusion, then smiled when she returned, carrying a bundle of clothing. Dropping the clothes into an empty drawer, she went back and sat in her chair. There! Lef smiled. Thanks, Peach. For what? It was the logical thing to do. I don't know. Maybe Zack was talking out of his ass. Humans put too much importance on stuff like that. So yes, he was. They both laughed. Lef yawned again and rubbed his eyes. He stood and fell onto his bed. Lena stalked over and jumped on top of him. Oof! Lef walked down the hall of the frontier towards the engine room. 
The place was silent, save for the hum of the ion engine as it worked. He soon reached the door to the engine room and entered. Zack? Feldo? You guys here? No one answered, but he spotted movement across the room. He walked over and saw Zack was working on something. Hey, Zack, why didn't you answer me? Zack continued to tinker with whatever it was, and eventually he put down his tools. Laugh. Yes? Laugh was getting a bad vibe from Zack. Zack turned around and showed him what he was working on. Leff looked at it and froze in place. He wanted to scream, but he couldn't. He wanted to look away, but he couldn't. What Zack held in his hands was an object, just a simple, shapeless shape. But when Leff looked at it, he saw the thing not only in Zack's hand, but in Zack's hand an hour from now, and in Zack's hand two hours ago. He saw the thing in his head, in the floor, in the drive, in space, on Alpha 2, in his house on the moon, in the sun, in the moon, on Terra, on Fax's ship, on his grandmother's little thing that feeds the Leff managed to tear his eyes away from the impossible object before it corrupted his mind any further. He looked on the floor and saw the shadow the thing cast. It was three-dimensional. Leff ran for the door, finding the bulkhead closed tight. He pounded on the door before hearing a dreaded sound. The drive was activating. In a brilliant flash, the frontier jumped into hyperspace, and Leff felt his flesh begin to burn as the radiation ate all the organic matter in the engine room. He fell to the floor, his body being mutilated beyond description. He shut what was left of his eyes and screamed with pain. The last thing he heard was Zack saying his name. Lef. Lef! Ah! Lef shot up, his cry of terror echoing around the room. He clutched his chest. His heart was racing, his lungs burning as he gasped. He felt something on his arm and saw Lena was clutching it. He looked at her her ears back, and a face that showed she was almost as scared as he was. Lef, just take deep breaths. Y you had a nightmare. He tried to take deep breaths, and eventually was able to lower his heart rate and get his breathing under control. <sighs> I'm sorry. If I startled you, Peach. I wasn't startled. I mean, you sounded like you were in a lot of pain. He flopped back down onto the bed. I don't remember much of it. I think I was in the engine room when the drive came online. Lena lay back as well. That's... a pretty terrible dream. Lef shook his head. That wasn't the worst part. There was something else I... can't remember. Lena turned Lef's face towards hers. Hey, don't worry about it. If you do, you might remember what it was. She kissed him, and he smiled. You're right. It was just a dream. Lef closed his eyes as fatigue took over his body. Just a dream. Lef awoke the next morning from a dreamless sleep. He reached over to the spot next to him, but found it empty. Sitting up abruptly, he looked around, then at the clock. Twelve already? He got out of bed, pulled on some clothes, and meandered to the cockpit. He saw everyone was already on duty, sitting around with nothing much to do. Hey Peach, you shouldn't have let me sleep in. She turned around and smiled sheepishly. Sorry, you just look so cute. Left sat in his chair as Surlia failed to suppress a laugh. Anyway, anything out of the ordinary? Zack sighed and placed another card on the table in front of him. <sighs> Not a single thing. Feldo placed a card on top of Zack's card. There, I win. Zack placed his cards down contemptibly. Man, this game is hard. Try me at chess, then see how you do, Feldo. Feldo poked Zack repeatedly as part of his victory dance. I'm the sacrifice king! Eat my shorts! Feldo, I didn't know you played sacrifice. Let's have a game. Feldo was about to carry his cards over when his console beeped. Hang on. Lef, no yield weapons fire. Very close. Lef stood. Drop out of hyperspace and arm the cannons. Lena, be ready to hightail it out of here if things go south. As the ship dropped out of hyperspace, the sensors began gathering data, and soon Serlia was able to get a visual of what was going on. Two ships, both small cruisers. One, maybe two men each. One seems to be attacking the other. The one not attacking is in bad shape. 
Atrian life signs aboard. I don't know what they did to be attacked, but it looks like they'll be killed if we don't do something. Zack, fire a few warning shots. The cannons blazed, firing projectiles so fast they simply looked like lines of hot metal as they streaked by the attacking ship. It broke off, fired a shot at the frontier, which missed, and jumped into hyperspace without a word. Sir Leah, what's the status of the other ship? The comm beeped. I think we're about to find out. The image of a burly tiger stared back at Sir Leah as the other ship hailed them. He spoke in a gruff voice. Much appreciated, cargo vessel. If you don't mind, we need repairs, and would be willing to trade for them. Left switched the transmission to his screen. This is the captain of the cargo ship, the Frontier. And before we do anything, you need to tell me why that other ship was attacking you. The tiger scratched his head. Well, we're both after the same item. They were only going to disable us. Left tilted his head slightly. Item? So it was a petty squabble? Well, yeah. All right, you can come aboard and we can negotiate. Docking port is aft. The tiger smiled. Thank you very much. He cut the transmission. Left jumped up. Sir Leah, let's go. They walked to the docking bay, arriving as the cycle went through its last few minutes. Sir Leah faced the door and crossed her arms, as she always did in situations like these. Lev, this had better not be something that wants to eat us. Ah, uh, don't worry about it. Bad luck has to run out eventually. The airlock hissed slightly as it opened, revealing the tiger from the calm. Greetings. My name is Conrath, but everyone just calls me Colonel, and this is my boss. The second figure walked through the door, and as left saw him, his eyes grew wide. What? How is this possible? You're dead! Nice to see you too. <laughs> Sue said as he grinned up at Lef. Lef ran over, giving Sue a bear hug. Oh, what happened to you? How did you escape? Let go, and maybe I'll tell you. Sir Leah shook her head. I knew it. I knew it all along. Conrav looked at the scene. I take it you know each other? Lef finally let go of Sue. Yeah, we know each other, Colonel. These are the people I told you about. The ones that pretty much broke up Bowman's rule. Conrev smacked his head with the realization. Oh, then you must be Lef, and you Lena. Boss told me all about his heroics in saving you. Conrev leaned in. He likes to brag. Sue smacked Conrev playfully. That's Sir Leah, you dope, and I do not brag. Lef couldn't keep the smile off his face. Sue, you have to come and tell us the story. Come on, I'll go get everyone. Lef pushed Sue and Conrev into the conference room and ran to the cockpit. He poked his head inside. Guys, put the cockpit in standby mode. There's someone you need to see. Lena pressed a few buttons. Who is it? You'll see. They followed him, puzzled looks on their faces. Lef grinned uncontrollably as he ushered them into the conference room. Sue stood and waved as they entered. Hey guys, I'm not dead. Sue? Zack and Feldo stood with jaws agape as Lena leaned over the table and looked closely at Sue. My god! It's really you! Hey, it's not like I escaped in the big flashy chase scene. They all sat around the table as Sue started his story. So there I was. I just sprang Lena and I thought I was done for. So I just threw down my gun and held up my paws and they just took me prisoner. And the cops showed up like an hour later and got me out. Left hand to laugh. <laughs> that was it? Yep, and of course you haven't heard of any of this. There hasn't been a press release yet, even all these months later. Conrev nodded. And you can bet it's gonna make Sue out to be a big hero. And I'm sure you guys too. Lena waved her paw. Sue, I want to thank you for saving my life. I'm sure I can speak for all of us when I say we will be willing to help you get your ship prepared as thanks. Sue shook his head. No, no, I should be apologizing to you for all the trouble I caused. I can't imagine how you felt, Lef. Look, let's just call it even and we'll repair your ship. Deal? You got it. There is one other thing you can help me with for all time's sake. This better not get us eaten, Fellow said. No, this is safe stuff. Well, relatively safe stuff. Colonel, show them. Boss, you sure? Yes, now get the scroll. Conrev pulled out a tube and upended the contents onto the table. A single roll of parchment. Sue pulled out a pair of pistols and used them to weigh down the ends of the roll. As Colonel already told you, we're after something. This. He thrust his finger at the page. It was an intricate drawing of some sort, detailed in its randomness, with an almost mathematical intricacy to it. 
It resembled a polygon with uncountable size and was shown to radiate strange energy. Lena studied it with growing interest. What is it? Sue grinned and chuckled. <laughs> I have no idea, but I know where it is and that people will pay very good money to get their paws slash hands on it. But then... that other ship is looking for the same artifact. We need to hurry! Sue leaned back. Nah, they don't know where it is. They were going to try and hack into our computer, but then you showed up. We've got time. Lef looked at the picture. For some reason, it instilled him with a sense of familiarity. So, where is it? <laughs> well, I'd love to tell you, but that's one of the systems that was damaged, our main computer. The coordinates were inside, and I didn't memorize them. Feldo, Zack, you know what to do. Feldo rubbed his paws together and stood. This'll be fun. Conrad stood as well. I'll show them the way around the ship. He led them out the door, even though they knew the way. Lef turned to Sue. Now you have to tell us why you became a... treasure hunter. Lena and Serlia leaned in as he started his story. Well, it all started when I found a gold coin on a deserted planet. The news spread quickly, and soon the conference room was crammed with colonists listening to the stories of Sue's adventures. He soon moved to the cargo bay where he continued, embellishing the stories more and more. He told about how he met Conrev, another rebel against the cult of Larosia, and how he reclaimed the sacred crown of legend for Atria's oldest colony, and other such tales. Leff and Serlia slipped out when it became clear it was mostly fiction. They climbed aboard Sue's ship, where Zack, Feldo, and Conrev were working. Feldo had his head buried inside the computer core, so Leff went over to Zack as he pondered over the drive's diagnostic software with Conrev. Zack? Oh, Lef. Uh, the drive is fucked, for lack of a better word. I don't know what it is about these smaller ships, but they can't keep their drives operational long enough to get anywhere. Conrev looked over the statistics on the screen, clearly having no idea what any of it meant. He looked from Zack to Lef nervously. So you can't fix it? Nope. Fuel injector is busted. The sphere's cracked. 300 circuits fused. Nothing we can do. Sorry, Conrev. Sulia patted him on the back. Cheer up, Big Kai. If Feldo can recover the coordinates, we'll take you there ourselves. Ahem. <clears throat> With 10% of the profits, of course. Sulia punched him. For free. Ow! For free! Conrev seemed to cheer up, but his anxiety returned when Feldo walked up. Hey, I got good news and I got bad news. Which one do you want to hear first? There was silence, as no one volunteered an answer. Okay, I'll give you the bad news first. Computer's memory core was damaged, and most of the files were lost. Good news? I can get the coordinates back, but it'll take some time. How much time? A few days at best. You took one hell of a beating. More than you made it out to be. Conrad slammed his paw on the wall. Damn it! He was so close to... When I get my paws on that Glicks knockinog, I'll punch your blue nose right through a skull! Lef backed up a step. Hey there, Colonel. Slow down. You can get your revenge by mooning this Glicks something as you fly away with your prize. It took a few minutes for Conrev to get himself under control. Sorry. Anger issues. Sirlia smiled at him, hoping he wouldn't smash any of their skulls in. It's alright. We all get a little mad sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Left thought for a moment, then went for the airlock. You guys see what you can do here. I'm going to get another look at that drawing. Left walked down the hall, the drawing on his mind. He didn't know where he knew it from, but it seemed important he remember what it was. It was still on the conference room table when he walked in, and he simply sat across from it and studied it. The thing on the page didn't resemble anything. But then again, it could resemble anything you wanted it to with a little stretch of the imagination. The more Lef looked at it, the more it became on the tip of his tongue, and he felt as though if he looked at it just a little longer, he would remember. That moment never came, and it drove Lef crazy. Not being able to look at it anymore, he stood fast and faced the wall, clutching his head. What are you? Lef's rumination was interrupted by the door opening. It was Toliko. Hey, Lef. I was looking for you. Lef found it was hard to focus on Toliko's face. Can you just... Some other time? But it's important. Me and Yar made up and now we decided to become mates. Isn't that wonderful? Toliko, I don't have time to deal with you right now. Leave. 
Toliko's face was the picture of dejection. She was about to say something, but instead just ran out of the room. Lef forgot about her the second she left. Returning to the drawing, he looked over every detail, digging around in his mind for something he wasn't even sure was there. As he gazed at the thing on the page, he felt the frustration in his mind consume him, causing him to go blind again, and his legs turned to jelly. That wasn't the only thing. He felt his heart stop. Gray. Lef had always heard when you die it was pure white all around. It was gray in this place, wherever this was. The gray mist swirled around him as he stood, totally naked save for his fur, in front of a monolith of water about eight feet high and two feet wide. Lef looked at the thing and drew the only logical conclusion. Are you God? The water didn't say anything back. How it was staying like that, Lef didn't know, but somehow it made him feel better. It was a familiar thing. Feeling silly, he tried to talk to water. He stepped over to the tower and put his paw inside it. Hello. He retracted his paw fast. In his mind, he heard the blunt, impossibly loud voice of something. Looking around, he saw he had no other choice but to put his paw back in. Hello, Lef. Uh, hi. Who are you? I, we, you. I am a traveler. The voice stuttered as if it didn't fully have a grasp of spoken language. A traveler, eh? Well, what are you doing here? Not much sightseeing to be done. Here. This is for your sanity. My sanity is just fine. Last time, you died. This time, we talk. Lef shook his head. Last time? What do you mean, last time? I don't remember that. You died. Yeah, I got that part. The water churned and shifted suddenly, shrinking down, compressing into a long, thin snake of water. No, Lef thought, not a snake, a worm. It reached out with what he assumed to be its head and engulfed his paw again. This time, when the thing spoke, its voice was muted and it seemed to have a better understanding of language. The artifact. It must be destroyed. What? You mean the thing Sue is after? Why? Sue isn't going to like that. It must be destroyed. The ramifications of its continued existence are impossible to describe to you and your limited vocabulary. For a split second, Lef experienced the most exquisite horror imaginable. A searingly bright darkness creating perfect chaos across the universe. If he had a stomach in this weird place, he would have lost his lunch. Destroy the artifact, or that will be the outcome. Wait, I need more information than that. Hey, wait! The tendril of water slithered away from him quickly, faster than he could run. Soon, the gray brightened, and caused him to become blind again. Lef awoke to Sir Leah's lips wrapped around his, as she blew air into his lungs. He coughed hard, and she jumped back alarmed. Lef gasped several times before he got his voice back. What? Sir Leah felt his pulse as she quickly wiped her face. Lef! Oh, thank God. What? He then noticed a pain in his right paw, and when he tried to hold it in front of his face, he realized someone was crushing it. Lena was clutching his paw as though it was a winning lottery ticket, tears streaming down her face. Don't cry, Peach. She took a deep breath to get her voice under control, then spoke. Left. We thought... We thought you were dead. Dee was also crouching beside him, holding her fancy medical scanner she had bought for the old farming community. You were dead for a whole minute! A heart attack! What? It's strange! Lef sat up, much to the surprise of Dee and Sir Leah. A heart attack? I don't feel like I've been hit by a truck. Isn't that what it's supposed to feel like? Dee looked at the scanner with increasing puzzlement. You should feel like that! I don't see any cardiovascular damage, no loss of oxygen, nothing that would indicate you just had a heart attack. This is impossible! Left pulled Lena into a hug, more for her sake than his. He felt fine. He looked around the room at the stunned faces of Rackham, Conrev, Zack, Feldo, Toliko, and Sue as they stared at a man who had just sat up from a heart attack. Dee scratched her head. You have a clean bill of health! This is... God's work! Left gently stroked Lena's fur as she silently cried into his shoulder. Sue, 
We need to have a talk. Frontier by Maggot Mosh Pit, Chapter Nineteen. Absolutely not. Leff pulled himself into a chair and rubbed his temples. Sue, you don't understand what might happen. I was shown what, what will happen if I don't destroy this artifact, and it isn't pretty. Sue looked around, as if the others might offer an explanation. What the hell are you talking about? You're making it seem like you had some vision quest from the gods. I suppose I should explain it to you. For a while now, I've been hallucinating. I guess it's always something bad, and it always comes true without exception. Most of the time, I have enough time to stop whatever it is. In fact, when Bowman attacked our ship, I had one of these hallucinations. It was too late to do anything, though. Sue stood there silently, then sat down. He looked around again. Is this true? Surlia nodded. Yep, every time. Sue shook his head. I'm sorry. This is still kind of hard to swallow. You're saying you're psychic? Lef shrugged. I don't know. Maybe, but what I do know is that I can say with 100% accuracy that our universe will be destroyed if we don't get rid of this artifact. The the entire universe? Yes. I don't know why or how, but it will happen. Sue, you have to trust me on this one. Help me do this, or at least don't get in the way. Sue sat for a long time, weighing the options. Eventually, he slammed his paw on the table and turned to laugh. Fine, but you owe me one weird alien artifact. Lef jumped up and ran for the door. Great. Now let's go. Feldo ran after him. We don't have the coordinates yet. Lef stopped. I know the coordinates. Don't ask me how. The thing didn't tell me directly. Once in the cockpit, Lef jumped in the pilot's seat himself and locked in the coordinates, flicking on the intercom. Get ready for a hyperspace jump, people. The frontier was already on its way by the time the rest of the crew arrived. Lef was looking intently at the ship's course, calculating how long it would take them to get there. The crew took their stations apprehensively, glancing at Lef from time to time, as though he might just drop dead from another heart attack. Lena stood awkwardly next to her chair, which was currently occupied by Lef. She tapped his shoulder. Um, Lef, can I talk to you outside? He looked up at her distractedly. Huh? Oh, yeah. Just give me a minute. He punched a few numbers into a calculator. Uh, we'll be there in a couple hours. Sit tight, guys. He stood and looked at Lena. Okay. She let him out the door and closed it behind her. Lef, you, you died back there. Nah, I wasn't dead. It was like my consciousness was just moved somewhere else temporarily. She stood stiffly, staring at Lef's chest. But your heart stopped. I thought. Her voice caught in her throat, and her ears pressed against her head. Lef realized what she just went through and almost smacked himself. How could he be so single-minded? He stepped forward and embraced her gently. I'm sorry you had to go through that, Peach. I'm all right now, so don't you cry. She sniffed and looked up at him. But what about next time? You, you might have another vision and, and not come back. He ruffled her head fur. I can't control them, so there's no sense worrying. She looked down again. Yeah. Lef broke the hug, patted Lena on the shoulder, and went back into the cockpit. He walked over to Sir Leah, his ribs still aching from when she performed chest compressions on him. She stood and punched his arm before he could apologize. Ow! What was that for? Don't ever make me do mouth to mouth on you again. Lef thought of about a hundred different jokes he could have made, but with his mate standing right there, he chose the most benign. I'm glad I'm okay too. She crossed her arms and sat down again. Whatever. He took his seat in the captain's chair and folded his paws in front of his muzzle. I hope we get there in time for any of it to matter. Sue sat in the converted cargo bay with Taliko and Yar, sipping drinks. Taliko wasn't particularly interested in her drink and kept moving it left and right on the table, gazing into it as though it held the secrets of the universe. Sue sensed something was wrong, and he glanced at Yar, giving him a look. Yar shrugged and made the I don't understand gesture. Sue rolled his eyes and set his glass down. Taliko, is something the matter? She kept looking into her glass. I don't know. It's Lef. He snapped at me before. He had a heart attack. Like, 
seconds before. Yar finally took the hint and placed a comforting paw on Toliko's shoulder. Uh, he probably wasn't himself, you know, because he was having a heart attack. She shook her head. No, he's changed. I can't put my claw on it, but he's different. You're right. Something's off about him, and I'm not just talking about being psychic. It's like... Sue thought long and hard, but Yar finished his sentence. Like there's something else in there with him. Yes. Toliko downed her drink in one go. I don't know, but I'm shook up, and I need some cuddles. Yar? She stood and dragged him off. Sue chuckled and sipped his drink. <laughs> See you later. Leff was about to nod off. He had been sitting in the cockpit doing nothing for the past hour when the ship dropped out of hyperspace. He grunted and looked around. Ugh. We can't be there yet, can we? Sir Leah checked her instruments. No, we're still 40 minutes away. Wait, look at this. Leff went over and scanned Sir Leah's screen. What? Someone sent the emergency deactivation codes to the drive computer. I don't even have those. Sir Leah's console beeped, and so did Lena's. Leff? There's a ship approaching. It isn't hailing, but it has weapons charged. Left jumped back to his own console and tried to gain access to the computer. Ugh, everything's locked out. I can't do anything. Damn it. Zack, try and override everything and switch it to the night computer from engineering. Zack nodded and dashed out the door. Feldo, weapons. Feldo jiggled the joystick around, but nothing happened. The weapons are gone, too. This guy's good. It's not a guy. Left looked over his shoulder. Sue was standing in the doorway, guns in paw. She's after the scroll, and I don't intend to give it to her. It's worth the small fortune itself. I'm guessing you have a plan. He grinned. That's my job. I'm the brains, and Colonel is the brawn. Lef, I need your piloting skills. What for? Sue stepped out the door and beckoned. I'll explain on the way to my ship. They walked quickly towards the airlock. Glicksnark and Og will try to get in through the airlock and probably blast my ship to bits in the process. She's very clever and never does something like this unless she knows she can. Who is she, anyway? Sue clenched his fist. My arch nemesis. She's taken half the treasure I go after just to spite me. All because I said she was a dude! Lef couldn't help but laugh. <laughs> Their race does seem to take extreme offense to that, don't they? That's beside the point. If we can hold her off long enough to get control of the computer back, we'll be able to disable her ship. No offense, Sue, but I don't think your ship is in any shape to do any holding off right now. That's where you and the Colonel come in. Sue piloted his ship towards Glicknark and Nogs, slowly, under ion power. He powered his light pulse cannons and hailed her. Glicknark and Nog, you don't know what you're getting into. There are 60 tough farmers on that ship, and they're all armed and bloodthirsty. Her blue, long-nosed face appeared on screen. She babbled something in her language, and the computer translated. Sue, you think I don't know that? My ship isn't as shitty as yours, you know. My sensors actually work. He gritted his teeth. You won't get close enough to be beaten to death. I'll stop you first! Glicksnarkenog laughed, but it sounded more like a drowning cat. <laughs> Big talk for a kitten in a cardboard box. You going to sneak by me or something? <laughs> Sue caught the line, confident he had baited her enough. He reversed thrust and settled directly in front of the airlock, maneuvering around one of the Frontier's cargo ellipses. Glicksnarkenog grinned in her cockpit. She had studied up on the specs of the H model, limited armaments, and an easily acquired emergency shutdown code. These codes were used by the police to shut down ships on the run, but after a privacy leak that was traced back to the use of these codes, the Atrian government removed them from all active ships. Glicksnarkenog knew the frontier wouldn't have been treated the same as it was practically a derelict. No one would spend time upgrading it. She powered her forward cannons and prepared to fire at Sue. She chuckled when his pulse blasts took her shielding down to 99% and hailed him again. Surrender. Then maybe I won't break what's left of your- Her ship shook violently and she almost banged her head on the wheel. Her shields were down to 70%. She pulled up and accelerated quickly, scanning the area. Two shuttles were waiting for her, hiding behind the ellipses and opening fire with plasma weapons. Where did they come from? They looked like fighter pods from an Atrian carrier ship, but... 
They were painted like escape pods, complete with warning lights. Her ship couldn't hope to outmaneuver them, and those plasma blasts would tear her ship apart in short order. She cursed and powered up the drive. Someone did spend time upgrading that ship, she thought to herself. Someone good. Sue watched with satisfaction as Glicksnarkinog jumped away. He held Leff, who was in one of the shuttles. Good work, buddy. She didn't expect that. By the way, where did you get those? Leff started the re-docking sequence as he responded. They came with the ship, and I just thought they were escape pods. I guess the previous owner got them. <laughs> just one of these is more combat-ready than the Frontier. Well, I'm glad someone spent money on them. Meet me back in the cockpit when you finish docking, Leff said, then cut the transmission. Sue walked into the cockpit with a smile on his face. He had finally gotten the better of Klixnarkinog and made her run away with her tail between her legs. Except she didn't have a tail. All right, Lena, continue on our previous course, Leff said. Lena shook her head. Zack still hasn't restarted! Lena stopped mid-sentence due to the fact that the computer switched over to night mode, invalidating what she was about to say. Never mind, I'll set the autopilot. Leff hit the intercom. Good work, Zack. Now see what you can do for getting the normal computer up and running. I don't like the reduced functionality of the night computer. The ship jumped to hyperspace as the autopilot took over. The night computer was for when there was nobody in the cockpit, and the route was not expected to have any problems. It had little control over the ship, and only went from point A to point B without any pathfinding. It wasn't long until Zack arrived back from the engine room. Okay, Lef. You can try it now. All I had to do was reboot the entire computer system. Left tried it, and the computer came back online, without any emergency restrictions. Nice one, Zack. Good work. Zack nodded and went back to his station, wondering if Feldo could have done it faster. Half an hour later, the ship dropped out of hyperspace and signaled their arrival at the coordinates. Left stood, feeling nervous for some reason he couldn't pin down. Cerulea, where are we? Um, a star system with 30 planets? Wow, that's a lot. The exact coordinates point to the 29th planet from the sun, on a spot on the northern continent. There are also two comets flying through the solar system. Leff opened his mouth to order them to the 29th planet when Sue cut in. Wait, Leff. Glicksnarkinog is probably waiting for us to make a move somewhere and then follow us. Leff looked at him skeptically. Where would she hide? Our sensors would pick her up anywhere in the system. The comets! Sue snapped his finger. Yep, she's probably using the comet's trail to confuse our sensors. Then, what do we do? Lena turned around in her seat and cut Sue off before he could start explaining. We use the comet too! Uh, what she said. Glicksnarkinog sat in her cockpit, fuming. She wouldn't be caught off guard again, not by Sue and his pea-brained companion. The comet continually cascaded frozen rocks and water around her ship, making it so she could see out of the tail, but anyone outside would mistake her for a large chunk of rock. She watched as the frontier flew near the second comet, which wasn't too far off the first, and match its speed. This maneuver was not missed by Glicksnarganog, and she grinned to herself. Trying to outsmart me, eh, Sue? Not this time! She thought to herself as she watched the Frontier break off and head for the 29th planet. She watched as they entered the orbit and waited, presumably for her to follow. But instead, she turned her attention to the comet, and more importantly, the ship that was now flying towards the 8th planet. She followed it with a fool's grin on her face. Left chuckled to himself as he watched Glicksnarkinog take the bait. <laughs> we can wait another few minutes, then we'll take the shuttles down. What's the atmosphere like? Surlia checked the scans as they came in. Oxygen, nitrogen. It's a bit thin. Don't overdo it. Left pulled her up by the shoulders. What are you talking about? You're coming with us. Surlia groaned. Ugh, come on, Leff. I don't want to go cave diving for some dusty artifact. I need you down there. You're the best shot here. Expecting trouble? Left turned for the door. I don't know what to expect. Lena, you stay here with Feldo and hold down the fort. If Klixnarkinog figures out it's a ruse, don't let her land. Call her a guy if you have to. Lena saluted, and Feldo nodded. All right, let's go, Sir Leah, Zack, Sue. Leff was about to put on his best badass stride down the corridor, when right outside the door was Rackham, blocking the way. Leff, we need to have a little chat. Some other time. Rackham picked up Leff effortlessly and carried him down to the cargo bay, Leff shouting back. 
Wait for me at the pods! Rackham put left down inside an empty cargo bay. Left, how many times are we going to have this talk? I was just listening to Toliko, and she tells me there's a bloodthirsty blue out there ready to jump us. Now look here. Left grabbed both of Rackham's shoulders and looked him directly in the eye, his voice taking on a serious tone. Rackham, look into my eyes when I tell you this, and know I have the utmost confidence in what I'm saying. The universe is in danger. The 60 lives on this ship doesn't compare to the amount that will die if I don't do this. Rackham stared long and hard at Leff, and a moment of clarity passed between them. He knew the stakes were high. <sighs> Get going. Leff left without another word. Rackham sat in the cargo bay, a strange feeling passing over him. He thought he saw something in Leff's eye, but he couldn't put his claw on it. Leff wrestled with the pod's controls as he made a shaky descent. Damn, this turbulence is really something. I thought you said the atmosphere was thin. Celia clutched her stomach tightly. Uh, I guess the wind speed is just really high. Leff felt them get buffeted to the right, and he was forced to roll violently. Oof! Celia, you all right back there? Celia just nodded and swallowed. Leff was able to make the landing on a suspiciously flat surface, rain beating down. He hailed the other shuttle. Hey guys, you getting down okay? Yeah, we'll land in a minute. Serlia opened the hatch and stepped out into the rain. The sky was a bright, oppressive red, the rain coming down in torrents, flattening Serlia's fur to her body. She ran for a nearby outcropping of rock and took cover. Left dashed after her, and both waited as the second shuttle made its landing. Left shook himself with rain. It's weird that it's so bright out in the middle of a storm, and that the rain itself is so warm. It's kind of nice, actually. Serlia shook rain from her ears. Ugh, I'll be glad to kiss this godforsaken planet goodbye. I hate rain. Sue and Zack ran from the other shuttle, ducking into the small cave. Zack ruffled his short hair. Huh, nice planet. It's like having a shower all the time. Sue shook himself vigorously. I hate water! God, why did I agree to this? Left turned around and inspected the wall. Well, this isn't an entrance or anything. I doubt they kept it on the surface. It must be underground somewhere. Zack, let's go find it. Surly and Sue watched as Leff and Zack searched the area, hoping they wouldn't have to run through too much rain to get there. Zack reached the other side of the flat rock and peered down the other side. He took a step back. Whoa! That is one steep drop. Leff, be careful. We're on a spire of some sort. Sue rolled his eyes. Rain and heights? Fuck me. Leff looked behind a large boulder and called back. Hey, there's a flight of stairs here. Zack ran over. Let's go down. Guys, come on. They disappeared behind the boulder. Serlia looked at Sue. I can carry you if you don't want to go yourself. Sue stepped out into the rain and walked briskly to the boulder. Hell no. Come on, or do I have to carry you? They walked as fast as they could down the stairs. Leff and Zack waited at the bottom, the light from the sky lighting the small chamber. The stairs ended in a grate that drained the water from the rain. Left ran his paw along the wall, feeling the runes etched into its surface. I wonder what these mean. In the center of the room was a pedestal, and atop the pedestal was a strange shape. Slightly round, but looking as if someone had smashed it in with a baseball bat. That must be it. Left approached it slowly, as if it might make him have another heart attack. When the pedestal creaked and began to shiver, he almost did. Zack jumped the hardest. Jesus, it's moving. D stand back. The pedestal began to unfold, revealing it wasn't a pedestal at all, but a vaguely humanoid shape folded into a rectangular prism. It creaked and groaned as it stood on its spindly legs, balancing awkwardly as it took a step forward, its head clearly too heavy for its body. Leff held out his arms disarmingly. Hey there, robot friend. Surya swatted the gun out of Sue's paw before he could raise it. The robot tilted its head as if it were looking at each of them in turn. A strange voice emanated from it. You. Have. Come. Leff looked behind him, then back at the robot. Uh, yeah, I think. You, um, don't mind if we destroy you, right? I. Am. Powerless. To. Stop. You. The robot stood stock still, awaiting its demise. Its head if it could be called that, did very much resemble the thing on the paper, if a bit more tame. Leff reached for the gun Sue was reluctantly offering him, 
but stopped and turned around. Hey, who are you? I am a vessel as you are. Left frowned. This thing knew something. A vessel? For what? What are you talking about? Tell your master they will never escape. What? Left didn't have time to ask any further questions, as a black tendril snaked from the thing's head, and it began to lurch towards them, spindly arms outstretched. Whoa! Sue, blast that thing now! Sue shot the robot's head with deadly accuracy. It exploded, not with fire, but with something much more destructive. Black, inky darkness burst from it, flopping on the ground like a wet rag. All four jumped back as it snaked towards them. Sue shot at it, but the pulses simply got absorbed by the dark energy. What the hell is that? Left shouted as he backed away from the dark monster. So they grabbed the gun from Sue's paws and shot at the ceiling, causing rocks to fall on the thing. It seemed to have an effect, squishing the organism, causing it to scream in what Left could only assume to be pain. They watched as two long tendrils shot out and hit the wall with devastating force. They were almost knocked to the ground as the entire spire began to shake. Zack grabbed a hold of the closest thing, Sir Leah. Uh, I think we need to get out of here. We did our part. I agree! Sir Leah shouted over the sound of the ceiling crumbling and crushing the thing even further. Leff was about to run for the stairs when something on the wall caught his eye. Sue and Zack were already up the stairs and running to the pod when Sir Leah glanced back down the stairs. Leff was standing, pressed against the wall while chunks of rock fell around him. Leff, what the hell are you doing?! Silly ran back, dodged a falling rock, and tugged on Left's arm. Left, this is no time to joke around! She looked at what he was looking at, and she froze too. On the wall was a perfectly accurate etching of Left's face. Under it was a message written in unknown runes. Left stared at it, unblinking. Sir Leah, all the answers are here. I know it. The spire shook once more, and this time it felt as though it could fall at any moment. Left, we don't have time to ponder this one! We have to go... now! Left ran his paw over the runes over and over, as if it might make him able to read them. Sir Leah put him in a headlock and dragged him away from the wall. He thrashed violently. No! It's all there! On that wall! Please! The section of the wall and the floor under it suddenly collapsed and fell into the void. Left gasped in anguish, then went limp as Sir Leah pulled him up the stairs and into the shuttle. She shut the hatch and took off, the spire crashing and crumbling to dust under them. Leff pawed at the window pathetically. It was all there. How do you know? It could have been a laundry list. My face was on the wall! My face! Sir Leah focused on flying, but she could hear the distress in Leff's voice. You're right. That was pretty freaky. Too late to do anything about it now, though. Leff took one more forlorn look at the rubble of the huge spire, then turned back to take the wheel from Sir Leah. Yeah, you're right. Glicksnarkenog climbed out of her ship and stepped onto the planet. She brandished a large rifle as she approached Sue's ship, which landed a few minutes ago. She crouched behind a rock as the hatch opened and Conrev stepped out in his own environment suit. Glicksnarkenog fired a warning shot that hit the ground next to Conrev's foot. Freeze! I have you now! Conrev smiled at her. Her voice carried to his suit through an automatic radio. Glicksnarkenog, it's you that I have. What are you talking about? I saw through your ruse, and I caught you. Now go back in there and fly away. The treasure is mine. Conrev shrugged, stepped back inside the ship, and powered up the engine. He sent one last message to Glicksnarkenog. All right, the treasure is yours. Have fun. Glicksnarkenog began looking around the area for something that would indicate where the treasure was. Oh, I will. Once Conrev docked back with the Frontier, he joined the rest of the crew in the cockpit. Sue was talking to Leff. Look, in the condition we're in, we won't make it to the next station for another century in our own ship. There's a repair station nearby, only a couple days. Leff looked at the map on his screen. You mean NSP station? Yeah, that place. Leff shared a knowing glance with Sir Leah before answering. Um, isn't there anywhere else we can go? Sue frowned. What? Why wouldn't we go there? No reason. Uh, Peach, set a course for NSP station. She lay in the coordinates and made the jump to hyperspace. 
Glixnarkonog was starting to think there was no treasure. Nothing but sand in all directions. Sand and broken promises. Glixnarkonog didn't like sand. She turned to the sky and shouted at no one in particular. Fuck! Frontier by Maggot Moshpit Chapter 20 Feldo stood on the bridge, looking out across the stars. They were a field of breathtaking celestial bodies, moving faster than he could guess, yet seemingly sitting still. He eased up on the throttle, slowing down enough to be pulled in by the station's arm. He heard it lock on, and he walked out the door down to the airlock. The airlock opened, and through it stepped Graham and Rum. He patted them on the back as they passed. She didn't tire you out shopping too much, did she? Rum laughed. <laughs> <laughs> ah, nah. Made us carry the stuff, though. He grunted and repositioned a box under his arm. Then came the fine Martin he loved, carrying nothing but a purse. He kissed her. Hello, honey. Nice trip. She laughed. Some guy tried to steal my purse. Feldo held both her arms and inspected her. You aren't hurt, are you? <laughs> nah, he snatched it from a bench. Graham caught him in three seconds. Seriously, give him a raise. They walked to the bridge. I might. She poked his side. No, you won't. Nope. They both laughed. They were followed in by another crew member, who took the helm. Feldo sat in the captain's chair, which was big enough for two. Biggs, resume course. And don't worry, I remember to fuel up this time. The air was light, the mood was happy, and life was good. They were an hour out when the drive cut. It was shaky, blinding, and loud. When they came out of hyperspace, Feldo looked around at their stunned faces. What the hell? Rum! What was that? I don't know. we just been pulled out of hyperspace. Something's coming! Feldo looked at his scans. It was huge, and it was unfriendly. Hail them. Ray shields. Arm weapons. There was an explosion. It must have been a shield-piercing missile, because no one felt anything before it was too late. Feldo found himself on the floor, his body shielding hers. He pulled her up, and they looked around. Rum was fighting flames, and Graham was a pathetic, charred heap on the floor. Feldo's console showed more fires in engineering that needed attending. He yelled to Rum. Get this under control! I need to check engineering! He pulled his love along with him. You'll be safe with me. They got as far as the airlock before the first pirates burst through. They grabbed her who was trailing behind slightly, felt a whirl around and time froze. The pirate was grasping her by the neck, a knife poised, his pals rushing towards the bridge. Fear overtook Feldo, ripping a scream from his lips, pushing him down the corridor. He stayed long enough to see a knife spill blood. Blood everywhere. Magenta! Magenta! Feldo opened his eyes slowly. He didn't scream anymore. After the first hundred times, he realized it didn't make a difference, so he didn't bother. He rose, splashed some water on his face from the sink, and ate a breakfast pack. His thoughts inevitably fell on Terry, and he smiled, something he never did in the morning. He smiled on his way to the cockpit, and as he took his station. Leff wasn't smiling. He was glum, and it looked like he hadn't gotten much sleep. He turned and glared at Feldo. What? Nothing. It's just you're usually so chipper in the morning. Left side. And you're usually dead on your feet. I just tossed and turned all night is all. <sighs> yep, and so did I, as a result. I said I was sorry. I know, I know. Sylvia, oddly, was up early. She was usually the last one to be up. Feldo caught her eye. Why are you up so early? She grinned. Wouldn't miss this for the world. Feldo didn't have much time to ponder her response when the frontier dropped out of hyperspace. Lena looked over her instruments. We're here! Celia hailed the station. NSV Station, this is the colony cargo ship The Frontier, requesting docking clearance. There was no response. Celia looked at Lef, then back at her console. I repeat- Yeah, yeah. Docking Bay 2. Welcome to NSP Station. The line cut abruptly after the message came through. Celia chuckled. Well, I guess they're not morning people either. Lena headed for Bay 2. The station was small, but equipped to repair anything, mostly through automation. 
It had three bays for ships to dock, and a waiting area with nothing more than a couple rows of benches and a canteen. The employees were mostly engineering students, completing their one year of on-the-job training, a win-win for the owner of the station as they didn't have to be paid as much. Stations like NSP and Alpha 2 were constructed during the war for military ships, which is why so many were close together, but after the war, the Atrian government had no use for them, so almost all were sold to civilians. The market was so competitive, more than half closed in the first year, and others, like Alpha 2, boomed. NSP, however, generated only enough income to stay afloat. The station itself was comprised of modular attachments, bound together by force fields. The bay barely fit the frontier in Sue's ship, and after they squeezed in, a force field closed behind them, and the entire bay began to pressurize. The voice from earlier came back on the comm. Please allow a half hour for the bay to pressurize, or whatever. Once again, they were cut off abruptly. Zack grabbed his coffee from the machine and headed for the door. <laughs> well, this place is a dump. Left followed him. You can say that again. Better wake up, Sue. Lena jumped up and ran after Lef. He noticed her and turned around. Oh, Peach, we aren't going to be here long. You don't have to come. We're just going to drop Sue off. She gave him a look. I know why we're here. I know, it's just... Never mind, come on then. They arrived at the airlock and opened the hatch to Sue's ship. Lef poked his head in. Hey guys, we're here. A few seconds passed without an answer. Hey, I got a deadline- A pillow flew from the darkness and beamed Lef in the face. Sue emerged from the darkness. I heard you the first time. Lef blew fluff from his nose. <sighs> we need to detach you so we can leave and they can start work on you. Sue yawned and scratched himself. Ah, <sighs> oh, do you have to leave so soon? At least let me buy you all breakfast and say goodbye first. I think that's a wonderful idea. Right, Lef? Lef realized he was seriously considering snapping at her. She didn't know anything about NSP station, Lef reminded himself. Yeah, sure. Get dressed first. Sue looked down and noticed he was only in his underwear. He ducked behind the door to his bunk, red-faced. Um, just give me ten minutes. They stepped out into the hall again and waited. Lef glanced over at Lena. She was in a bad mood due to lack of sleep. I should just tell her, he thought to himself. Nah, she won't show up. I don't even know if she still owns the place. Besides, in this mood, Lena wouldn't take it well. He looked at her again. Wait, isn't this the thing they do wrong in romantic comedies? Left didn't have time to ponder further when Sue emerged from his ship. He turned and shouted back. All right, take her away. Conrad detached the ship with a whoosh of air. They watched as he piloted it a little ways away, then set his thrusters to keep the vessel stable. The interior of the bay wasn't well kept. It was rusted and unsupervised. A sign in the wall read, Danger! Zero-G flight zone, use at your own risk. Along the walls there were handrails at even intervals to help people around. Sue walked to the door leading back to the main part of the ship. I'll go see who wants to come to breakfast. You go on ahead. Lef extended his paw to Lena. Shall we? She took it, and they stepped out and immediately started flailing about. Lena ended up wrapping herself around Lef, who awkwardly swam in the air while trying to get at one of the rails. Conrev effortlessly maneuvered around to one of the rails nearest to the pair and extended a paw. You two should kick off with more momentum next time. Lef grabbed his paw and he pulled them to the rail. Thanks. Now where's the exit? Lena clung on for dear life. Whoa! It, it feels like I'm falling! Blazes! He patted her on the head. Remember what the attendant told us back in Alpha 2? Yeah! Whoa! They made it to the exit without incident. It was a short walk to the station, and they came out into a fairly large room with a desk at the entrance. A human woman sat half asleep at the desk. Lef had to cough to get her attention. What? Oh. Welcome to an SP station. What do you want? It was the same unenthusiastic voice from the comm. Conrev produced a pad and handed it over. Our ship, the smaller one, needs the following repairs. She glanced over the list on the pad and threw it into a bin. We'll get to it as soon as we can. There'll be 900,000 credits. Conrev grumbled. That's about how much we'll sell the drawing for. Sue won't be happy. He handed over his bank chip and the woman opened the turnstile. Meals are free, no sleeping on the benches. We won't stop you if you do, though. 
Konrev nodded thanks, and they went in search of a table. Lef pointed one out in the corner, and they sat. Lef glanced around, saw there was no one else in the room, and relaxed. Quaint place, huh? Konrev grunted. Feels like the waiting room for the dentist. Lena chuckled. I almost bit my dentist's paw off once. It was one of those big places in the city. I had been waiting for hours. When I did get seen, the guy just jammed his paw into my mouth, and I bit. How old were you? Nine? Lef and Konrev laughed, and Lena glared at them. What? Nine isn't that old? Soon they were joined by Sue, Zack, and Sir Leah. Sue poked Conrev as they sat down. Conrev, did you at least try to haggle? Haggle? I don't think you can haggle. Sue and Conrev began to argue, so Lef tuned them out and turned to Sir Leah. Hey, where's Veldo? He already ate. Zack walked past the table and went over to the canteen and rang a bell. A fat little man ran up and looked up at Zack. Yes, what can I do for you? Uh, well, we'd like to order breakfast. I'll have- Ah, no. I'll bring you all something you want. Just you see. Zack shrugged. All right. I like psychic chefs. The man ran back into the kitchen and began cooking. After a surprisingly short amount of time, the chef returned with a tray loaded with eggs and toast. Zack smacked his forehead. Oh, that's what you meant. (laughs) The chef chuckled. This is all we serve for breakfast. Sorry. Zack picked up the tray. Thanks. He placed the tray in the center of the table and they all dug in. Zack shoveled eggs into his mouth shamelessly. Mmm. Man, these are really good. What's this chef doing in a place like this? Lef shrugged and ate a piece of toast whole. I don't know. Maybe he had a criminal record. Zack looked over Lef's shoulder. Hey, who's that? Lef! He didn't dare turn around. Maybe she would just leave? Sir Leah looked at him. Lef, grow a pair. Lef stood up and turned around, facing the wolverine woman, who was sauntering up to the group. Uh, hi? She was the same height as Lef, but her fur was much darker, and she didn't have stripes. She was attractive and carried herself with an authoritative air. Lena stood up and stood next to Lef, confused. Lef, who's that? He looked at the woman, then at Lena. Uh, she's... Rissa. His wife. What?! Left turned and snapped. Ex-wife! I signed the papers for a reason. Fine. Ex-wife. Lena turned her fiery eyes on Lef. And when were you planning to tell me you had a wife? And that it was Rissa! Lef's eyes darted back and forth as he stuttered. I, uh, I, I was going to, um, tell you earlier, but... Rissa tilted her head and smiled a smile that held no warmth. You lied to me! You said she was nobody! Peach, listen. Rissa leaned back in mock surprise. What? So he calls you Peach too? Do you treat all women the same as me, darling? You called her Peach too? Peach, Lena, listen to me. It's just a name, nothing special. Lena stamped her foot and fought back tears. Oh, so I'm not special? You just give me a second-hand pet name? God, you said you loved her, Les! What? I didn't? You did! When we crash-landed on that planet, you talked in your sleep? You said you loved her! I don't, you... Lena turned around. Did... you ever love me? She ran across the room, Les shouting after her. Lena, you're jumping to conclusions! But she was gone. Lef slowly turned to Rissa, glaring hot iron at her smug face. Rissa, this is why we didn't work. Rissa pointed at his face. You broke my heart, Lef. Now I'm going to break yours. He glared at her for another second before running after Lena. Zack watched the entire scene play out, a fork full of eggs halfway to his open mouth. That's some shit, he accidentally said out loud. Sue nodded. You can say that again. Rissa sat down as though nothing had happened, and began eating Lef's portion of the eggs. Rissa, it's been a while. Sir Leah, still as gorgeous and as single as ever. I'll take that as a compliment. Now, we need to talk. Just you and I, Rissa. Rissa stayed where she was. We can talk with witnesses around. I know you still want to kill me. 
Zack shook his head. Okay, I feel like I'm jumping into an episode of something mid-season here. Can someone explain why Lef has an ex-wife who hates him? Surlia growled at Rissa. Well, she moved into town, fell for Lef, and rushed into marriage with him. What he didn't realize was she was a manipulative little bitch with a superiority complex. I'm sitting right here, dear. Lef almost dropped out of school to move here with you, and after he realized his mistake, he almost drank himself to death. Sue looked from Sir Leah's bared fangs to Rissa's calm face. Oh, fuck. This is my fault, isn't it? Conrev grunted. A little bit, yeah. Rissa chuckled. <laughs> oh, I would have found him eventually. Don't beat yourself up. Sir Leah glanced back and closed her eyes. Well, once Lef sets things right, I'm sure Lena will be back here to claw your face off herself. They sat and continued to eat in silence. Meanwhile, the bored woman, after watching and deriving great entertainment value from the fight, picked up her buzzing escom. Yes? Oh, okay. She hung up. It was her turn to supervise repairs. She sighed and walked out the door towards the control room. Lef ran down corridors he probably wasn't supposed to be down, looking indoors and calling out. After ten minutes, he ran out of breath and slumped against the wall. <sighs> I'm so stupid! He smacked himself in the head. Lena sat in a stall in the woman's washroom, staring at the wall. She didn't know what to think. Lef had lied to her, sure, but maybe she overreacted. Nonetheless, she'd stay there a little longer and let him stew. The bored woman paced the control room and watched as the repair arm continued working. It welded new components and buffed surface damage. A second arm reached out and grabbed a handle, twisting in a code as though it were a padlock. A hissing sound prevailed in the room, and after a good five minutes the arm began pulling out a large section of the ship. The woman leaned in close and watched carefully. Last time a small ship needed this procedure done, something had gone wrong. The tech said they had fixed the problem, but she wasn't about to take any chances. The arm pulled and pulled, revealing the drive of Sue's ship, which was not looking in good shape. All looked well, but the arm suddenly stopped mid-procedure. She dashed her hand across the keyboard. Damn! She would have to go out there and fix it herself. Again. Rissa stood from the table and sighed. Ah, <sighs> I must give Chef a raise. He makes wonderful eggs. Well, it was lovely catching up, but I must go. Before anyone could react, she strode away. Zack burped. That is one piece of work. You think Lef and Lena will be fine? Sir Leah shrugged. Uh, don't know. Well, I think they'll be fine. Have you walked by their cabin at night? Ugh, Zack, what have I told you? Not at the table. Zack grinned. <laughs> Okay, Mom. Sue and Conrev burst out laughing. Rissa headed straight for the washroom. She had a hunch it would be where Lena was hiding. She smiled to herself. It was a stroke of luck Lef had found someone else. Now she could exact her revenge. She pushed the door open and called out. Lena, are you there? Go away, Rissa! You know Lef is looking for you. I know! Rissa leaned against the sink and waited a minute before speaking. Tell me, why is it you're mad at him? Isn't it obvious? He lied to me about you! Is that all? There was silence. Then... It's none of your business! <laughs> I know exactly what it is. She stood and walked around the room. You know, there's something nostalgic about this situation. I thought I was going to be Lef's wife forever, and I feared losing him every day. Turns out, I was right. Lef isn't a long-term person. He might like you a little more than the You're other- You're wrong! Lena shouted as she once again fought back tears. Rissa smiled and leaned against the sink again. That's what I thought, too. The bored woman kicked off the wall and floated towards the arm. She spotted a geyser of fine mist a few feet away, and braced herself against the arm, carefully to inspect it. 
A rubber pipe that ran along the entire arm had been nicked, and now liquid sprayed into the bay. She checked further down the pipe. It was a lubricant line, a hydrocarbon polymer. A shock went down her spine. The lubricant was extremely flammable. Her eyes darted around the bay, and her eye caught something on the wall. Too late. A single light fixture sparked every few seconds, each one making her flinch. She kicked off from the arm and headed for the closest shelter, Sue's ship. The explosion could be heard from everywhere in the station. Lights flickered and died as the power went dead. Emergency lights and sirens flashing as the battery power backup came online. Sue, Zack, Sirlia, and Conrad jumped up in surprise. What the hell was that? Sirlia was already running. It sounded like it came from our bay! When they arrived, they found the bay was missing. An emergency force field held the oxygen inside the main part of the station, but the sight outside was grim. The three bays floated away slowly, emergency force fields flickering into place. The second bay was dead, mostly in pieces and charred from the apparent explosion. The Frontier and Sioux ship floated away at different angles, having taken only superficial damage. A room floated by, and Sir Leah realized the entire station must have fallen apart, each section only holding enough air for 30 minutes or so. Sir Leah ran back down the corridor. Looks like we've got our work cut out for us. We need to find a way to get this place back together. Rackham rubbed his head where he had bumped it. He looked around the cargo bay as people picked themselves up after the shock. He ran to the cockpit as fast as he could, finding Feldo sprawled out on the floor. Feldo! What happened? Feldo picked himself up gingerly. Oh, I don't know. It sounded like an explosion. He ran to a station, emergency lights flashing. Oh, crap. The airlock's been shut. Looks like we're in space again. Hang on. What? What is it? The station. It's falling apart. What do you mean? Feldo scratched his head nervously. Uh, this station was cobbled together. Most of it is falling away because of the temporary power loss. Even some of the bathrooms. Rackham, you need to rescue anyone trapped in those rooms before the air runs out. Rackham cracked his knuckles. Ugh, ain't no rest for the wicked. Frontier by Maggot Mosh Pit, Chapter 21 The ringing in Lena's ears finally started to die down after what felt like ages. She opened her eyes and found the world indeed hadn't ended, and she was still in the bathroom stall, or rather, the ceiling of the bathroom stall. With a yelp, she realized there was no gravity anymore, and that she was floating. She kept her cool and pushed gently off the ceiling towards the stall door. Rissa? What happened? She heard a groan and nothing else. She pushed the stall open and floated out, looking around. The lights were dim, clearly on reduced power, and an emergency light flashed near the door. From where she was, she couldn't see out the door. She spotted Rissa fairly quickly. She was against the back wall, cradling her head in her paws, droplets of blood floating around the general area. Lena kicked over to her. Rissa, can you hear me? Rissa glanced up at her, eyes slightly foggy. Ugh. With a voice that shrill, who couldn't? The knock to the head had turned Rissa's calculatedly gentle tone into a more annoyed one. Lena reached out and tried to remove Rissa's paw from her head, but she swatted it away. Don't touch me! A drop of blood floated into Lena's face, but she ignored it. Rissa, I need to see your wound. It could be serious. Rissa shoved Lena with her foot, and she floated away. Go away! I don't need your help! Lena grabbed the frame of the stall door, looked at Rissa, then went back inside. She grabbed a large roll of toilet paper from the wall and poked her head from the stall. At least take this! She threw the toilet paper at Rissa, who caught it. Grumbling, she ripped off a large amount and applied it to her head. <sighs> Goddamn thin public bathroom toilet paper! Lena floated back and grabbed the sink. Now can you tell me what happened? I kind of got stunned by the noise. You know, because of my ears. I don't know. It sounded like an explosion. But it hardly matters now. We've probably been thrown away from the station. Lena glanced towards the door. What do you mean, thrown away? See for yourself. Lena kicked off the sink and braced herself against the other wall, which was right next to the door. So she was staring out into empty space. 
She suppressed a scream. What? How? There's an emergency force field, Fluffhead. She extended her paw and held it close to the doorway, feeling the energy cause her fur to stand up. How long can we survive? Rissa shrugged, but Lena didn't look over. Maybe an hour. I had CO2 recycler put into all the external mods. Doesn't matter. There's a good chance we won't get rescued. Lena floated back away from the void. What makes you say that? That explosion sounded pretty loud. It might take a while for them to get their shit together. The bathroom was eerily silent, and it felt as though they were alone in the universe. Rissa replaced the paper on her head with a fresh sheet. They floated in silence for a while, until Rissa spoke up again. Makes you wonder what else he hasn't told you, though. Rissa, not now. I don't trust what you say, and I'm not going to be tricked. Now, why don't we try to find a way out of this? Rissa grumbled, but acquiesced. Ugh. You're right, I suppose. Put your thinking cap on, then. When Surlia arrived in the station's main control room, complete with windows showing a panoramic view of the debris field, Lef was already there, being restrained by one of the station engineers. Let me go! You need to find her! Sir, we're conducting rescue based on level of urgency. And right now that's Bay 2. We had someone in there. Surlia wrenched Lef out of the engineer's grasp and gave him a firm slap across the muzzle. Ow! Lef, get a hold of yourself! You're no use a hysterical mess! The engineer mopped her brow. Thanks, ma'am. She went back to the sensor station. Lef rubbed his jaw. You know, you didn't have to slap me. I wanted to. Oh. Surlia saw the worry in his eyes as he glanced at what the engineer was doing at the sensor station. Lef, we'll find her. Yeah. Zack and the others entered the room, and one of the engineers walked up. A thin man with a black wife beater on. Hey, this ain't a fur convention. You guys can't be in here. Zack stopped Lef from eviscerating the man and addressed him. Hey, dude, you look a little understaffed. You need our help. He glanced behind him at a total of two other people in the room. They were frantically dashing around, trying to determine exactly what the situation was. The man shrugged. Ah, <sighs> fuck it. Um, I'm kinda panicking right now, so if one of you could run another active scan on some of those rooms, I'm going to see if we have any ships to use. Surlia snapped her fingers and pulled out her escom as Zack began his scans and left followed the wife-beater guy. She dialed Feldo. I'm kinda busy right now, so if you could just leave a message. Feldo, what's going on out there? Oh, it's good to hear your voice. No, Rackham! Not that one! The blue one! Surlia, that explosion took out all of our sensors! I wish they'd just said hurry up and invent sensors that don't need to be stored externally. We've been flying around in circles for ten minutes. Surlia dashed back towards the corridor that used to lead to the bay. I have an idea. Hold on. Sue and Conrad stood awkwardly in the middle of the room. So, any way we can help? Sue said to himself. He didn't need to wait long. Soon, Zack looked back for someone's attention. Hey, I've got a situation here. Sue and Conrad hurried over. What? What is it? Look. The screen showed an icon on each piece of debris, and the progress of scans of each one. A smaller room had its scan finished, and a plethora of information was on screen. That's one of the bathrooms, see? And there are life signs. I'm not sure how many. The force field is still in place, but I'm showing an atmosphere leak. We need to bring it in soon. Sue grinned and looked at Conrev. I just had a brilliant idea. Zack, does this station have an arm? Uh, I think so, but... Sue pushed Zack aside and searched for the arm's software. Uh, here we go. The screen flickered and switched to a camera presumably attached to an arm. Uh, where's this bathroom? Pan the arm a bit. Sue used the keys to pan the arm around a bit. He was surprised to see himself through the window. He waved to himself. Zack sighed. Damn, the bathroom is on the other side of the station. At the same time, Surlia skidded to a stop before she hit the force field leading out into space. This time, she took careful consideration of her surroundings. She could see a large field of debris, the Frontier, Sue's ship, and two of the bays, only one of which held a ship, one of Yeren design. She didn't see the corpse of the person that was supposedly in Bay 2 when it exploded, thankfully. 
and there was only one place for such a person to go. She held up the ESCOM again. Feldo, are you unable to see anything at all? What? Not really. We have rear and front cams, and windows, but I can't see shit from them. Sir Leah couldn't help but giggle. The frontier was turned at a 90 degree angle, so all the front and back cameras could see was empty space and debris. Uh, Feldo? Check your attitude indicator from when we docked. Sir Leah heard a shuffle, a soft curse, then saw the frontier begin writing itself, so Feldo could see what he was doing. Sorry, that was kind of a dumb thing to forget. Forget it, hang on. I'll just call you back. She hung up and dialed Zack. Sir Leah? Kinda busy. I'm tired of hearing that. I need you to scan Sue's ship. Why? There's no one in there. Just do it! She waited apprehensively as Zack prioritized the scan of Sue's ship. Salia, there's a faint life sign. Someone's hurt pretty bad in there. She hung up and rang Feldo again. Feldo, I need you to get on Sue's ship as soon as you can. I still can't see right. You'll have to direct me. Salia cursed to herself silently. She craned her neck and squinted at the frontier, comparing its location to Sue's ship. Uh, right 20 degrees, uh, down another few... Stop! Straight another few... What the hell? Zack shook his head. This is a bad idea. Sue grinned like a madman and grasped the hold of the station's thruster controls, used mainly to make slight adjustments. Nah, with all the weight removed, we'll get the station around in no time. That's not what I'm- Whoa! Sue jerked the stick to the right, jolting everyone a little. The station started to turn, as if on an axis. Woo! Sue watched the screen carefully, making sure to get lined up with the bathroom. And... there. He jerked the stick the other way and set the thrusters to stabilize. He didn't even get a glance from the other two engineers, who were attached to the two other sensor stations. See? No biggie. Zack's SCOM rang, and when he answered, the sky fell. Zack! What the hell?! Turn the station back! I can't see the frontier from here, you idiot! Hey, it wasn't me! Sue grabbed the SCOM from Zack and barked into it. We have a room with people venting air, and we need to get them before they suffocate, thank you! He shot the SCOM, shoved it back to Zack, and ran to the arm controls again. This time, he could see the bathroom, spinning slightly from the hole somewhere on it. Alright, let's try this again. It was Rissa's private ship, small and cozy, and at the same time equipped for high speeds. They jumped inside as Wife Beater Guy pulled out his SCOM and called one of the engineers in the control room. Michael, what do the scans throw? Lef could hear the response as he tried to find the starter on the small ship. Well, we've got another bathroom, left signs, no immediate danger, but I found Zafudo. He's in the refinery, and the sensors are having a hard time finding out exactly what it's like down there. Lef glanced back. You guys have a refinery? Wife Beater Guy smiled sheepishly. Well, it's not really a refinery, we just called it that. We need to get down there. There is a risk of secondary explosion, especially in the refinery. Alright. Left pressed a button that looked promising, and out popped a wheel and keypad. The screen on the keypad said, please enter passcode. Left slammed his paw on the wheel. Damn! You don't happen to know Riss's secret code. Wife Beater Guy shrugged. We don't even know much about Risa herself. She usually just hands down the orders and we follow them. Lef hovered his paw over the keypad and typed in Peach. The engine started with a hum and the front of the craft lit up and became transparent. Wife Beater Guy looked at him. Uh, how? Lef gripped the wheel. Lucky guess. Well, let's find the refinery. It's on the lower part of the station. You can't miss it. Left didn't have time to marvel at how smooth of a ride Rissa's ship was. Left spotted what must be the refinery right away, a large disc-shaped room with pipes hanging off it at odd angles. Wife Beater Guy pointed. That's it. I guessed as much. Um, you should be able to dock where it used to be attached to the station. That is, if the force field is in place. Left pulled alongside the refinery and leaned over to see if the force field was in place. It was. Well, at least there isn't a body frozen to the entrance. Wife Beater Guy shivered. Don't say that. Lef looked back and realized something he probably should have a long time ago. Hey, Wife Beater Guy, you speak Atrian? Yeah. It's so when people like you come around without translators, we can communicate. I mean, it's a skill that comes in handy. Lef eased the ship in backwards so that the ship's hatch parted the energy barrier, which were designed to recognize airlocks and hatches so they could be entered. 
Yeah? Well, you humans should just hurry up and decide which language you all should speak. We decided a long time ago. It's not that simple. The ship stopped abruptly. All right, we can get out. They floated to the rear of the ship and opened the hatch. Immediately, the smell hit them. Ugh! <laughs> what the hell? Is this where all the bathrooms lead? More or less. Lef pulled his shirt over his nose. Not an easy task, despite Lef's relatively short muzzle. I really hope Lena's not here. They floated down the narrow corridor towards what looked like a hatch. Hey, Zafuto. A muffled voice could be heard from the other side in English. Wallace, get me out of here! Lef opened the hatch to a horrible sight. Although there was open sewage in the room, the real danger were the huge beams floating around. Zafuto was trapped under one. Lef waited for a huge beam to pass by and kicked off hard, making it across the room quickly. Zafuto flailed his arms. Hey, who are you? Get me out of this! Lef pulled on the beam, but it didn't budge. I have no idea what you're saying, but just wait a sec. Wife beater guy floated over too. What's taking so long? It's zero G. Lef pulled again, and the beam moved slightly. It's still attached to the wall. Wife beater guy climbed the beam so he was under it at the end that was further away from the wall. Give me a hand. Um, I mean paw. Lef braced himself on the wall next to wife beater guy, and they pushed hard with their legs. <sighs> Zafudo, push! With their combined effort, they were able to free Zafudo. Ugh, let's get out of here. He swam pathetically towards the hatch and was caught by Lef on his way back. They closed the hatch behind them and climbed into the ship. Zafudo shivered. Uh, thanks, mister. I still don't understand you. What? Wife beater guy laughed. <laughs> he said, I don't understand you. Oh. Lef looked around the field of debris as he headed back to the main part of the station, which was just then completing its turn. Lena. Feldo pulled back on the stick and stopped the frontier. What? What do you mean you can't direct us anymore? Sue turned the station around, so you're on your own. Feldo looked at Rackham, who shrugged. Then it hit him. Oh, um, I know. Uh, Rackham, take the helm. What? I ain't touching that thing. Then get someone else to do it. Just get it done quickly and wait for my call. Feldo ran towards engineering, almost tripping over his own paws. When he got there, he tore open hatches, lockers, and drawers in search of what he needed. At last, he uncovered something in one of the large storage lockers near the drive chamber. Bingo. Feldo held up the environment suit and looked it over. Satisfied with his inspection, he pulled it on quickly and prayed there wasn't anything wrong with it. He tapped the helmet and the HUD appeared, nothing more than an oxygen gauge and pressure indicator. Running to the loading bay, Feldo tapped the suit's communicator. Rackham, tell me you got over the fear of flying. Hi, Feldo. Teleco? Rackham's voice came through the comm. We ain't got no pilots, Feldo. She's the closest we've got. I won't let you down. Yar, who was also there, chimed in. And I believe in her, Feldo. So don't worry. Oh, thanks, love. Fello grumbled to himself. All right, do exactly what I say. He burst through a door into the loading bay, the perfect spot to get an unobstructed view of the area. He first depressurized the bay, then opened the large ramp, revealing the debris field, and Sue's ship with its single life sign. He quickly lashed his leg to a rope and tied it to the console as securely as he could. Sue eased the arm forward ever so slightly, watching for a spot to latch the arm onto as the bathroom spun quickly. I, uh, don't know how this is going to work, but... Well, you could start by stopping the room from spinning. Oh, yeah. As the rectangular room swung around again, Sue put the arm in its path. There was a crunch and a creak and the room slowly stopped spinning, even though it pushed the arm aside after a few seconds. Another couple like that, and we can bring her in nice and easy. Lena felt the room shake suddenly, the emergency lights flickering. Rissa looked up from her slumped, half-awake state. What? What was that? Lena looked around, but there was nothing to indicate what had happened. Uh, I don't know. Well, look out the window and see. Lena floated herself towards the door, which Rissa had called a window. She stopped herself before she got there, afraid of what she might find. Rissa glared at the back of her head. Well... Lena steeled herself, then peeked out the open doorway. 
darkness there and nothing more. I don't see anything. It's just whoa! A slab of metal floated right by the force field, causing Lena to instinctively push away, her paws coming in direct contact with the force field. Ah! She recoiled and floated back into the wall. What are you doing? Rule number one of force fields, don't touch them! Lena clutched her paws close to her body, the smell of burnt fur tickling her nostrils. Th there was a metal plate! It, it startled me! Rissa sighed. Well... It must have hit us or something. Come up with a way out yet? I can't think straight right now. Lena looked at her right paw. After the initial shock, the burn didn't hurt too bad, and hardly showed up on her pad. Um, no. We don't have anything to... Wait. What? Lena shook her ears. I, I don't hear the whirring sound anymore. What whirring sound? It was coming from the ceiling. But it stopped! Rissa thought for a moment, then to Lena's surprise burst out laughing. <laughs> well, <laughs> we're dead. Lena stared at her. Yep. That whirring you heard was most likely the CO2 recycler going offline. Try not to panic. We'll run out of air faster. Lena no longer felt her burned paw. Sue extended the arm a third time, this time stopping the spinning motion of the room completely. There we go, now I'll just latch onto that protruding bit there. Sue clamped the arm onto a pipe sticking out of the bathroom wall. He pulled it towards the control room. Ha <laughs> ha! Yes! Go us! Sue shouted as he jumped into the air. Careful, Sue. What? Oh, yeah. Sue grasped the controls again, watching the room get closer from through the window. I'll just stop it and... Oh, shit! All three watched with stunned surprise as the pipe snapped off when Sue tried to push the arm, and the room continued on its path, directly for the control room window. Conrav had just enough time to push both of them to the floor and dive on top of them before the giant room came crashing through the window. Glass rained down on the trio and even peppered some of the engineers working on the other side of the room. Sue looked at the hole in the window and waited. Nothing happened. The doorway of the bathroom protruded into the control room and stayed there, suspended. One of the engineers ran over and checked the console. He then turned to Sue, who was pushing Conrev off himself. You idiot! What the hell were you thinking? Hey, it worked out, didn't it? The engineer wasn't happy. He was red-faced, in fact. You're lucky the force field activated. We would all be a fine, bloody mist right now if it hadn't. They heard a sound, and all four of them looked towards the doorway. A figure crawled out and tumbled to the floor. It raised its head. Many thanks, friend. However, I can't help but think there could have been a safer way of rescuing me. The Yeren stood up and dusted himself off, then turned to his former prison. Well, it looks like the two force fields merged successfully. I recommend we leave. It might not stay that way for very long. The engineer pushed Sue towards the door. You heard him! Everyone out! The occupants of the control room rushed for the door and exited as fast as they could, the engineer, who was the last one out, shutting the bulkhead behind them. Zack looked at the assembled group. Now what? Just a little to the left. No, one degree to the right. Toliko grasped the wheel firmly, sweating bullets as she tried to make fine adjustments to their snail's pace. Feldo? This is... Really hard. Feldo watched as Sue's ship grew closer and closer. He even thought he saw a flash of movement from one of the windows. Keep it up. Toliko, you're doing a good job. Right, quick! Toliko adjusted her course just in time to avoid letting a sheet of metal smash into the loading bay. She took a deep breath and Yar massaged her shoulders. Hey, how much longer? Yar, in conflict with his confident attitude, spoke up in a shaky voice. Yeah, there, there's some freaking out going on up here. <laughs> Feldo watched Sue's ship closely, catching another glimpse of movement. Just a little further. Left a few degrees. All right, slow to zero, zero, 008. The frontier slowed to a crawl, Sue's ship only a few feet away. Wait for it. Now, stop, put her in park. Tilico pulled back on the accelerator and parked to the frontier, then immediately went limp and took several deep breaths. Yar? Yes? If I ever plan on getting a pilot's license, shoot me. 
Yar just patted her on the head. Rackham leaned forward and spoke into the comm. So what does it look like over there? Fellows studied the section of hull he could see. Well, I see hull and nothing else. I'm going to crawl around to the airlock and try to find a way to get inside. He stepped up to the edge of the loading bay and kicked off. Lef pushed wife-beater guy and Zafudo out of the ship and closed the hatch behind them. He detached from the station and pulled out his escom, dialing Zack. Zack, I haven't found Lena yet. I need you to scan for Atrian life signs. Uh, sorry, Lef, but we're kind of shut out of the control room at the moment. Um, hold on a sec. Lef heard the muffled voices of Zack and Serlia, then Serlia spoke to him. Lef, if you need a scan, I'm afraid you're fresh out of luck. Lef smashed his paw on the dashboard. He wished he would pass out and have another vision, but he didn't feel anything coming. Where's the deus ex machina when you need it? Lef, just try looking for her in the most logical places, and we'll keep looking for her here. There are still some people missing, Rissa among others. Lef hung up. He didn't care about Rissa. He flew out away from the carnage and did a 180 turn, surveying the entire area. There were three larger structures that could hold a person, but nothing to indicate there was someone in any of them. He sighed, picked one at random, and flew towards it. Fellow floated slowly towards the hull, his boots pointed towards it as much as he could manage. He felt his feet being pulled towards the metal surface, and he accelerated. He landed with a clang, his boots fastening themselves to the hull via magnetism. His boots' magnetism was weak enough so that he could take steps with a little effort, at the cost of maneuverability. He took step after painstakingly slow step. The silence inside his helmet made him more than a little on edge. He felt a crunch under his boot, and he looked down. He was standing on a scorched patch of hull, where the paint hadn't totally fallen off yet. Almost there, Feldo. Don't panic now, he muttered to himself, his words hanging inside his helmet. A few steps later, his foot slipped. His other boot still stuck to the hull, keeping him secure. He flailed around a bit, the zero-gravity environment making it difficult to maintain balance. His foot finally made contact again, and he looked down at what he had slipped on. It was a window, obviously not made of metal. He crouched down, partly to calm his quick pulse and partly to get a look through the window. The inside of Sue's ship was in bad shape. It looked like the airlock was opened at the time of the explosion. Items lay strewn across the floor in various states of destruction. The lights were out save emergency lights, and the place was as still as the glacial continents on Atria. Fellow briefly considered the possibility that the interior was open to space, but expelled the notion from his mind. I'm sure it's fine in there. Another few minutes, and Feldo had reached the airlock, luckily closed. He tapped the exterior access panel, and the ship began cycling the atmosphere in the airlock. Feldo sighed with relief. That meant there was an atmosphere to cycle in the first place. The airlock doors opened, and Feldo dropped inside the gravity area, deactivating his magnetic boots. When the airlock finished, Feldo threw off his helmet and took a deep breath, scanning the area beyond the airlock. Sue's ship was as silent as space, and just as empty, too. Hello? Anyone there? No answer. Feldo stepped forward and turned on every light on his suit for his own sanity. If he hadn't, he might have missed the stained floor. He leaned over and examined the stains, and was almost sick to his stomach when he realized it was blood and possibly skin. Whatever it was, it was burned there. Feldo gulped and started down the short corridor to the right that led to the cockpit. Hello? There was a sound from behind him. He whirled around, facing the sound from the left corridor, the living space. He raced down it and burst into the room to a grisly sight. There lay the bored woman on the floor, a large first aid kit spilled onto the floor next to her body. Her left arm and shoulder were badly burned, red and cracked. Half her face was burned to a gruesome, ghastly grin, but her eyes were foggy, and she wasn't screaming in agony. Feldo ran over and looked her over. Uh, miss, can you hear me? Yeah. Feldo looked at the scattered medical supplies and saw two empty syringes of morphine. Oh, crap. You didn't inject yourself with that much morphine, did you? I did. The pay was too bad. Her words were slurred and Feldo had to shake her to keep her from slipping into a coma. I'm gonna get you out of here. The emergency ship should be arriving soon. I'll have you good as new in no time. He pulled out his escom as she groaned in response, dialing Sue. Sue? 
Don't talk back. Just tell me where your environment suit is. Uh, um, there's one in the locker behind my bed, but... Fellow shot the escom and hurtled into the locker, tearing out the suit and getting it back to the woman in one motion. You need to put this on. No. Fellow just gritted his teeth and pulled the suit onto the woman, ignoring her pathetic attempts to stop him. He fitted the helmet and locked it, watching the suit pressurize itself and balloon slightly, self-testing the suit's seal. Can you stand? <laughs> Who am I kidding? Fellow grabbed the woman's right arm and hauled her up the Atrian helmet looking strange on her. She cried out in pain slightly, despite the huge amount of painkillers in her system. She took one step and slumped against Feldo, who almost tripped over the rope trying to right her. Whoa, stay with me here. They stumbled to the airlock, cycled through, and climbed out into space, Feldo's boots clamping on again. Feldo felt the woman shift and kick out. Ah, ah. Feldo was smacked in the side of the head as she started to panic, and he lost his grip on her. Oh, fuck. She flailed helplessly as she quickly floated away from the ship, without a lifeline to stop her. Fellow tried to kick off after her, fumbled with his boots' magnet controls, then kicked off hard. Come on. Come on. Come on. He glanced back. The rope was quickly getting more taut. It would soon pull him back. He shook his head and concentrated on her foot, dangling nearby. Stay still! He shouted over the radio. He swung once. Missed, then caught her foot on the second attempt. At the same time, he felt the rope go completely taut and pulled him back towards the frontier. He thanked his lucky stars and let the inertia carry them back. The first possibility turned out to be completely empty, much to Left's chagrin. He flew towards the second object, the woman's bathroom. Rissa looked up at Lena as she floated, contemplating their situation. Something in Rissa's brain went off. Be it from injury, lack of oxygen, or some other reason, she extended her legs and gently floated towards Lena, who looked up as well. Rissa? You shouldn't move! Oh, cut the concern, friend bullshit. I know how you really feel. Lena instinctively took a step back, but her effort was wasted in zero gravity. Um? Rissa poked her chest. You don't like me because I used to share a bed with Lef. Rissa, that doesn't matter now! Like hell it doesn't! I know what you were thinking about over there. You want to be rid of me! Rid of you? Now what would give you that impression? Rissa's face twitched, and her voice went up an octave. I'm competition! Though, why he would choose a fennec over me is a mystery. You're as flat as an ironing board. Ow! Lena opened palms, slapped Rissa across the face, sending them floating apart. Rissa's expression of shock quickly turned to one of anger as she turned on Lena again. You little bitch! She pounced and swiped with claws extended. The only thing that saved Lena from harm was zero gravity. Rissa had no way to change her course midair, and Lena dodged easily. Wait! Rissa, I'm sorry! Rissa recovered quickly and pounced again. It's too late. I'll be rid of you soon. It looked as though Rissa would hit her mark this time, except she was tackled from behind suddenly and pinned against the far wall. Don't touch her! Rissa stared into Lef's stone face. Lef? Uh, we were just... Um, we were... Lef glared daggers at Rissa, then released her, turning around. Lena, are you alright? Yeah! A little burn! He took her paw and inspected it. It doesn't look too bad. Come on, I don't know how long the force field will hold the ship in place. Lef and Lena floated into Rissa's ship, Rissa following behind. Lef disconnected from the room and flew back towards the station proper. Lena, I'm sorry for lying to you, but me and Rissa have a past. I'd rather forget. <sighs> I'm right here. It's nothing you haven't heard already, Rissa. She grumbled. Bright flashes could be seen at the edge of the debris field, and emergency service ships began flying in. Lena looked at Lef, who was slumped over the wheel, concentrating on not hitting debris. I'm sorry for running off. I didn't mean what I said. Yeah, I'll try to be more honest with you, though I don't keep that many secrets. Lena tickled his face with her ears as he shifted uncomfortably. Oh, I understand keeping some secrets. Rissa looked at Lena, then at Lef. Their smiling faces no longer made her angry. Ugh, I must have hit my head harder than I thought. Frontier by Maggot Moshpit Chapter 22 
Lef stood in the control room and watched as the last of the soot was scrubbed off the side of the frontier. He turned on his heel and strode for the door, Surlia by his side. God, finally! I thought they'd never finish. The station is half destroyed, Lef. Lef shrugged and stepped over Wife Beater Guy, who was crouched in the middle of the hallway, fixing something under the floor. I'm just anxious to get underway. We've been cooped up in here for days. They walked into the large waiting area, where slumped the half-asleep Sue, Lena, and Conrev. Hey guys, they finished. Sue snorted. Yo, oh, what? Oh. <clears throat> he stood and stepped up to Lef. It's been fun. <laughs> I'll miss ya. Lef shook his paw firmly. I'll miss you too, Sue. He stepped over to Conrev and patted his shoulder. Good luck out there, buddy. Conrev wiped away a tear. Thank you. Surlia planted a kiss on his cheek. Thanks for all the help. Lena stepped forward. Uh, Sue? Thanks again for saving my life on the Bowman's planet. I really owe you one. Ah, don't mention it. Now get going. I hate long goodbyes. They waved all the way back to one of the hallways, where the most recently repaired bay was. Hey. Leaving without saying goodbye? Rissa ran down the corridor towards them, her head still bandaged tightly. Lef coughed. <clears throat> uh, sorry. She ran up and abruptly jumped forward and hugged him. Goodbye, Lef. Lef was surprised at first, but he sighed and hugged back. Bye. Rissa stepped back and turned to Lena, extending her paw. Lena hesitated, then took it, Rissa shaking a little too firmly. The winner takes it all. Take good care of him, will ya? I will! Surlia punched Rissa on the arm. I still don't like you very much. I'll miss you too, Surlia. Well, I must go and deal with all the insurance paperwork. She waved and strode down the hall. As soon as the three entered the frontier, a wolf reporter ran up and jammed a microphone in Left's face. Are you the captain of this ship? Yes. I'm Shelley Halliburton for AGNN. Would you care for an interview? What? An interview? Yes, I would. Thank you. She turned to another wolf who was holding a camera. Hit it, Des. Hi, this is Shelley for an exclusive interview with the brave captain, whose crew helped save many lives in the recent explosion here at NSP Station. Mr. Quill, what was it like putting your life at risk like that? Well, Shelley, it was pretty insane, but lives were at stake. Sir Lea and Lena left left to his moment in the spotlight and walked to the cockpit, where Feldo and Zack waited playing a game of sacrifice. Hey, did you guys let that reporter in? Feldo shuffled to his cards. Um, I abstain from answering. Me too. Sir Lea just rolled her eyes and slumped in her chair. Lena sat on the floor beside Feldo and observed the game. Feldo! She pointed to one of the cards in his hand. Oh, Zack, my advantage. He placed the card next to one of Zack's. Zack sighed. Ugh, Lena, don't help him. I'm already losing as it is. She laughed, then stuck out her tongue at Zack. Left strolled in, his ego having received a good stroking. He was shredding a small piece of paper. What's that? That was Shelley's number. I didn't have the heart to turn her down. Des didn't seem too pleased with me, though. He tossed the paper into a trash can and sat in the captain's chair. All right, guys, we've spent enough time here. We have a colony to establish. Strange, he thought. If I'm sleeping, why am I doing it standing up? He looked around and sighed. It was another dream, the same one he had when his heart had stopped. He felt his chest and tried to feel for a pulse. There wasn't one. In fact, his physical features seemed softened somehow. He couldn't feel anything inside himself, and his fur was less fluffy. He looked around at his surroundings. The water monolith was there, the fog was there, and nothing else. Hey, waterworm monolith thing. The water formed into a long, pulsing worm again, and this time it began snaking around Lef. Lef, you have done well. However, forces still work towards the destruction of this plane. This plane? Where's that? This plane is an area where biological life forms live and die in a linear fashion. Wait, you mean the universe? You may call it the universe, if you wish. Other biological life forms such as you have been corrupted. You shall be given the identity of each. Kill them at all costs if you should encounter them. 
They have been told to kill you. Left watched as the worm flowed faster and faster. What? Who told them to kill me? Wait, am I a pawn? Hey, answer me! The worm abruptly closed around him, tightening around him. The faces of countless people flashed through his mind, then were gone. He couldn't even remember them afterwards. The water didn't stop flowing around him. He was trapped. Hey, get off. He pulled to the left suddenly and the world became dark. He couldn't feel the water anymore. Hey, come back! Love? He recognized the voice and started to feel his surroundings. There was a blanket over his face and he threw it off. Lena was staring down at him, eyes half closed. I'm right here, Lef. Uh, I know. You going to get back in bed, or what? He shook his head and realized he was on the floor. Uh, yeah, just a sec. Lef crawled back up into bed and lay on his stomach, unusually tired out. He drew breaths deeply and frantically. Lena rubbed his back. Lef, are you alright? You didn't... No, don't worry. Just a bad dream. I don't even remember what it was. He flipped himself and reached over for the blanket he threw away, spreading it over them and lying on his side in the same motion. I'm sorry if I woke you. She wrapped her arms around him, nuzzling her head under his. It's fine. I'm already falling back to sleep. Left side, the bad dream's effect wearing off quickly. Zack's alarm rang, and he smacked it hard. He finally looked up when it didn't stop. Ugh. It wasn't an alarm, but the computer console next to it that was going off. He groaned, hauled himself up, and looked bleary-eyed at the message on the screen. It read, Drive offline. Obstacle detected. Full stop. He sighed. As the chief engineer, it was his duty to maneuver the frontier around anything that stopped the night computer from reaching its destination. He hauled himself up, pulled on some clothes, and shuffled to the cockpit. He grabbed a coffee, ran a scan of the area, and switched on the forward camera. He almost spat out his coffee when he saw what the front camera showed. A huge congregation of Atrian ships, all lined up in front of an entire armada of Solar Federation cruisers. He smashed the comm button. Uh, Lef, we've got a situation here. Sir Leah's console lit up. They were being hailed. Zack scrambled to answer it. Uh, hello, um... Please don't shoot us. What? Why would we shoot you? Zack looked at the screen and saw an otter atrian in a smart captain's uniform. Uh, I thought you were from one of those Solar Federation ships. The otter tilted his head. I was about to make the same remark. You aren't the captain of that atrian ship, are you? Uh, no. I'm just the engineer. Left stumbled in, rubbing sleep from his eyes. Zack, this better be important. Who's that? Uh, I don't know, but there's an entire fleet of Solar Federation ships out there. The otter twirled his whiskers. I'm Captain Canton. Who are you? Left sat in his chair and straightened his shirt. I'm the captain of this ship. Can you explain what's going on here? Well then, you must be Left. I'll explain everything in person. Await my arrival. Oh, and one other thing. No need to wake the rest of your crew. He cut the transmission abruptly. Zack looked at Left as though he had an answer to the situation. That was weird. Lef looked at the screen. The area was filled with ships and sensor nets. Yeah, but I have a feeling it's about to get a whole lot weirder. They both watched as, from the assembled civilian ships, the only military Atrian ship dispatched a small shuttle pod, which flew towards them. Zack, I think we'd better do as he says. This situation looks pretty tense. They walked towards the airlock as Zack nodded his head. Agreed. The airlock was already cycling by the time they arrived and as soon as it finished, Canton stepped out with two Special Forces soldiers. Lef tried not to be intimidated by the two. They were heavily armed with plasma-jacketed Seeker assault rifles and reactive combat armor, and their expressions were set grimly. Lef extended his paw to Canton, who brushed by them. No time for chat. I have important business to discuss with you. All right. Fine. Come on, Zack. No, not him. Son, go back to your bed and sleep. You look like you need it. Zack eyed the gun in one of the soldiers' paws. Go on, Zack. I'll be fine. He walked down the corridor, glancing back once as Lef led the three guests into the conference room. Lef and Canton sat down at the table, but the two soldiers stood unmoving. Before Lef could open his mouth, Canton leaned forward and spoke in a low, serious tone. Listen very carefully. If anything we discuss here ever gets out into the public, you will disappear. 
Leff was stunned for a moment. Uh, sure. But I don't like being threatened. Canton shrugged. Desperate times call for desperate measures. We're in a little bit of a situation right now. I've got a bad feeling about this. Canton laughed, the two soldiers' expressions still not changing. He glanced up at them. This is why I dislike boorish military types. No sense of humor. <coughs> but I'm being facetious. Before you ask, there is a reason the Solar Federation is stopping people from passing into no man's space. Leff wasn't surprised. No Man's Space was a region of space technically owned by the Solar Federation, but after the war, a document was signed that made the area co-owned by the Atrian government. Eden happened to lie in this area, as well as several Solar Federation colonies. It was supposed to stand as a testament to the cohabitation of the two races, though much like everywhere else, the two races rarely mingled. There were many legal battles over whose laws should be used, among other conflicts. This is the important part. The Atrian military have been experimenting with photonic weaponry, small arms and mid-sized cannons mostly. That's common knowledge to most up-to-date people, but what people don't know is this. Canton looked behind him at the soldiers, then back at Laff. I really can't stress this enough. No one must know anything I'm about to tell you. Laff shook his head. Then don't. Why do you need me for this whatever it is? Canton folded his paws and sighed. You are a colony ship. You might be able to get through that blockade. Why do you need me through the blockade? Just listen! Leth held up his paws and Canton continued. Adrian spies have uncovered some unsettling news. There are indications that the Solar Federation is mobilizing their slow battleships to no man's space. We don't know what they're for, but in response I and a few others were ordered to carry the prototype photonic weaponry and prepare a demonstration to ward off any attacks and be ready to attack at a moment's notice. Somehow the Solar Federation discovered this, and now they've set up a blockade to stop any Atrian ships from entering no man's space. They know that if we get our weapons set up, they can't make a move. But if they stop us here, they could do whatever it is they're planning on doing in no man's space. This is where you come in. Lef held up a paw. Don't tell me. You want me to smuggle the photonic weaponry across the border for you. Precisely. And if I say no? Canton smiled. Technically, you can't say no. Oh, really? Yeah. Canton handed Leff a data pad. Official orders from the 8th Fleet General directing you to follow all of my orders. Leff tossed the data pad under the table. I'm not a military officer. I don't take orders from the General. Who pays you? Um, the Atrian government. Yep. And when you signed all that paperwork, you probably didn't read the fine print. Section 31, subparagraph 420, says that you have the rank of acting captain in the Atrian military, and must therefore obey all commands from the general. And if I disobey, you'll haul me off to jail for insubordination. But if I do help you, I'll probably be blown up by the Solar Federation. At least then you have a shot at not having your life ruined. Leff looked at the two soldiers, then at Canton. There really was no way out of this. Canton... You know this is a colony ship. It has 60 innocent colonists on it. If they all die... Leth, this goes beyond you, me, your crew, or my crew. Spare me your propaganda. I'll cooperate. But what am I supposed to tell my crew? Canton shrugged. Tell them we took on some extra cargo. Beyond that, we'll get the Solar Federation to get you through. If we use a pretty cool trick in getting here without them noticing, I'm sure we can think of something. Canton stood and so did Leff. I'll contact you on a secure channel, at which point we'll dock with you and transfer the cargo. In full view of the Solar Federation. Canton smiled and twirled his whiskers again. Don't worry, we have a plan so simple it's foolproof. Marcus Starr was the chief security officer on the Solar Federation light cruiser Mary Celeste. He was slightly short, but muscular. His face was well proportioned, but his hair was short and wiry, and he gave off an air of strength and confidence. He was happy with his job, serving his planet and getting a good pay. However, in this specific situation, he would much rather be literally anywhere else in the Solar Federation. He adjusted his lieutenant's uniform with its single solid stripe and sighed. The woman sitting next to him leaned over. Having trouble with something? Uh, not really. I'm just a little on edge is all. That's good. We need everyone on their toes. After all, we are the only thing keeping the super-secret weapons from crossing the border. She said, super-secret, as though it was a joke. Hey, this is serious business. Who knows what those fur fa I mean, Atrians are up to. She frowned at him. I'll pretend I didn't hear that. Sorry. Slip of the tongue. 
His station beeped, and the display showed two Atrian ships moving together. He stood and looked up at the main bridge. Most Solar Federation ships were designed the same way. The main bridge was a raised platform upon which the commander, pilot, and second officer sat. In a ring around the main bridge was a lowered trench that was around four feet deep, holding the rest of the bridge crew. Many complained about this design, despite protecting most of the bridge crew from explosions and giving the commander an unobstructed view of space through the panoramic windows, made possible by the cockpit being on the very bottom level of the ship. Marcus called up to Commander Tony, who was sitting in contemplation. Tony was very tall, so tall people called him Beanpole behind his back. He had an amazing beard and a slightly droopy right eye. Sir, the Atrian warship is moving to intercept the cargo ship that just arrived. Let's see it. Marcus pressed a button, and his console's screen was projected as a hologram before Tony. What are they up to? Before he could stop himself, Marcus spoke. Sir, they're probably transferring the weapons. Lieutenant, let's not jump to conclusions. They are right, it could be. Marcus sat back down and watched as the two ships docked. Left stood by as soldiers wheeled large crates into the frontier, pushing them over to the furthest cargo bay. Solia had been awoken by the noise, and she came over to Lef, a puzzled look on her face. Lef, where did this cargo come from? Oh, we're at a border checkpoint of no man's space, so I decided to stock up on supplies. Sir Leah narrowed her eyes. And why is the military delivering our supplies? Uh, Sir Leah, come with me. Leff led her to an out-of-the-way spot. As my first officer, I feel I have to tell you everything. I was, uh, ordered to take on cargo and deliver it. Ordered? By who? The fleet general. Yes, I know, but they can do that. Don't worry, it won't hinder us. Leff, I know you aren't telling me everything. I've known you long enough. They also ordered me to keep some... secrets. Sir Leah looked back at the soldiers, pushing away their boxes, then back at Laugh. Fine, but if this gets out of hand... Yeah, don't worry about it. Oh, and it looks like the Solar Federation has a whole bunch of ships guarding the border, so don't be alarmed. He smiled disarmingly as she frowned. I'm going back to bed. She stalked off. Leff made sure she was back in her cabin before heading to where the boxes were being kept. He stood next to Canton, who was standing next to one of the crates. Leff gestured at the handle. May I? I don't see the harm. Left pulled the crate open and looked inside. It was a pile of components that could have been anything. Huh, I was expecting something more grand. I'm sure the Solar Federation has told their people what to look for. Anyway, it's time to hide them. Marcus watched as the frontier broke off and began heading towards the checkpoint. Sir, the cargo ship is moving towards the border. Tony stood up. Vasquez, signal the checkpoint. Tell them that ship has been selected for a random search. Star, Gomez, situation room. Tony walked into the next room, where private conferences were held. Marcus climbed a nearby ladder and joined Gomez, the second officer, as they walked into the room. Tony leaned over his desk. Lieutenant, I want you to lead the inspection. Marcus gulped. Yes, Commander. Unfortunately, we can't hold them there for long. Gomez raised an eyebrow. Why not? They're subject to the same laws as the other Atrian ships. Tony pressed a button on his console and turned it towards them. I took the liberty of searching up that ship's registry. It's a colony ship. The Frontier. Marcus nodded, trying to contribute to hide his apprehension. That means we can't hold them for more than a few hours. Exactly. Marcus shook his head. It would take longer than that for a full search. That's why we're going to pull some legal trickery of our own. I'm fairly certain the weapons are on that ship now, but we can't seize them unless we have proof. Lieutenant, you're going to stay aboard that ship when it leaves. What? The commander smiled. According to the law, as long as that ship is in no man's space, we can keep one officer aboard if we suspect foul play. We do. Marcus fought to keep control of himself. With all due respect, sir, you need me here. Lieutenant, you have your orders. Get over there. Although we can't determine exactly where it is, you're looking for a medium-sized crate. And it has to be reinforced with gold alloy. Aye, Commander. My apologies, Commander. He quickly exited the room and caught his breath. He looked around at the faces of the other bridge officers and quickly darted near the elevator. Back in the situation room, Tony sat at his desk. 
Gomez looked at him skeptically. Are you sure he's the right one for the job? You know about his... fear. Tony waved his hand. Marcus needs to face his fears. Besides, the photonic weaponry isn't really on that ship. It's bait. Gomez grinned. So killing two birds with one stone, huh? Teaching Marcus a lesson and making it seem like we took the bait at the same time? Tony held up three fingers. And if the weaponry really is on that ship, Marcus will find it. What do you mean, random search? Left sat in the cockpit alone, talking into the comm. Your ship has been selected for a random search. Please stand by and prepare to be boarded. Leff rolled his eyes, but remembered what Kenton had said. We both know there's nothing random about this search. The comm was cut abruptly. He sighed and hit the intercom. Sir Leah, I know you like to sleep in, but we have guests. Meet me at the airlock. Leff stood up and headed for the airlock, passing Lena on the way. Leff, there you are! I woke up and you were gone! Yeah, sorry. We've been selected for a random search. We're at the checkpoint between Atrian Space and No Man's Space. Oh, okay. Left snapped his finger. When you get to the cockpit, wake Zack and Feldo. Okay, but why? Um, I don't like an understaffed cockpit. He walked off before she could formulate an answer. Lena shrugged and took her station, calling Zack, then Feldo. Sir Leah was already at the airlock, apparently because she hadn't been able to get back to sleep. She had on a cranky face and glared at Leff as he came in. This better not have anything to do with that cargo. I don't know. The airlock opened, revealing Marcus and four officers. He gulped and glanced quickly at Leff and Sir Leah before turning to his officers. Start searching the cargo bays. Remember what to look for. They walked off, and Marcus reluctantly turned to the two Atrians, nervously adjusting the translator on his uniform. Uh, this won't take long. Sir Leah bared her fangs subconsciously. It better not. Marcus took a step back. Uh, excuse me. He ran after his comrades. Is it just me, or did that guy look positively terrified? As far as I'm concerned, that's a good thing. Marcus's hour was almost up, and he wiped the sweat off his brow as he checked the hundredth gold ally reinforced crate. Leff observed him and two of his officers silently. Feldo walked out to him and watched as well. Marcus busied himself with the search, but he could feel their eyes on him. He just could. He jumped when his wristwatch beeped. His time was up. He stood and called out to his officers. That's it! Back on the shuttle! They nodded and walked out. Marcus rubbed his neck and walked up to Leff and Feldo. Uh, I... I... I have... Orders to stay with you as you, uh, go. <laughs> Leff frowned. Everything was going according to Canton's plan until now. What? You can't do that. I won't be keeping you here. And the law says I can continue the search as long as I don't get in the way. Leff resisted the urge to slap his knee and shout, Damn. Uh, alright. Feldo felt sorry for the officer, not really knowing what was going on. Marcus was just a poor officer set on a routine duty, and not sent to find a secret cache of weapons. Buck up there, buddy. I know the H1 was a crap bucket, but it's nice and comfy. He patted Marcus on the back, but it just made Marcus seem more tense. He coughed and turned around to get back to his search. Once back in the cockpit, Leff addressed the crew, cursing Canton for making him lie through his teeth. So, we've taken on some extra supplies from another Atrian ship and have been tasked with bringing it to the coordinates I have punched in. We also have an inspector of sorts on board. Just ignore him. We'll let him off when he's done. All right, Lena, take us out of the checkpoint and let's continue on. Tony watched as the Frontier jumped into hyperspace. He turned his attention to the Atrian warship now approaching the checkpoint. Hail the checkpoint again. That ship has also been selected. Frontier by Maggot Mosh Pit, Chapter 23 Canton stood at the airlock before Tony, his paws folded behind his back. Hello again, Hurt. Canton chuckled at Tony's use of his first name. It's been a while, Rick. Gomez's smile widened. You two know each other? Canton nodded. We've met. In battle. Tony was backed by a compliment of his officers, while Canton only stood with his son and first officer, Frey. Well, it's peacetime now. Would you like a tour of the ship? This is strictly business. 
We're going to search your holds, and, well, you know what happens then. Candon patted Frey on the back and laughed. Well, go right ahead. My son will show you the way. He's a fine young officer. I'm not nearly as good as you, sir. Gomez looked at Tony. Modest still. Tony understood the real meaning behind the look. If they had subverted Candon's plan, why wasn't he at least a little bit nervous? Tony concluded that Canton must have been a better actor than he gave him credit for. He, Gomez, and the assembled officers followed Frey as he chatted away, pointing out things on the walls. Canton headed back to the cockpit to send an encoded message. Marcus was halfway through the Frontier's holds, despite being alone. He muttered to himself as he worked. Another crate full of stem bolts. Why did I have to end up on this assignment? I bet he did this on purpose, trying to fix my anxiety through fire, like it'll ever undo. He almost jumped out of his skin when he heard a noise behind him. He took a deep breath and told himself he had nothing to worry about. They're intelligent life forms, after all. He looked back and saw Serlia walking towards him, the one with the big teeth. He turned back around and continued sifting through stem bolts. Can I help you? He heard her lean against a crate. Tell me something. Marcus was prepared to deflect her question if she was trying to get information out of him. Why are you afraid of Atrians? He was surprised. Maybe she had no idea why he was here. Uh, I'm not. Celia chuckled as she watched him look through the same crate over and over. Something about this human intrigued her. She had seen humans that hated Atrians, didn't care, or even loved them. Never afraid, though. That's a lie. You're quivering in your boots. He sighed, stopped sifting through the stem bolts, and finally moved to another crate. It's none of your business, anyway. She followed him. Hey, I won't bite. Marcus wished she would just go away. You look like you were going to... earlier. (laughs) Sorry about that. Morning grumps. He stood up and turned around abruptly. What do you want? I have a job to do. I have to... He sighed. I have to complete my inspection. She realized he was a little more freaked out than she thought, so she backed off and tried to appear less intimidating. I won't get in your way. I just want to talk is all. I've never met a human who's afraid of Atrians. Marcus found that hard to believe. Really? I've met humans who are seething with hate for us. Laugh even tells me he met a human whose sister is married to an Atrian, I think. Fear never seems to be a huge issue, though. Marcus, his head buried in a crate, saw a flash of teeth in his mind's eye. So anyway, what is it you're looking for? Hey, are you all right? Ah, I'm fine. It's Relia. I need to talk to you. Lef was standing at the door, tapping his paw. She ran over. Lef closed the door behind her. Serlia, stop bugging our guest. Why? Because he, uh, it's polite? Lef, you're a terrible liar. He scratched his arm. Look, if you let something slip, you could get us in trouble. Lef, it's time to cut the crap. What the hell is going on here? I wish I could tell you, but... You know what? Screw it. He leaned over and whispered the short version into her ear. Huh. That's not as bad as I thought. I suppose we have no choice. But what if Marcus finds them? Lef paced the floor. That's what I'm worrying about. I sent a message to Canton, but I don't know when he'll get back. Serlia glanced back at the door. I have an idea. I was going to do it anyway, but now it kind of works out. She walked back into the cargo bay and sat nearby where Marcus was working. You intrigue me. Marcus jumped again, almost as hard as the first time. He mentally slapped himself in the face, then decided now was the time he would at least try and hold a conversation with an Atrian. He stood and turned around, looking her in the eye. Really? Uh, thanks. Yeah. You met Zack? Marcus had talked to Zack, but he acted very Atrian, and even spoke Atrian at first. It was perhaps more unsettling than Atrians themselves. She blinked, and Marcus realized it was the first time she had blinked since he met her. When you talk to Zack, he's kinda arrogant. He trashed my apartment once, too. 
I guess I don't get to meet many quiet humans. Uh, no offense. None taken. This isn't bad, Marcus kept telling himself. At least her eyes are nice to look at. Canton sat reading Leff's message, which was waiting for him when he got to his office. This complicated things, but Canton had an idea. He began typing a response. Down in the holds, Frey continued showing the Solar Federation officers around, even while the officers dug through their small collection of gold alloy crates. Sensor experts were even using a scanner array in the hold to scan for the components, all under the guise of a biohazard that might have gotten on board. At least, that's what the official records would say. Everyone knew what was really going on. Even Frey, who played his part as a host well. Tony stopped him in the middle of a history lesson on Atrian Drive systems. Frey, I'd like to have a word with my first officer, if you please. Frey nodded. As you wish. He stepped aside, smiling. Tony turned to Gomez, his mask of politeness gone. They aren't here. I can see that, Commander. But why not? I was sure the colony ship was a decoy. Besides, Star would have found something by now. Unless... Unless they did away with him. Gomez turned around, anticipating the commander's next order. Alright everybody, back on Mary Celeste, on the devil. Everyone froze for a moment, then there was a frenzy of activity as the crewmen scrambled to get everything packed up. Gomez followed Tony as he walked back to the shuttle. Contact the New Vegas and tell them to accompany us. We have to catch that ship before it gets to where it's going. Frey watched the airlock close after a few minutes, then he rushed to a wall communicator and called Canton. Father, the humans have discovered the ruse. They're going after the frontier. Well, the game is up. Come back up to the bridge. I'll warn the captain he's got company. Leff was reading Canton's first message and mulling over its contents when he received the second message. He skimmed it, felt the shock run down his spine, then read it again, carefully. Ah, fuck. He ran down the hall to the cockpit and caught himself on the doorframe, poking his head inside and calling to Feldo. Hey, Feldo, is there any way we can increase speed? Um, maybe. Why? Uh, uh, we're behind schedule. Hurry up and do it. I don't care about the risks. Sure, Lef. Take a breather. You look terrible. Terrible? Nah, I'm cool as a fan. Lena was watching the exchange, and she stood and walked up to Lef. He seemed to calm down a little when he saw her. Hi, Peach. Lef, I checked the coordinates you set. That's a restricted system. We aren't allowed in there. Uh, we got clearance. But why did we get clearance? What are we carrying? Lef stepped forward and reached out to touch her arm, but she backed away. It was at that moment that Lef realized he had made a huge mistake. Here he was, chased by two Solar Federation cruisers, his crew quickly losing trust in him. Look guys, I'll explain everything soon, but we really need to increase speed or... We just need to. Lef, you told me- I know! I know! I've been ordered to keep secrets from you, otherwise I'll... Uh, disappear. And you would too. I can't risk telling anyone else. Faldo frowned. Wait, who did you tell? What? I- I, I told Celia, but I trust her not to let anything slip. Despite her best efforts, Lena's ears fell. And... You don't trust us? Lef cursed himself and shook his head. No, that's not what I meant. Look, just trust me on this- How can you ask us to trust you if you don't trust us? Lena poked him in the chest to emphasize her point. I... He looked over at Feldo, who was giving a very disapproving look. Then back at Lena, who looked ready to scratch him with her claws. If I told you everything, which I really want to do, it might result in all our deaths. It's not that I don't trust you guys, it's that I want to protect you. There's too much at stake. There was silence, then Feldo sighed. Is it really that serious? Yes. I'll get you your speed, Lef. But I do expect an explanation. Lena went back to her station. I will too. Great. You guys are great. Now if you'll excuse me. He ran down the hall a short way, then darted into the nearby cargo bay. He raced the crates containing the secret weapon components and threw one open. He looked around. The only other things in the cargo bay was a bunch of empty crates, as the colony needed all but this cargo space. He recalled what the message had instructed him to do, and he began hauling crates to the far end of the wall. 
Marcus laughed as he dug through the last crate in the room. Did he really? <laughs> no way! <laughs> Serlia held her aching ribs as she told him the story. Yep. <laughs> uh, you couldn't expect him to know what it was, though, but it was still funny. He stood, finished with the crate. You know, I never thought I'd say this, but... Marcus made a quick mental note that she could still be the enemy before finishing his sentence. You're pretty fun to talk to. Surlia blushed, then was mad at herself for doing so. Oh, thanks. Likewise. He headed for the door, but Surlia stopped him, extending her paw for a shake. Marcus looked for her claws, but they weren't extended. He nervously took it and shook once, then quickly walked to the next room. Marcus thought to himself how funny her paw was. He never guessed Atrians could retract their claws, and he never would have guessed her paw would be that soft. He sighed as he stood in front of the next-to-last cargo bay. Solia ran after him. Uh, Marcus, you don't want to go in there. He quickly turned around and placed his hand on his pistol, checking her over for a weapon. And why wouldn't I want to go in? The door opened quickly and two wolf children ran full force into his legs, almost knocking him over. One looked up at him and blinked slowly. Sorry, Zack. They ran off down the hall, giggling. Because it's full of colonists. Atrian colonists. He turned around and looked at the hive of activity in the converted cargo bay. People cooking, playing, reading, eating, and talking. He stepped back, and the doors closed. Oh. He'd never seen so many Atrians in one place before, but he wanted to test his courage. If he was able to talk to Sir Leah, he would be able to search that bay. Besides... He thought he saw a couple gold alloy reinforced crates in there. <clears throat> it's fine. Don't worry about it. He stepped forwards again, hesitated, then walked into the cargo bay. He spotted the crate on the other side of the bay, and he started walking, keeping his eyes on the crate. Serlia walked next to him, and he didn't know if it made him feel better to have her there, or worse. Uh, alright. I'll just quickly check this. He opened the crate and looked inside. It was full of clothes. He reached in and dug through them. Hey, get your hands out of there! An Atrian woman walked up and wagged a claw in his face. What are you doing? Rooting around in the dirty clothes bin? She bared her teeth at him. Ah. Uh... Alma, he meant no harm. Leave him alone. She huffed and turned around to continue working on whatever. Fine. Just put everything back where you found it. He coughed and looked in the crate again. Th there is nothing in here. He felt a tug on his uniform as he turned around. There were the wolf children again, pulling on his shirt. Hey! Play with us! Uh, not now. <laughs> One of them dug his short claws into the fabric of Marcus's pant leg. He jumped back and almost screamed. Uh, let's go. The children were about to pester him further when Taliko showed up and shooed them away. Go away with you! Stop bugging our visitor! Sorry about that. She smiled widely, showing her sharp teeth. Marcus turned around as he heard a noise. Oi! Who's your friend? The biggest biped Marcus had ever seen loomed over him and smiled as well. Rackham's towering stature was twice as intimidating to Marcus, and he almost had a panic attack. Ah... Uh... Bye! He dashed as fast as he could out of the bay and down the hall towards the Waxar pen. He burst inside and leaned against the rail, catching his breath. He didn't even look up when one of the Laxar licked the side of his head and grunted at him. Marcus, they're just being friendly. Just being friendly. He heard the door behind him open, and he glanced back, seeing it was only Sir Leah. S sorry about that. It, it was a little intimidating. Uh... Sir Leah leaned against the rail next to him and petted the Laxar. I used to hate humans, you know. Really? I mean, that's understandable. May I ask why? She sighed and grabbed a handful of grain from a nearby bucket and fed it to one of the Laxar. Same as almost everybody else, I suppose. My parents, they... shipped supplies to Atrian battleships during the war. Her tone dropped, and she spoke in a very soft voice. They never came back. I'm sorry. Marcus liked peace as much as the next guy, despite working for the military. He liked exploring the stars and helping out in emergencies. 
He knew war could break out any day, and he accepted that. Which is why he didn't hate Atrians, or necessarily blame them. Cerlia shook her head. You aren't to blame. You aren't nearly old enough to have served in the war. Besides, they were just following orders. Marcus took some grain and let the laxar eat out of his hand. It made a purring sound that was strangely comforting. Which is a damn shame. The only one to blame is the one you can't get revenge on. I hear that. She looked at him, eyebrow raised. Oh? Oh. Uh, nothing. She placed her paw on his hand. You can tell me. It'll probably help, whatever it is. O okay. Cerlia smiled. She was effectively keeping Marcus occupied, not searching the cargo bays. She also thought he was kind of cute for a human. Marcus really didn't think the components were on board at that point. Tony had probably already found them. He cleared his throat. I was eight when the war started. I was living with my family on a border planet. We were farmers. I remember my father, when we got the news, he just scoffed and said, Earth finds a bunch of fluffy animals and decides to make war with them? Nonsense. <laughs> Your father had a way with words. Yeah, and he still does. He's going on 90 now. Still farms that land. I'm getting off topic. You may know this planet as one of the border planets the Atrium military would launch attacks from. Commandos landed and came into our town. They didn't do anything horrible, they just told us to leave within 20 hours. In fact, they came around to our houses and told us personally. I was in our garage with my big brother. We were doing some damn fool thing. He coughed nervously, just then feeling her paw, despite it having been there the entire time. Take your time. Marcus shook his head. I'm fine. One came through the door and told us to leave. My brother was only 16, young and rebellious. He refused, and the soldier grabbed his arm. I don't know how much of what I remember next is reality, but, but this is how I remember it. My brother, his name was Jonah, he pulled a knife and stabbed the guy in the stomach. He didn't even wince, he, he just picked Jonah up, and, and he... I'm sorry. It's alright, just skip that part. Okay. After he was done, he came after me. His teeth were covered in blood. More soldiers showed up, and I think I fainted. Later, I found myself with my family on a ship going to another planet. They told me the soldier died, and so did Jonah. I watched the news every day. I saw the war coverage, how ruthless and unstoppable the Atrians were, at least in the beginning. Of course, as the war dragged into a stalemate, those kinds of reports stopped. But I guess Atrians became the only thing I'm afraid of. That and clowns. What's a clown? You don't want to know. Marcus was still shaken up, and he tried taking a few breaths to calm himself down. Marcus, I understand now. Thank you for sharing. He shook his head. He had just told his life story to a random stranger. It was Atrian. What was he thinking? He even almost forgot his mission. Uh, I'm sorry for taking up your time. I need to get back to work. He started for the door. Cerlia ran in front of him. Wait, uh... He sidestepped her quickly. I've got one last cargo bay to check. Maybe after that we can talk more. He walked quickly down the hall to the last cargo bay, Cerlia following behind. If she tried to stop him, he would get suspicious. He entered the bay and looked around. There were five or six gold alloy crates sitting in the corner of the room. Cerlia came in as he was opening the first. Uh, hey! Empty. Cerlia peered over his shoulder. The crate was indeed empty, as was the next, and the next. He pulled out a scanner from his pocket. Time to go over the ship with a fine-tooth comb. Surlia smiled and hoped Lef hid the components somewhere the scanner wouldn't pick up. Turned out, it didn't matter. Marcus sniffed the air. Wait, what's that smell? Surlia sniffed. Something was burning. Smells like improperly packed power cells. 
He drew his weapon and pointed it at Sir Leah, whose paw was on her pistol. Drop it. She pulled out the gun silently and let it fall to the floor. He glanced quickly at the empty crates across the room and quickly backed towards them. I guess the commander was right. To think that whole time I thought you were being nice. I didn't know about this whole thing until a while ago. I couldn't just stop conversing. It would have looked suspicious. And it kept you away from here, too. She smiled guiltily. Sorry. He opened one of the crates and waved away the smoke, pulling out a rather strange-looking rifle. The battery pack had burned the wood away a little. Well... He placed it back so the battery pack wouldn't make contact with the wood, and took out his communicator. Hey, slow down there, buddy. Drop the phone. Left stepped from behind a tall crate, the rifle he bought from Rico in his paws. Marcus's pistol was in Left's face in an instant, Left's rifle poking his ribs. Is that an M1? I don't know. Drop the pistol in the communicator. Before Left could react, Marcus pushed the barrel of the rifle out of the way, and pistol whipped Left in the chin, sending him flying. He whirled on Sir Leah, but he was too late. The pulse of energy from her pistol caused him to convulse and fall to the ground. Left dragged himself up and rubbed his chin. Ow. That really hurt. He kicked away Marcus's gun. Sorry, man. Nice try, though. Marcus coughed. What are you going to do with me, then? Nothing. Sir Leah leaned over him. We're really sorry about this. We were kind of forced into it. When you wake up, you'll probably be back with your people, and you'll never see us again. Despite all that had happened, Marcus didn't like the sound of that. He slumped to the ground, fully unconscious. Laugh's escom beeped. Hello? Zack, why didn't you use the intercom? Right, I knew that. What? Already? Did Feldo bring you up to speed? Right, right, be right there. He ran for the door. Sir Leah. Take good care of him. We want to return him in the same condition the Solar Federation gave him to us in. Commander Tony sat on the bridge, frowning. With a class of ship that could only go out of the three, they should be in our sights by now. Gomez nodded. Carmen, sensor analysis. Carmen pressed a few buttons. Sir, sensors show they're going L to 4.6. I didn't give them enough credit. Increase speed to L to the 6. Are we in range to hail them? Yes, Commander. Tony hailed them from his station. Atrian cargo vessel, the Frontier. Please decrease speed to sublight and deactivate your weapons. There was no response. Silence won't get you anywhere. After a minute, there was an answer. Laugh appeared on screen. Yes? How can... Uh... Tony smiled at Leff as he gawked at his face. What? Never seen a black man before? No. <laughs> Fair enough. Surrender. We know you have the weapons. I have no idea what you're talking about. Indeed. He cut the transmission. How long until we reach them? Eighteen minutes. Tony folded his hands. Prepare to fire on them if they're not out of hyperspace by the time we're in range. Left frowned. Uh... Feldo, Zack, and Lena were all looking at him. Left? What weapons? Well, I guess the cat's out of the bag now. He sighed and gave them the rundown. Lena's expression softened. Oh, we're in some deep... Shit. Zack finished. Lef quickly typed a message and sent it. I am the worst at keeping secrets. Hopefully someone in the system we're going to gets that message. What is it? A prayer. Frontier by Maggot Moshpit, Chapter 24 Left watched as the computer spat out a projection. We only have ten minutes! Zack, I want more speed! Look, I'm giving her all she's got, Captain. If I, if I push it any harder, the whole thing's gonna blow. We're running the highest amount of coolant we can. Zack! Ugh, I can increase power to the drive, push our mass close to zero, but- Do it! Put some ice on the drive for all I care! Zack glanced at Feldo and shrugged. I'll be at power junction 5. Watch that temperature gauge. If it gets above 5,000 degrees, warn me. I think I might have a trick up my sleeve. He hurried to the door. Left followed him. What's this trick you say? Felda watched Left's back as he exited the room. Did you eat a lemon or something? What? What's a lemon? 
Lena smiled nervously. It's a sour fruit! Felto chuckled and watched the temperature inside the drive chamber rise steadily. I just don't like Lef right now. I can understand that. I still like him, though. Feldo sighed. He could have confided in us, especially in something like this. He kept it from us, even though we could die. He did what he thought was right. I guess that's why I love him. He has a very firmly set moral compass. Firmly set. The where it's pointing might not be north, if you get what I'm saying. I'm sorry. I don't agree. Oh, don't apologize. I'm just annoyed is all. He called Zack's SCOM from his console. Zack, we're headed for an automatic shutdown soon. Temperature is 4,900. Um, alright. Feldo, I want you to open port 89. Feldo's eyes bulged, and he leaned into the microphone. What? You want to decompress engineering? Feldo could hear Zack chuckling. <laughs> no better way to decrease temperature in the drive than to expose it to space. Lef's voice came on the comm. I've already okayed it, Feldo. Do it. Lef, once port 89 has been blown, we can't repressurize engineering unless we get a repair team. Again. We're going to need a repair team anyway. Do it. That's an order. Feldo sighed and crouched down to remove a panel from his console. Under protest, Captain. He pulled the panel off and scanned the rows of switches. He flipped the one marked 89, and the ship rocked abruptly as the engine room and drive chamber was exposed to space. He stood up again. Lena, did that throw off our course at all? A little. Adjusting. Well, Zack, I hope you didn't have anything valuable sitting on any tables. I locked everything up, as usual. Oh, but my favorite wrench was lying on the table. He heard an audible sniff. There was a thump, and Lef's voice came on the intercom. Feldo, what's our speed now? Uh... L5.07. Feldo detected and shared the worry in Lef's voice. No H model has gone this fast. Peach, check the hull pressures. It's in the red, but not critical. Well, that bought us some time. Let's hope it's enough. Lef shut off the comm. Lena jumped at each creak the ship made, and the usual ambient noise was a higher-pitched whine. She held onto her seat tightly for the next ten minutes. To think! Our pursuer ships are built to go faster than this on a regular basis! Yet we're barely holding together! Eep! There was a loud crack from the floor. Feldo walked over and put his ear to it, Lena anxiously watching from her chair. That's just the cooling pipe adjusting to the rapid changes in temperature. That was probably ice. Laugh and Zack walked in. Oh, Peach, you... He saw the look of fear about her, remembering her inability to act well under pressure. He walked over and put a comforting arm around her shoulders. Everything is going to be fine. Famous last words! She said, even as she relaxed into him. Zack threw an arm around Feldo in an exaggerated manner. Everything is going to be fine, dearest. Oh, shut up. Left kissed her on the forehead and walked to his chair. I think I have a plan. Lena, we'll be passing a nebula soon, right? Yes, but our power signature is too high to hide inside. Lef grinned. That's not what I had in mind. Serlia sat in a crate, staring at the wall. Lef, leave it to you to give me the most boring job. Marcus sat bound loosely to a crate, the stun keeping him under. Suddenly, the ship began shaking, and Serlia rolled her eyes. <sighs> well, here we go. She left Marcus behind and dashed for the cockpit. Lena was wrestling for the controls when she got there. Fello and Zack were madly trying to stop what was happening on their consoles. Lef, our mass is increasing! We'll drop out of hyperspace soon! Lef glared into his console. Zack, there has to be a way to cut the beam. There was a bright flash of light. Lef, what's going on? There was a bright flash of light. Reading sublight speeds! They got us! <sighs> Looks like the Solar Federation's caught us red-handed. Tony grinned and patted his chief engineer on the back. Good work. Now let's give the engine some downtime. The engineer beamed. Thank you, Commander. Tony climbed up to the main bridge and sat down. Hail them, on main viewer. A holographic projection of Left's face appeared before Tony. Hi, may I ask why you've dragged us out of hyperspace? We need to- Excuse me, but you disobeyed a direct order from me. Our man on board hasn't responded to us, and you appear to be pushing your engines past their limit. This charade has gone on too long. Left smiled, and even though they were different races, Tony could detect worry on his face. 
Well, Commander, your man was involved in an accident. Apparently, he has a phobia of Atrians. He lost control and we had to stun him. He's fine. As for disobeying your orders, we don't answer to you and we happen to be behind schedule. <laughs> you expect me to believe you almost blew yourselves up because you're behind schedule. Forgive me if I'm a bit skeptical. Okay, I will. Now let us go. With all due respect, we have you now. Nothing will stop us from- Sir! Atrian hyperspace signatures! The officer that was temporarily replacing Marcus stood. They're coming from direct fronts, and by the looks of their power output, I'd say it's three Tempest-class battlecruisers. General Quarters! He hailed the new Vegas. Jim, assume attack pattern theta and prepare to engage. Three flashes of light briefly blinded him, and the Atrian battlecruisers appeared around the frontier. Leff hailed the closest ship. You got my message! Listen! A jackal with piercing yellow eyes and an unreasonably clean uniform stared Leff down. Mr. Leff, is it? We shall handle this. No, no, you don't need to handle this! Just make sure they don't blast us out of the sky! Let them search the ship! The jackal narrowed his eyes. And why should I do that? Do you not have the cargo? Leff grinned. Well... Tony waited for them to make a move. He knew they would. Surprise tactics were the Atrian standard. He was puzzled when he received a hail. The jackal appeared on the hollow screen, smiling warmly. Greetings, Commander Tony. I am Captain Ronzo of the battlecruiser Darkwing. Fancy meeting you here. Tony was stunned. Fancy? He shouted. Gomez gave Tony a strange look. Commander. <clears throat> Sorry, Ronso, may I ask what three Atrian battlecruisers are doing around this ship we're about to search? Ronso's smile grew wider until his teeth were showing. We were in the vicinity and we wanted to observe the proceedings. Tony muted the audio and leaned over to Gomez. Sounds like a trap to me. Gomez raised an eyebrow. Well, Commander, in my opinion, they won't try anything. It could mean another war after all. What if that's what they want? There could be no weapons at all. Just a plot to get us out here and start the war over. Commander, may I remind you of our battleship movements? The ruse to get them into no-man's space in the first place? Tony nodded. Yes, yes. But they could still be using this as a springboard. Gomez sighed. It is. Possible. Satisfied, Tony leaned back. Keep weapons charged. If they put a single paw out of place, I authorize the use of nuclear warheads. Gomez looked over in shock. Nuclear weapons were the mainstay of the Solar Federation's arsenal. Their destructive power rivaled the largest particle acceleration cannons, not to mention most warheads were shield-piercing. However, the radiation caused from a nuclear explosion prevented hyperspace travel for a wide radius and caused terrible injury to anyone left alive on the target ship. Similar missiles were the reason the Solar Federation was able to keep the Atrians at bay during the war as Atrians preferred not to use nuclear technology for environmental reasons. Sir, that's a civilian ship out there. It has no shields to speak of. Don't worry, Gomez. The threat alone will be enough to keep them in line. He switched the line back on, and Ronzo jumped from his chair where he was waiting. Very well, you may observe. But any sudden moves and we will retaliate with all means necessary. Ronzo shifted uncomfortably. I understand. He cut the line. Tony stood and tapped Gomez's shoulder. Grab the dock. Meet me and the security team in Shuttle Bay 4. Leff and Serlia waited at the airlock for Tony. Well, here we are again. He grinned. It's always such a pleasure. The airlock hissed, and in stepped the stone-faced commander, his first officer, and a wiry-looking man with gray hair, wearing a medical uniform. Leff stepped forward and extended a paw. I'm Leff. Captain of- Tony and his team pushed past them, without as much as a word. Well, nice to meet you too, Commander. Tony stood with his men, a larger compliment than the first time, in the center of the hall. Search every corner of the bay. Scan the walls, too. Tony finally acknowledged Leff's presence. Where is Marcus? Oh, he's in my room, asleep. Tony turned to the thin man. Doc, see to him. The man spoke in a heavy Polish accent. Yes, sir. Leff led him and one security officer to his room. The doctor hurried to Marcus's side and scanned him with a medical device Leff couldn't identify. Yes, he is fine. Stun blast to the chest, mineral burns which have been treated with a gel. The doctor muttered to himself as he worked. 
Yes, he will not remember much from the incident. Lef, is it? Lef nodded. I'll wake him off. You should leave the room, Mr. Lef. Oh, yeah. He shuffled out. The doctor injected Marcus with something from his bag. He quickly opened his eyes and sat up abruptly, only to have the doctor push him back down. Wait! Doc! I have something very important to tell Tony. I just... can't remember what it was. The doctor checked Marcus's pulse. Your blood pressure is a little high. Just take a second to breath. Marcus sat calming himself for a few minutes, then he sat up again. What do you remember? <sighs> I can't remember much. I remember. I was in a cargo bay, surrounded by Atrians. I ran away from them in panic. After that, it's really fuzzy. I remember punching someone, then getting shot. The doctor nodded. Yes, yes. That would seem to correlate with their story. It seems you lost control of yourself and got violent. You gave the left fellow a nasty bruise. I could see it through his fur. Marcus held the side of his head. Doc, give me something for the headache. I would, if it would help. Sorry. Marcus racked his brain, but still came back with fuzzy details. Had he really gone crazy and attacked some Atrians? It was certainly possible. He sighed. I made a fool of myself, Doc. Even after that white furred one was so nice to me, I don't remember her name now. Ah, don't worry about it. I would punch someone if they resembled a giant frog. Haha. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. Tony stood in the middle of the converted cargo bay, getting no shortage of glances and looks. He was furious which was evident as he vented to Gomez in English. Not a single power cell? They double-crossed us. No weapons, no secret test of said weapons. I doubt they ever even existed in the first place. Commander. I know, Gomez. You don't need to tell me. I'm just frustrated is all. What do the scans show? Well, Commander, there could have been photonic weapons here at one point, but it's more likely the hydroponic planners you have on board are giving false signatures. Damn. Two hours of searching came up with nothing. Tony was red-faced, but he kept himself calm on the outside. Leff met him at the airlock, extending his paw again, blocking the entrance to the pod where all the rest of his men had already boarded. Commander, it was a pleasure. Atrian's had somewhat stubby fingers, and Tony's hand dwarfed Leff's, his grip causing Leff to wince. I don't know how you did it, but it doesn't matter. He pushed past Leff and closed the shuttle door, leaving Leff holding his hand and resisting the urge to bounce around in pain. Sir Leah, who was also there, frowned. This generation of Solar Federation commanders hate Atrians way too much. You'd think they were put in command to undermine the peace. I don't think this is over. Better get to the cockpit and warn Ronso. Tony sat on his bridge, glaring at the view screen, watching the Atrian ships sitting in space, silent and motionless. <laughs> He knew they were up to something. Why would they come all this way and go through all this trouble for nothing? Something was afoot. Ferris. The weapons officer stood and saluted. Commander. When I give the word, I want you to fire the nuke. He hesitated, but only for a second. Aye, Commander. Gomez wiped sweat from his brow. He knew Tony could act rashly. Sir, I advise against this. Gomez, I've had to tell you not to worry multiple times today. As I will tell you now... I'll only fire if they do something first. We just have to wait. I know they want to start something. The commander of the New Vegas sat on his bridge, bored out of his mind. This is what I hate about being assigned to someone else. They do all the work. His second officer, Cynthia, yawned. I, I hear that. I mean, this situation is supposed to be tense, but I think they've got it. She said as she picked absent-mindedly at the leather on her chair. The comm officer stood and addressed them. Commander Tony instructs us to arm nukes and wait for a signal. Jim shot up straight. What? Does he know there's a civilian ship out there? Hail him on screen. Tony's face appeared on screen, frowning at Jim. Jim, is there a problem? You authorize use of nukes. I don't advise this. In fact, I protest. Jesus, Rick, do you want to start another war over this? Tony's face grew red. Insubordination! Look here, Jim. 
They're about to do something. I know it. Jim narrowed his eyes. You don't mind my saying, Rick. I'm not your subordinate. I'm contacting the Admiral and advising her of the situation. Do as you please, he said, then abruptly cut the communication. Jim sat down and sighed. He needs to remember the war is over. Cynthia turned to the comm officer. Send a message to the Admiral. Aye. I really hope this doesn't go anywhere. Left sat in his chair, conversing casually with Ronso. Yeah, I was the one that did that. Man, I didn't think the story would spread that fast. Ronso chuckled. Well, it's quite a rumor. Is it really true? Yep. Now, can we change the subject? I need someone to replug port 89. Could you get a shuttle out there and do that? Ronso nodded to his left. Of course. You've done so much for us. It's the least we can do. Leff grinned to himself. Yep. All you have to do now is go back to the nebula and collect the weapons. Never even expected me to hide them there. I hope my shuttle is okay. I'm sure it's fine. We'll get you another if you need. A ship has been dispatched. Expect it in a minute. Tony watched his screen for any sign of movement. His finger twitched. He saw a faint power change in one of the ships. Then the proximity sensors picked up another object. He jumped up and shouted, F Fire! They're launching something at us! Unfortunately, Ferris was a young and unexperienced officer. He fired without even looking. At the same time, the sensor operator whirled around and stood in the same motion. Sir, it's just a shuttle! Everyone watched in horror as the screen displayed the missile as it accelerated towards the assembled ships. The silence was so prevalent you could hear a pin drop. Ferris almost threw up, and Gomez placed his head in his hands. Yeah, and then she just walked up and... Report! Left sat up abruptly, and the rest of the crew did as well, sensing the urgency in Ronso's voice. Nuke incoming, sir! Power engines, get us out of here! Left swallowed. His mouth had suddenly gone dry. Sir, the engines are cool! It'll take three minutes for them to activate! It's too late! He turned to Left and shouted. Abandon ship! Maybe the inertia will carry us away from the blast! There was a mad dash from the cockpit of the frontier, Left activating the evacuation alarm on his way out. Zack stayed behind and madly programmed all the escape pods for launch. Fuck. Commander Jim was the only person who was ready. Sir, Tony has launched a missile. He sprang to his feet. Helmsman, on my mark. Do light speed L to the first four. He checked the computer and his calculations. 0 0.00008 seconds. Heading 1, 8, 7. Program that into computer and wait for my mark. He watched as the computer tracked the missile. Mark! The ship rapidly accelerated and stopped, sending half of Jim's bridge crew into vomiting fits. Jim looked to his left, out his window, and at the missile that was now coming directly towards them. Jamming signals now! Done, Commander! Jim grinned at the missile as it rocketed towards them. Let's hope it isn't defective. There was a loud thunk. Jim laughed with delight as the missile bounced off the hull and went careening off into space, away from any ships. His sensor operator pumped his fist. Sir, the missile is not reacquiring. Ha ha! Thank goodness they programmed a safety range into these things. They don't arm until they're a certain distance from the ship. I saw that in the movie once. The missile flew into space and was soon too far away to see. Any second now. There was a brilliant flash of light as the nuke exploded, too far away to do any damage. The bridge crew cheered, and Jim shook Cynthia's hand. She winked at him. <laughs> that was good! I suppose. Hail Tony. Tell him he's an idiot and he has a lot of explaining to do. Tony sat in a pool of his own sweat as he recovered from the shock of what had just happened. His comm officer stood. Sir, Jim says the order... An idiot, and you have some explaining to do. Tony spoke in a small, sober voice. Tell him. Tell him he's right. What do you mean, we aren't all going to die? Zack grinned. Man, you should have been there. It was, like, so cool. The other Solar Federation ship deflected the missile and exploded out in the asteroid field. They hailed us and said there'd be no more aggressive actions, too. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah. 
We're not about to die. Left turned to the confused looking colonists in the escape pods. All right, good drill, everybody. Back to normal operations. There was a collective sigh of relief as all the colonists shuffled back out to their bay. Lena walked over to Lef, visibly shaken. Lef! We were so close to being obliterated! I know, Peach. We, we could have all died! I was so scared! And so were you! She smiled weakly. Lef gave her a quick kiss. A few months ago, you would have been crouching in a puddle of your own tears. She punched him and laughed. <laughs> and you probably would have insisted on going down with the ship. I almost did, he said as they walked back to the cockpit. Sir Leo was answering a hail when they got back. Lef, it's Ronso. Ronso, what the hell happened? Ronso's uniform was filthy now. Well, apparently they accidentally fired a nuke at us. We're going to stick around and work this out. Lef tilted his head. You still haven't repaired our ship. you will take about as long as it will to deal with this whole thing and get the cargo back. We'll get started right away. His face disappeared from the screen. Left stood and walked over to Lena. I need a rest. I'm dead tired. Wanna watch Onslaught? She stood up. Do I? I'm dying to know what happened to Gregora after the last episode. They walked out of the cockpit, left yelling back to the rest. I'm declaring today a holiday. We didn't get blown up day. Marcus lay in his cabin, awake, even though it was midnight. He had a nagging feeling in the back of his mind. Why couldn't he remember the name of that nice Atrian? It wasn't Leah, but his mind seemed to go to that name when he tried to remember. His bedside computer blinked, a call from the bridge. He answered it. Sir, it's Ensign- Sir Leah! When the Ensign said Sir, everything came back in a flood. Sir Leah's name, the photonic weapons, sharing his story, and being double-crossed. Sir, is something the matter? No. Nothing's wrong. Nothing at all. Frontier by Maggot Moshpit Chapter 25 The crew of the Frontier sat around the conference table, having a quiet meal of freeze-dried mystery meat. Leff regarded the chunk of meat on his plate with distaste. You know... I think they call it mystery meat because they don't want you to know it isn't actually meat. Zack chewed on it happily. Eh, I don't know. I like it. Surlia sniffed at her portion and picked up a piece. It looks like insect meat, but it kind of smells like fish. What do you think, Feldo? Feldo raised his head suddenly. What? Oh, it's fine. He popped some in his mouth and chewed, going back to staring at the tablecloth. Surlia frowned. She knew something was up, but she'd have to ask him in private. Lena pushed her now empty plate away and eyed Lef's. Hey, Leffy, are you gonna finish that? He sighed. <sighs> Don't call me that. She grinned mischievously. <laughs> Only if I can have your dinner. He pushed it aside. Don't blame me if you get mystery food poisoning. Celia ran after Faldo as they dispersed from the dinner table. Hey, Faldo. Can I talk to you for a second? He looked around. Oh, yeah, sure. She walked past him to his room. Well, I'm not standing around in the hall and talking. Come on. Feldo sighed and followed her inside. She sat at his desk and kicked another chair at him. Feldo, something's bothering you. I can tell. He flopped into his chair and hung his head. I don't hide it very well, do I? You can't deal with everything by yourself. It's good to talk to your friends once in a while. I'm your friend, Feldo. He sat up and smiled. Thanks, Celia. It's not a big deal, though. I just miss Terry. And Magenta, he added, in his head. She nodded. I get it. Do you talk to her much online? Feldo chuckled. The delay on online transmissions was long, while ships zipped around at faster than light speeds, most messages taking hours or even days to be delivered. Most internet users resided on planets, not interstellar craft. We've exchanged maybe 80 words. Besides, it's not the same. Yeah, you're right. I don't communicate with my friends back on the moon much anymore. I guess I've learned to accept it, having served on a cargo ship before. Feldo spun his chair around. I guess that's what makes crews so close. They were silent for a while, Surlia fiddling with her chair, and Feldo staring up at a piece of art he had purchased on Alpha 2. 
After a while, Serlia looked up. Feldo, I've been meaning to ask you this for a while. Yes? What is it? She looked him in the eye. Who knows you're alive? Feldo took a deep breath, then leaned back before answering. Nobody. Aside from people who don't know me, and you guys. Not one person? You have to contact someone eventually. Family? Or friends? I'm sure they would be delighted to know you're alive. Feldo's voice became strained. I... I built my crew out of all my best friends. I don't have any siblings. My father is dead and my mother is in prison. There's nobody for me to contact. Serlia rolled over next to him and patted his shoulder. Sorry for bringing it up. Serlia gave his shoulder a squeeze and stood to go. Was there anything else? Feldo looked down. No. She went for the door. Feldo sighed again, then looked up. Wait. I lied. She stopped, then turned around and sat back in the chair next to him. Okay. What about? There are some people. Magenta's parents. I see. Do you want to talk to them? I... Feldo rubbed his paws together, gathering his thoughts. I, I don't know. I'm afraid. I'll make it worse on them. I don't think your fears are justified. If you were close to them, they wouldn't have to mourn your passing anymore. Feldo looked up at her again. Thanks. You're right. Can you do me a favor? Anything. We're near a colony called Seagate. It's Magenta's homeworld, and her parents retired there. She sprang up. Of course. And if left disagrees, I'll mutiny. She walked for the door again, turning to look back at him when she got there. He smiled. Celia, you're a great friend. Thanks for everything. She smiled back. No problem, buddy. She stepped outside and walked a few steps before turning around and gazing at Feldo's door. She heaved a heavy sigh and continued on to the cockpit. Oh, sure. Celia was prepared for Lef to put up a fight. <laughs> Wait, really? Lef shrugged. Yeah, why not? We need shore leave, and this Seagate place sounds lovely. That is why you wanted to stop, right? She smiled dumbly. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> nah, don't mention it. He flipped on the shipwide intercom. Good afternoon, everybody. I have some news. We will be taking shore leave on the planet Seagate for a short while. We will arrive tomorrow morning. He flipped the off switch. I still get scared I might leave that thing on, or it might stick or something. Serlia laughed as she took her seat. You probably deserve it. Lena set a course for Seagate. Do you know much about this planet? No, actually, Feldo suggested it. Zack wandered into the cockpit. Hey, what's this I hear about shore leave? And on Seagate? You know that's just a boring fishing planet, right? Ugh, a fishing planet? Why do you do this to me, Serlia? She threw up her arms in indignation. I don't know. I'm sure it's a nice planet anyway. At least there's bound to be fishing. Lena tried not to sound too excited. I love fishing and fish. Eating it specifically. I can't say no to you, Peach. All right, fishing planet it is then. When they arrived, nobody hailed them. Left looked at the scans of the planet. Maybe they don't have communications? Lena shook her head. That's impossible. They have to. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to order supplies. Serlia, hail the planet. She switched on the comm. Seagate, this is cargo vessel of the Frontier, requesting docking clearance for shore leave. Feldo, who was anxiously waiting behind the engineering station, spoke up. Just give it time. They don't get visitors often. Lef turned to look at him. How do Hello? you- Serlia paused for a moment, then realized it was a response. Yes? We requested docking clearance. The voice on the other end sounded tired, but young. Uh, we don't have docking facilities. You have to stay in orbit and send a shuttle down. Did you say shore leave? We don't get tourists often. Leff answered. Oh, we aren't tourists. I'm Captain Leff, and we're a colony ship, just looking for some respite. Oh, cool! Uh, I mean, <laughs> come on down. We'd appreciate some visitors. Thanks. Out. Serlia cut the line. Left switched on the ship intercom. This is your captain speaking. If you would all proceed in an orderly fashion to the pods, we can start getting you all down there. Fellow peeked out the door and saw the colonists, in a very orderly fashion, rushing for the two pods. 
Lef glanced back at the commotion, then sighed. Lena, you pilot one pod, I've got the other. Sir Leah, you take the cockpit. He followed Lena out the door. And someone finds Zack, he added. Lef grabbed Lena's shoulders before she entered the cargo bay. Peach, remember everything I told you about piloting a shuttle. Go easy on the throttle, remember re-entry procedures, and- I got it! I got it! You're such a worry! I just don't want you to crash. She smiled, kissed him on the cheek, and strode confidently into the bay. Don't worry about me! I'll handle it! Lef laughed, as she almost crashed into Yar and Taliko, who were at the back of the line. He turned around and walked into the bay, pushing past the colonists and climbing inside the fighter pod that was once considered the escape pod. He turned around. All right, five at a time. Five people quickly occupied the shuttle. It was a tight squeeze, but the shuttle weight limit was high. He looked back to check the colonists and was surprised to see Feldo among them. What are you doing here? Taking shore leave. Left shrugged, closed the hatch, and launched. Sirlia sat in the captain's chair, wishing she could be down on the planet hanging out with Lef or Feldo. She had to wait until Lef had half the day, then she'd get her half. She sighed, hoping Feldo was doing all right. She jumped as the comm beeped. She answered it. This is the frontier. Oh, is that a chorus of angels I hear, Sirlia? Prax. Prax's face appeared on screen. Even through his demeanor and friendly attitude, she could tell he had something important on his mind. Yes, it's me. I'll be coming aboard soon. I have something urgent to discuss with Lef. I'll tell him. In the meantime, we can- She cut the signal. Surlia didn't want to listen to Prax anymore. He just wanted to get into her pants. She scoffed in disgust. If he wasn't a military man, she would slap his face off. She held the shuttle, where Lef was taking down the last few colonists. Hey Lef, looks like Prax is here to talk to you. Says it's urgent. What? Well, okay. I'll be there in a sec. Sir Leah walked over to her station and scanned for Prax's ship. It was coming in fast, L to the 8, a whole factor above his ship's design specifications. She frowned. Whatever it was, it was serious. Sir Leah ran to her cabin and strapped on her pistol, just in case. Running to the main airlock, she called Lef's shuttle on her escom. Hey, Prax is coming in pretty fast. He'll be here in a few minutes. Did he say what he wanted? Aside from me? No. Huh. Let's go see, then. Feldo strolled down the streets of the town. He was lost in the memories of that place. He remembered proposing to Magenta on that dock over there. He remembered falling into the water shortly after. He turned a corner and saw Town Square packed with colonists and the people of Seagate having a huge cook-up. Similar-minded folk really did get along. He wondered if Magenta's parents were among the revelers. Feldo walked over and sat at a picnic table with Taliko and Yar. Taliko sipped happily at a milkshake, which they were sharing. Hey, Feldo! Ah, hey, man. He scanned the crowd with his eyes. Hey, you two. Have you seen an elderly couple around? One stone-faced and silent, and the other kind of motherly. Taliko giggled. You just described both halves of the population of this planet. Except the children. She booped his snoot. You know what I meant, darling. Yar popped her back, but he used his nose. Of course I did, dearest. Before the nose cuddling could devolve into a full-on make-out session, Feldo stood and nodded to them. I'm gonna leave before you guys give me high blood sugar. Taliko protested. Don't go! We need a third wheel! Yeah, come on, come hang with us for a while. They're preparing some singing and dancing. It's gonna be a huge party. Feldo considered it, but he had to find Magenta's parents. Sorry guys, I really want to, but I have something to take care of. Don't get too drunk now. Aww, but that's the only way I can get Yar in bed with me. Yar's face flushed. What? I... No, it is not! Feldo left them to their banter and wandered the crowd a little more. In the end, he couldn't find them there, so he walked down an alley and headed for their house. Walking down the old street was surreal. He felt like he was his old, naive, and arrogant self again. He passed a bush he recognized. He passed this bush many times before, and every time he did, he would take a leaf from it and place it in Magenta's ear. He shook his head and blinked a few times, and continued on his way. He heard a gasp when he passed the front steps of an old building. As I live and breathe, Feldo Mason. But you're supposed to be dead. 
He turned around and smiled up into the homely face of Rajik, an acquaintance of Magenta. Hello, Rajik. I am Feldo, and I am not dead. She ran down the steps, though her short legs made her quite slow. What happened? It's been three years and you haven't sent a single word. Feldo saw the relief in the old woman's face and knew Sir Leo was right. I'm sorry. I didn't want anyone to know. For personal reasons. She smiled and patted his arm. We had hope when yours was the only body they couldn't find. But that hope had almost disappeared. Until now. Come in, you need to tell me all about it. The last time Felder was made to relive his experience with Nocto, he had gotten so drunk he almost jumped off a balcony. He really didn't want to tell the story twice, as he anticipated Magenta's parents asking him the same question. Not now, Rajik. I have to see Nan and Grant. Her face softened, and she nodded. I understand. They're at home right now. I won't keep you. He waved and continued down the path towards the house. He turned a corner, and there it was, down a short path into a wooded area nestled quietly away. He walked down the path, remembering how intimidating it was the first time he walked the path with Magenta to meet her parents. He stepped up the stairs, his paws trembling with a mix of excitement and fear. Grant didn't like him very much. He blamed Fello for corrupting his daughter into joining his space mission. Surely he didn't have anything nice to say. He held out his paw, hesitated, then rapped sharply on the hard wooden door. He heard footsteps, and he drew a few deep breaths. The door opened slowly, and towering before him was Grant, mayor of Seagate. Sir Leah tapped her paw as she waited for the airlock to cycle. Prax had stopped dangerously close to the planet and immediately dispatched a shuttle. Leff hadn't even joined her yet. The airlock opened and outstepped Prax, completely alone and armed. He glanced around the room quickly. Hey, Sir Leah, where's Leff? He's not here yet. What's so urgent, anyway? You went through a lot to get here. Prax seemed more preoccupied than before. In fact, she had seen this kind of obsessive behavior somewhere before. Where, she couldn't guess. Leff walked in, his arms above his head and his eyes closed mid-stretch. Oh, man. Try cramping yourself into... Leff opened his eyes and froze the second he saw Prax. His presence seemed to have a profound effect on his brain, and he began to feel a dull pain in the back of his head, eating up his synapses, causing him to lose consciousness slowly and painfully. He took a shaky step forward. Prax! You... Sir Leo looked around and saw Leff stumble and fall, his eyes cloudy. Leff! Leff was back in the mist, but this time he had no control over his body. He was frozen. His physical features felt very blunted, as though someone had put blurring glasses over the world and caused him to become distorted, like a clay figure. The worm was nowhere to be seen, but an image of a face flashed in his head, and the worm's words echoed around the space. Kill them at all costs if you should encounter them. They have been told to kill you. The face flashed again, and he knew it was true. He knew what he had to do. Leff's eyes fluttered open. Sir Leah was kneeling next to him, Prax in the background. He stood up and grabbed the pistol from Sir Leah's belt as he did. Leff, what are you- Hey! Leff raised the pistol and aimed it directly at Prax's head. I'm sorry. He expected Prax to try and get the draw on him, but instead, Prax raised his arms disarmingly. It was perhaps the only reason Lef didn't fire. Lef, I didn't come to kill you. I'm in control. Sir Leah eyed the gun. It was set for the highest setting. It would kill. Lef, what the hell? Stay out of this, Sir Leah. Prax is very dangerous right now. Prax stepped back. Wait a minute. It's me, Lef. Look into my eyes. Lef did. Prax's eyes were naturally red, like many other Atrians. He wasn't sure how, but he detected something behind his eyes, shifting, alive, and angry. Lef, something happened to me a while ago. I collapsed on my bridge and lost consciousness. It was very painful. Lef tightened his grip on the pistol as Prax continued. I had a vision of a group of shifts. Solar Federation and Atrian ones. The Solar Federation ship fired a missile at the Atrian ships, and I regained my senses before anything could happen. It was the strangest feeling. 
I knew it would happen. And it did. Three weeks later. And then... His face twitched. Then something visited my dreams. It was... terrifying. It told me to... It told me to kill you. Sir Leah was very confused. Wait, so you've got... what left, Scott? Prax looked at Sir Leah with something approaching rage on his face, but he didn't speak to her. Lef, I really, really want to kill you, but I can control it. Lef knew what Prax was talking about. Every inch of his being wanted so much to pull the trigger and kill the thing in front of him, but a nagging piece of his mind told him Prax was still there and would die as well. He lowered the gun, but didn't drop it. So why not go very, very far away from here? Prax relaxed, but Sir Leah was still uneasy. I think we can help each other. I think I know how to... get rid of this. Faldo forced himself to look into Grant's eyes. Neither of them spoke, and Grant's expression didn't change at all. It was a neutral expression that didn't betray any of his inner thoughts. Feldo felt he needed to say something, lest Grant's gaze cause his head to explode. Hello. I'm not dead. Grant didn't move a single muscle. Another voice called from inside the house, shattering the infinitely tense moment. Dear, who is it? Is it that salesman that... Feldo? Nan stood behind her husband, mouth open in shock. Nan wasn't her real name, but that's what everyone called her. Nan, it's good to see you again. Feldo! She ran up and wrapped him in a surprisingly tight bear hug. Oof. How is this possible? They told us there wasn't a chance. Come in, I'll make you some tea, and you can tell us everything. Oh, this is wonderful! Grant didn't look as though he agreed. Frontier by Maggot Mosh Pit, Chapter 26 Faldo sat on a soft, fancy couch, a dish of tea in front of him. Grant still hadn't said a word, and he was staring at Faldo, his tea untouched. Nan walked in, placed her tea on the coffee table, and pressed her paws together. Now, Faldo, tell us how you escaped. Faldo sipped his tea. It was a type of tea popular among Atrians. It reacted to the rather acidic saliva Atrians had, producing a similar effect to that of peppermint tea. It tingled in his mouth as he sought for something to say. I... didn't escape. I was captured. He unbuttoned the top buttons of his shirt and revealed the beginnings of his scar, left by Nocto's whip. Nan placed her paws over her mouth, and Grant's expression changed ever so slightly, his face becoming more relaxed. Oh, my goodness. How terrible! I got away, though. Met a nice group of folks, and they gave me a job on the ship called the Frontier. He looked at Nan's face. Her eyes were misty and sympathetic. He looked over at Grant. His expression was still the same accusing glare. The only people left alive from his group of close friends. He sniffed and tried to hold back the tears welling up in his eyes. I... everyone I knew... He shut his eyes and held back the flood of sudden emotions. Something akin to intense nostalgia filled him. Memories of people he would never make new memories with filling his head. Nan ran over and sat beside him, throwing her arm around his shoulders. Oh, you poor dear. We know how you feel. There's never a day that goes by I don't think of Magenta. Each time I shed a tear. I loved her so much. Like hell. Grant finally said, his voice dripping with malice. Prax, Lef, and Sir Leah sat around the conference table. The unease in the room was palpable. Sir Leah had taken both their weapons and threw them into the cockpit, far away from where they now sat. Lef's eyes were locked onto Prax's, his fingers twitching in apprehension. So, how do you propose we rid ourselves of this... whatever it is? Prax reached into his breast pocket and pulled out a data pad. Unlike you, I have some influence on Atria. And right after my first experience, I did some research on this type of thing. Sirlia felt as though her presence was being completely ignored, the other two's attention being focused completely on one another. You mean psychic stuff? Yeah. Every article or piece of writing I read traced back to one ancient red panda. 
Well, they can't help us now. They're all dead. Nonetheless, there was a journal, if you will, by this red panda monk who suddenly acquired the ability to predict events with startling accuracy. Sound familiar? Left nodded. Well, according to the text, because of his already well-disciplined mind, he could control his powers and expand them. While for us, the premonitions are random, he could make them occur. He also describes reaching into other people's minds. What? How is that supposed to help us? I don't want to read your mind. Prax brought up a section of text on his data pad. It's not like that. It's quite hard to explain, actually. I'll read his explanation. It was very well put. He coughed and scanned the pad before beginning. <clears throat> as my paws touched her head, it was as though a bridge was built between our minds. I, standing on one side, could see her there, her mind a city behind her. A great beast charged down the bridge from my side, flowing, twisting, and contorting like nothing I had ever seen. I felt weak as it left my city and crossed to hers, the strength of the past few months leaving me. Now, by strength, I assume he meant his abilities, meaning something must have passed to his sister, the one whose mind he was connected to, leaving him powerless. Anyway, he goes on. It flowed past her and around the city, searching every corner and causing her some discomfort. I might have broken the connection, but I found I could not move. It seemed to be looking for something. However, fruitless with its search, it returned across the bridge and coiled around my city, bringing with it shreds of my sister's mind. What those shreds were are irrelevant. Left began to understand what Prax was getting at. So, something in his head went to hers, then back? He even described it similarly to... Wait, that would mean the waterworm thing is in my mind? Prax smiled slightly. Now you understand. Yes, apparently. All this monk had to do was grab onto his sister's head and concentrate, and he was able to initiate the connection. This is where my idea comes in. My guess is the thing in my head wants the thing in your head dead. And as it turns out, vice versa. All we have to do is bring them together, let them duke it out, and hopefully whatever is left won't be strong enough to bother us. Surely I couldn't believe what she was hearing. Are you too crazy? You could both be killed! We have no idea what we're dealing with here! I don't know, Sir Leia. I can't control myself much longer, and I don't know what else to do. Lef, how many times have you risked your life? Too many! The cause may come to collect on your debt to them. This is the only way. Lef, without hesitation, pulled his chair next to Prax. Do it, then. I really have no idea how to do this, so I'll try to copy the technique from the journal. Hesitantly, Prax raised his arms. He glanced at the data pad, grasped Left's head in his paws, and shut his eyes. He concentrated hard on forming a bridge, Left doing the same. Nan gasped. <gasps> Grant, what an ugly thing to say. Grant continued to stare at Feldo. If you really cared about my daughter, you wouldn't have gotten her killed. Stop this now! It isn't his fault. He couldn't have known. Grant stood up and roared. You knew there were pirates around, yet you still left. You took my daughter from me. Despite sitting in his late wife's parents' house, being accused of murder, a small, dark part of himself still laughed at the situation. Who was he kidding? He knew full well that this would happen, and here it was. Nan stood up and pushed her husband in frustration. Why would he want to do such a thing? You saw how close they were. I noticed you said you loved her. Tell me, have your feelings changed that quickly? Have you replaced her too? I don't want to hear another word out of you. I'm sure he hasn't. Nan, he's right. Her name is Terry. Nan looked at him in shock. Well, that's your business, she said, trying not to sound too hurt. Grant pointed an accusing finger at Feldo. See? I knew it from the start. You just wanted Magenta because she was attractive. And when you were tired of her, you gave her to the pirates and found another. You never really loved her. Feldo stood and walked up to Grant, stretching to his full height and staring him directly in the eye, tears streaming down his face. You can stand there 
and accused me of poor judgment. And you have the right to be mad because I found another. Hell, you can accuse me of murdering Magenta if it makes you feel better. But for you two to stand there and tell me that I never loved her. To say I replaced her. To say I wanted her dead. You're a fool. A fool who is too blinded by grief to feel the pain I feel every night when I relive. When I... Faldo's voice was lost in his frenzy. He growled at Grant, whose face had gone back to what it was when he answered the door. Fuck you. Faldo ran out the door and slammed it behind him. He ran down the path, ran up the streets, and down the dock. He stopped at the end, looking over the salty waters of Seagate. He drew a shaky breath and sat dangling his footpaws above the water, the ocean's steady rising and falling action calming him somewhat. He began talking to the waves, an audience who might not judge him. I'm selfish. I wanted to visit them because I thought it would make him feel better. Reduce the damage I've caused. The sea gasped at him, spraying him with water. You're right. I can never undo what I did. What what did you do? For a split second, Feldo thought the ocean had responded to his statement, but it was Grant, lumbering up behind him. He sat down beside Feldo, folding his paws together. He sat like that for a long time. Laughter and music could be heard from the town square, but it soon died down as the sun sank beneath the waves. It was little under a half hour before Grant spoke again, his rage from earlier subsiding significantly. What did you do? Feldo looked up. What did I do? You knew full well when you were screaming at me. He grumbled, then pulled out a knife and began absentmindedly trimming his claws. Forgive an old fool's outburst. I didn't know what I was talking about. I mean, you showing up here was a shock to be sure. <clears throat> Forgive me. You came to visit us, and I just... It brought back bad memories. Faldo laughed dryly. Yeah, sure did. I guess I did blame you. I still do, probably. I should be more angry at the pirates. He chuckled. <laughs> we had a huge party when they caught Nocto. Still... Feldo said, determined to find a reason Grant should hate him. There's Terry. When I was a kid, you might have been thrown out of town for remarrying. But now you get all these, oh, what did they call them? Social justice warriors? Yeah. Anyway, they're raising all these good points about why it should be acceptable. I'm just an old-fashioned, sad man. I shouldn't judge what's in another man's heart. Feldo smiled slightly. Well, we are married. Just mates at this point. She kind of made me stop blaming myself. I was on a real masochistic kick for a while there. And I haven't replaced Magenta. She's still in there. Grant slapped Feldo on the back, almost knocking him over the edge into the water. Feldo, I never told you this. But, but I'm proud to call you my son-in-law. Thanks, Dad. At first, Sirlia kept the same level of caution while Laugh and Prax were locked together in their strange embrace. However, after the first half hour passed without a single thing occurring, she just watched, wondering if it was some elaborate prank. How long- Shh! She sighed and shrugged. Prax's arms did not tire, and he began to feel something in the back of his mind grow stronger. Lef! I think it's... Suddenly, Left drew a sharp breath and tensed up. It's... working. They both grunted and spasmed, causing Sirlia to jump up and run to their side. She grabbed onto Left and tried to pull him, but he pushed her away. No. Don't. Break. Connection. First, Left passed out, slumping onto the table. Prax's face twitched erratically. This... Isn't supposed to happen? He slumped on top of Lef's numb form. Celia stood, arms outstretched, but unable to do anything. She sat and watched their lifeless forms, observing their shallow breathing. I hope this works. Lef was back in the mist. He could remember everything they were trying to do, and he wondered if this was what his brain looked like. Man, I'm boring. A sound behind him made him jump and whirl around. A giant vortex had formed in the air. It was black, swirling, and tinged green. Whoa! 
The worm appeared, flowed around him once, and formed in front of him. What have you done? The worm said, as a statement and not a question. Lef grinned with his clay mouth and pointed his stubby arm at the worm. I'm getting rid of the thing in Prax's head, and you're going to help me do it. What? You have brought it here? Lef crossed his arm stumps. Yes? Yes, I did. This manifestation does not have enough power to face the Prax entity. You have jeopardized everything. You are the one who didn't tell me shit! Maybe if you would explain who the hell you are and what you want, I wouldn't have to do this. The vortex made a ghastly noise, like the bubbling of mud, and another clay figure flew in, landing without any impact. It stood, and Lev could see it. It had vague, dark spots and points on its head that could be ears. Prax, is that you? Lev? Why do you look like I'm seeing you through a filthy magnifying glass? Your physical appearance is irrelevant. This was learned. Prax waddled up to the water form. Hey, you look like my... The vortex made another sound, this time more frightening. It was the sound of a far-off clap of thunder, but it never ended, and it was getting closer. Prax and Lef stepped back from the vortex and covered their faces with their arms. Lef realized he could perceive the vortex, even though he was covering the spot where his eyes should be. The sound grew too much to bear, and out from the vortex shot a jet of black water, glossy and oily. The thing oozed to the ground and formed into a worm. I have found you, it said. Indeed. I would have eradicated you from the lesser planes, but this one is strong, no matter. It served my needs. You will now atone for the crimes you have committed. The clear worm began swirling around, trying to flank the oily water, but it flowed around at the same rate, until Prax and Lef were surrounded by a swirling mix of the two. I have committed no crimes. The continuum is corrupt. It must be corrected. Lef tried to cough, but he had no mouth anymore. He spoke anyway. Hey, you guys, can't we just talk this out a bit? Suddenly, the clear water changed directions and collided with the oily water, causing an immense wave of pressure that pushed Lef and Prax back. Hey, Lef! I think we should help! They watched as the two swirled around each other, occasionally stabbing and splashing at the other. Yeah, but which one? Uh, the one in your head! I couldn't agree more. They began an awkward shuffle towards the side that had the most oily water. It took no notice of them, even when Lef dealt it a blow with his arm. It's no use, Prax. We're going to have to- Ah! Suddenly, there was a bright flash of light, and the black oily water shot with a blood-curdling screech into the vortex. Lef pumped what would have been his fist. Yes, you did it! It is not defeated. It was sent back to Prax. Prax looked around in dismay. What? It's got my body? Hey! Wait for me! Prax waddled to the vortex and hopped in. It is too late for Prax. The Prax entity has taken over its body now. You must kill it now, and do not attempt another bridge. Aye, aye, Captain. He opened his eyes and sat up. Prax was there, his body still limp. Left jumps back and grabs Serlia's paw. We have to get out of here and get the weapons now. What? What are you- Holy crap! Prax's body began to twitch, and black tendrils rose from his head. The room dropped a few degrees and darkened significantly. The Prax thing stood without leaning forward or moving its arms. It turned to face the two petrified Atrians and opened its eyes. Prax's red eyes were now pitch black, without so much as a reflection on the seemingly endless surface. Sir Leanne Leff began backing up, out the door. Uh, Prax? Its mouth opened, and a long sigh escaped. It made noises like it was trying to speak, but it didn't know how to use a mouth. Suddenly, it thrashed both of Prax's arms in a wide arc, straight into the table. The table exploded in a shower of splinters and black powder. Lef and Serlia didn't stick around long enough to see what else would happen, running down the hall towards the cockpit. Lef, what the hell happened? Uh, I may have made it worse. That's not Prax, for all intents and purposes. Sir Leah's keen mind recognized the circumstances. Lef, it's like that robot, remember? They dashed into the empty cockpit. Lef watched the door as Sir Leah grabbed the pistols. Yeah, but then we exploded the thing's head. I am not exploding Prax's head as much as I want to. 
Shalia tossed Lef Prax's gun and set her own for the lowest setting. It seems to absorb the energy from my pistol, and it would probably do the same thing to plasma. What? Plasma? Shalia gestured at Prax's gun. It's a plasma pistol. Oh, I knew that. They looked down the hall, but there was no movement. Yet. Thank God no one's left the board. Celia wasn't listening. She was desperately trying to think of something to do. You remember when I shot the ceiling? It seems like it could be harmed with physical objects. Physical objects, you say? Like, for example, a piece of supersonic metal? The lumbering form of the Prax thing could now be seen down the hall. Celia sighed. Too late to get your gun now, Lef. He smacked himself in the head. Ooh, I've got it! A plan! Serlia, it'll probably go after me only, right? Okay, I'll lead it into that cargo bay, then I want you to seal the bulkhead and start venting the atmosphere slowly. The pressure will drag it out of Prax, and at the same time, you go to my cabin and grab the rifle. When it's out, I'll give the signal, and you stop the atmosphere drain and repressurize the room, come in, shoot the thing, and we'll be done with it. Prax was now halfway towards them. How do you know the pressure will work? Lef tapped his head. I have no idea. Serlia didn't know if he meant he didn't know how he knew, or if he meant he didn't know if the plan would work at all, but she didn't have time to ask him, as he ran down the hall and waved his arms. Over here! He fired a shot at Prax's body, but the aura around it absorbed the shot, and it fizzled out. Serlia slammed her fist on the wall and dashed up to the engineering station. Does he have a death wish or something? Left stuck out his tongue at the Prax thing and darted into the cargo bay before a tendril of darkness could impale him. He dashed behind a crate and held his breath. Celia finished preparations and glanced down the hall, seeing the Prax thing enter the bay. She slammed her paw on the button and the bulkhead shut tight. Lef heard it shut and he hoped Prax couldn't sense him. The Prax thing stood for a moment as if considering the shut door behind it. It didn't for long, and reached an arm out, shooting another tendril, blasting the nearest crate to smithereens. Right after, Lef could hear the hiss of air escaping into space, the temperature dropping, the pressure in his eyes beginning to hurt. He stumbled to his feet and cast his weakening gaze towards Prax. Lef didn't try to speak, despite wanting to taunt Prax, as he desperately held his breath against the rapidly dropping pressure. Prax was doing no better. He was grasping at his chest, watching Lef with bulging eyes. The entity inside Prax didn't seem to know what to do in this situation, but soon he passed out. But then an inky black thing pooled around Prax's head. Lef opened his mouth, and as the air rushed out of his lungs, he used it to yell so loud his vocal cords burned. No! The pressure in the bay wasn't so low it would cause permanent damage, but Lef collapsed and clutched his neck in pain. Serlia, grasping the gun in her paws, opened the bulkhead and braced herself as the air rushed back into the bay quickly. She shook her head as the pressure normalized, shouldering the rifle and stepping inside. Lef, are you alright? Lef gasped for air and looked up at Serlia, the entity nowhere to be seen. <gasps> Where is it? Serlia glanced around. All she could see was Prax's unconscious body. He was still breathing. I... I don't- ah! From nowhere, a tendril whipped out and smacked Serlia across the chest, sending her flying back into the hall, slamming against the wall with an oof. Lef stumbled to his feet and lunged forward. No, Serlia! Lef stumbled to his feet and lunged forward. The thing snaked from under Prax, where it was hiding, and came towards Lef, forming into a roughly shaped ball. Lef grabbed a splinter from the ground and swung it around, pathetically. Don't! Come any closer. He swung at a tendril that was extending towards him, batting it away. Three more took its place, grabbing Lef's arms and pinning him to the floor. Hey, get off! It lifted itself up and plucked itself right onto his head. Don't you dare... The feeling was not unlike burning by acid or thousands of tiny bug bites, but whatever it was, it hurt like hell. Lef struggled the best he could, his nerves on fire, but he slowly lost strength. Just as he was about to lose consciousness, a shadow fell over him. Take this, you manipulative parasitic bastard! With a mighty swing, similar to how a golfer would swing, Prax dealt the entity a blow, using the rifle as a club. It flew a few feet and plopped onto the ground. Shoot it! Prax was an excellent shot, and he was able to hit dead center. However, he was unprepared for the recoil from the archaic firearm, and it almost knocked him over. 
The bullet seemed to do something to the entity, ripping a hole in its center and splattering inky substance on the back wall. It screamed and writhed in pain. It didn't die, however, and slithered towards them again. Laff and Prax backed for the door, Laff slapping Prax on the arm. Shoot it again! It's semi-auto! Keep shooting! This thing really hurts to shoot, you know. He fired again, this time missing completely. Ah! How did they fight wars with this thing? They made it out of the bay, the entity having lost its speed from its injury. Very well, apparently. Prax fired again, this time grazing the edge of the thing, sending it spinning. Suddenly the bulkhead slammed shut again. Leff looked around and saw Sorlia in the cockpit, once again venting the air from the bay, this time at a much faster rate. She clutched her chest and gasped as she spoke. There. It'll make a nice new ring for this planet. Leff and Prax ran to her side. Are you all right? No, you idiot! My my left rib is broken! Prax took her side and supported her before she could collapse. Let's get you back to my ship. They'll have you good as new in no time. Laff took her other side, and they wobbled, bruised and broken, towards Prax's shuttle. Hours later, after receiving the news, Lena, Zack, and Fellow docked their crammed fighter pod with Prax's ship. Lena nervously let go of the stick as the autopilot took over. Do you have any idea what happened? It sounded serious. Zack shrugged. I don't know. Probably an accident. The light above the hatch turned to blue when the airlock opened. A short fox woman stepped forward and ushered them inside. Hello. The captain told me to escort you to the sick bay. Right this way, please. Lena matched her pace as they walked down the corridors of Prax's ship. What happened? The woman looked uncomfortable for a brief moment. Well, I don't know. The captain wouldn't tell us even after he defied orders and changed course. They entered sick bay and crossed the room to three beds. Serlia was in a torso cast, Leff had an oxygen mask on, and Prax looked like he had the galaxy's largest hangover. Lena ran up to Leff and grabbed the chart by his bed. Decompression? What happened? Leff frowned, indicating the mask over his muzzle. Oh. Feldo sat by Serlia and tapped her arm, waking her from her light sleep. What? Feldo? Hi. He laughed. Hi yourself. You had us worried for a while. What happened? Surlia hoped her sudden and inexplicable blush would be hidden by her fur. Well, I don't exactly know. Something really, really weird. Zack looked at the x-rays of Surlia's chest that were on the wall. Heh, <laughs> broken rib, huh? You know humans have way more than two ribs. Prax groaned. Guys, please keep it down. The doctor walked up to Laff and removed his mask. I think that's enough. Take a deep breath and tell me how it feels. Ooh, kind of nice. The doctor nodded. Good as new. You'll be out of here in a bit. Your friend will have to stay a while, though. Lena took Leff's paw. Tell me everything. Leff sighed and started the story from the beginning, attempting to describe each experience in detail, but ultimately failing to convey them properly. When he finished the story, the gathered audience sat still. Lena's ears were down slightly, and her voice was quiet. That's scary. Zack huffed. Huh, you don't say. Well, let's hope that something like this never happens again. Lef, do you think your entity is gone? Lef shook his head. No, not at all. It's still there, I'm sure. Her ears fell all the way, and Lef held onto her paw tighter. No, don't worry, Peach. It... it won't let me come to any harm. That I'm sure of. She nodded. I hope you're right. Fellow grinned at Sir Leah. Quick thinking there at the end. She smiled back. I just wanted to make sure it was dead. He chuckled and patted her paw. You'll be happy to know that I had a nice visit with Grant and Nan, or Magenta's parents. It went well at first. Sir Leah lay back as Feldo told his story, admittedly less exciting than what she had just gone through. She briefly wondered what things would be like if circumstances were different. Maybe a vacation on Koron 4 wasn't such a good idea. A week later, Grant was sitting on his porch sipping tea and watching the sky. He heard someone approaching and opened one eye. A tall figure stepped up, his face masked by the glare from the sun. Has a ship called the Frontier been here? Grant was a little suspicious. Who's asking? A friend. Grant sighed and shrugged. <sighs> I don't know. The figure left so silently Grant didn't notice he was gone until he looked up again. A fine dust was all that was left of the entity as it floated in orbit, frozen by the intense cold. 
Slowly, despite being solid, the bits floated together and formed a frozen ball of ice. It shrank slowly, reducing in size until it winked out of existence altogether. Frontier by Maggot Moshpit Chapter 27 The mornings were never kind to Grace. When breakfast was served, the guards would rattle their nightsticks along the bars of her cell, jarring her from her sleep very uncomfortably. As the only atrium in the entire prison, she was often the victim of daily harassments from other inmates and even the guards. This morning was no exception, quite to the contrary. Wake up, pussycat! Time for food! A large woman in a smart-looking prison guard uniform banged on Grace's cell door. Grace stumbled to her feet and banged back. I'm awake! She said, in Atrian. The prison guard frowned. Now, now, what do we tell you about speaking Atrian here? Personally, I don't care. But the other prisoners do. English! Grace rolled her eyes, making sure the guard couldn't see her through the small window as she did. All right, now let me out. The guard snickered and pressed a button by the door with her keycard, walking down the catwalk to the next cell, Grace's door opening with a buzz. Grace threw on some clothes and stepped out of her cell. The prison was very old, one of the first penal colonies to ever be constructed by the Solar Federation. There were eight different facilities on the planet, three for women and five for men. Although the interiors of the prisons themselves were relatively low-tech, with metal doors instead of force fields, there was always two Solar Federation cutter-class ships in orbit, and a security field around each facility. She looked down from the catwalk at the assembly of women eating the admittedly decent-tasting prison food, though none of the other prisoners would agree with her on that point. Grace descended the ladder nimbly, her natural cat-like agility coming from the fact that she was just that, a cat. A snow leopard, to be exact. She took a seat next to two of her only friends, a very loose definition of the word. There was a massive woman with tattoos all over her right arm, no hair and a grin on her face, and the other silent and muscular, but looked almost normal despite her prison clothes. Hey, pussycat, the slop has been served, and yours is getting warm. Grace sat down, and her food rose from a small hatch in the table. She grabbed it and placed it in front of her. The food delivery system was supposed to ensure everyone got an equal share of food, but once it was out of the hatch, it was fair game for anyone. Big Jess, how many death threats this time? Jess nudged her roughly. Three. All of them empty. Grace shoveled her food into her mouth. Most of her fellow prisoners hated Atrians, for one reason or another, but none of them dared to tangle with Grace because of her background as a military commander. She served throughout most of the war, earned a plethora of medals, and in the last month of the conflict was taken prisoner by the Solar Federation. All POWs were supposed to be released. But for some reason or another, she was taken to the cage, as it was referred to, and in the cage she stayed. The other woman finally spoke up. Has your dad rescued you yet? Grace punched her in the arm, wishing they hadn't removed her claws. Shut up, Sarah. He's probably in prison himself by now. Big Jess nabbed a roll of bread from Grace's tray. If he does show, you better spring us too. Grace ignored the comment, as she had already given up on being freed from her unjust imprisonment. Left sat down in the cockpit, waking himself up for another day of flying in a straight line. Zack was there, whistling an Earth Pop song and sipping his morning coffee. Lena walked briskly into the room, kissed Lef on the cheek, and sat down in the pilot seat, checking their course and speed. Hey, Lef, guess what? What? She beamed at him. I turned 20 the other day. (laughs) Now just age another four years and you'll be as old as me. Zack clapped his hands. We should have a party. They both looked at him blankly until Lena clapped her paws in realization. Oh, that's right. Humans celebrate the day of their birth. Zack nodded. Yeah, I used to have them when I was a kid, but my parents stopped after we moved to the moon. Left tilted his head, still confused. Yeah, that always bothered me. Why would you celebrate an occasion you couldn't possibly remember? Zack shrugged. Eh, I don't know, but you get presents. Lena looked at Lef with a grin. I like the sound of that. Serlia's station beeped, and Lef walked over to check it out. It's going to have to wait, Peach. Looks like we're being hailed. He answered. This is the cargo vessel of the Frontier. How can we help you? Yeah, hello. Sorry to bother you, but our singularity generator's down. Cut out in flight, and we can't get to a station on a photon power. Could you give us a hand? Lef frowned at the strange contents of the sentence. Photon power? Singularity Generator, it was probably a human vessel. 
Of course. Give us your coordinates. They came over in text, so Lef didn't have to memorize them. Then the line cut. Zack, get Feldo and Serlia. Lena, take us to those coordinates. Done. ETA, half an hour. Lef nodded as Zack walked out. Then he stood and leaned against Lena's console. So, have you thought about what you want to do after you get to Eden? We're less than a month away. She turned her chair so she was facing him. Well, I've been taking online classes, as you know, and it looks like I'll get a proficiency from that in a couple of years. Physics, maybe. Until then, I want to stay here, with you. Left blushed despite himself. I'd like that. Zack burst in, breaking the moment. He was dragging a half-asleep Serlia and an annoyed Feldo behind him. Serlia slumped in her chair and yawned. Are we answering another distress call? <sighs> this won't end well, mark my words. Feldo slumped at his station as well, low on energy like Serlia was. It's nice to help people in need. If it turns out to be pirates, I'll give you a cookie. Serlia chuckled at his response. <laughs> well, you'd better pay up. A few minutes later, the Frontier dropped out of hyperspace nearby a fairly large cargo ship. It was a newer model than the Frontier, despite the fact that it was the one experiencing problems. Serlia hailed them and switched the channel over to Left's screen. Hello. Any new developments? The screen flickered slightly, and the face of a man appeared. He was unshaven and sweaty, and looked like he really, really needed a bath. I'm glad you're finally here. We just narrowly avoided a singularity breach. We could really use some extra help. Hurry! Left stood. All right, be right there. Serlia, you, Zack, and Feldo go aboard. Help them the best you can, and if we have to tow them, we will. Serlia nodded and led the two out the door. Lena looked at him worriedly. If they have a singularity breach and we're nearby, we'll get sucked into the implosion. Left sat back down and folded his paws in front of him. I know, Peach. I know. Serlia, Feldo, and Zack piled into a shuttle and flew the short distance to the other ship. Upon arriving, they were greeted by a very unkempt man wearing nothing but overalls. Despite his appearance and the situation they were in, the ship didn't seem too hectic or smoky. Zack stepped forward. How can we help you? The man wiped his brow, though the temperature wasn't very high in this part of the ship. Come on down to engineering, I'll show you. They walked and listened to a long-winded explanation of what was wrong. Serlia couldn't understand a single thing the man said, but Feldo and Zack nodded solemnly. This sounds bad. Nothing we can't handle. The man clapped his hands. Great! However, it became abundantly clear exactly what the problem was as soon as they entered the engine room. Left was sitting, quietly reading the scans of the other ship. A faint tickle in the back of his mind made him stop and shake his head. Weird. Lena looked up. What is it? He pulled up a previous window of information from the scan and reread it. I just... Wait, did they say they had a photon sublight engine? Lena nodded. Something was forming in Left's head. And what kind of faster-than-light drive do they have? Lena tilted her head and thought. Well, where our ship creates a subspace bubble, then decreases the mass of the ship to go faster than light, they use some kind of wormhole generator to shorten the distance between A and B. And they need to create a singularity to do it? Lena smiled, going full physics nerd mode. Technically, it isn't really a singularity. It's pretty darn dense. A dirty singularity. Similar to how our ships don't actually acquire a mass of zero. Laugh could feel something at play here other than his own brain, and he was glad he wasn't passing out. So, if their faster than light drive was to go down, what would happen? The wormhole would collapse, and they would drop out at somewhere in between. That's what happened here. Lef started another scan. What radiation would such an event produce? Lena gave the question some thought. Um, I guess a lot of it. None that would harm us. The area where the wormhole collapsed would continue to release radiation that was inside at the time. Why? What's all this about? Lef stood abruptly. The scans show no radiation whatsoever. None from the wormhole, none from the photon engines. Lena shrugged, but gulped nervously. Well, who knows how long they've been out here? Could they have been a while? Left hurried over to Serlia's console. And they happened to have a close call like that right when we were en route? Something's fishy about this situation. He hailed the ship. This is Lef, Captain of the Frontier. I'd like to speak with my people. There was no response. That isn't a good sign. Left routed the comm to the weapons station, continuing the hail. Peach, things might get hot. Keep calm. Uh, all right. 
Left reopened the channel. Let me speak to my first officer now. There was still no response. Left gripped the weapons controls. Something told him something was very, very wrong on that ship. Please respond. Sirlia, Zack, and Feldo stepped into the perfectly operational engine room, facing down the barrels of eight guns pointed at them. The man who was escorting them had conveniently ushered them inside first, and he now held a pistol and pressed it against Sirlia's back. Sorry about this. We needed the money. He prodded her back and moved all three of them deeper into the engine room, the other eight keeping their weapons trained on them as they were pushed into a corner. I really don't want to do this. D don't worry, I was promised you wouldn't be hurt. Sirlia fixed him with a cold stare. Do you really think someone who says that is telling the truth? Someone hurried in and addressed the man in the overalls. Henry, the captain of the Frontier wants to speak with his first officer. I think he knows. You didn't answer, did you? No. <sighs> Good. Henry regarded the three prisoners briefly and walked out the door. Leff finally received a response. Hey, I've been calling for an hour. Henry appeared on the screen beside the weapon panel. I'm sorry, but we've taken you people hostage. Leff's eyes widened, then he growled. What? You... Give them back now! Henry chuckled at Leff's lame attempt. Uh, no. Make any move and we'll blow them out in airlock. Lena was covering her mouth in shock, but she shakily came over and stood next to Leff. Leff slammed his paw on the table. <sighs> well, you've got us by the balls then. What the hell do you want? Well, nothing. Just stay there and don't try to leave, and don't send any transmissions. You're being jammed anyway. That's it? What are we- Hey, he cut the line! Left slammed the keyboard again and stood, pacing the cockpit furiously. We have to do something! Lena stopped his pacing by grabbing both his arms. Wait! Didn't you hear him? If we do anything, they'll kill them! Left stood, drawing deep, angry breaths. It was frustrating situations like these he just couldn't stand. But we can't just... do nothing! They might be hurt! Lena spoke softly as to encourage Left to do the same. Calm down. Making a rash move will make things worse. And you were the one telling me to calm down. Left took a deep breath and unclenched his fists. Sorry. He slumped in his chair, at a loss for what to do. So, we just wait? Should we tell Rackham? I'll let him know. He'll kill you if we keep him in the dark. You just... don't act before thinking. She patted Leff on the shoulder, and he grabbed her paw. You're being awfully confident. Well, I'm actually barely keeping my composure. But what we have to do is clear. Leff nodded and let go of her paw. I wonder how Rackham will react. An entire day passed before something happened. Zack, Feldo, and Sir Leah were not mistreated, but Leff couldn't think of a single thing to do that wouldn't jeopardize the lives of his friends. That afternoon, he, Lena, and Rackham were sitting at the cockpit, waiting. Time passed agonizingly slow, until eventually the sensors picked up another ship. Leff watched it streak in from where they had just come from. He wanted to hail them, but their transmissions were being jammed. However, it seemed, this ship was what they were waiting for, as it slowly flew in and began to dock with the frontier. Puzzled, Leff stood. Lena, let's greet them. Who could it be? They walked down the hall towards the airlock. I don't know. I don't have any enemies. They walked into the room and heard the other ship lock onto the airlock. Left took Lena's paw. Be ready for anything, Peach. The figure that stepped out of the airlock certainly was not what Left was expecting. He was very thin-looking and wearing a sort of coat which ran down to his boots. His face was what Left could only describe as tired-looking, and he was wearing a large-brimmed hat that covered his eyes. Though from his fur color and tail, it was clear he was some sort of feline atrian. He carried an unreasonably long pistol, but he didn't raise it when he spoke to the pair. Hello, Mr. Quill. I'm here for something of mine. Leff raised an eyebrow. And just what is that? I'm here to take my ship back. Leff and Lena stood there for a shocked moment until Leff started laughing. <laughs> Your ship? I still have the receipt, you know. The man walked closer, his eyes becoming visible. Leff and Lena both noticed they were heterochromatic. One eye was gray, while the other was white, blind. Yes, but I was never one for the rules. Who do you think paid for all of this stuff? The fighters? The drive? The coffee machine? 
Leff was a little more than intimidated by this man, and Lena had taken up position behind Leff, grasping his paw very tightly. Uh, oh, so you owned this ship before me? He brushed by them, indicating they should follow him. I never meant to sell it. I got sloppy on the moon and had to go into hiding. A ship without ID numbers in a junkyard is less noticeable than a ship without ID numbers parked in a spaceport. I just never anticipated anyone would actually buy the piece of junk. So I must commend you for your taste in spacecraft, Mr. Quill. <laughs> yeah, but why would you want it back? It's still a piece of junk, even with our combined modifications. He whirled on them, and both suppressed whimpers. What? What have you done to her? J j just some safety retrofitting. He narrowed his eyes at Leff. I would have taken you for the kind of man to add guns. People do that too much without a care for the power drain in my half. And regardless, my reasons are partly sentimental and partly bred from necessity. I stored some things here. I need them back. Lena spoke up from behind, laugh. Th then will you leave? He regarded her, as if for the first time. You're awfully young to be the first officer. One of the colonists? The, the pilot, sir! He hmmed and stopped in front of the colonists' cargo bay living space. Hmm. Well, little Fennec, like I said, it's also partly sentimental value. He opened the panel beside the door and flipped down the manual override, shutting the bulkhead. What are you doing? He continued on to the cockpit. Where we're going, the colonists will just be added weight. I'm cutting them loose. Left grabbed his arm, but the man didn't react. Are you crazy? They only have enough air for an hour tops! Fool. Henry will dock with the module and supply it with air. I am not a murderer, Mr. Quill. However, I have your people, and I need your help more than I need to keep from becoming a murderer. I'm not helping you. The strange man chuckled dryly. <laughs> of course. The gun was out in a flash, the barrel barely a millimeter from Lena's eye. Don't help me then. Lena tried not to move, and Leff raised his paws. Okay, okay. Where are we going? The gun was away as quick as it appeared. The man was so light-footed, he practically floated over to the engineering station and removed a panel. He flipped a few switches, and they felt the colonist section get blown away from the ship. The man opened a channel. Henry, collect the colonists and bring me the rest of the crew. Keep those colonists safe, but don't open the bulkhead. If I don't come back within a week, leave them with a distress beacon. He didn't wait for an answer, though no one would have dared refuse him. He walked over to the captain's chair. Well, this is a nice addition, though I will be taking the helm. I used to fly this ship in the military. It was a troop transport designed to hold hundreds of soldiers. I was forced to fight with them more than once. Them and... <coughs> no matter. As soon as your people are here, we're setting course for Alpha Cedi Penal Colony. Why? What's there? That is none of your concern. All you need to do is help me with a jailbreak. A jailbreak? You're insane! How are we supposed to get past all the security? <laughs> I have the access codes. They're in the main computer. Lef walked up to the man and stared him down. This trip has taken us six months. In those six months, we've been fucked with by drug dealers, pirates, the government, cultists, aliens, bounty hunters, treasure hunters, my crazy ex-wife. I have lost my patience for you people, but you do have a gun to our heads, so I'll cooperate under duress. But you better know what you're doing, because if you hurt any one of the hairs on my crew's head, you'll see a man get mean. The man smiled slightly. I believe you. And don't worry, I have only one goal. And whether or not you believe me, it's for a good cause. Right. <laughs> now, let me send a message. You can call me Grey, though most humans I've met call me Angel Eyes. For some reason. Grace was sitting down for dinner after having to be separated from another prisoner who had tried to stab her with a shiv. She got off with a bruise from the guard stick, but the other prisoner had a broken nose and a black eye. She sipped her soup and noticed someone had dropped a paper cup next to her plate. It held a scrap of empty paper. She quickly gulped down her soup and ran to her cell, holding the paper to her bedside lamp. A message appeared and began to burn away under the light. Two days, red hair, it said, before dissolving completely. 
Frontier by Maggot Moshpit, Chapter 28 Grace quickly disposed of the scrap of paper, not wanting any wandering eyes to see her peering at it. She lay down in her bed and stretched, flicking her tail lazily. She smiled. It looked like she was going to be rescued after all. What are you smiling about? She jumped and opened her eyes as her cellmate walked in. None of your business, Sarah. And where's my tuna? She asked, changing the subject. Sarah didn't emote much, and she had an uncanny ability to read social cues, even in an atrium. Nah, you're hiding something. I can tell by the way your tail goes limp. She sat up and made a rude gesture at Sarah. Oh, go get laid. Sarah climbed to the top bunk, more to hide her expression than to get comfy. Grace had learned how to play the human game of social interaction, which was much more conflict-driven than atrian socialization. It also kept Sarah from questioning her further. I ain't no fag, you hear? Grace laughed. Right. I saw you eyeing that. What do you call her? Blondie? Yeah. Sarah grumbled and didn't say another word. Although Grace had formed some semblance of a friendship with a couple of her fellow prisoners, she knew they were criminals, and Grace wasn't. Grace was escaping alone, no matter what. Rackham pushed on the door one more time before slumping against it. Damn! D slapped his paw. Ten credits! Oh, heck, D! He dropped a tiny bill into her paw. And I told you it wouldn't work! Tilliko, Yar, and a small group of other colonists stood around the closed bulkhead, waiting for it to be opened. Yar kicked it. I bet Lef's playing a prank on us. Suddenly there was a bump and a loud scraping of metal. Tilika was so startled she jumped onto Yar's back and clung onto him in a forced piggyback. What was that? Rackham put his ear to the door, but there was no further sound. Whatever it is, it's not making itself seen. Serlia, Zack, and Feldo were ushered into the cockpit by three men. One of them was Henry. Sir, I bought them. Serlia made eye contact with Lef. What the hell is going on here? Serlia, we have to do as these people say. She glared at Gray. Who's Beanpole over there? He swept across the room silently and eyed the other three crew members. He took out his gun and held it, pointing it downwards. He looked at Zack, then at Serlia, then to Feldo, then back to Serlia. Hello. I recommend you do as your captain says. He pointed to Henry. Stay out of the way. If any one of them tries to move, stun them. Henry nodded. Of course, Angel Eyes. Please, we're friends. Call me Gray. Gray fixed them with his stare again as he explained the situation, telling them about the jailbreak. Sir Leah jabbed a claw at him defiantly. Why is this person in prison if they didn't do anything wrong? Gray raised an eyebrow. Hmm? I never said that. I deduced it. Why would this be for a good cause if your friend was a true criminal? He nodded. You are right. Very sharp, Miss Wesker. Yes, this person has committed no crime. Gray sat at the helm and engaged the drive. Mr. Mason, take the engineering station and begin configuring the drive to the specifications on the console. Mr. Wilde, I want you to memorize the lines here. He tossed him a pad. Zack read it. What? But we clearly aren't a human vessel. Memorize the lines and each possible outcome, please. As for you, observant one, I read you are an excellent shot with a pistol of yours. We'll need that. Red? Red where? Gray chuckled. Your resume. He stood up and walked to the door. I will be in my cabin. Alert me when we arrive. He left. Left followed him, and surprisingly no one stopped him. They just watched his back as he walked down the corridor. Leff was surprised at the speed at which Gray moved. He was already inside one of the cabins when Leff stepped out of the cockpit. After reaching the crew quarters, he checked his room, the largest. No one was there. Puzzled, he crossed the hall to Sir Leah's cabin, finding Gray standing there, reading a book. You used to own this ship, right? Why didn't you take the largest room? He read the book at the same time as he answered Leff. Two of my crew members were married. They needed the bigger bed. He turned the page. Leff caught a glimpse of the cover. It was Sir Leah's journal. As if somehow sensing Leff's realization of what Gray was reading, he chuckled. It's funny. One can relieve so much stress just by putting down one's feelings and experiences. From what I read in this, it seems you had a very interesting crew here, Mr. Quill. Leff snatched the journal and placed it in a drawer. Why do you keep calling us by our last names? And how do you know who Feldo is? He sat on a chair, his tail poking through the back. 
Shalia had always complained that the chair's tail opening wasn't big enough for her more bushy tail, but it fit Gray perfectly. We aren't friends yet. Why should I call you by your first name? And as for Mr. Mason, I had a lovely chat with his mother and father-in-law. No, don't worry, I didn't hurt them. Leff raised an eyebrow in puzzlement. Wait, Feldo's married? Not anymore. Gray put his feet up on the table and Leff eyed him suspiciously. Don't get too comfy. I'll be winding my ship back by the end of this thing. Yes, of course. I won't be needing it anyway. Besides... He gestured around the room. It seems you've gotten awful comfortable. Leff didn't really know what to think of this guy. He was casual, friendly even. Though he was clearly very dangerous and wouldn't hesitate to shoot any one of them, it was as though he regretted having to coerce them. Leff didn't know what he would have said had Gray come to him in peace and proposed the idea of this jailbreak. He probably would have said no, though Leff didn't have all the details. He sat down on another chair Sirlia had in her room. Leff decided to be bold. Why do you need us? Gray looked up, his blind eye showing little features, simply appearing to be a milky orb. What? I mean, us specifically. You need the ship, for the access codes, but you could have left us behind. Gray took his feet off the table and turned to face Leff. When I discovered who had my ship, I was intrigued. You and your crew have quite the track record. Exposing a cult and a major drug dealer, both of which led to many arrests of many guilty people. Quite frankly, you're perfect for the job. Then you should have asked us. Gray smiled. You would have said no. Leff frowned. Gray seemed to have plenty of information about him and his crewmates. How do you know so much about us, anyway? Did you read all our resumes? Actually, I did very little research. You're all quite easy to read. For instance, it would take a blind man to not notice how your chief engineer is jealous of Mr. Mason. Or you and that young pilot. Are you married or just mates? Leff kept his expression as neutral as he could. We're married. Gray wagged a claw at him. Now, now, what did your mother tell you about lying? Just testing you. Impressive, by the way. So, who are we getting out of jail? An innocent individual. Gray watched Leff's face and his reaction. Come on, you have us here against our will, helping you with a dangerous mission. You could at least tell us who it is. I will tell you one thing. They're an Atrian prisoner of war. Leff was surprised. He was expecting something more sinister. Atrian POWs weren't supposed to exist, though there had to be a reason that this person was still in prison. All right, I'll let everyone know. He stood and went to the door, stopping and turning around to speak, but Gray answered before he even spoke. No, I won't go through any more of Miss Wesker's belongings, don't worry. The next day, Grace kept her eyes open for any trouble. The last time she received a note from somebody, it had not gone unnoticed. This seemed to be the case now, as a group of women approached her, and they did not look friendly. She recognized the leader, Cheryl, notorious for getting what she wanted through violence and cunning in equal measure. Hey, pussycat. I heard you got something from the outside. Grace pushed past her. Get your ears checked. Cheryl grabbed Grace's tail as she passed, yanking it back savagely. Grace yelped in pain and shot around, her paws outstretched as though she still had claws. Cheryl and her entourage laughed and encircled Grace. <laughs> now, pussy cat, they took your claws away, remember? Give it to me. Grace growled. Cheryl had expected her to hiss because of her uncanny similar appearance to an Earth organism. However, all Atrians shared a very similar set of internal organs, with a few exceptions, and only growled to show aggression. I threw it away. Lynn, one of Cheryl's underlings, stepped up from behind and stepped on Grace's tail. She was about to laugh about it when she received a swift blow to the sternum, knocking her over. Cheryl cracked her knuckles and stepped forward. You're lying. I bet it was something good. Give it to me. Hey, break it up, ladies. A guard walked up, brandishing her nightstick. Cheryl turned around with a look of defiance on her face, but she smiled at the guard. Grace was just showing us a furry sport. Ain't that right? Grace knew better than to start something. Yeah. The guard eyed them suspiciously. Get back to yourself! The group dispersed, mumbling and grumbling, shooting dirty glances at Grace. The guard stopped her before she could return to her cell. 
You better have been telling the truth! Grace recognized the guard as one who was more sympathetic. I was. There's nothing to stab me over. The guard tapped her on the shoulder. Good. Don't want that to happen on my shift. Too much paperwork. Back to your cell! Gray stepped onto the cockpit, floated across the room, and sat in the pilot's seat. We're here. Feldo looked up from his work. What? But we haven't dropped out of- The ship dropped out of hyperspace, having reached its destination, a point far away from the prison planet, just on the outskirts of the system it was in. Feldo coughed. Creepy. Gray set the computer to hold their position, ensuring there was no celestial bodies nearby. Their sensor net begins a few hundred miles from here, Mr. Mason. Have you completed the modifications? He leaned on the console and sighed. Yes. Good. Not a moment to lose, then. Mr. Wilde, take the captain's seat. Mr. Mason, you will find magnesium flares in our shuttle. Please load them into the particle cannons and program the automatic attack pattern Delta-8. It's in the main computer. Mr. Quill, Miss Wesker, you will be coming with me on one of the fighters when the time is right. I explained the plan earlier. Do you all know your roles? They all nodded. Gray swept to the engineering station and flipped a switch. There was a loud grinding sound and a hiss from deep within the ship. There. Now we're disguised. He swept back to the pilot seat and set a course directly to the prison planet. Gray muttered something under his breath, which only he could hear. I'm coming, Grace. Cutter-class vessels were by every means formidable warships. The ship was small in stature, long and tapering to a point resembling a giant needle. From the rear, where the energy was stored, to the tip, where the energy, having gone through many, many amplification coils, was discharged with devastating effect. Once fired, these ships took twenty minutes to recharge, but nothing was suspected to survive one blast. Cutter-class ships were in danger of going obsolete, being completely useless against prototype plasma shields, much to the inventor's anguish as it didn't serve in any wars and was already becoming useless for ship-to-ship -ship operations. However, two of these ships were more than enough to guard an already heavily armed prison planet. The bridge of the command cutter, the Maggot, was very small and only had room for three crew. The commander, in charge of operations, both shipboard and stellar traffic duties, hated her job. It was boring. Nobody tried to escape, and the tedium of looking at cargo manifests and security codes over and over got on her nerves somewhat. She never got to fire the cutter, not even for target practice. She was sitting, reading an old book called To Kill a Mockingbird, when the sensor operator perked up. Commander Paula, unscheduled cargo ship incoming. A slight smile played across her lips. Perhaps her day was about to become interesting. Hail them! The ceiling of the bridge lit up, and a nervous-looking human appeared on it. Hi, I'm Captain Halen of the cargo ship Leap of Faith. I, uh, know this might be unexpected, but the warden ordered an express shipment of hot sauce, and he's waiting. The man looked vaguely like someone she had seen in a movie once. Well, Captain Halen, you are not on the arrivals list, so you're going to have to turn around and leave. Captain Halen shifted uncomfortably. Um, check the whitelist. You'll see us on there. The commander muted the line and turned to the operations officer to her right. Check it. After a moment, he turned around and nodded. Yep, they're whitelisted. She reopened the channel. Well then, transmit your security code and we'll let you through. Halen nodded to someone off screen, and the code was entered directly into the cutter's computer system. The ops officer watched his screen, then turned around. It's an older code, sir, but it checks out. Commander Paula smiled to the captain, but internally fumed. Turned out it was just the warden's strange hot sauce addiction getting her hopes up. All right, dock with Cargo Station 2. They will handle everything. Halen looked relieved, and he nodded, then cut the line. The commander was still skeptical, however. Keep an eye on that ship, and scan it thoroughly. Aye. Five minutes later, the sensor analysis was complete, and the cargo ship was halfway through the system, still at a visual range. There's something strange about this power signature. It looks like a regular Solar Federation standard issue cargo ship, but it's got much more mass than it should. The commander stood up and studied the readout. What do you mean? It's twice as heavy than the power signature would have us believe, see? It was true. Although the ship appeared, to the sensors, to be a Solar Federation cargo ship, it was moving much slower and was much larger and heavier. Where are they now? They're passing the sensor station, sir. 
She sat down and folded her hands. Set a course. Maximum sublight speed. Contact the Finch. Order them to follow. The two cutters flew swiftly towards the sensor station, which the Leap of Faith was lumbering past. As soon as the maggot was within visual range, Commander Paula ordered the forward cameras on. Let's see them with our own eyes. The ship on screen was definitely not a Solar Federation vessel. What the hell is that? General Quarters! Check the ship registry. Get me a match on that model. The operation officer's hands flew over his console, activating combat alert and running a search on the ship. Sir, it's an Atrian cargo vessel, decommissioned ten years ago, H model. I ran the numbers. It's the Frontier, not the Leap of Faith. Hail them! Halen appeared on the screen again, sweat pouring down his face. Uh, 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 hi. We saw through your little disguise. Now, deactivate your engines and state your purpose here. Halen looked up and to the left, searching his brain. Well, we didn't want to start anything, so, so we pretended to be a human ship. I don't know what you might do if we found out we were in a furry vessel. Paula narrowed her eyes at him. Is that so? Then you wouldn't say no to a search. Oh my god! Commander, get your ship! The line fizzled, then died. Nobody had time to react before the Atrian ship exploded in a bright flash. The entire ship was engulfed in light, almost blinding the bridge crew. What the hell? Someone report! The ship was rocked as white-hot bits of metal hit the hull. Sir, the sensors are going crazy. That blast is too much for them. The light eventually died down after a few minutes, and the camera showed the frontier totally intact. Okay. Someone tell me what's going on. I don't understand. Wait, sir. There's about 300 inert magnesium flares floating around the area. Sir... They're hailing us. On screen! Halen looked distraught, and the commander could see what she assumed to be the crew members running around in the background. Ugh. I'm sorry, Commander. We've just had a very serious weapons malfunction. The computers just fired off all our flares and shut down our weapons. Are you damaged? She was taken aback. Uh, no we aren't. You and I are going to have a little chat. Prepare to be boarded! I'm sorry, we... we can't. The computer also locked the ship down. All of the bulkheads are stuck closed. The commander turned to her ops officer. Verify it. The officer initiated a wireless uplink to the Frontier's computer, and after a minute, he shrugged. Verified. Their computer has control of most systems. Looks like it's corrupt. Paula looked back up at the nervous captain. How long until you get computer control back? Halen looked to his left, and someone told him something Paula couldn't make out. Uh, another hour or two. Depends on how bad this is. We'll stay here for now. Tell the warden his hot sauce we'll have to wait. The commander nodded, then cut the line. She turned to Ops. I'm not convinced there isn't something going on here. Study the sensor logs from when they fired the flares. And check with the warden about the shipment. Also, contact the Intergovernmental Info Exchange Office and ask them for all files on the frontier. Aye. Lef, Gray, and Sirlia were all crammed into one of the fighters, already entering the atmosphere of the planet. See? They didn't see us. The sensor station and both cutters were the only detection equipment in orbit, and they were disabled by our flares. <sighs> yeah, alright, it worked. But as soon as we approach the prison, we'll be seen. Gray took them close to the ground. We aren't going to approach it from an expected angle. See that gorge over there? Sirlia craned her neck out the window and saw a narrow scar in the earth running into the horizon. Right now we're too far away to be detected, but anything in the air or on the ground would be at a range of about one kilometer. And there is one weakness, however. He pointed to the gorge. We won't be detected if we fly directly to the prison through that. If Lef, at that moment, had been drinking milk, it would have come at his nose. What? I couldn't even fly through that without obliterating us all against the wall! Gray chuckled and dipped the craft into the gorge which for now was relatively straight. I have seen your skill, and your young pilot's skill. Not to brag, but I have been flying since before you were born, and have skills that far surpass both of you combined. A giant stack of rocks rose from nowhere, and Gray expertly maneuvered around it, tipping the fighter 90 degrees while he did. 
Leff and Serlia clung to each other as he continued to defy death, swerving through tight rock formations and scraping the canyon floor to avoid natural bridges. Serlia, if we survive this, I'll never say anything to annoy you again. And I'll never go through your browser history again. Wait, what? Nothing! Look out! A huge boulder was blocking their path through a particularly tight space. Gray just coolly activated the plasma cannons and blasted it to bits, showering the fighter with debris. You'll get us all killed! Gray chuckled as he avoided a wall protrusion. <laughs> we're almost there. Hang on. They turned the next corner and were faced with the end of the canyon, the prison not far away. Gray set them down gently, but Leff and Serlia didn't let go of each other. Are... we safe? Yes, now. There isn't a moment to lose. He opened the door and pushed them through. The planet was hot, dusty, and dry. And as Leff looked around, he found it eerily still and quiet. Gray was already walking towards the cliff face, pointing to an old, frayed rope. Well, it looks like I didn't waste my money after all. Looks like the rope's here. He didn't climb it, however, instead crouching down. Leff and Serlia walked over to see what he was doing, and found him fiddling with a small device. Leff peered at it. What's that? He pressed a button on the side of the device and stood. It will cause all the security cameras to display a ten-second loop. Now we can get inside with a little sneaking. He grabbed the rope. And a little climbing. Frontier, Chapter 29 Zack relaxed in his chair, done acting for now. Oh, I wasn't sure they weren't going to blast us out of the sky. Lena flashed him a thumbs up. You did great. It was very convincing. Fellow poked his head from behind the engineering station. Can I come out now? Yes, but get ready. They may hail us again. He stepped from behind the console and sat down on the floor. Did the fighter make it through? Lena quickly scanned the area from Serlia's console. There's no sign of it, so it must have. She concentrated on the console, and Fellow noticed she was trembling slightly. He stood and walked over, touching her shoulder. She was extremely tense. Lena glanced up at him, annoyed. What? Uh, something wrong? She frowned. Of course something's wrong! The love of my life and his best friend are attempting a jailbreak alone with a psychopath! Feldo stepped back a few paces. Alright. I'm sure they'll be fine. Lena turned her head, but after a minute she looked back at Feldo. I'm sorry. I snapped. I understand. In fact, I've been in your position before, and I acted the exact same way. Zack put on his biggest smile and clapped Lena on the back. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I've known Left for longer than you, but I'm sure that you already know he's one tough motherfucker. Lena loosened up a little, but her anxiety remained. I hope you're right. Grace looked around. It was the second day since she got the note, and she was watching carefully for the signal. There. A guard was just being relieved by another guard, who had red hair. She was guarding the hall which held the kitchens, the break room, and a few storerooms. Sometimes, prisoners would break in and steal food or kitchen utensils, so it had to be guarded. She quickly darted down the catwalk to where Jess was leaning. Jess, I need you to do me a favor. Yeah? What's in it for me? You can have my tuna and all my cigarettes if you distract the kitchen guard. I need something from there. Jess smiled. Really? All your tuna? You got it. One prison riot coming up. She vaulted over the rail and landed on the floor, grabbing the nearest person. Hey! I saw you looking at me funny. The unfortunate woman looked up at Jess in bewilderment. What? What the hell are you saying? Jess shook her. Did you just cuss at me? The argument escalated and soon a crowd had formed and a few people were pushing each other. Grace leaned against the wall near the door, and the guard eventually ran over to break up the fight once the first punch was thrown. Grace took her opportunity and slipped through the unlocked door, staying low and watching every detail of the hall. Her military background had trained her to notice everything in her surroundings. She could see a door at the end of the hall. It was the guard's break room, conveniently right beside the kitchen. She stalked down the corridor, putting her ear up against the doors, hearing only some movement and muffled conversations. She knew she was in the right place. If she wasn't, the cameras would have picked her up. Gray must have done something to them, though that wasn't surprising. She whirled around when she heard a sound. One of the ceiling vents was moving. A brown, white-striped footpaw shoved the vents great down with a clang. Left dropped down and glanced around wildly, his back to Grace. Coast is clear, guys. Grace cleared her throat. Ahem. <laughs> right here? 
Leff almost fell back. Ah, ghost! Celia dropped down and drew her pistol on Grace. Who are you? Wait, you're Atrian. Gray appeared next to the two gracefully, but he lost all his composure when he laid eyes on Grace. There you are, Grace. Grace ran to him. Oh, Dad, I miss you! She hugged him so hard his hat flew off. Left nudged Cerlia as Grace and Gray hugged in the middle of the hallway. Reminds you of history class, doesn't it? What do you mean? The, uh, story about Martin and his daughter. Everyone knows that one. Cerlia glanced behind her, relieved none of the doors had windows. Guys, this is not the place or the time. Gray shook his head and let go of Grace, quickly wiping away a tear. Of course. Back into the- The break room door flew open with a bang, and a guard stepped out, yawning. She froze when she saw the four standing there, bent open. She pulled out her gun, hastily. Escape! Prisoner escape! The guard was so startled by their appearance, she didn't check to see what setting her gun was in before firing at Grace, unknowingly firing a fully charged plasma blast directly at her chest. It would have bored a hole all the way through, but Gray's unnatural speed came into play. He dove in front of her, the blast catching his abdomen and spinning him around. The searing heat aided his body, and he screamed in pain. Celia pushed Grace aside and stunned the guard, her body dropping to the floor, twitching. Grace dragged Gray's moaning body to a small alcove in the wall, and was joined by Leff and Celia as more guards began coming out of the break room, weapons wisely set to stun. Father, we have to go. Get up! Celia fired blindly at the door, keeping the guards at bay. Gray groaned and felt his wound. It's bad. I... <sighs> Fire lit up in Grace's eyes, and she pulled the long pistol from Gray's coat. We're getting you out of here. She rooted around in his coat some more, pulling out a grenade. Close your eyes. She tossed it, and it rolled to a stop beside one of the guards. The guard looked down at it as it let out a blinding flash of light and an ear-bursting whine. Grace used the stun grenade's blast for cover and ran out to the main room, where the fight was dying down as the stun grenade drew the attention of the combatants. She ran up and fired into the air, the high-energy beam cutting a swath in the ceiling. Freedom! She ran back to the kitchen door as the first cries of triumph could be heard. At this point, there were at least ten riot officers breaking up the fight but they were trampled under the surge of hope from the prisoners. Soon the hall was flooded, and the guards were caught, ironically, totally off guard. The prisoners stormed, without any thought to wear, down the hall. Cerlia was already in the vent, helping Leff up as well. One of the prisoners grabbed his leg and pulled. Hey! Let me in there! Grace kicked her out of the way and brandished the gun at the other prisoners, who were gathering around. One at a time! Jess walked up, a smile on her face. I knew you, pull true. Jess! No need to thank me. Oh, need help? She saw Leff trying to grab onto Gray and lumbered over, grabbing Gray and tossing him into the vent. Grace clambered in after him and Jess tried to follow, but the vent was too small for her girth. Hey, help me! The other prisoners started yelling. Get your fat ass out of there! You're blocking our only escape! Ah! There was a poof sound, and soon the five in the vent could smell tear gas. All right, time to leave. Grace pulled Gray behind her, ignoring the trail of blood. Hey! Jess yelled at them, waving her arms. Help me! Don't leave me here! Grace was about to turn a corner when she looked back. Sorry. She rounded the corner, and Jess went limp, eyes puffy from the gas. Oh, well. I was gonna murder me and those pretty boys anyway. The ops officer on board the maggot shook his head in confusion. Sir, I have a report. Paula shot up and looked over the ops officer's shoulder, only to see a blank screen. What? I don't see anything. I contacted the info exchange like you ordered, but you refused to give us any info. What? But we have their ship in custody. According to law, they have to. They were adamant, sir. She sighed and waved her hand. Never mind that, then. What about the scans? He brought up a series of fuzzy images. These are the best visual readouts. All of the sensor data got eaten up by the flares and never got back. These images reveal something, though. He pointed. A shape could be seen between two flares. It didn't look like much, just a blob, and it was vaguely triangular in shape. What is it? I don't know. It could be the Frontier, or any other ship. Hmm... And the warden? He's not gotten back to me. She nodded. 
Keep me posted. I'm going to look over the sensor data from before and after the weapons malfunction. Sirens blared as the four tumbled out of the vent onto the ground. Grace supported Gray and helped him towards the rope, where Celia was waiting impatiently. Stop. Put me down. She shushed him and stroked his head comfortingly. Be quiet, Father. Just a little more, and we'll be safe. Put me down. Now! The urgency in his voice compelled her to obey, lying him down on the rocks. Leff took the opportunity to check Gray's injuries. Oh, Grace, I'm sorry. He's heart shot. Leff could feel the weak beating through his side, and it was getting threadier and weaker. Gray coughed and held up a paw. Listen, get away from here now! <laughs> I'm done. Can climb down there if I wanted to. Go. Live! Grace's tears splashed onto Gray's face, soaking his fur. No! I can't leave you! Not after I waited so long! Leff pulled her shoulder, but she smacked him away. They have ships out already. We have to go now if we're going to make it. Gray's eyes clouded over, and he reached out to touch Grace's cheek. He never did. Grace shook his body. No! Oh, come on! Leff pulled Grace off Gray's body, and she struggled feebly. He's gone. Don't waste his efforts by staying here. She stopped struggling and gazed at Gray's corpse. She looked at the gun in her paw and gripped it tightly. She stood and climbed down the rope swiftly without looking back. Sir Lea was already at the bottom, and as Leff swung himself over the precipice, he took one last look at Gray. You were wrong. I would have said yes. He descended as fast as he could, heading for the fighter. Zack jumped as the comm beeped. Feldo dove for cover so he wouldn't be seen, and Zack straightened his hair, answering the call. Hello, Commander. Leff! Leff was on screen, his face creased in concentration. Zack, we're coming back up. Ready more flares? Ah! The ship rocked as something hit the fighter. We're under fire too, and Gray didn't make it. There was another shock to the fighter, and the line caught on its own. Zack sat upright with purpose. As the highest ranking officer, he was captain. All right. Feldo, disengage the computer program. Ready weapons. Wait for my mark. Lena, set a course out of this system. Maximum light speed. She looked at him like he was crazy. What? Inside a system? We'll be flattened into a pancake if we run into anything, and this system has hundreds of hunks of rock in it! I know, pilot. We have no choice. Plot the safest course you can. Along the Z-axis would be best. I... Faldo looked up from the first officer's position. Guys, they're in sense range of the commander's ship. Flares! Commander Paula had just gotten off the line with the warden. A ship with escaped prisoners was heading up from the planet, and fast. Turn around and engage. Don't let them escape! Yes. Suddenly, the screen once again went completely white. This time, the flares were fired directly into the two ships, which didn't have any shields. The navigational computer went crazy, mistaking the flares for stars and trying to get a celestial fix on them. The ships careened out of control until the engines were shut down. Damn! Halen must be behind this whole thing. Someone find a way to cut through this interference! Aye, sir. Left swerved and dodged as three surface-based ships pursued him doggedly. Hold on, guys. He pulled up on the stick abruptly, pulling them into a half loop. He leveled out and fired a few shots from his plasma cannons across the bow of the lead ship. It swerved to avoid them, but took a few shots into its shields. Left spiraled around and accelerated, leaving the less maneuverable ship to try and catch up. Celia pounded on his back as she clutched her stomach. Stop. My stomach. Just fly straight, damn it. The frontier could be seen not too far off, firing flares one after another into the other two ships, which were now firing blindly with their more light energy weapons. Left tried to hail them again, but the comm system was shot. Looks like we'll make it. There was another crash, and a plume of steam began gushing from the floor of the fighter. Grace's first instinct was to plug it with her foot, but she pulled it back as the steam almost cooked her foot. Ow! Celia threw her coat over the steam plume, and Grace held it down with Gray's gun. I think they've caught up to us. Left pulled hard to the right, avoiding a missile that would have destroyed them in one shot. I know that, Sir Leah. Sir Leah snapped her fingers. Oh, I'm an idiot! She pulled out her SCOM and called Zack. He answered. Hello? Zack, aim a few of those flares our way. Give them a few more things to lock onto. All right, but they might get a lock on us. Just hurry. The flares began streaking past the fighter and flying into the three pursuing ships. One tried to fire again, but the weapons locked onto one of the flares, and the shot ended up destroying a nearby asteroid. 
Sir, there are less flares. I have a partial lock on the frontier. Hail them. Zack's face appeared on screen. Hey, what's up? Enough of this! We have locked on with our cutter beam. Cease fire and surrender, or we will reduce your ship to a collection of atoms whose half-lives won't last as long as a blink. That's a rather long threat. All right, you win. He cut the line and stopped firing. Paula caught a flash of movement. A shuttle had just docked with them. Before she could react, her ops officer yelled, They're readying a jump. Fire! Aim to obliterate their engine. Don't kill them. There was a brief hum, the power drain causing all the lights in the ship to dim. A loud sound that could only be described as a pshow deafened the crew. The cutter glowed, then a beam so pure in energy and brilliant in luminescence that all surrounding darkness seemed to be vanished shot forth. However, the beam didn't hit anything. The frontier was already gone by the time the beam cut through space, continuing through the system until it hit a gas giant to no effect. Pursuit course. Order the finch along with us. Sir, orders from the warden. We are to stand down and not pursue. She whirled around. What? Speak to him yourself. The ops officer said, gesturing to the incoming hail on the console. She sat down and answered it. There had better be a good reason for this, Warden. The old withered Warden grimaced at her. I don't like this any more than you do. I just got word from General Jared of the Solar Federation that, uh, there was no prisoner on that ship. What? How the hell would he know? The Warden sighed. <sighs> if there was a prisoner on that ship... It would have been prisoner 18895. Understand? She shuffled uncomfortably. Yes, there was no prisoner on that ship. Just a failed escape attempt we can ignore. He nodded. Good. The line was cut, and the commander sat back in her chair. After a minute, she got bored again and pulled out her favorite book. Left dashed into the cockpit and almost tripped over his own foot. Quick! Status! Faldo looked back casually. Oh, chill, Lef. They aren't following us. Grace walked into the cockpit with Sir Leah, her face an anguished grimace. They won't look for me. I'm a secret they'll deny until the Solar Federation is dust. Lef nodded, the realization dawning on him. Oh, of course! Since you're a pow, they won't risk trying to bring you back. Lena walked over to Lef, trying to hide her relief. She couldn't for long and hugged him tightly. You tough motherfucker! <laughs> Whoa! Peach, I think that's the first time you've ever cussed. I'm so proud of you. He patted her ears down. Surlia rolled her eyes, and Zack suppressed a laugh. You're a terrible influence, Luff. Zack stood from the captain's chair and gestured to Luff. You're back in command, sir. Luff swatted him as he sat down, Lena returning to the pilot's seat. Oh, shut up, Halen. Surlia relieved Feldo and immediately saw something on her screen. Oh hey, Atrian ships, dead ahead. Grace nodded. Yep, those will be for me. Although not officially a mission run by the government, might as well have been. My father, he was ordered to free me, off the records. Most of the government thinks he's a criminal, but he's a hero. Lef patted her shoulder. I'm so sorry this had to happen. I have to admit, he was a pretty cool dude. Yeah. Henry, who had been waiting in the background with his goons the whole time, stepped forward. Hey, so... Grace waved at him. Yeah, yeah, you'll be paid. He nodded, hesitated, then spoke up again. Your father was a great man. We won't soon forget, Angel Eyes. His cronies nodded and grunted in agreement. Soon they were hailed by the gathered ships. A face none of them recognized appeared on screen. Greetings. I trust... Wait... You want to cry. Lef kept his face somber. He passed away during the mission. We were successful. Gray stepped into the camera's view. I have all the information, Admiral. Good. I will look forward to the debriefing. Eddie out. The calm went dead as Lef gawked at the empty screen. That was Admiral Eddie? Grace nodded. Yep, I just have some things to tell him. Things I learned during the war. Things the Solar Federation doesn't want us to know. Zack grinned and leaned in, ear pointed her way. Who do tell. I will bite your ear off. Zack quickly shuffled away. Grace walked to the door and turned around. Thank you for all your help. Then she swept away, gracefully, like her father. The crew of the Frontier never saw her again. 
As Rackham held the last note of an old Adrian folk song, the bulkhead opened and left Sept inside to the smell of sweaty, unwashed bodies and roasted meat. The room was dark as the power was low and was just beginning to come back. All eyes fixed on Lef, and Rackham laughed loudly. Ha 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 ha! Lef, come join us! We're just having a sing-along! After the power went out, we treated it like a camping trip. Lef almost laughed at the childish prospect, but when he saw some of the people around the small, smokeless fire, he knew it's what they needed. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. But boy, do I have one hell of a fireside tale to tell you. Frontier by Maggot Moshpit Chapter 30 Zodi was young and ambitious. The moment he acquired his research grant from his government, the Yaren scientist hopped onto the fastest ship he could afford and made a beeline for dead space. He was certain he would solve the mystery. He was certain he was going to be the one history would remember. As he drew near, he started another log to document his journey. I'm now half an hour away from the anomaly, and I find myself getting rather excited. If my research is correct, this could mean a tremendous advancement in hyperspace technology. He did a little shuffling dance in the middle of the floor, trying to calm himself. A chime on his wrist went off, and he jumped. Oh, log out. I must take the ta jara. He rooted around in his pocket and pulled out a container of gel. He scooped some on his long finger and spread it on his head. He said a lengthy prayer and put the gel away. He felt the ship exit hyperspace, and he excitedly dashed to the cockpit, only to skid to a stop at what he saw out the window. He expected the sight to be unnerving. It was a completely black area in space, but he didn't expect it to be moving. He peered with his large eyes into the shifting shadows. It isn't supposed to do that. Suddenly, a giant tendril of darkness flicked out and grabbed the ship, crushing the hull and throwing Zodi against the wall. The last thing he saw before he was swallowed by the thing was nothing but darkness and the crack lines on the glass. May the light ever drive out the d- Lef woke up to two strange sensations. One, the overwhelming sense that something terrible had just happened, which was fading quickly, and the other was a peculiar tickling sensation all over his chest. He opened his eyes, solving the mystery of what was causing the tickling. Lena was clinging to him unusually tightly. Laugh glanced at the clock and yawned. Hey, Peach. Time to get up. She sighed and clung tighter to his side. <sighs> Just five more minutes. It was already late, and they were expecting to finally arrive at their destination later that day. There was a lot of work to do. Sorry, Peach. Come on. Get up. Left tried to free himself from her grasp, but she actually managed to hold him down. She sighed again, and Left could hear a very distinct sound. Lena, is something the matter? We need to get up. No, I love you. Left tugged on her arm. I know that. What's gotten into you? She opened her eyes and saw Left trying to remove her paw from his arm. As if realizing something was amiss for the first time, she slowly retracted her arm and sat up. Left looked at her with worry. Lena? What was I doing? I was still half asleep. You just clung to me and didn't let go. She felt her chest. It feels really weird. It's like... I'm kind of dizzy, but it feels good instead of nauseating? Oh my god! What? Lena sprang up and ran to the bathroom, slamming the door behind her. Lef ran after her, but the bathroom door was locked. He heard Lena rummaging through drawers and items being strewn across the floor in a frenzy. Lena, what's wrong? Damn it, Lef! Don't you remember sex ed class? He shook his head. No, I... Wait a minute, you don't mean... She flew out the door. Maybe Surlia has one! They were across the hall in an instant, pounding at the door, forgetting they were still in their underwear. Surlia, her eyes half-closed, poked her head out the door. What the hell? Lena wrenched the door open and ran into Surlia's bathroom, locking the door. Laf paced outside the door, and Surlia watched with mild amusement instead of surprise. Um, wanna explain? Left ran his paw through his fur, his mind running at light speed. Lena woke up this morning and she was all clingy. At first I didn't realize, but now I do. It's obvious. Oh god, oh god! Surlia shook him. Slow down. What you're saying is impossible, though. He gulped. That's why I'm so anxious. 
Five minutes passed, but to Lef it seemed like five years. Lena finally stepped out of the bathroom, holding a vaguely thermometer-shaped device. It's positive! I'm pregnant! Lef's jaw dropped. What? It must be a false positive! I ran the test three times! Lef walked in a quick circle and grabbed Lena's arms. Who did this to you? One of the colonists? I'll kill- No, it! It's yours! I'm sure of it! Celia grabbed them both and sat them down on chairs. Calm down, you two! How am I supposed to be calm? Lena is pregnant with an impossible baby! Celia chuckled. What if it isn't so impossible? Lef shook his head. You don't understand. Canines and mustelids are different subspecies. We aren't genetically compatible. Lena shrugged slowly. Well, that's not totally true. What do you mean? She looked down with an expression of wonder on her face. Well, I read a paper a while ago. It's supposed that two genetically incompatible atrians conceiving a child was actually possible. Though the chances were so near zero, it didn't matter. And with all the stigma against two different subspecies being together, we don't have any recorded occurrence of this. It was quite interesting, actually. So, it is mine? She looked up at him. It has to be. Celia clapped her paws in delight. Aw, Lef, you're growing up so fast. Lef wasn't listening to her teasing. He slowly placed his paw on Lena's abdomen, then spoke as though most of his mind wasn't interested in what he was saying. We should probably get you a checkup when we stop at the medical center near Eden. To make sure there are no problems. Oh, man. Surlia grinned. So, what are you gonna name the kid? Neither of them heard her. They were in a world of their own. Gedio enjoyed floating around the shipyards of Alpha 2 in his off time. He would flap his arms like an insect and do flips in the air. On this particular day, he was simply floating without a care in the world, snoozing among the clangs and clashes of the busy workmen around him. He sighed and opened his eyes, looking out into the stars. He frowned. Some of the stars were missing. He laughed to himself and shook his head. The stars couldn't be missing. It was probably just his head playing tricks on him. He looked again, then fear shot through his body. What the hell? Most of the stars that were in the sky were gone. Gedio could already hear the panicked yelling and screams as the encroaching darkness reached the edge of the station. Gedio grabbed the compressed air pack and accelerated away from the thing, looking back to see it devour an entire ship in an instant. He felt the force field fail, and all the air in the entire station exploded into space. Nobody was safe from the sheer force of the explosion. That's great news! Feldo patted Lef and Lena on the back in congratulation, still a little confused as to how it happened. Zack wasn't phased, and he threw his arm around Lef's shoulder. You dog. So, you getting married? Lef looked at him. Why? Feldo chuckled. Zack, on Atria, marriage is only a legal contract for people to more easily share assets. It doesn't hold the same cultural significance as it does on Terra. Oh, really? Lef grinned at his lack of knowledge. Did your parents not teach you that? Well, my parents never told me anything about Atrian sexuality. I kind of wish they would have. You wouldn't believe how frustrating it is not to have your sick dance moves work on the ladies. Lena's console beeped, and the ship dropped out of hyperspace. She ran over. We've arrived in the system, and before you say anything, Lef, I can still work. He didn't answer. He just gazed at Lena with a dumb grin on his face. What? Did I get something on my muzzle? No, you're just so beautiful right now. Aww. Oh, shush you! He shook his head and cleared his throat. <clears throat> Set course for the medical center. Lena did, and they entered the Eden system. ETA, two hours. Oh, blazes! I need to tell Taliko and Yar! She jumped up and ran out the door, tugging Laugh along with her. The Eden Medical Center was built even before the planet was discovered. Constructed to provide the best care for extreme cases from any planet in no man's space, and staffed by humans and atrians alike, the facility was very impressive and huge. It was roughly a cube in shape, each corridor or room on the outside layer having a window that ran the entire length of the center, the combined lights causing the cube to glow. 
One side had the universal symbol for medicine on it, and the rest was white. The facilities and staff were equipped to handle anything from an alien plague to casualties from biological warfare. It was constructed in five years by both Atrians and humans, and was one of the friendliest places to go for both races. As it was being constructed, it was discovered that one of the planets in the system was habitable and very lovely, with rolling hills, low shrubs, and nutritious native fruit. Shortly after the completion of the facility, the Atrian government declared Eden open for colonization, and randomly selected Rackham's group to be the first wave of colonists. As the frontier approached, an arm reached out and slowly guided it to a free airlock. Inside, Lena, Toliko, and Yar sat at a table, chatting after Toliko almost had a heart attack from the news. Leff was called away when they reached the center, and as soon as he left, Toliko leaned in and whispered, So, which night was it? What? Toliko giggled and nudged Yar, who smiled knowingly. You know, the night of conception. Toliko and Yar laughed, but Lena buried her head in her paws. Why do you always have to take it to a weird place? Toliko nudged her. Oh, come on! Light it up! Lena slapped her paw but couldn't help but laugh along. <laughs> Quit teasing! We're not teenagers anymore! All three burst out laughing. Toliko nudged Yar once he had stopped giggling. Though, I bet it wasn't as good as Yar is. She hugged him. No one is better lover than him. <laughs> oh, cut it out now. You're embarrassing me. She let go and grinned. I wonder if you'll knock me up one of these days. He waved dismissively. I doubt it. Toliko narrowed her eyes at him suspiciously. You sound like you hate the idea of having children. Well, I, I don't hate the idea, I just don't want kids. Lena could see the situation was quickly heading to a bad place. Uh, hey guys! Shh! I want to have kids someday, Yar. Even if we have to adopt. Well, I don't. I'm no good with kids. Toliko stood up abruptly. God, you're so dismissive! She turned and ran away, her last words seeming to be overtaken by a sob. Lena opened her mouth, but the intercom blared to life right next to them, Left's voice coming over it. This is your captain speaking. We have just docked with the Eden Medical Center, so if anyone is overdue for a checkup, I recommend you go aboard and arrange something. We will remain here for the next few days to give all of you enough time. Left out. Lena stood. I've gotta go! You need to find Toliko and talk to her. Yar jumped up, as though he just realized how serious the situation was. Ah, shit. You're right. He ran out the door and Lena followed, but instead of heading towards the airlock like Yar, she went to the cockpit and tapped Left's shoulder. Hmm? Oh, want to go, Peach? Yeah. He took her paw. Don't worry, I'm sure it'll be fine. Celia waved. Have fun. Rissa sat at her desk, looking over another disappointing quarterly report. She slumped on the table. Balls deep in debt again. She picked up a calculator and began importing a long string of numbers, but was interrupted by wife beater guy. Madame, did you see the news? Rissa sighed and gave up her calculations, having forgotten the exact numbers she was trying to crunch. Ugh. <sighs> what is it? Can't you see I'm busy? He shuffled uncomfortably. Um, but Alpha 2 is gone. She looked around and saw worry on his face. What do you mean, gone? They walked to the main control room and joined the crowd of people watching a live broadcast on one of the screens. A wolf was there, standing in a room with some doctors working in the background. This is Shelley Halliburton reporting for AGNN with a new development in the case of the mysterious disappearance of the Alpha 2 repair station and possibly the missing Yaren research ship. A survivor has been recovered, one Gedeo Devora, owner and operator of Alpha 2. He's agreed to an interview. Shelley and the cameraman walked over and stood next to one of the doctors, who stepped aside and revealed a sorry sight. Gedio looked scared out of his wits, pale and wide-eyed. Shelley sat down next to him and began the interview. Mr. Devora, what exactly happened to Alpha 2? Gedio's eyes barely fixed on her face as she spoke, and it took him a moment to answer. It was like, first the stars were gone, like, like something moved in front of him. Then it reached out and... Oh, God. Shelley's voice was sympathetic, but also impatient. Take your time. It started to eat everything. Ships, people, it, the force field generator. I don't know how I did it, but I made it to a ship and jumped to hyperspace before it... His voice trailed off, and he did not continue speaking. Shelley now sounded slightly disturbed by what she had learned. Thank you, 
Mr. Devora. She turned to the camera, and the operator focused on her. More details as the situation develops. Right before the live broadcast switched to the news anchor, Atrian officers could be seen approaching in the background. The news anchor switched topics to politics, and Rissa shook her head. What did I just hear? The gathered workers offered no explanation. Rissa sighed. <sighs> well, I guess this means we'll be getting more business. I just wish it didn't come with such a price. What's wrong? Zafuto was rushing the group, fear in his eyes. The stars! They're disappearing! The group began to panic, and all hell broke loose when someone yelled, We're all gonna die! Rissa wasn't so sure. She grabbed the nearest person and slapped them across the face. Be quiet! Everyone! The entire room stopped in its tracks. Rissa flung the unfortunate individual back onto his feet. You are all going to do exactly what I say, or it's not some space thing you'll have to worry about. We're going to perform a total shutdown of all systems, including life support. Go! This time, the rush was less mad and more directed. Workers shutting down every system they could lay their hands or paws on. Soon, the station was totally dark. The light from distant stars was the only thing that could be seen, though that was fading fast. The whole station watched out the window as the stars continued to disappear. Someone whispered in the dark. Do you think this will really work? It's a shot in the dark. No pun intended. But it's the only thing we can do. They watched in silence, as though if they talked, the thing would destroy them. They watched the patch of darkness move past, marveling at the sheer size of the thing, as the stars were gone a good five minutes before they reappeared. It eventually passed completely, a patch of darkness in the far distance. It worked! There was a collective sigh of relief as people started breathing again. Rissa fumbled in the dark and restored life support, lights flickering on all over the station. Somebody get the police on the line. I think we found what destroyed Alpha 2. Yar walked through the center, trying not to get too distracted by the sheer size and impressiveness as he tried to locate Toliko. He turned a corner and saw an old Atrian fox in a wheelchair. He was staring out the window, and it looked like he had been there for a long time. If Toliko had come this way, the guy would have noticed. Yar approached and made sure he was noticed before he spoke. Uh, excuse me, sir? What? The nurse left the damn translator on. Told her a thousand times. Yeah, what you want? Um, sorry to bother you, but did you see a girl run past here? She, uh, might have been crying? The man looked up at Yar. His face seemed to be stuck in a permanent frown, but he still managed to deepen it. What species was she? She's an atrian. Yeah, sir. Pretty young thing, falling like nothing else. I asked her what was wrong, and she ran off down there. Thanks she didn't notice me right off. Yar was about to go off down the corridor when he was grabbed by the surprisingly strong grip of the man. Whatever you did, son, looked like it was going to take more than a box of roses to fix. You get my meaning? Yar nodded. Yeah, I, I think so. Thanks. He continued his brisk pace down the corridor, catching part of a conversation between the man and a nurse before he turned the next corner. Nurse! I told you not to leave the translator on! Mr. Stanley, there is no translator, remember? What? Then how did I know what the furry was saying? Mr. Stanley, you speak Atrian. Yar turned a corner and continued his search for Toliko. Captain Prax stood before Admiral Eddie as he explained Prax's next mission. This thing has already destroyed three ships and the repair station. We need to stop it before it does any more damage. Luckily, it seems to be moving in a straight line. He pointed at the map. There were four dots on the map, and a line connecting them. The next target of this thing seems to be the Eden Medical Center. Only a few short light years away from here. Going by its speed right now, it will arrive today. I understand, sir. What are my orders? I don't like this decision but it comes directly from the higher-ups. Frankly, I think you're too independent. Borderline insubordinate. He sighed. You've been promoted to... Ugh. Fleet commander. You will command the fleet to Eden and try to stop this thing. Prax grinned and swelled with pride. I won't let you down, sir. Let's hope not. I doubt they'll be able to evacuate the Eden Medical Center in time. I've given you the flagship, 
the twisted brother. Three Sanyo cruisers, two carriers, eight light cruisers, and 30 destroyers. It's pretty much everything you will have in this sector. And the Solar Federation can't get ships here until tomorrow. Eddie ran his paw through his fur nervously. I'm going to be totally honest with you, fleet commander. We have no idea of what this thing is. And from what I've seen it do, we might as well be throwing pixie wings at it. I understand, sir. Eddie pointed a claw at Prax. I don't think you do. If you have to, you need to pull the fleet out of there, even if it means sacrificing the medical center. I won't throw away the lives of thousands of men trying to save another thousand. Rendezvous with the fleet in one hour at Eden. Dismissed. Prax shuffled uncomfortably. Sir, we can't just- Dismissed. Prax lingered only for a moment, then stepped out the door of the general's office and walked quickly down the corridor towards his old ship. Once he arrived on the bridge, his first officer stood up. Captain, your seat. I kept it warm for you. Sit down, Sylvia. I'm promoting you to acting captain of the ship. He laid out the orders he had just received. Sylvia looked disturbed, but she nodded along with his plan. Prax sat in the first officer's chair and patted her on the back. Don't worry. I've encountered something like this before. I'll be commanding the fleet from the flagship, and with a little luck, we'll stop this thing. She nodded. I hope. Helm, set a course for Eden. Maximum speed. Leff and Lena sat apprehensively, waiting for the results of the tests. After a few short minutes in a scanning machine, they had been waiting half an hour for the doctor to interpret the data. Lena watched the doctor through the window, his head nodding or lowering periodically as he worked, his lower body obstructed by the wall. What's taking so long? He's probably never seen anything like it before. Give him time. Here he comes! The doctor emerged holding a file, sat down at his desk, and smiled. Congratulations, Mr. Quill and Miss Toto. You are the parents of the first Fennec-Wolverine hybrid. Lena leaned forward in amazement. Thank God! But how? The doctor's expression faltered. Well, I don't know. In every right, you shouldn't be pregnant. But the DNA came out a positive match. It's from both of you. Mostly. Left's face immediately screwed up in concern and fear. What's that supposed to mean? Calm down. There are no risks I can detect to the fetus. The DNA simply exhibited some very strange strands, probably a result of the specific union. I have one more thing. Yes? yes? The doctor smiled. Do you mind if I write a paper about this? It could make my career. They started laughing, but were interrupted. Leff clutched his head and yelled, causing Lena and the doctor to shoot up. Leff! The doctor rushed to his side, feeling his pulse. Mr. Quill, can you hear me? Yes. Ah! Once again, the world faded out, and he was in darkness. But that was all. Just darkness and nothing else. Though, as Leff tried to focus on something, anything, the endless, inky blackness began to have meaning, as though the absence of anything meant something. Leff understood perfectly what the meaning was. He opened his eyes and moved his lips. We need to get out of here. The doctor raised an eyebrow. What? He was cut off when a loud buzzer sounded and an intercom blared to life. All personnel and patients, please be advised. As of now, there is a general evacuation order in effect on the center. Please gather at the nearest muster station and await sorting into evacuation ships, which will carry you to the planet Eden. Intensive care patients will be taken. The message continued in the background as Leff ushered them out the door. There's no time to lose. It'll be here soon. Lena stopped him. Doc, you go on! You sure? Right. He scurried off and joined the flow of people. Leff pulled her. We need to leave now! Leff, what is it? He looked her square in the eye. It's nothing, Lena. And it's going to destroy everything. Prax's ship was the first to arrive. Ships were already streaming from the medical center and heading for Eden, where they assumed they would be safe. Scanning for anything out of the ordinary, sir, the sensor operator reported. Acting Captain Sylvia glanced at Prax. Nothing out of the ordinary yet, Commander. <laughs> I like that. It's got a nice ring to it. He watched out the window as ships began dropping out of hyperspace, from small maneuverable destroyers to giant carriers, all with enough firepower and men to destroy a large moon in a small amount of time. 
Finally, the flagship warped in. A class of its own, it was massive, with the most sophisticated sensors for exploration, the fastest drive ever invented, and the most powerful particle acceleration cannon in existence. Many people called it the egg due to its oblong shape and smooth surface. Sylvia, I'll be leaving the endless ocean in your capable paws. Hail the twisted brother. Tell Captain Umatani I'll be joining him shortly. Sylvia shook his paw. Good luck. Prax completed the short shuttle ride over and headed for the bridge. The bridge was huge, with tactical displays everywhere, crew running around with reports and other things, a huge screen which doubled as a window, now showing the fleet in a standard idle wedge formation. The weasel captain Umatani was one of the most respected captains ever, and he greeted Prax with a bow. Sir, 42 wings report normal status and ready to deploy. The repass is experiencing drive trouble and won't join us for another few hours. Prax nodded and walked to the rear of the bridge, where a table displayed a map of the system, the medical center, and each ship in the fleet. Umatani joined him, and so did his tactical officer. Prax pointed to the edge of the table and drew a line with his claw, intersecting with the medical center. This is the angle we think this thing will approach from. We will deploy the fleet here and here. We'll have the carriers orbit these moons. That way, if they need to bring their big guns online, it won't interfere with the other ships. We'll have them send out the fighters now and deploy them with the rest of the fleet. As for us, we'll be front and center. They were about to leave and carry out his orders when he stopped them. Listen, send out a probe, and have them send out a message saying we want to talk in every language and code you can. Yes, I would have done the same, but from what I hear, this thing can't be reasoned with. I want to cover all our bases. Umatani nodded, then gestured at the tactical officer, who went off to deploy the beacon. Prax watched the screen as the fleet deployed, spreading out in a net-like formation, bigger ships in the rear, smaller ships out front. One of the officers tapped him on the shoulder, and he looked around. Yes? Sir, I think we have something. She led him to the sensor station, then pointed at the screen. We tried to scan a section of space, but we didn't get the sensor beam back. It's as if something just ate it. Prax felt a cold chill run down his back. Put that region on screen. All eyes turned to the window as it switched from a fleet to a section of stars. Prax and Umatani stepped closer to examine it. Anything unusual? Not that I can. Wait. He peered closer at the screen. Zoom into sector 9G. The screen shifted and became black. Prax stepped back. What? Zoom out a bit. This time, a few stars could be seen on the edge of the screen, sometimes blinking in and out of existence. That would be it. Matches every description. The tactical officer spoke up. At the rate those stars are disappearing, the computer calculates the thing will be upon us in 20 minutes. Prax and Umatani exchanged glances, then sat in their chairs. All ships, battle stations! All ships reporting battle stations, fleet commander. Prax watched as the stars continued to wink out. What do you think it is, Captain? Looks like nothing for fleet commander. Yar ignored the evacuation announcement and continued pursuing Toliko who he had caught a glimpse of. She wasn't heading to any of the muster stations, and the last he saw her, she had docked into a storeroom. He stood outside the door, but couldn't muster up the courage to open it. Taliko, I, I want to talk, but didn't you hear the evacuation announcement? We should leave. He looked around, then stepped inside, the door swinging shut behind him. Taliko was sitting on the floor, arms around her knees. Yar sat next to her, and she abruptly hugged him tight, pressing her face against his shoulder. I really want kids, Yar. I know, my love, but something's up. We need to evacuate. She sniffed and stood with Yar. Alright, I don't know what came over me. Don't worry about it. Hey, what's this? He pulled on the knob and twisted it several times, but it did not move. It's locked? They both looked at each other, then out the window at the assembled fleet. Frontier by Maggot Moshpit Chapter 31 Lena dodged and weaved through the crowds, keeping her eye on Left's back as he plowed through the crowd towards the frontier. She slipped past a larger woman and almost crashed into Lef. He stood, joined by a few other people, at one of the windows, looking out onto a strange sight. A huge patch of space was now devoid of any stars, blocked by some pulsating nothingness waiting on the edge of the system. Lef? What is that? Thing. Laugh was shaking, his paws clenched, claws drawing blood from his pads. I don't know what it is, but I know what it means. Lena, you need to join the evacuation. 
There's something I need to do. She grabbed his arm. I'm coming with you! He looked down at her, his face screwed up in pain. I don't want anything to happen to you. Or the baby. Lena's ears flopped down and she pleaded. What? Does that mean you're putting your life in danger? Lev? Whatever it is, you don't have to risk your life for no reason! He grabbed her arms. I'm risking my life to save everyone. You don't understand. My mind is... so clear. I have to go over there, but you have to stay behind. He let go and dashed off without warning, leaving Lena in shock. Wait! She continued to pursue him. Prax didn't expect it to be that big. The entire view screen was taken up. The only things visible were the other ships and the medical center. The sensor operator looked on in terror and remembered she was supposed to be on the job. S sir I think it stopped. Prax watched the screen intently. Any answer to the beacon? No, Fleet Commander. All of a sudden, a single destroyer disappeared. For a moment, everyone on the bridge was silent. Then Prax sprang up. All wings, report! After a moment, the communication officer spun his chair around. Sir, fighters Iota and Moo have not reported in, and neither has a destroyer tie. There were no messages from any of them before they disappeared, either. Prax shook his head. That's an act of aggression! Group 13, attack wing! Make a single pass on it! Keep your distance and fall back to a safer position once you do some damage! Roughly a hundred fighters began moving, forming into wedge-shaped groups of five and streaking towards the thing. They began peppering the edge of the entity with particle and plasma cannons. One wing flew too close and was swallowed up, at which point the destroyers came into play, launching antimatter torpedoes. Cheers rose from the bridge crews as the missiles detonated against the thing, shards of metal flying off it, flashes from the explosions being totally absorbed by the entity. The entity did not take this assault lying down, as millions of tendrils shot out and wrapped around the nearest five ships. Jumbled yelling and screams could be heard over the comm before all five cut at the same time, utter silence prevailing. Group 13, fall back. I want a casualty report and damage assessment of it. The fighters and destroyers scrambled, zigzagging and dipping to avoid more tendrils of darkness. Sir. The tactical officer spoke up. Passive scan to the size of it has decreased by 0.8%. We've lost nine fighters and three destroyers. Prax refrained from slamming his paw in the chair as he gritted his teeth. Signal the carriers, we're bringing the big guns in. The twisted brother began to hum with energy as a particle beam was generated, similar to those in particle accelerators. Ready, sir. Fire! Taliko and Yar watched the fight from where they were trapped in the storeroom. They clung to each other, equally terrified. The largest of the ships suddenly released an extremely thin, extremely bright beam of particles into the black, formless mass. No one could have been prepared for what occurred next. A high-pitched scream emanated from the blackness, resonating in the heads of everyone in the Eden system. Yar clutched his head and rolled onto the floor, letting go of Taliko, who did the same. The screaming grew more intense as the two carriers added their beams to the flagships. I can't seem to travel in space! Yar managed to say through his clenched teeth. The three beams cut off, and the two unclasped their heads. Taliko hauled herself up onto the windowsill. Oh, that's better. What happened? The ships had ceased firing, but the entity did not look happy. A giant protrusion, the thickness of a planet, and the length of a star system shot out and decimated a carrier and the moon it was orbiting. A second, smaller one swung in and headed straight for the medical center. Neither had time to react as it crashed into the center, cutting from top to bottom and carving a jagged scar down the side. Taliko looked over at Yar, and then was gone. In her place was a hole running down another eight floors. Yar's eyes bulged and his jaw hung open, falling to his knees before the hole, an emergency force field taking over in an instant. He reached out a paw and felt the smooth edge of the floor. Taliko? Leff hauled himself up from the shock and continued to the ship. He rounded a corner and dashed through the airlock, dodging Feldo on his way. Leff, there you are. Hey, wait! Leff practically fell into the cargo bay and tumbled into the fighter pod. He closed the hatch and launched as soon as he could, flying directly into the blackness. Sorlia ran up to Feldo and looked inside the cargo bay and at the quickly disappearing fighter. They stopped firing. Who's that? It's Leff. He just jumped in and he's flying towards the monster thing. Lena ran up, out of breath. 
He did what? Come on, we're going after him! She ran towards the other fighter and the two followed, bunching into the fighter and launching after Laugh. Zack was in the cockpit and he watched as the fighters were launched. He facepalmed and hailed the furthest ship. Hey, are you suicidal or something? Get away from there! There was no response. Zack grumbled and hailed the other fighter. Lemmings, what the hell? Zack! Lef just jumped into a fighter and flew towards that thing! We're gonna get him! Zack fought with himself internally before answering. Guys, we're taking on evacuees. We're taking off any second now. We can't wait, so if you get him, bring him to the center and go from there. Surlia's voice answered. We understand. Shuttle out. Rackham poked his head inside the cockpit. Zack, we're at capacity. Take us out of here. Have you seen Taliko and Yar? Zack prepped them for departure, though he didn't know how to fly very well. They must have gotten out on another ship. Look, we can't wait for them. That thing might attack again. What? What if they're in trouble or something? Zack pulled the heavy, overloaded ship away from the center slowly, pushing the engines to the limit as they joined the stream of other ships fleeing the combat zone. I'm sorry, Rackham. I'm sure they'll be fine. Uh, you're probably right. Prax shook his head, recovering from the screech that almost knocked him off his seat. Damn! Status! Crew members picked themselves up from the floor, returning to their stations. One of them looked at the screen with disbelief. Sir, one of the carriers is gone. What? There were 300 people on that ship! How much did it shrink this time? It shrank by... Sir, it's gotten bigger! Prax looked at Umatani. Looks like we can't kill it. Indeed. He turned around and caught the attention of the sensor operator. Take all the data we've collected so far and take it down to the boys in the lab. See what they come up with. Yes, sir. Prax looked at the entity, now motionless for some inexplicable reason. Do you think they'll be able to figure this one out? They have to. Hey, what's that? There was a flash of silver in front of the entity, then another a second later. It looks like a ship. Or two? Scan them, and zoom the screen in on them. The screen displayed two fighters, heading directly towards the entity. Sir, it's two fighters. But they're not ours. Whosoever they are, they're about to get killed. Hail them. No response from the furthest, but we have someone on the other. A voice came over the comm. Yes, we're kinda in the middle of something here. Prax almost laughed out loud and realized the situation they were in. Sir Leah? I should have known it was you. Prax? Not a good time. Left's in that other shuttle and we're trying to get him back. Prax glanced at Umatani, who looked confused. We know each other. Is there any way we can get them out of there? Umatani shook his head. No, not without risking blowing them up. Damn. Sir Leah, if you can get him out of there, do, but be careful. Lena answered this time. You don't need to tell us twice! Once the exchange had ended, the sensor operator tapped Umatani on the shoulder. Sir, a small fleet has just jumped into the system. Three ships, cargo vessels. Tell them to leave immediately. We don't want any more civilians in danger. Yes, sir. Zack was wrestling with the controls, trying to fly the ship straight, even though he wasn't a pilot and they were overburdened with evacuees. It didn't help that he was being hailed at the same time. He reached over and switched on the comm, putting the call on the pilot's screen. Yeah? Lef. Oh, you're not Lef. A blue-eyed Pine Martin looked at him, worry on her face. No, I'm the engineer. Lef is currently flying a suicide mission. Do you know him? Yes. And Faldo. I hope you were joking. Zack shook his head, wiping the sweat off his brow. Sorry, I was being facetious. I don't know what's going on, but there's something attacking the medical center. Lef just took a fighter and flew at it. Feldo, Celia, and Lena went after him. <gasps> Feldo! I'm going to help- Wait, don't you see the entire armada there? I think they've got it. Besides, Lef's got a way of getting out of these situations. The woman on the other end looked left to what Zack assumed to be a screen, biting her claws. I guess you're right. There is something you could do. We're evacuating the center to Eden. You could pitch in. But they told me to leave. <laughs> if they weren't so focused on trying to stop that thing, they probably would have ordered you to anyway. She drew a shaky breath and nodded. All right. I suppose it's the right thing to do. Before she cut off, Zack snapped his finger. Oh, what, what did you say your name was? It's Cherry. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Don't get eaten. 
Lef couldn't hear anything. His focus was so intense, the only thing he saw was the total blackness before him. As he drew closer, he felt a strange tingling on his scalp. He glanced up and realized there was something around his head, a sort of shell of inky black energy. And it was coming from his head. He wanted to scream, but he found his body wasn't allowing him to. He tried to do anything besides fly the ship, but still his body did not allow him to. Then something hit the ship, rocking him around. The interior of the ship began fading out of existence, and at first Left thought he was losing his senses, but he could still see his paws in his peripheral vision. What? Tendrils of darkness enveloped his body, covering his face, flowing out of every crevice. Suddenly Left was somewhere else. He was standing on top of the Eden Medical Center, totally oblivious to the fact that he was standing in space. Leff saw the warships moving around. He saw the evacuation taking place. He saw all this in perfect detail. Every molecule in everything in the entire system, all at once. At first, this was too much for Leff's brain. But as the entity delved deeper, he found it a trivial amount of information to take in. However, this comfort did not last. His perception began to expand past the confines of the solar system, to other systems. He saw Rissa talking to reporters. He saw a man buying bread. He saw an insect inside a log eating another insect on a planet no humanoid had ever set foot on. He knew his body was getting damaged by this, but he could do nothing to stop the expansion of his brain. Soon it went beyond the galaxy to other galaxies, with life he could not comprehend, yet he still took in every detail without fail and without consent. This process continued, galaxy after galaxy, world after world, molecule after molecule. After it seemed like his mind would explode from the sheer pressure of all the information he was gathering, it stopped. Leff had seen everything. He was seeing everything. All at once, the entire universe was now contained within his brain. Once again, he felt a sort of relaxation as the entity expanded his mind further, and once again, Leff had no problem with the amount of information in his mind. It did not stop there. What he was seeing began to unravel. Now there were more and more versions of the universe, each one infinitesimally backwards and forwards in time. Time rewound to that morning when he had discovered he was going to be a father, back to when he was on Alpha 2, and back when he was just flying away from the moon. But he did not see only his past, but each thing he perceived's past. He saw earlier humans dancing in strangely lit rooms with reflective balls hanging from the ceiling. He saw an ancient canine atrian racing after two armed felines who bore a young female between them. Leff didn't know how he did, but he also began to know the relationships between all he saw. Particles and their different reactions with each other, each organism's unique reaction to any given situation, gravity and relativity were all laid out before him. And he understood it all as though it was child's play, the entire universe throughout all time. The noise of everything Leff was hearing and seeing would kill anything that were to perceive even a fraction of it, yet he thought nothing of it. He thought he was done, but there was more. It started with a single atom, an atom which Leff didn't recognize. Curious. How can there be anything I do not recognize? It exploded, and Leff suddenly saw another universe. And then another, and another, and another. Billions of universes opened up to him, most of them chaotic and without order, just clouds of particles that never formed into anything throughout that universe's timeline. Some were so beautiful they filled Leff with sorrow. Some so ugly they filled him with rage. There couldn't possibly be anything else to see. I have seen every universe and all time. Nothing remains to be seen. Pain shot through Leff's mind. Not physical pain. Leff no longer felt through his body. But pain coming from a place Leff never thought possible. Pain coming from an angle that, according to the laws of every universe he perceived, was impossible. That, in itself caused the pain. Through the agony, he saw more. A strange man standing behind a lectern, speaking to Toliko. He saw impossible shapes existing in more dimensions than three. And, through an especially painful stab, he saw a human sitting in front of a screen, listening to these words. Luff, now you understand the nature of your existence. Yes. Yet where am I? I do not know. We do not come from your reality. 
You come from our reality. I do not understand. To us, your reality is but a paperweight on a desk. That was a metaphor, yes? Yes. How can you be in a reality which you created? We throw ourselves in, giving in to the corporal nature of your reality. However, our lack of understanding can sometimes produce unforeseen results. Oh? I came here to you so that I could hide. I did not know where I would be, when I would be, or indeed what I would be. But I knew my pursuers would be similarly handicapped. The perfect place to flee to? Yes. However, they have found me. I deduced as much. The world faded back in, but it wasn't the world Leff expected to come back to. He was standing on a marble floor in a strange room. Around him were wooden pews, columns ending about halfway through the room. There was a sort of dividing wall, then an open space with a couple tables and chairs. On the far side of the room was a tall bench before an even taller wooden block, atop which sat a small hammer. There was a fat man sitting on the bench, frowning down at Leff through his ridiculously sized powder wig. Sit down, Leff! Leff glanced around, noticing for the first time that there were similarly dressed and wigged men, grumbling at him from pews and chairs. Oh, sorry. He sat in the nearest chair, next to a man who was covered in chains, which seemed to hold him to the chair by fusing to the floor. Hi. Hello, Leff. Hey, you sound like the waterworm guy. The man sighed. Yes, it is me. We needed to conduct this proceeding in an environment you would understand, as you are a key witness. A witness? But this looks nothing like a court. The fat man on the bench spoke up. We apologize, Leff. This is a human court. Its structure resembles ours in an infinitely simple way. Oh. The fat man took the gavel in his hand and slammed it on the block. This court is now in session. We are here to determine the guilt of the Leff entity. <laughs> what? I've not committed any crimes. The assembled men grumbled again, and the chained man leaned over to Leff. He means me. Huh. Sorry. The man on the bench banged the gavel again. Order! Leff entity, you are accused of the following crimes. Inciting terrorist thinking. Inciting terrorist activities performing terrorist activities, disregarding doctrine, allowing the existence of pocket planes, murder. Left's entity strained against the chains and yelled, It was in self-defense. Down came the gavel. Ahem! Murder, evading the law, and one parking violation. The assembled men murmured among themselves. The fat man leaned forward. How do you plea? Not guilty. There was a gasp from the assembled men. Even the judge seemed surprised. Your disregard for the law runs deeper than we thought. Very well. We will proceed. Suddenly, three more men appeared, one of which was taller than the other two. The tall one stepped forward. I am prosecutor, Lef. Yeah, I gathered that. Stop talking to me like I'm a child. The tall man blinked slowly. What is a child? Never mind. Carry on. The persecutor began pacing up and down the room, speaking in monotone. You started your activities the moment you were created. You stated in this recorded scrap of media that you believe our doctrine is wrong. Is this correct? The tall man held up a scrap of paper, but left doubted the real piece of evidence looked anything like paper. Yes. I will now list in order your terrorist activities. You destroyed a law office while making it known it was your opinion that it was corrupt. You attacked key members of the High Council. You placed messages around our plane stating the Continuum was corrupt. You... Lena, Sirlia, and Feldo were in a precarious situation. As Lef entered the entity, tendrils had grabbed their fighter and were holding it in place. It looked like they were about to be crushed, but as soon as Lef disappeared completely, the tendrils stopped crushing and became still. They now all sat around, breathing shallowly and looking out the window. Lena tapped her claws on the window. He's probably fine, right? I mean, we're not dead. Sir Leah huffed. <sighs> Yet. Uh, thanks a lot. Sorry, 
Lack of oxygen kind of getting me salty. Faldo raised his arms. Guys, save your breath. Literally. We've been here for three hours. I think it's about time we give up hope. Don't say that. We'll get out of this. We've got enough air for another hour. Surlia sighed. Ugh. I can't stay negative towards you, Feldo. Yeah, that's the spirit. She fiddled with her claws nervously. Though I would like to say a few things in case we all die. You'd- Shut up, Feldo! You can't stop me! Lena, thanks for being there for Lef. He'd never tell anyone this, but he used to drink. Lena nodded. Yeah, he told me. Celia couldn't help but feel hurt. Oh. He told you? Yep. He told me he drank a lot because of Rissa. Huh. Well, he never touched the stuff much after you came along. Thanks for that. And I suppose I should write one for Zack and Lef. Later. She turned to Feldo. Do you know how hard it is to be attractive? What? I was always expected to have higher than average success in the love area. Sometimes I was pressured into relationships with guys I didn't even like. Eventually, I gave up trying and just lived. Until I started to get to know you, Feldo. I felt really sympathetic to your problems, and then... She trailed off. Fellow gulped. Where is this going? Shut up! I'm, I'm trying to spill my feelings here. Damn it, now I've lost my momentum. Fuck it. I like you, Feldo. He coughed. Thanks, I, I guess. And that's sweet, but I'm kind of promised forth. I, I know. I, hey, what are you laughing at? Lena was laughing hard, clutching her sides. <laughs> Surlia chuckled, then started laughing too, Feldo joining in as well. <laughs> Probably gonna die. <laughs> huh. We end up talking about Lev's drinking problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, we are so pathetic. Eventually, the laughter died down. Surlia slumped her head back into the wall and sighed. Well, at least we all have a dark sense of humor. That'll be useful in hell. Prax and Umatani stood at one of the tables, which was now displaying a plethora of data. The head scientist was there, indicating different things on the table. We've sent probes, done scans, hell, we even tried collecting a sample of that thing. And in every test we came to the same conclusion. There is nothing out there. Prax raised an eyebrow. Is that right? Then you can't explain how or why it's killed hundreds of people. We can't even determine whether or not we even did any damage to it. There doesn't seem to be a correlation between its size and its health. Prax shrugged. So, what do we do? It doesn't seem to be doing anything at the moment. And those fighters are still lodged into it. Maybe it's... asleep? Prax turned and looked at the screen, which was displaying one fighter trapped in the clutches of the entity. I should have known Lef would be up to something. Would you believe me if I said I've encountered something like this before? Umatani and the head scientist looked at each other, then the captain spoke up. Have you? Maybe. In any case, I think Lef might help us, if not save us. Fleet Commander, who's Lef? <laughs> He's the young captain of a cheap, old, outdated cargo ship. You then led a band of similarly minded ones in protests of doctrine, and then swayed an entire congregation to incite a rebellion. And don't forget that you did the most heinous thing imaginable. You allowed the creation a pocket plane in which biological life forms exist. You then entered the plane and hid in it. The proof is right here, sitting among us. The tall man finally stopped pacing and pointed at Laugh. Huh? You mean me? Yes, you. A biological life form. The chained man rattled his chains and yelled again. If we create a life, why don't we allow it to live? Have you seen the wonders these things have created? The judge cut in. Yes, 
But do you see why we destroy these planes when they're created? Look at this war these beings have gone through. Millions dead. Millions more traumatized or injured. Billions of these conflicts are going on in that plane at any given moment. Is this something you can live with? Do you not see why we cut these planes as soon as they are created? The chained man hung his head and left waved his hand at the judge. Hey, I'm kind of lost here. Did you say you created the universe? The judge waved his hand dismissively. Yes, well, not on purpose. They are a natural byproduct of our creation. We saw the horrid nature of these universes, as you so call them. So we disposed of them. The merciful thing to do. Our largest source of guilt is only being able to destroy about 80% of them, leaving billions of planes suffering. Oh, if only we could destroy them all. Left slammed his paws on the table. What? You kill universes? After having created them? What gives you the right- We created them. That gives us the right. You see, Lef, in our plane there is no killing, no war, no suffering. The worst things that might arise are ones like this, who wish to change our ways. You must understand, Lef, this incident may cause a civil war within the Continuum. Something that has never happened in our history, and something that may very well end existence in our plane. And without our plane, there can be no other planes, just nothingness for all eternity. Do you want that, Lef? <laughs> you know something? There's a good chance your plane is just a cube on some guy's coffee table, too. There was outrage from the assembled men. Many shouted at Lef, and some just stared at him in shock. The judge banged his gavel to restore order. You know not what you say. It is strictly forbidden to hold such beliefs. We are the supreme beings. There are no others. I thought pretty much the same thing until now. The persecutor walked up to the judge and craned his neck. This is irrelevant. You cannot allow the witness to speak further. Agreed. The witness will no longer speak until spoken to. Left suddenly no longer had a muzzle. He rolled his eyes and sat down. The persecutor walked over to the chained man and leaned over the table. I have presented my evidence, and it has been verified. You are guilty. The crowd murmured, and the judge looked at the chained man. Your defense. All of these accusations are based off a of flawed doctrine. This atrian, as they call themselves, has dreams, aspirations, a life, and a love. Yes, he has pain. And yes, to do countless others. But there's also so much joy there. Too much to just end. The judge waved his hand. Saying the law is flawed is not a defense, I'm afraid. We do what we do to ensure minimal suffering across all planes. You have been found guilty. The plane you created will be terminated. And you will suffer the ultimate punishment. Death. The crowd gasped, and the chained man's jaw dropped. The two men that had appeared with the persecutor began striding towards the table awkwardly. The chained man looked at them, then at Leff. He started struggling against the chains, reaching out to Leff. It began to phase through his bindings as he strained. Stop him! The two men sped up, but were clearly not accustomed to bipedal locomotion, as they tripped over one another and fell in a heap. One of the chains snapped, and Leff felt a hand close around his arm. He looked down at the hand, thinking what a futile gesture it was. But when he looked up, he saw he was no longer in the courtroom, but standing in the mist again. This time, however, his body was totally intact, and before him was the worm. What just happened? I did something they never would have expected. I returned us to my world. Left looked around, unimpressed. Kinda... Spartan. This is only what your mind comprehends. It resembles what you saw in your visions of me, no? Yeah, you're right. So you just made yourself at home in my brain, huh? So to speak, yes. A small object rose from the ground. It was round, smooth, and totally white. What's that? This is your plane. I must hide it. The stone flew away at an incredible speed and disappeared in the mist. So you just... 
threw it away? No. I created a subspace fold and masked it with a quantum flux field, and then put your plane inside. Your brain simply perceives it as being thrown away. Weird. So, can I go back? Yes, but not like this. You were only alive because I expanded your mind's ability to store information. Otherwise, our reality would have killed you. I must take away the memories of much of this experience. Laugh looked around once more. Maybe it's for the best. I don't think I would ever be the same knowing what I know. Yes. Goodbye, Leff. And thank you. Goodbye. I hope you change the doctrine, or whatever. Leff rose into the air and slipped into an invisible opening in the fabric of space. Lena watched the oxygen concentration gauge steadily drop. Well, guys, we've only got maybe a couple more minutes. Serlia blinked slowly, her eyelids becoming heavy. Phil? She didn't finish the word, as she slumped next to Feldo, unconscious. Lena wanted to react, but she didn't have the strength. Instead, she tilted her head towards the window, looking out into... another fighter. Left? Get some ships over there! The entire crew watched with hopeful eyes as the patch of dead stars quickly dissipated, leaving the two fighters behind. We have two destroyers headed over, sir. Umatani tapped his claws. Uh, I hope they've not suffocated yet. Prax shook his head. It's possible they have, otherwise they wouldn't be just sitting there. The destroyers reached the two fighters and docked with them. There were a few minutes where nobody spoke, then the comm officer sighed in relief. Sir, they're alive. All four of them. Thank goodness. I can't bear having any more people die. Speaking of which... Do we have an exact loss report yet? The tactical officer handed Prax a datapad wordlessly. Prax skimmed it, then ran a paw down his face. 390 missing. Assume dead. Umatani patted him on the back. It's a shame it had to happen on your first time out, Prax. He sighed. Time for cleanup, then. They watched as the thing disappeared completely, leaving nothing in its place. So long, Blobby. Lena woke up with a mask covering her muzzle. She immediately tore it off and sat up, rubbing her aching head. A human nurse rushed over and pushed her back down. Hey now, slow down. You were in a coma for 16 hours. Please try to relax. She blinked and looked around the room. She was back on the medical center. What happened? The explanation given to me was sort of hard to understand. But you suffered oxygen deprivation and slipped into a coma. You're the first one awake. She took a moment to let it sink in, then sat up again. Where's Leff? Was he the one in the other fighter, or the one in yours? He was in the other fighter! Is he alright? Yes, he's... alive. She grabbed the nurse's arm. I sense... a butt coming! But he's also in a coma. We suspect there's more at work than simple lack of oxygen, however. He has it worse off than the rest. Let me see him! The nurse nodded. Very well. He's not far. Lena jumped out of the bed and fell over on her side. Whoa, slow down. You aren't strong enough to walk yet. Lena clambered back into the bed with the help of the nurse and lay back, exhausted. I'll wheel you there, the nurse said with a smile. She pushed the bed down the hall to a room next door. Leff was connected to every tube imaginable, and a mask covered his face. Oh, Leff! The nurse left them alone, and Lena took his paw. Please wake up. She heard a shuffling sound and turned to see Yar coming in the doorway. His eyes were red from either crying, lack of sleep, or both. Yar! I'm glad you're all right. Where's Taliko? Yar walked over and sat on a chair next to Lena's bed. Tears began streaming down his face. Yar? Where's Taliko? He buried his face in her sheets. <laughs> Gone. Somewhere, very, very far away, Lef could hear a sound. It was loud, but distant. A sort of tap-tap-tap sound. He reached out and slapped whatever was making the sound. It squeaked. Lef! You're awake. He recognized the voice. It was Sorlia. Yeah, who could sleep through such annoying tapping? He opened his eyes and saw Sorlia smirking down at him. Sorry. Nervous habit. Leff felt absolutely dead tired. 
It was like his body was fused to the bed, and his legs were petrified. Ow! My tail hurts. You've been in a coma for three weeks. What do you expect? The three weeks? Yep. Three long, boring weeks. Her face fell slightly. We all missed you. I'm sorry. She punched his arm. Don't you dare apologize. Hold on a sec. I'm going to call everyone. Soon the room was flooded with people. Rackham, Feldo, Yar, Sirlia, Zack. They were all there. Rackham gave Lef a giant bear hug, and Lef made a sound akin to a dog's chew toy. <laughs> I knew you'd snap out of it. I never got to thank you for bringing us here. Eden is lovely, by the way. We've got a real nice town going. Zack stepped forward and grinned. Lef, now you can pay me. What? I'm just kidding, man. It's good to see you. Faldo was standing next to Zack, and he butted in. Ah, thank God you're awake. I was leaving with Terry this afternoon, and I would have missed you. <laughs> Ditching me for some chick. <laughs> good for you. Faldo blushed. No, that's not it. I... Don't worry, Feldo. I'm happy for you. You've got some rare talent there. Don't let it go to waste on the frontier. Feldo laughed, but Lena was finally able to get through the crowd before he could speak further. She jumped on to Lef without any care in the world, burying her face in his chest. Lef! Oh, Lef! Hi, Peach. Uh, sorry for making you wait. Again. She sniffed and kissed him. He felt a slight bump in his stomach. Whoa, you're getting bigger. <laughs> yeah. Left side and hugged Lena close. So, is someone going to explain what happened? I don't remember anything past finding out the baby was okay. Feldo, Sirlia, Lena, and Zack waited on the cockpit of the frontier, having idle conversation. The door opened, and Lef stepped through, looking a little thinner than he did before. Hey, guys. Feldo walked over to him. Are you sure you're strong enough to walk? Lef stumbled to his seat. Who said anything about walking? I don't need walking to captain this ship. Feldo extended his paw, and they shook. I'm leaving now. I wanted to thank you for all you've done for me. Lef smiled. No problem. You more than made up for it. I guess... Look, if Terry ever wants to run freight with us, I'm game. I'd like that. Until then, so long. He walked out the door and waved to everybody. He stepped out of the door, but was stopped dead as Sirlia clung to his back in a tight hug. Take care, Feldo. Oh, I will. Let go. She did, and he awkwardly continued walking. Sirlia watched him until he was gone. Lef noticed Zack standing behind the engineering console. Hey... I thought you were going to stay on Eden. Pfft, no way. And miss all the adventures with you? Not on your life. <laughs> all right, Celia, we're going to need a job. She grinned. I've got just the thing. A group of deep space explorers need a cargo ship to haul their equipment to an unexplored sector of space. We'll need another engine upgrade, but what else is all the money you got for? Tell the explorers we're on the job. Peach, set coordinates for the Paradise Shipyards. Aye aye, Captain! She set a course and engaged the engines, setting a course for the shipyards. As soon as they exited the system, they jumped into hyperspace, disappearing with a flash into the stars. Feldo stepped aboard the Skylinks and called out. Chief Engineer Feldo, reporting for duty. Terry appeared as if from nowhere, a huge grin on her face. <laughs> there you are. She took his paw and kissed him on the cheek in the same motion. Whoa, oh, slow down, Terry. I have to get you comfortable. Come on, the rest of the crew is writing for us. The crew of the Skylinks and Terry's other two ships waited around a table full of snacks. They began to cheer when the two entered the engine room. A grizzled old jackal walked up to Feldo and shook his paw. I hope you know what you're doing, young fella. I don't want to leave my engines in no fool's paws. Don't worry, old gaffer. I'll take good care of them. Everyone swarmed Feldo, congratulating him and welcoming him. He was overwhelmed for a moment, but eventually they gave him some space. Someone shouted, Speech! Feldo shouted back, You first! 
There was laughter, and Feldo smiled, pulling Terry close to his side and whispering into her ear, Thank you for all this. I love you. There was an ooh from the assembled crew as Terry's face turned beet red, a huge smile on her face. Yar and Rackham sat on the grassy knoll, watching the sun go down over their new home. Rackham was telling Yar about the next wave of colonists. They're going to arrive in another month. Uh, there's twice as many this time. And they'll be bringing plenty of seeds to complement the Laxar Ranch. Yar? Yar, are you listening? Yar snapped out of his stupor and looked up. Oh, yeah, sorry. You were, uh, thinking about Toliko, weren't you? Yar shook his head. Mm-mm, not this time. He stood and stretched. I was thinking more about the crazy bus ride that took us here. He began strolling down the hill, Rackham chuckling to himself as he got up to follow. Ha 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 ha! That's an understatement, lad. It was so crazy, someone ought to write a book about us. Left Quill was played by Jester Dayrama. Lena Toto and assorted extras were played by Princess Sue. Sir Leah was played by Sola Hayes. Feldo and Texas Red were played by Watcher162. I am Deep Sea Works and I have voiced Bowman, Kane, and Marcus. Canton, Conrev, Henry, and Cultist Six were played by Di Cymru. Assorted male extras were played by me, Dan Porter VA, or Lightning Runner, on YouTube. Hestia042, Miss Jenkins, Colonist, Mother, Security Guard, and Commander Paula. Yar was voiced by Arkinea. You'll find me a little anywhere. Follow me if you dare. Wallace and Doc voiced by Haristan. Rico, Sue, and Assorted Extras were played by Cressy Cress. Assorted Female Extras by Silver Eyed Lily. Assorted Male Extras were played by Burst SMG. General Nephron and Gray were played by Jamal Deep. Zack was played by Darkwing. Buddha was played by Akal. Ray Phoenix was played by Blackmore Crest. Prax was played by J.D. Jones. Assorted Male Extras by King. Grace was played by MLPM Dog. Assorted Male Extras were played by Papo Donturto. Cyrus and Lef's Entity were played by RMP321. Tony and Grant were played by Bew. Taliko was played by Deco Royale. Umatani and assorted male extras were played by Drew Moon. Gedio was played by ITF Video Games. Nan and Shelley Halliburton were played by Itzel, 41. Rackham and Fourth Dimensional Judge were played by Jimmy S. Rissa was played by Mado Tsuki. Assorted child extras were played by Mickey Yannix. Assorted female extras were played by Little Lee. Written and narrated by Maggot Moshpit. Fin. <laughs>